La Spania, or Spain, a knightly poem of the 14th century, edited of Carlotta Gradi, Canto 1. Most High Lord, Eternal Light, Mercy and Peace and Charity, Supreme Justice and Perfect River, Principle of Created Souls, or Path of Truth without Volume, by which all things are governed, O Supreme Father, King of the Universe, by whom the enemy was submerged from heaven, I always have recourse to you and with your name I want to make the beginning, middle and completion, of your grace gives me as much as you gave to Saint Peter with your resolution, although I am not worthy of such a burden. Do not look at my great failure. Give me grace to begin with this story, so that everyone likes it. Gentlemen and good people, who have come before me to hear, I want to pray to the Almighty Sire that you listen to me in peace with pleasure, and I will count you in this saying of the valiant, great and perfect King, who through his strength, wisdom and great goodness greatly raised Christianity. The deed of Chiamonti and Mongrana, which already descended from Constantine, first emperor of the Christian faith, of which deed King Pippin was born and many more than my words explain, and the paladin King Carlo Mano was born from Peppa, as the book names him, he was king of France and emperor of Rome. Having this great king subjugated part of the universe to his power, and made all his enemies avenged and recalcitrant, staying one day, he decided to have all of Spain at his will, and as he had done the thought, suddenly he had a parliament held. Throughout Christianity, through valleys, plains, through coasts and through mountains, through villas, through cities and through districts, to princes, marquises, dukes and counts, to all his barons of nobility, he commanded them to be ready for him to come to the royal city on the day of Christmas Easter. All the barons of the Christians named on the day of Christmas were presented at court before Carlo Mano, each baron led each of his various buffoons to tell how many of their tools were strong. We have never seen more beautiful people nor so many good leaders and guides. Carlo, seeing such barony, said in his heart, I can praise myself well that I am lord of the law of Mary's thread and, if I am not, it seems to me, since such beautiful company will come, wherever I want, to accompany me. In his chair he stood up speaking, as you will hear right here listening, each of you, sir, must know well that Christianity is at my command, I don't have a son and I'm not about to have a son and I feel great pain as I think about who I should keep the kingdom. I have no closer relative than Orlando nor will he still have children unless he first becomes king of Spain. When Aldabella took over, I promised to crown him with all Spain, therefore I beg you, without others divided, noble barony, powerful and magna, regardless of the conquered Saracens, with your effort be in my companion and with Orlando, so that he may be crowned by Spain, as I have sworn to him. After Carlo had thus spoken and said what pleased him, he returned to the chair to sit, no baron made any reply. King Salaman rose to his feet, he began to speak boldly, to the honor of God, Almighty Father, I will follow Orlando with my people. Otamilia will come under my banner of bold people, full of arrogance, who already disdain to fight, who will not have the training of two so many, so much courage reigns in their courage that it would be a burden for me to tell it. Orlando said, I thank you, sire, not only for doing, but also for speaking. Then the good Dane stood up, to the honor, he said, of Maria's line I will be with Count Orlando to defend him with three thousand on horseback in company and follow him through every country, I will still be guarding him. Orlando said, I thank you then, then he sat down homeless. Gander Pontieri, a ferocious traitor, rose to his feet and thus began to say, in honor of him who died on the cross with sixty-two counts I will follow Count Orlando by sea and by mouth in every part that he wanted to travel, with thirty thousand good knights. Orlando gladly thanked him. The Marquis Olivieri of Vienna said, as a valiant and pro-champion, emperor, and tenor of the Christians, every baron will be prepared, until I can only do one pen, I want to follow Milo's son. Give us leave so that everyone can adorn themselves and return to the court in spring. Carlo marked Olivieri and blessed him when he heard him speak so well, then he commanded each baron and said that each one must return to his country and in the spring he told him how much effort could be made. And so the barony departed, once Carlo had heard rumors about him. 
Then when all the people had departed and everyone returned to their own district, he appealed to Carlo Orlando sweetly saying, I want you to go, perfect sir, to the city of Rome quickly, to the apostolic, in his presence, and tell him that much I recommend it, then you will tell the reason why I am sending you. Tell him that I want to gather together to want to ride in Spain, of twenty thousand the standard and six hundred true champions must confirm you, that by Christianity commandment on his part must be sent, that punishment and guilt be forgiven to those who go to Spain against the Feria. Then he took Orlando Strong to ride towards Provence with good escorts of him. Carlo suddenly had various supplies prepared at the port of Valenza and in other ports he also had ships assembled with very short supplies, so that Massilio would not be able to know when and in which direction he wanted to ride. But it was also brought to King Massilio as Charles was gathering, so that his heart was greatly troubled, and he sent for the brothers without hesitation and, when each one was presented, he said, Brothers, we are in fear, because Charles, Roman Emperor, great part of the Christian populace. Inside Paris he held counsel with all his barons and most powerful, I'm afraid that the claw won't lift towards us to make us suffer, we have deserted him, so we are in danger, because we are less powerful than him, all of Christendom will follow Carlo without stopping along the plain and along the coast. So, if he wants to come upon us, he will have such a large following of people that we cannot suffer or argue against him, so powerful will he be. Out of Spain he will have to flee, if we do not want to certainly die at the hands of that striking devil, Orlando, son of Milan de Anglant. King Falseron replied, My brother, it seems that you are already frightened, wounded or dead, I do not yet see you, nor imprisoned by Orlando or Carlo, in this world I no longer have any desire other than to see him arrive in Spain, and all those who follow Carlo will remain, prison or dead. Massilio on the other hand raised his forehead saying, Ah! Don't make so many threats, doesn't it remind you when the powerful King Agalante arrived in Aspromonte, with him his son Almonte, Gorant, Sinagon and King Balanti, King Iliano, that strong Saracin, Marconi with Speranti and Maldacino, Gyrus and the Amistanti Dalfonia with many other kings, dukes and princes, with seven hundred thousand in company, all died in torment and trouble. Of how many furs of Saracenia pawns and knights will never return? I don't know how this thing goes, never with them the trait never goes away. And then he had Massilio gather all his barony in a garden, and he had a large basin brought out of silver near a fountain, and he had a vessel made of wax, and in front of that Saracen people he filled the basin of water, and then he placed the ship in it and then the legend said Pagramanzia above the Baxin in more verses. Suddenly the ship moved, turning around in several different ways seventeen times, and then struck in the countries of Spain, and stopped on the rivers and lost all its possessions, it collapsed entirely where the port was written above the basin on the straight hem. King Marzilian spoke to Brother Balaganti and to Falserona and to the barony he had led, now let each baron understand me, the ship, which broke, means that King Carloni with all his barons and great companion will arrive in the countries of Spain. It seems to me that a messenger should be sent to Carlo Mano to find out why he is so proud of people and of our people, so that if he has bad thoughts against us, we will know everything about his wicked will. Then the tallest and greatest replied, as best as possible, the message should be sent. Then Massilio appealed to a baron and said, now go to the Christian countries, before the great Emperor Carloni, and you will give this letter into his hands. For the answer, know for sure whether riding is meant for Pagani. El Baron left without a companion towards Navarre and left Spain. He passed Gascony, Burgundy and Provence and arrived in France in Paris, and on that day the book told me that the good Count Orlando, who had such power, had returned from Rome, and the Pope had him confirmed as champion of the Holy Church and firm, of twenty thousand the banner and six hundred. All Christendom made a movement, small and large, to go around the passage and there was such a large gathering that the third story does not harm you. Let's leave this meeting alone and return to talking about that message that went to the palace of such value where the emperor sat. And he thought about that message in each corner of that room, and saw Charles, the emperor adorned, then all his other college, and in his heart he almost frowned, 
seeing Carlo with so much entourage, and there before him without fear and greeting him with this tenor, that true God who made the whole world, who you say died in passion, save and keep King Carlo Mano in a joyful state with his legion, and yet not putting my God to the bottom, save and maintain King Marsilian with all his barony and deeds. And then he gave the letter to the mayor. Carlo gave the letter to Turpino and said, read it so that everyone hears it. Turpin read it first for him, before he read it in person. Sir, then he said, listen to this Latin, may Jesus Christ protect you from harm. Now you will hear the letter composed, how Marsilio made a beautiful proposal. The letter ran in this way, most powerful and frank, Carlo Mano, most legitimate king and emperor of Rome and all the Christian people, who by your great valor rule and rule under you with your hand France, Provence, Campania, and La Magna, and all the Hungary with Brittany, Ireland, Flanders, Scotland, and Normandy, Chinese, England, and Gascony, Cales with honor and Picardy, Brabant, Frisia and also Sansogna, near Cyprus and Sciavonia, Maganza, half Navarre and Burgundy, and in Italy city and castle, that no one rebels from your will, I, Massilio, legitimate lord of Spain, of Granada and of Ragona, Sibelia, Portugal at my valour, half of Navarre is under my crown and I hold more cities for this tenor, Lucerna with the star and Pampelona, and others more than my commandment all do without any failure, with reverence, sir, I greet you, as the great and esteemed emperor. I mean to you as I learned about the great effort you put together, because you do it, he remains silent for me, I am very amazed at this. As much as you like, tell me when you will be playing and in which country. If you need help at all, not out of fear, but out of great love, I will soon come with my people, who will be of such great value that for four such people they will certainly not flee or be afraid, on a steed a thousand times three hundred of frank people full of courage. Carlo said, Message, I am replying to you without a letter giving you this direction, whoever you want for the whole world, who has not served me in any way, for my Lord God, cheerful Father, who at this point will be punished for it. Let everyone beware of me who does not believe in the true God and in the Christian faith. Hearing that message spoken by the just emperor, he took his leave. Charles suddenly ordered him to be accompanied out of Paris by several people without further delay. Four barons, each esteemed, accompanied him out of town for two leagues and then returned. It carries that message strongly, France, Provence and Burgundy passed, and Navarre also completely entered Spain in a few days, he went quickly to Saragossa, resting for a short time during the day and night. When he reached Saragossa, he reached the palace without stopping, where King Massilio lived, and found him and his barony settling inside the great hall. In the next article I will tell the rumor that the message to Massilio told and I will tell how great cavalry, he sent to well defend every country with him. God rest you in peace without war. Canto 2. True God of supernal glory, most perfect mirror and supreme light of all Christians forever and ever, each grace is produced by you, and through you the universe is governed, and without you no good is conducted, give me grace, my cheerful Lord, so that I can follow my singing according to. Gentlemen, I said in the first song how the messenger baron had returned to King Massilio from Carlo Mano, and was kneeling before him. Now I want to tell you, in the name of Saint Piero, as he greeted Massilio, of the response he received from Carloni. Now you will hear a noble sermon. Apollinus, Macon, and Trevaganti, save, guard and maintain Marsilian, Falseron, the Argalifo and Balaganti, and defeat and defeat King Carloni, Orlando son of Milon Danglant, Denis Ugieri, Count Ganalone, all his deeds and the Church Roman, and shatters and destroys the Christian faith. I went, my lord, in front of Carlo and presented the letter in my hand to him, my eyes could not suffer to look at it, such a proud king has never been seen. I don't think you can deny it, he has so many frank and gay barons with him that the whole world doesn't have as many in such as in his court, nor so natural. The answer that Fraudster gave me, he challenges everyone who does not believe in Jesus Christ, the Almighty Father, who has all and who sins reward. He already wants nothing of your help, 
nor of anyone who believes in our faith. Now I have told you the fact as it lies, do now, sir, what you like. When Massilio heard the news, he thought he would die from the great pain, and to provide the city and castle for him, he had Pharaoh come before him. With ten thousand, said he, mount the saddles of our people and depart, let Lazira be looked after for you by Carlo and by people baptized by him. Then he called to Massilio a young man, who was called Isolia by name, and said to him, Nievo my perfect, let you be immediately equipped with thirty thousand without any defect and let each one be well armed on horseback, I want you to pray that they are yours person defend and look after Pampelona. Then he called to that great Saracen king one who was the son of one of his sisters, by his name he was called Serpentino, brave and daring and a beautiful person, now leave you and put yourself in the path with ten thousand armed men on the saddle, let the star be defended for you by anyone who offends you. Those young sovereigns will depart with those people who were given to them, and more lords of lands and castellans will depart to guard their territory. Marsilius sent ambassadors to distant countries as his adjutant, throughout Paganaya he made it heard how Charles wanted to travel to Spain. Then the Argalif sent Balaganti to Persia, Alexandria, and Soria, on behalf of Macon and Trevaganti, who forgave guilt and punishment to all those of the African faith, who with all their might and vigor in Spain will come to oppose King Carlo Mano, and who wants to continue. Now let us leave their business to the Saracens and return to the Christian countries, to beautiful France, where the paladins and dukes and counts and princes and marquises of distant and neighboring countries came to court with noble tools. Now you will hear, gentlemen, please tell us here about the noble barony. Came Salamon, king of Brittany, under his banner eight thousand on horseback of noble barony and noble people, never to give them great blows in the wrong, and this king with such a beautiful companion wore a black rooster as a crest, and his arms in black and white checks, have always belonged to his Frankish ancestors. The Duke of Bavaria also came there, that was the Dusnamo with four of his sons, with him oh, 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 on horseback of proud people, all armed and fresh as lilies. He had his arms in his flag straight in gold two red rabbits. And the Dane came from the marker, with three thousand knights behind him. He had the silver flag with four red stars on one band, his people were very courageous. Phil di Giraldo, Arnoldo di Berlander, followed him with three thousand on horseback to take command of him. His armor was a green dragon in the vermilion field, and a lily in silver. And Olivier of Burgundy in Vienna presented three thousand knights, his armor was silver, a griffin on the blue field with green steeds. And then the good Gualteri de Monlion with two thousand free warriors on horseback, and his arms were two moons on the white field, all of them brown. Then there came from the house of Maganzagan de Pontier with sixty-two counts, thirty thousand on horseback of great strength to follow him across plains and mountains. These people customarily carried, as far as the book and the story tell, a white falcon into the blue field, which stood upright towards the right side. And then Angelin de Bordella came there with valiant and very strong people, four thousand armed warriors in the saddle who would not flee like cowardly people. His armor was a silver star, and on his crest he wore a serene one who held a pagan by the throat in each hand. And the good Girardo also came from Rossiglione with many valiant people, his arms were, the shield and the flagpole, in the golden field a rampant lion. And from the lineage of the good King Yvonne came Angeliri with his attant people with six thousand barons in his podesta, for weapons he had a boar's head. And the King of Scotland came there in might, ten thousand on horseback near him. He carried a black serpent on a yellow field, a shield and a brush. And from Hungary the valiant King Fiore came there with six thousand in a squad, all on horseback, and his arms red in the white field du Voltoi. The son of the King of England came there, who was of the deed of the brave, with five thousand war knights, quick and daring and not cowardly. This man carried, if my words do not err, three gold leopards in the red field. Then Samson of Picardy came there with three thousand a horse in company. He wore these as crests a deer and his arms in the white field, was a green dragon of a mature color. And from Flanders there came a Frankish warrior, 
Count Anselmo, so the verb says, who already didn't seem to be able to miss it, his armor was a yellow leopard with a red field inside a banner. From Normandy, mighty Richard came with four thousand knights of very brave and good people, his arms were two red greyhounds in the blue field, if the book does not lie, one towards the other stood erect and proud, and for crests he wore a leopard's branch, which was yellow and white. Of France, of Burgundy and of Hungary, of England, of Flanders and Magna, of Ireland, Scotland and yes of Normandy, of Picardy, Gascony and of countryside, of Christian the whole great barony, to follow Charles and conquer Spain was in Paris with their Magna Vista on the day of Saint John the Baptist. I would not have the virtue of recounting the beautiful people and the rich adornment that could be seen going around Paris. There was a great dazzling to see, the good steeds were seen covered with gold and silver surcoats, and crests and shields worked with fine stones and pearls adorned, and the shining graceful insignia of noble lords, dukes and counts and and many more valiant people who were ready to come to court. Let us leave behind their powerful forces, where necessary, it is better for me to tell stories. Now you will hear the general move that Carlo made with all his might. Then he left Carlo and gave the entire lordship of Cristionita to be judged by one of the nobles from Maganza, who wanted to deceive him with his frauds, this was Macarius with barony of him, who was Gano's nephew. I made him lord of everything and then told them that everyone should punish with reason. Then he had Carlo Mano command that all his people should gather at the first sound they heard wherever the general banner went. Then the people began to arm themselves, everyone retreated under his banner, the brave and noble innkeeper left Paris without stopping. One cannot count the provisions and armor and loads loaded with plates and leather, iron and mail, pavilions and worked trabacchi. There was no such gathering in Thessaly, when so many people were cut off. In front of this companion was Salamon, king of Britain. With eight thousand under his banner, then behind him went strong Orlando with twenty thousand and six hundred in a line, then came Carlo Mano, and at his command Denise Ugieri, and the Duke of Bavaria, with Gano de Pontieri following and other great barons of his deed and other insignia of Magna Podesta. The book tells that 180,000 knights were numbered without the pawns who followed them, masters of wood and fine archers. And so in a few days the pro-warriors passed through Provence and Gascony, in a short time, the book tells me so, they reached the country of Navarre near a land called Lazira, and the city is still called thus, which it was raised above two hills. On those hills he had two castles, between those two hills it was all at home, inside there were those wicked people. A very powerful and frank pagan was the captain of that land. Son of Falserone was Carnal, the strongest man among the pagans. Charles, seeing such a city, recalled Christ, the light of Christians. Then he asked the Dane in this way, what is this city of these strange countries called and what people rule it? Is it Christian or pagan law? The Dane said, my dear lord, this city is called Lazira. Those people don't believe in our God, inside there is the best man of these lands and they hold this land to their desire, and he is of such virtue and goodness that among us there is certainly nothing that is worthy of being hand to hand with him. When King Charles understood these things, he commanded everyone to stay, and spread out pavilion and tents, and camp around the land. Then everyone waits to camp, it seemed as if the country was resonating with the great sound of many thunderstorms and the ducking of good, powerful steeds. Let us let Carlos in keep a rest and we will talk about the fearless warrior, who called himself Ferrau, who stood up and looked at the plain and the innkeeper saw him standing around like this, and said to himself, this is lucky for me. He left immediately and quickly to his mother, and told the innkeeper what had happened. Give me your word, my mother, that I go to the field to try myself with them. The mother said, My sweet life, I don't want you to leave this territory. She ensures that the walls are well supplied with what she needs, without abode. We are above and they will be below, one of us alone will be worth more than eight of them. Ferrar replied, I want to try myself with that fiancé Milan, Count of Anglant. The mother said, Go, but the worst seems to me, go, May the god Trevigante help you. 
Then all his weapons were brought to him, and he was armed from behind and from the front in front of that demon of a mother. Now you will hear graceful armor. First he placed seven tempered steel plates on the comb, and this he did in defense of him, who had done everything else there, then he was made of slats and sheets of metal and worked with snakeskin, I put a helmet of virtue on my head, there was never another so fine. On top of his helmet he had a Makumeto standing on the top of refined gold, he was adorned with pearls and sapphires, in front of him was a perfect carbuncle, which was of such light that it would have been, without any defect, armed at night to the splendor of two thousand knights for its vapor. The baron mounted a great steed, which was covered entirely in steel, from plate to plate even to the heel, then the baron emerged from the earth, after the innkeeper went King Carloni, as far as he could throw a bow, and he began to shout and call, and to tinkle with his loud horn. As he played, the Bacellieri said, O Carlo Mano, O High King of France, send with me a knight to joust, the best you have and the most proven lance, send me the one who has the armor in quarters, your son Orlando I don't care about a trifle, if Spain wants to be crowned, let him come to the field with me to try. Carlo, hearing this sound among the Seine, said to Dusnamo, what kind of sound is that? Who is the one who plays so well? In the time of my life I have not seen such a beautiful sonar an emperor or a kidney. Dusnamo said, he belongs to the people, he comes for battle and he says loudly that you send him your son Orlando. Carlo, then who heard this talk, called his whole barony to come and said thus, Lord, what do you think of that pagan who has so much pride that he wants to compete with me? Which of you is the first to boast of fighting with him and taking him to prison at the end and I will have him hanged? Said the Dane, it will be wrong for you, for there is no one of such might who will not be reviled against him. Said Orlando, evil cowardice. It seems that you are already afraid, it seems that you have the baron's learning. Those who trust in cowardice do great harm, who always go back and never go up. In my life he was never a coward, said the Dane, and you cannot prove it. With the Saracens many times with this gaze I have been aimed at war, there has never been a man of theirs so strong, who has wanted to joust with me, with lance or sword, on foot or on horseback, that I have not put myself with him in the dance. With Pharaoh I want to be first, but against him I won't last anything. I will certainly be his prisoner and then all the others alike. To please you, who are so proud, I don't want you to say that I am a re-believer. Come my weapons, the Dane shouted, coward never called I will not be. Astolfo of England of King Otto knelt before Charlemagne, saying, My lord, I have never learned, I want to fight with this pagan. Give me the glove, once I'm done with it I'll try it on the piano. Granted you be, Carlo told him, and with his hand he signed and blessed. Armed Astolfo and then mounted his horse, he went out of the pavilion into the forest, and the whole innkeeper was watching him, he seemed so powerful. Now the armed lasser in this stall and in the other cantar, without more remaining, I will tell how he was defeated. May the true God always be our help. Canto 3. At the name of him, by whom the entire universe was formed, I want to return to my precious song and tell of that cheerful baron, who was called Pharaoh by name, by his power I want to count the weight. Now you will hear, Lord, may God honor, defeat more knights and lords. Gentlemen, I said in the other song yes as Astolfo was on the field armed, with Pharaoh to want to counter. In this way he greeted him, damn God who has no equal, evil traitor, renegade dog. How do you come to demand battle against the Christians who are of such great worth? Pharaoh said, Are you Count Orlando, are you the Emperor's nephew, about whom people are talking so much? Oh, tell me the truth, if Christ gives you honor. Astolfo responded by threatening him, If you saw the Lord of Anglant, you would not want to have come to the camp, nor would you ever have been born in this world. I am Astolfo, son of King Otto, who lords over all England, surrender to me, without further ado, if you do not wish to receive worse. Pharaoh said, it seems that I am a prisoner, I don't see myself already beaten by you. If you are as strong as you show, he takes the field and throws it to you. 
Each of them took off from the field and stretched out two arches, then the good steeds turned towards each other, shields around their necks and spears in hand. On the shields each one caught himself with all their immense possessions, above the pagan of Astolfo the lance passed the shield in front of the belly. Ferrar did not flinch from his saddle bow, nor did his spear suffer any damage, he wounded Astolfo because of this condition, the big spear in several limp pieces. Due to the great blow that Ferrar gave him, he was unable to bear it and leave alone. How long was the rod to measure the reverse Astolfo fell to the plain? Is Orlando and Olivieri like this? Ah, tell me the truth, noble baron. Is the Prodenis Ugieri, and the four sons of Duke Namon like this? Are the twelve Pieri made like this? Make yourself a renegade and a prisoner. Astolfo replied to him, Yes, handsome gentleman, I can't do anything else. Astolfo gave him the sword right away and Ferrau took him to the bridge, then he blew the horn very loudly and soon a hundred or more of his people came down the mountain, finely armed. And Ferrau raised his forehead towards them, the city must take this man to prison and look after him very carefully. Then Ferrau returned to the field and began to blow his horn, and as he played he said in his dictation, Carlo, what are you doing? Unfortunately I may meet you. You sent me a squire to the camp, who was unable to attack me. Send me Orlando, your carnal son, and I think I'll do the same with him. Carlo, hearing that Astolfo was defeated, no longer felt sorry for his life and remained silent for a long time, and truly said to his heart, This is the devil who will come to destroy all my people. Then the mighty King Charles shouted aloud, Who will go to the floor to oppose him? Then the frank and mighty Dane came with all his weapons. Fully armed, he took his good steed, he quickly mounted, full of courage. Towards the pagan he lay down to walk, reaching him in this way he began to say, Bad luck, cavalier, your power. How do you have such arrogance against us? Quickly dismount to the ground of your steeds, take off all your weapons and, as a sergeant or squire, you must follow me on foot and on your knees you will go to the Pierieri. You will say, Messer, you must forgive me. He is so humble that he will forgive you and honor you like a great lord. Pharaoh laughed, hearing this sermon. What, he said to him, do you call yourself? The Dane said, when he was a boy, I believed in your faith, then I got baptized and denied your Macon. Now I believe in that God who has no appearance. Strong Dane, Lord of the March, appeals to me those honorable people. Pharaoh said, You are the unfortunate one, I have already heard you mentioned. You have been fighting against Marsilian for a long time in Navarre. Beware of me, renegade, traitor, for I believe I will avenge you. Take the field and demonstrate your power, either with the brando or with a big spear. And so they were both extended longer than a bow can shoot in length. With strong spears and shields in his arms, he went about wounding with great pride. Both were found together, Denis Ugieri breaks his lance over the pagan's shield, step, but no bow from the saddle. Ferrau wounded him with great pride on the shield and divided it all from him, he passed the weapons to him and with great bitter pain he placed him on the ground of the steed by force. Vegendal Ferrau, lying on the grass, laughed loudly at the baron, saying, your threats were of no avail to you, nor your malicious and false words. The Aranditi prisoner, without saying perhaps, said the Dane, yes, by my faith, and then Cortana, his sword, handed him, and Ferrau led him away to the bridge. Then his people to take him to the races. Ferrau said, take him away, and then he returned to the camp and blew the horn, making the Christians mock and scorn. Olivier, greatly iniquitous, cried, Veng in me a may, and he was armed, he was mounted on a majestic and powerful steed like a light greyhound, the lance in his hand he took the joyful sir, he leapt towards the pagan. He seemed to be a worthy baron, so full of courage was he in arms. Arriving at Ferrau, Olivieri said, God destroy you, wicked Africant, are you the devil who does not cure so many warriors and their power obeisant? From the field taken then turn the steeds. 
then let each one dwell in front. The one towards the other demonstrates his strength, which none of his pride seems to dampen. And good warriors together meet their iron spears above their shields, the spears together break down into several pieces, their shields pass through my bellies, and a good steed is forced to kneel, since those blows were already not for chatter. Olivier of the Destria voted for the horse, but Ferrau did not change his saddle. Then Ferrau said, Tell me, Cristiano, since you were so proud in your speech, now that I have sent you from your steed to the plain, do you want to surrender yourself as my prisoner? Said the Marquis, Yes, Sovereign Baron. Then he gave him his brand altaquiero, with the others he was imprisoned with no escape and Ferrau immediately returned to the camp, blowing the horn as he was used to, despising King Charles by speaking about him. Then each knight was immediately armed with a great deal, to fight with whom they had sworn either to remain prisoners or to lead him. Gualtieri de Monlian mounted his horse, against the pagan he went as a dragon. He was similarly defeated, and then by Ottone and Berlinghieri, and by the mighty Sanson of Picardy, the strong traitor Gander Pontieri, Angelin di Bordella and other people, even the best and most frank warriors, and there were thirty-seven barons in all, who surrendered in Ferrau prison. From Ferrau they were all killed one by one and taken to prison. Carlo was left crying and mourning, thinking hard about this cause, seeing his baron and himself thus conducted, he stands like a madman inside the pavilion, holding himself tight and twisting his hands, and preaches against God like this, saying, Lord God the Father, Lord of all, do you want to desert me at this point? Do you want to leave me destroyed of all good things? With this he wanted to despair, with tears, with sighs and grave mourning in the pavilion he remained to pose. Ferrau went into Lazira and took thirty-seven prisoners. Her mother, as soon as she saw him coming, threw herself on his neck with great joy and more than a hundred times, not to lie, but rather if he disarmed her, she would kiss him. How could you suffer so much in battle? Tough ask him? Now tell me if you have the Anglant prisoner. Ferrau said, not, for Trevigante. Tomorrow I will take him and Carloni, Duke Nemo and all the other people, I will plough all of Christianity without combat, since Massilio, Valaganti, and Falserone, and the Argalifo and none of my relatives will already know nothing about it. I want to be a gentleman of Christianity and from here I will leave all the districts. In Rome, in the church of San Piero, my Ferranti will eat on the altar, the law of Jesus without thought will be overthrown, and Trevigante, Apollino and Macon will be more haughty, as lord of the West End. Levant? And thus disarmed, he went to eat, as he had great need of such an affair. And he gave food to those prisoners who were all locked in one room. Each wept with sad sermons, one says to the other, Christianity is declining. Astolfo said, Dear barons, tomorrow you will stop flapping your wing. Ferrau with Orlando, gentle count, will avenge all our shame tomorrow. Then they all dined in mourning, taking Duke Astolfo's words as mockery, all trembling as the leaf does and with thoughts that make their hearts shudder. Everyone regretted that they had wanted to fight, and Astolfo beat them and it didn't seem that he was a prisoner, nor that he had any thoughts of death. Let's leave Astolfo and the others in this state and return to that perfect baron, Ferrau who was so esteemed in arms. As soon as he had supped, he went to bed, and then, when the morning was bright, I removed that baron without fault, and called one of his good sergeants, who carried the shining arms. All his weapons were dressed and the good steed led before him, with plates covered with hard steel, his saddle was of lyophant bone, the arms of Macometto of pure gold and those of Apollonius and Trevigantes were carved around the tree, behind and in front, all for reason. Armed, that baron mounted his horse and descended from the ground to the plain, near an arch without fail, where Carlo Mano's pavilion was, and immediately began to despise him with sad, terrible and rude speech, and shouting, your person will no longer wear a crown in France. Come to the field without residence or you send me your nephew Orlando, like the others I will do the same. Orlando was listening to this sermon. Come my weapons without more learning. Many sergeants, without further ado, 
brought in their weapons and took VD and Tino to his heel covered in fine steel. The Frankish baron was dressed with the armor and the plates and then the surcoat, all in sections, which was nothing missing, and the arms of the church on top of this, and Derlindano on the left side, the cap and the shining helmet on his head, the sword and helmet belonged to the Pro Almonte, son of Agalanti, who was in Aspromonte. And thus armed he mounted his steeds and went down towards the pagan with his virtue. Coming to him he said, Knights, the Supreme God, Eternal Father Jayasu, grant you grace and put your mind to returning to his faith, just as you believe in Macon and his false laws with all those pagans you lord over. And Pharaoh, when he heard this said, shouted to him, Filthy bastard, I do not want to baptize myself before your sire nor deny my god Macon for that god who allowed himself to die. You show too much erroneous intention. Tell me if you are King Charles' nephew, Lord of Anglant, whatever you can. Orlando replied, I am Lord of Anglant, son of Milan, nephew of King Charles, and no, when I was a young child, in Aspromonte, clear as crystal, when the strong King Agalanti came there, King Charles' hand went to confront him with 180,000 Christians against 600,000 pagans. In the name of God, glorious Father, I want you to know how in Aspromonte the death of the valiant King Agalanti, in a large plain, near a fountain, made me painful with a stick. Thus, King Almonte, who was called by this name, died, a stronger man was never found. This helmet and this Derlinden sword and this good steed so common to me I earned them at the fountain, when I wounded that mighty king. Ah, deny your faith, which is wicked and vain, and return to Christ the Almighty Father, baptize yourself in my faith, Frank Baron, and leave Trevaganti and Macon alone. Pharaoh said, Ah, don't talk so much, swear to us together, each by his faith, who will be beaten, how much or how much, prisoner surrenders, calling reward, then each one should digress from his side and recall the one in whom he believes. Orlando said, You swear first? Pharaoh then swore by this esteem, by that god Apollo and Trevaganti and Macumeto, who is my perfect faith, that, if I am defeated by this grasp, without making any more moves or righteousness against you, I will surrender to you. In front, you will do with me what your heart delights. Now swear to me, by your God, to follow what you promise without failing. Orlando said, By the true God who died on the cross and was nailed to free us from the hell of the river, where each one was previously pierced, if you knock me down from my horse, I surrender to you without contradiction. And so they were sworn between each other and then challenged to give themselves to death. In the meantime they turned their strong steeds, one of the other throwing two arches then quickly and carefully spread out, with large shields and spears gripped, spurring them on, they ran towards such a fate. There was never a dart or arrow thrown, which flew fast through the air, as one goes spurring the other. The low lances and pennons unfurl, they both struck each other on the shields, the shields were passed and the spears were broken, and they cut large pieces through the air. Due to the great strength the two barons bent, but they left nothing of the horses, and a good steed they carried them more than two arches for their virtue. When the steeds turned, they took the good sharp blades in their hands, one against the other as if they were warriors, wounding those powerful blows on their shining weapons, cutting large gaps and sheets of metal down to the flesh, turning here and there across the countryside, he wounded everyone on the right and on the left. Orlando stood up in the stirrups with the brand in his hand and with all he could to hurt the pagan he let himself go, with the brand on his head he gave him such a blow that everything was removed. The fairy helmet did not care about him, the heavy blow touched him in such a way that the bow of his steed bent. Rizossi Ferrau was completely stunned, he didn't know which side he was on, and he had Orlando with a wounded man on his right arm with all his possessions. Now we will leave this party alone in the other corner I will say great beatings. May Christ from heaven, through his mercy, send us peace, abundance and harmony. Canto 4. True God, who in your own form made Eve and Adam out of sand, from whom the great multitude later descended, we are all here at your call, under your lordship and just rule, whether we want it or not, 
we are all yours. Help me, Lord, for your sake and do not look at my great fault. Give me so much ingenuity, O noble sire, that I know how to follow the beautiful story. Gentlemen, I will let you tell me in the other hand how Orlando and Ferrar were in the saddle, both fighting with great courage for the Christian faith and for the fella. Listen, gentlemen, in courtesy that the barons of Vigor did. Since the ninth morning had passed and the good warriors had fought, without ever having taken any energy, and they had wounded each other badly, but they had not cut their flesh. Each one was blacker than the one who changed where the sword had touched, because each of them was enchanted. Everyone was tired of fighting, and they didn't have to hurt. Then Orlando said, Frankish Baron, please listen to my words a little, I see you coming as soon as possible, come forward and let yourself die, I see that you have no power against me and I have a great desire to make you die. Surrender yourself to me, before I kill you, and deny Apollonus and Macumeto, return to him who guides the whole world, Almighty God, Perfect Lord. Pharaoh loudly shouts towards Orlando, Filthy whore, what did you say? If you are tired, you surrender to prison, or you defend yourself with your might. Towards him with the sharp sword he went shouting, Surrender, coward, and a great blow landed on his helmet. He made the strong helmet on his head, it is fitting that the brand on the shoulder goes for the great strength of the strong pagan. Of the strong weapons that Orlando wore, as many as he took, so many did he cut away. Orlando stood up in his stirrups to avenge that tedious blow, on top of the great helmet he forcibly cut off a golden macumeto that was beneath it, as in the other term you are counted, which he wore on his helmet as he dared. So great was the blow and so heavy that his head touched the grasper. Now who would count the great blows and the great frank and powerful forces? As each one saw himself giving, he could not count it in verse or prose, and to see him go through the field, if I were to say so, they would seem doubtful. Ferrar received great hardship, which the battle lasted all day. Already the rays of the beautiful sun had faded and the vapor of the night had begun, when each valiant and wise baron, had taken leave of their scent. Each one leaves and goes to his sure where he lived, without another tone, and they had sworn to return on a clear day and show off their strength. Orlando returned to the master pavilion in front of Charles and the Duke of Bavaria, and told of the strength of the baron, how brave and daring he was. Then he had all his garrison taken away and eaten in such a manner. Once he had had dinner, he had a rich bed decorated and went to lie down. Ferrar returned to the land and ascended the palace and echelons, he was immediately surrounded by knights, sergeants and boys, who now had him disarmed with strong arms and rich garrisons. His mother came in front of him and began to speak with this appearance, How did you do, my sweet son, with that Orlando who is so strong? May Apollonus and Macon our God give death to him and to all Christians. How did you leave him, my love, who didn't put you through hard or bad luck? Why isn't there anyone so strong that he doesn't remain a coward against him? Pharaoh said, Mother, I promise you by our god Macon and Trevigante that I have never seen a baron so perfect as Orlando, that lord of Anglant. Nor does he seem like a lazy man or valet, so valiant and handsome is the baron. We fought all day today, and with swords in our hands we were all wounded. We have not been able to advance one another, since we have been equal all day and tomorrow morning we must return, by our faith, each united. Tomorrow I believe he will be taken prisoner here in spite of everyone and baptized. I ploughed Christianity at my mercy, I ploughed the lordship of the whole world. When Pharaoh had thus spoken, he ordered his sergeants to order that the dinner be prepared for him. Suddenly, without staying, Pharaoh went into the room, where he had the counts, knights, marquises and infantrymen stay in lock-up and prison, he took them all out with him. Pharaoh had all those prisoners seated with him at the table, and honored them as champions, and gave them great food to eat, hare, pheasants, capons, quails and partridges and croakers, and wine of every reason, red and white, of what was needed, there was no lack. All the barons with Pharaoh dined on what pleased them, then everyone went to rest. The strong Pharaoh, full of courage, went to a bed, 
joyful and clear, to rest as much as he could. Now we let them sleep and rest until it is necessary to get them up. He had already overcome the dark night by day and almost illuminated the east, the sun was not yet in its nature, because nothing was yet shining. He lifted Pharaoh, and took care and saw the day clear and shining. He shouted, All my weapons come, and his baron was soon in front of him. All his weapons were quickly brought before him. His spurs were made of Ayusenti gold, his hat was made of heavy steel, he had snakeskin on top and he looked like a gentle African. At his side he had the sword and the helmet on his head, over the arms a rich surcoat o of Alexandrian cloth embroidered in gold with the entire law of Macon. When the baron was so well decorated, he placed seven plates of tempered steel in front of the patignon and trimmed them underneath. Then I knelt down in front of my mother and greeted her and then stood up and said, I want to go back to battle with that Christian who is so brave. If Trevaganti and Apollino suit me, I will make him remain a coward today. I no longer care about his blows for a medal, since I have paid good attention to the patignon, seven steel plates I have tied to myself, nobly crafted in study. The mother said, Go, may Makumeto and Trevaganti be your help. From her the perfect baron departed and soon descended from the palace. The good steed was brought before him and he climbed up. The baron put the shield around his neck, then took the strong staff with the flagpole. He drove his valiant and daring steed and quickly went towards the door, he was immediately released from the earth and quickly dismounted down into the plain. Having crossed the bridge, that flowered baron pushed hard towards the pavilion and approached an arch, the loud horn began to sound. Orlando, hearing the good horn sound, said to himself, I am a lazy man, who lies in bed and is waiting for me, and is in the field like a good warrior. I dressed immediately without further delay and then called Terigi, his squire? Let me suddenly bring my weapons and quickly try to arm myself. The arms were brought before him and many sergeants went around him. Armed was the Lord of Anglant with four bright coats of mail and very heavy steel plates, the surcoat and many ornaments, the Frankish baron put the helmet on his head, then he put the sword around his left side. The good steed was led before him, Orlando quickly mounted it. He then took up the good shield and then took the big spear again, left the pavilion and went towards the baron, who took no time, and having reached him, quickly greeted him. Thank you Pharaoh for the greeting. Orlando said, Are you still determined to deny Apollonius and Macon and Trevigans and their foolish valour, and believe in him who passionately died with much pain and torment, to redeem us from damnation, who in the depths we were damned for the sin that did Eve and Adam. Surrender yourself to Jesus, if you want to save your soul from pain and torment, return to his faith and be baptized, and I will have Charles crown you with a rich country and property, and I will make you rich with gold and silver, so that you will always live in honor, more than Christian, apart from the emperor. Pharaoh answered him very proudly and said, How do you have so much courage you whore, you filthy idler, that you want to deny Macon, my sires, and return to your faith in San Piero? Indeed, I would sooner let myself die than deny my god Macumeto, who above all is the most perfect. If you want to say that your god is better, or that he is of greater power, take the field and show your valor, for so much talk comes from cowardice. If you beat me, do not be afraid, for I will be your prisoner by my bond, just as I promised you here in front of me, and you will do the same to me. Orlando said, It is quite right that, if I beat you with my strength, you should return yourself to me as prison, and I swear to you by my faith that, if you strike me down, without doing any combat I will be your prisoner and at your mercy. Now he looks at you from me as an enemy. Then he turned Vigliantico's steeds from him and they both turned their heads and lingered as long as they pleased, then quickly the noble warriors ran towards each other to wound, and spurring their light horses, each seemed like an arrow from a bow, their spears low and their shields up their arms, running hard, they clashed. The barons were wounded on their shields, the shields were worth nothing to the blows, the boats passed them, and the masts and the masts immediately broke, the sections flew this way and that, so powerful was the blow from each one, good steeds pass more than two arches when running, 
as I understand it. They held back their steeds and turned towards each other like a fierce serpent, they took up their swords and challenged each other, shouting loudly to each other, and hung the good brand on the helmet and, as soon as they took it, cut them off immediately. The two barons went here and there, due to the great strength on their bows they bent. Each went three on the neck of the steed and with great difficulty they returned to the saddle. Then Orlando, the strong knight, said, Son of beautiful Saint Mary, help me now, because I need it, I commend myself to you, O clear star. Pharaoh wounded Orlando on the shield, as much as he took, he took away with the sword. Orlando then gave him a blow and with the sword in his hand raised his helmet and put as much in front of the sword as he could forcefully onto the ground. The shot went on the right shoulder, through the middle the entire cleavage band and all the arms on the left side. For that great blow the right baron bowed. Pharaoh heard the enormous blow and called Apollonus and Macon back and ran over Orlando in anger, shouting loudly, Abandon yourself in prison, and he gave him a great blow on the helmet. The blow did not remove a button from the helmet. Orlando became forgetful after the great blow and bent over his horse's bow. The book says well and the author tells me, except that the good steed led him away, Pharaoh seemed to have died to his shame, Orlando was so out of his control. Orlando then fell into great misfortune, and soon returned to his strength, and took the good band with both hands and dealt Pharaoh a great blow. The blow landed on the horse's neck, the steel plates were so strong that nothing could break the blow. Pharaoh, to that blow, as much or as much as he was ready to wound in that place, from Orlando he moved away on one side, then he stung his steed with great courage and went to strike Count Orlando. On the right and on the left the angry barons are defeated by such great force, the weapons and the plates fall to the ground due to their great strong and powerful blows. And both of them had great trouble in fighting, those brave men, but while Orlando was fighting he dealt him such a heavy blow that he bowed his whole body. He reached the summit and was unable to hold on to anything, rather he descended down to the hill and then lowered himself onto the neck of his steed, weapons that had nothing were of any use to him other than the armor and his neck, so that the steed was dead on the ground. Kadir. In the direction of Orlando Ferrau he shouted, Woe is he who shod you with golden spurs. Orlando, when he saw this fact, immediately dismounted from his horse and said to Ferrau, By my faith he does not seem to have committed a fault, but I go to battle with you on foot. I take no advantage of you, God bless you. With brands in hand I began the great battle on foot without any shelter. Until Vespers on foot and even more, they had fought the Frankish barons, however, by raising their virtue, they are not even tired of fighting. Orlando and Ferrau fought hard and did not lack battle, if one gave, the other returned, so vigorously did each fight. One shot after another doubled as a baron who knew how to handle them and the weapon went to pieces across the field, but they could not cut their flesh. The day of that place changed, the sun was beginning to go to bed, and the baron had given many blows and had not gained any advantage. Ferrau said, what do we want to do? The dark night comes and the day goes. Do we want to go and rest and come back here tomorrow morning? Orlando replied, with what you think I am happy, adorned knights. And at the camp I will promise to return in the morning and force them to try. Orlando said, now listen to my sermons that I want to tell you, O oh free knights, my barons and especially the Marquis Olivieri are recommended. The pro-champions both departed, each took his own path along the paths. Now the present battle will follow. Christ protect you from pain and travail. Canto 5. In the name of him who did everything and who can undo us at his will, may he allow me to tell how destroyed Ferrau was in the present singing, dead and conquered with tears and mourning by that baron, who never had equal, Orlando, son of Duke Milo, who was so strong and noble a champion. Gentlemen, I said in the other song how the two barons of great power had left each wanting to return to his mansion by alliance. The jurors had returned to the camp the other morning as a matter of certainty to demonstrate their mighty strength. Now you will hear great anguishing pain. Tornosi Ferrau in the city and Orlando in the pavilion of the great innkeeper. 
In front of Pharaoh, a large number of his barons were without stopping, they carried to him the arms of great dignity, as they had worn in the morning. Unarmed as he was, he went to eat with those prisoners, as he usually does. Many foods were brought to him, as befits such a gentleman, once the great barony had dined, everyone went to bed to rest. That Pharaoh, whose name spreads, went to bed and his barren partiency. We leave Pharaoh and return to the strong Orlando of victory I long for. Mano returned before Carlo, telling the story of the strength and supreme courage that Pagano had, and how I tried, and then he told how he caused the horse below to die, and then disarmed. After having had some dinner, he then went to sleep, on the bed he slept without getting up all night, until the day broke. When the stars and the moon darken, when the night leaves and the day abounds, and the sun inflames plains, mountains, hills, rivers and waves through the shining air, the baron, who seems to twist nothing but force, that is, Pharaoh, with a cheerful mind I arose from sleep and had all his weapons brought and armed with advantage. The good steed was driven by steel, covered entirely in large plates, which no iron could weaken, and her mother, master of masters, wanted to see him mount the destria and then spoke to him with masterly words, have, son, Makumeto in memory who on this day will give you vector. And thus armed Pharaoh mounted his steeds and left the land, he ordered the masters of the land to close the bridge, which is over the river, on the road that the host passed from the land, entirely of wood. And on each side there was a heavy door, which could be opened and locked with a key. Once it was closed, Pharaoh crossed the bridge towards the innkeeper, sounding his horn, saying loudly, Cowardly Count, O nephew of Carlo, O proud Orlando, come into the field, for I have descended the mountain and am standing here for you. Waiting. Orlando, who I heard call thus, got out of bed and put on his beautiful jacket. He had himself covered with strong weapons, as was the custom, and then mounted his steeds. Towards Pagano he went very boldly without sergeant, companion or squires. Coming to him they began to say, Why do you scold me, villain knights? It won't be worth calling me with disdain because today I will buy you with much value. Take the field, which it seems that God wants, since you do not want to subjugate yourself to his faith, that on this day you have the pain of death. He replied Pharaoh, Now you leave, take the field as much as you want. Orlando said, I will do it to please you. Two archers and more of the field each removed, then with lance in hand the steed turned. Each one takes up the lance and the strong shield and on his steed he stabilizes and shaves it. Running towards each other we chase each other, no arrow or ship has ever come out like this with luck or calm. The one or the other waits to thrust their spears on their shields, by their strength to bend here and there. Carry their steeds a half mile ahead of them where they can hold them, then, soon each more than Hare or Merlin, to demonstrate his strength and great power, quickly took hold of the strong brand. Orlando, full of anger and ill will, struck the pagan on the helmet which made him feel all his possessions. And Pharaoh came towards him without saying perhaps a blow from him, who did not seem tired, who all the first bent and twisted him. Such a shot was never seen before. The armor cut by force and the sword ran on the blanket which was red and white. Then Orlando, with pride and anger, with the brand in his hand, heads towards him. Above the shoulder the blow descends with as much force as the count can deliver, he takes away as much armor as he takes and the brand hits the saddle, up to the straps the tree splits. The pagan, seeing such notes, unfairly struck Orlando on the helmet with great force with his sword. The fairy helmet didn't care a thing, of course the blow landed on the shoulder. Orlando of the Vigliantico steed staggers from the great blow on the neck, then with great anger against his enemy he strikes a blow, which misses nothing, on the shield, by force he divided it, as much as he took, he put down on the ground. Each one of us cuts the armor right to the flesh with its sharp blades, the black flesh, if Christ sifts me, becomes rat from those great blows. There was never such a battle between barons. Count yours, even if no one else asks you, that their arms were all cut off, but not the meats because they were enchanted. 
It was already past the ninth hour and the sun was facing south and everyone had their own person to do the wounding and to do a lot of fighting. And Ferrar sermonizes towards Orlando, tell me, Baron, have I not taken blood from you? Where do you have your fairy tale? Where are you fairy and why? Orlando said, tell me where you are fairy and then I will tell you where I am. Ferrar said, see, you couldn't hurt me anywhere, by my god, except in the comb which is so armed. Tell me your fate, I told you mine. Orlando said, since you ask me, I am not enchanted with the soles of my feet. Ferrar said, let us rest a while, and on that bridge then we will fight, which is made of wood and everything is closed. Let us enter inside and then we will close ourselves, so that neither you nor I will be helped by any of our people. So they agreed together and then they closed on the bridge. Ferrar then gave the keys to Orlando, Orlando then threw them into the river. What the hell are you doing? said the pagan shouting, who taught you to do such a custom. If one of us is defeated, when will the other come out of this volume? Orlando said, if I make you die, it will be my loss if I don't know how to get out of it. Then they rested a large part and the barons, so much so that vespers had passed, and then they mended themselves on their horses, each one was inflamed like a dragon. Orlando, flower of all champions, landed a blow on Ferrau's helmet, which completely bent. Orlando moved the blow with such force. And Ferrau shouted loudly at him, By my god, I will take revenge, at this point I will give you death. Orlando against him with the brando weights. Ferrau wounded him, by this fate on the right arm of the perfect weapon. As much as he took, the brando took away, yes it was that blow of great vigor. Orlando then got back on his steed and struck the baron with great force, so that he cut through the slats and the sheet metal, that blow went right down to his flesh. If the knight had not been enchanted, the champion would have felt death and, with all his strength and vigor, stunned everyone by the great blow. Rizos Ferrau on his steed, he took the strong sword in both hands, saying, Now surrender, knight. To give the blow, arms are extended. Orlando thrust himself under the warrior, but Ferrau caught him between the head and neck with his right arm due to this stalemate, and forcibly took him off the horse. He held it so tightly in his helmet that Orlando didn't know what world he was in. Ferrau carried himself, and did not stick himself, to the very large doors of the bridge and worked hard to cut them with his sword. Strongly cutting, Orlando roused himself, the apple of the sword under his chin he gave to the pagan with great valor. And Ferrau from the blow of the brando let Orlando fall to the plain and on his steed, without waiting any longer, immediately mounts and quickly swears to God to give him death, and Ferrau shouting, Baron, he said, were you very afraid? Orlando said, did you think I was dead? Don't you think I'm doing a great disservice by doing this? Orlando from the pagan went as far as the bridge on one side was and said, Eternal Father, Sovereign God, do not let me die in this state. Oh! Not wanting to desert Carlo Mano, and all the other baptized populace. Give me grace that this African can kill, who is so handsome. Then he said to Vigliantino his horse, With you I have already been in several flocks, you never allowed me to do it. Enjoy yourself, don't let your life hurt you. If you show your farm in this stall, you will honor me with great value throughout the world. The Destria, as God made it heard, began to die strongly. With his front paws he toasted himself so that it seemed as if he were creating fire. So strong Antrendo, it comforted him. Orlando then seemed to cheer him up, humbly in this way he spoke towards the Bando so that he did not lack it and said, My Bando, artfully made, you have rescued me from how many great dangers. You never gave me the power not even many pagans did you tower from life, if you are loyal to me now, I am more frank than Achilles and strong Hector ever were. Semicolon then Orlando was not at all tired, he took the sword and ran from Junga, and the apple supported the saddle for me, spurring the steed against the baron. He ran the steeds with great strength and fury. As the supreme king of the supreme curia pleased, wanted and consented, 
Orlando Ferramet and wounded him within the bow with such and such an insult that the strong shield and the bow were torn apart, with the strong sword those seven plates all passed, so that nothing he stood. The strong shock of danger passed the baron from one side to the other. He shouted the pagan, O oh May, you have broken me? The soul of my body departs. Please be pleased to give me holy baptism, for I can clearly see that my God has a bad art, nor is it worth anything compared to your Supreme Father, as he incarnated in the Virgin Mother. Then Orlando didn't delay anything, he got off the steed to christen him, he left the bridge very quickly towards the host of the mighty Carlo, from his head he took the good Iusenti helmet, only to want to carry it full of water. He went down to the river and filled it with water, then he hurriedly ran on to the bridge. And he arrived in Ferrau and took a boat, as was customary in the Christian faith, the supreme God of grace commanded him, then he took Derlindana's sword in his hand to lead him out and Ferrau humbly begged him in his pagan language, please, don't do it, handsome lord, hate me a little, rather than leave this place. Although I am dead, you have done nothing, since you will not have your prisoners, I have a mother who certainly, if she knew such sermons, there was never a dragon over a serpent, who had his claws so sharpened, if she knew that I had died, that baron of yours would come to harm. Bring me my arms when I am gone and put yours on me, those in quarters, gird me your refined brand at my side, ties on your noble steeds. In Lazira you will go to this party, without saying a word to the sergeant or squires, let him bring me in front of my mother, so that in your exchange you will slay me. She swore that if I beat you, she would take your guts out of her body. When she tells me to reveal herself, don't wait, she'll kill her. Make sure you give it to him immediately, as nothing else would be worth it to you. Once you die, you will be lord of the whole city without fear. The arms of your barons are all in the palace where they are imprisoned. Saying this, that strong African had all his senses changed. The valiant and procount of Anglant, the flower of the high renowned knights, took the brand out of the comb, once he had it, the baron died. Once he was dead, Orlando lamented the courteous baron with great tears, but then he, who had received holy baptism, took much comfort in his heart. Gentlemen, I will tell you on the other hand how Carlo man took the city. May that holy virtue, which always reigns, save and maintain us all in common. Canto 6. True God, Jesus of Nazareth, who allowed yourself to be killed on the cross, by that Jewish people full of guilt for wanting to separate us from hell, where the pains never cease and will never come to our life, give me grace, divine majesty, who I can follow the beautiful story to the Latin people in the present, so that all the people will enjoy it. You, good people, if you want to hear, all of you sit down in peace, and I believe history will follow, if Jesus Christ gives me the power. Gentlemen, I left you in the other saying, as the perfect baron was dead. As soon as the strong Ferrau died, his soul without any separation was carried up by two angels in glory, to the holy paradise, where it will always have joy and joy with songs and with songs and with laughter. Carlo Mano saw that soul, he believed for certain that it was Orlando. In great pain he lay down on the ground saying, Lord God, what have you done? Christianity is destroyed, this is clear, since you have defeated this baron. Where or in what country will one find such a suitable knight of arms, who was above all people as the lion is above minute beasts? Now who will fight against the pagans of Spain, of Navarre and of Galicia, of India and Persia and the Saurians, Turks and Africans and their militia? Now all Christians will be able to lament and cry with sadness. For Christianity, the maidservants and ladies of the father, of the husband and some of the son, of the brother, of the relative and of the cousin, who are now all in mortal danger due to the death of Orlando the paladin, can well be called sad and sad. His entire brow filled with tears, calling himself sore and very miserable. How will thirty-seven barons who are all prisons in the city do? They will be dead, and this is the pure truth that he will never have mercy on them, against them he will be so cruel and proud that he will never return them for treasure, against me he will become so haughty that he will not give reason to silver and gold. Oh dear, I did such a feat. 
that I will have to defend myself. I grieve very much for the Marquis Olivieri and the Dane and King Solomone, for the English Astolfo and Gander Pontieri and for the Picard Pro Duke Sansone, Turpin di Rana, Ottone, and Berlingieri, Divino, Avolio and Guido d'Avignon, Darnaldo di Berlander, my nephew, my soul grieves as much as it can. The heart of the strong and brave Angelin of Bordella, of the Pien di San Michel Marco and Matteo, of the Pien di San Michel Marco and Matteo grieves and cries strongly, the pro Angelia still gives me grief, of Guy of Burgundy Saeo. This bad news about Sir Gerardo de Rossiglione and the strong Gualteri de Monlion passes my heart. My heart is thoughtful about everyone because I know well that they cannot survive. Since the valiant Baron is dead, I will not be able to conquer them for treasure. Today I have lost all my rest. Give me death, God, don't leave me, without them I don't want to live any more, who for myself alone will not cultivate virtue. Dusnamo heard this complaint, I marveled greatly at this, and he said, Sire of great worth, why do you make such a sorrowful lament? Don't you seem to have more knowledge or have you gone out of your mind? He then said Carlo, well, leave me alone and don't make me forgetful again. Dusnamo said, perfect emperor, tell me why you are saddened. Have you had messengers from Christianity or elsewhere? Carlo said, you are my advisors, I must not keep anything hidden from you, my son was killed by the pagan and therefore such a rude complaint. Dusnamo said, do you know how to divine? How do you know that he is dead? Carlo then said, I saw his soul carried by two angels, so it certainly seems to me that Christianity will be in harm's way. Dusnamo, when he heard these words, was greatly astonished to himself. A knight of those of Ganalone said to King Carlo, Don't be dismayed, because a little while ago I saw Malone's line outside that bridge quickly turning back to the river, holding his helmet in his hand, full of water I believe it was do not lie. He will have brought that pagan back to our faith and wants to baptize him. The soul that you truly saw will have been that of the pagan, when he dies he will be our powerful baron, and in dying he will have made him a Christian, but don't doubt anything that your baby will be happy and healthy. And Carlo was comforted by that saying and his heart rejoiced a little. Let's leave Carlo with a trembling heart, who yes or no believed in his heart, and let's return to that lord of Anglant, who wept loudly over Pharaoh, because he had been so strong and strong, and towards God said such a sermon, Lord God, why didn't you give me yours for my companion El Franco Ferrau? With him I believe that I have conquered the whole world to the east and to the west, everyone would have returned to your faith or death would have been very painful. Have mercy on him, blessed Lord, since he has returned to the Christian people and do not look at his many sins, receive him to the glory of your saints. She took the surcoat from that baron and put on hers, made in quarters, and Derlindana put it right around him and put on her helmet and the plates, then he placed a garrison on his back and Ferrau tied Vigliantino, who was good and handsome, to his steeds and mounted him, who was Morello. He then cut the gate with his sword and went out of the bridge towards the city, Vigliantino went ahead and began to climb the mountain. All the people of Lazira shouted, now that great count has been conquered. And many people came to meet him, celebrating and playing storms. And they praised their god Macon saying, Christianity is defeated because he died in the snow of Carloni. Long live Ferrau, who is so good. All the people shouted loudly. Orlando entered the strong city, without speaking to anyone, he went to the beautiful palace, and dismounted there. And he had Ferrau taken from his horse and had him carried to the main hall. The mother suddenly ran to hug him saying, Son, may you come back. Is this Orlando, son of King Charles, who wanted to crown and expel Massilio and Falserone from Spain? Orlando replied, Oil, by God Macon. She who had her nails sharpened wanted to eat Orlando's heart. Orlando said, Don't do it right away. To cause his baron greater pain in front of them in the hall you eat, and do this, mother, for my love. Whatever pleases you, my beloved son, I will do, replied the cursed devil. Orlando Ferrau had him dragged into the large room where the prisoners were, then he made all the people, 
old men and boys, stay outside of that room, he didn't let anyone other than his mother enter so that no one could defend themselves. Our Christians, the arms in quarters seeing, in a song we go strong crying. And Olivier of Vienna, very sorrowful, said, Highest glorified God, how did you allow that mighty Orlando, my companion and my brother-in-law, to die? That the Christian people are now defeated, every baptized person can complain, your name will be extinguished throughout the world, since Orlando's valor has reached the bottom. Great lament was made by King Solomon A., the sons of Dusnamo, Avolio, and Avino, and the other two, Berlingieri and Ottone, Marco and Matteo, and Rana Turpino, Denise Ugieri and the Sir de Rossiglione, Gand de Pontieri, Petit Traitor, Arnoldo of Berlander, and Angelieri and from Monlai and the good Duke Gualteri. Everyone mourned the learned baron, Olivier wanted to despair. Astolfo then, son of King Otto, began to speak to the good Orlando. Out of great fear he said this motto, Dear Baron, may I meet you? Well you did, you killed the bastard who wanted to subjugate all people. Signor Eja flies all Christians with his arrogance and with great pride in him. Blessed are your hands, Baron, with which you gave him death with condolence. And among the Christians in distant countries with my person, I want to accompany you, I know well all the paths and paths, from here to Paris up to Montpellieri. France, Gascony and all of Germany, Ireland, Scotland and all of Picardy, Provence, Flanders and all of Brittany, and all of Aspromonte and Normandy, Savoy, Frischland and also the countryside of Hungary, Bromanti and Lombardy up to Rome, the great city, I will guide you through the castle and districts. I will give you beautiful England with sixty cities that I have at my mercy and four thousand fortresses and castles I will place all of them in your lordship. However, I will not believe in your fay fella, I will always believe in Maria's fi. Orlando said in Saracen speak, you will be the first I will have hanged. Astolfo didn't laugh at this joke, he lowered his face and said nothing. Donna Ferrar wanted to tear her apart, believing she was truly Orlando. Olivier of Vienna moved and said to Orlando, Mighty Ferrau, give me death, for I ask you for it, before I see Orlando so tormented. Orlando said in Saracen parlance, Stand back, Burgundian duke, with the others I will make you miserable. Tomorrow I will have King Carloni hanged, I will plough Christendom to my name, my banner will go all the way to Rome and in your San Piero, on the altar, I will still make my steed eat. Olivier of Vienna did not answer, in one corner he went away crying with great sighs and painful tears. And the versa, Olivieri seeing, placed his hands on top of her son, for me the heart with the nails departing, sheets and spergo and zendado jacket with the nails parted without further attention. When she saw the mortal wound that Ferrau had in his coat, and his jacket, which she had sewn, and the steel plates that he was holding, her mind was greatly lost for me to know that he took off his helmet. Orlando brought the sword down and cut off his head. How many weapons did she take with her nails, he took away and how much land did he take, the sweep of the room scratched and lay all on the dead ground. The devil took his soul, which was not disputed against him, and the pagans, who were watching, began to fear greatly. He said to each other, Have you seen that Ferrau seems to have gone mad? he has the departed head of his mother. Who the hell would have thought this? He fought all day today, would it be heated fighting? What if the memory were turned to him, what does he do as a person who is foolish? Many pagans left the mansion for fear it would hurt them. Astolfo of England, son of Otto, said to Orlando, Baron Natural, great reward you have killed the Sturpone, who wanted to be royal of Spain, all of Christendom, if you want, under your lordship you can have. I'll come with you and tell you everything, I know about Christianity all the way. Carlo Mano will truly be destroyed, Paris and Rome will be at your mercy. Orlando said, ugly bastard, I'll drag you like a mastiff, don't speak any more, so that Macon will give you pain, I'll treat you as you should. When Orlando had thus gone a great league or more, he raised his helmet from his visor to show that he was not Ferrau. Otto, fifth of the Duke of Bavaria, 
the Marquis Olivier, full of virtue, immediately rushed to embrace him, the other barons did the same. Everyone embraced Malone's heart. Astolfo stood and said nothing, he was ashamed of what he had said. Orlando said, where is my relative? Astolfo immediately went to embrace him, praising the high almighty God, saying, that renegade dog is dead, you will be crowned in Spain. Orlando said, did you love me so much? Is this how much you want me, cousin? You were happy that I was crushed, did you believe that I was the Saracen? Astolfo replied, I would have cried more if I had seen you such a wretch. I recognized you, but I wanted to hear what the traitor Gan said. Orlando said, be silent, all of you, so that those pagans can hear nothing, all your wares are in this group to tell the truth. And Derlindana took hold of her in front of her and began to hurt her in the doorway. Pagan said, Pharaoh is crazy. Everyone rushed out of the palace. Orlando opened that paw and found the armor of the barons, each one immediately took it from him and quicker than leopards or lions. Orlando led them all down from the palace, to the foot of the steps, to the main door of the palace, where Pharaoh used to be at ease, and said to them, don't leave this door until I return. Outside the palace no trips at all, as I leave you, so you are on target. If the pagans come, then wound against them without any restraint. Astolfo said, well, don't command any more, go, if you want to do anything, don't delay. Orlando, nephew of our emperor, was reassembled on him in the palace, his surcoat, which was in quarters, he took from the fort Ferrau. That warrior attached those quarters to a spear trunk without staying any longer, then up the echelons he ran with it and was mounted on the main tower. From up on the tower you could see the whole beautiful field of King Carlo Mano, Orlando placed up that flagpole, and then it looks all around the floor and all Carlo's innkeeper could see, and Carlo Mano's pavilion too, then he quickly leaps down the echelons and descends the tower which was so high. Gentlemen, I want to finish this singing and go out and drink and refresh myself a little, and you, if you are tired of listening, you can rest a little in the meantime, and then I will follow my return to the beautiful story in the seventh canto, as Carlo Man Lazira took. God of glory be at your defense. Canto 7. With the name of that God, Lord of glory, who is the supreme creator of us all, I want to return to the present story and continue with true tenor, and in this I want to remember how Emperor Carlo Mano with his people took Lazira, and how all the people surrendered. Gentlemen, I said in the other song how Orlando killed the Verschera and how he had his barons armed and placed the flag on the tower, his barons had him stand at the door, so much so that they came down from the high tower, then he went to the stable with the knights and saddled all their steeds. Each man covers his steed well, then they all mount their horses, armed with helmets, harpoons and plates of prawns, leg guards and gloves, without flagpoles, banners or squires, the fighters came out into the square, huddled together, with swords in their hands, Orlando had the banner of the pagan. Behind Orlando everyone followed, loudly shouting from behind and in front, Mongoia, long live Saint Dionigi, long live King Carlo Mano, and Orlando Danglant. All the pagans, some here and some there, fled, calling Macumetto and Trevaganti, saying, the traitor of Ferrau was baptized in the faith of Jesus. They certainly believed, that it was Ferrau because of that overcoat he had on, everyone went to their houses and everyone put on their weapons. There was no such noise when the great Troy, which was so valuable, was destroyed, as those lax Saracens made, loading the balconies with weapons and stones. Alarm, alarm! shouted Pagani, all in common, journeymen and old men, let these Christians be driven out, throwing stones, spears and arrows hard, drawing arrows with tabby bows at our brave and vigorous Christians. Die Carlin and those who deceived us. Those renegade, dogs go shouting. Let that traitor Pharaoh die who deceived us in this way. Let the law of God Jesus die. Christian people be all conquered. The walls of the land were soon equipped with arms without any other uniform, insignia at Trevaganti, and Macumetti they placed the cursed on the walls. Our Christians, more than thirty-seven, 
fought a great battle in the square, receiving the arrows and arrows, their weapons did not care a straw. The houses were high and the wrinkles were narrow, stones of great value rained down. Christian, for fear of dying, did not want to leave the square. Strictly the Christian people march loudly up the square shouting, Long live the Holy Roman Church and Emperor Charles and Count Orlando. The pagan people did not approach them and expressed themselves against them with mazes and swords, and defended themselves in the houses by shouting, Let Charles and Holy Church die. Let's leave Orlando with the other barons and return to talking about the good King Charles, who was on the floor under the pavilions with many people on foot and on horseback, all armed and mounted on horses, young, slender men lighter than crystal. Eight thousand Breton from Solomone stood guard for reason. Dusnamo of Bavaria, the councillors towards Lazira, began to look again and saw the flag of the districts on the strong tower blowing. Immediately he shouted to them Pierieri, move quickly without further delay. Do you see the flag of Orlando on the proud tower? Alarm! shouted our emperor and made the hammer strike, the whole camp armed themselves, with a great noise. The good Dusnamo, without staying any longer, went towards the earth in great fury. The people began to follow him, without flags, banners or flagpoles they ran on knights and pedestrians. And each other expected nothing, they didn't line up for anything, what I could, the steed spurred on. Dusnamo of Bavaria quickly, more than anyone else had to do this, was before all those people to get back his Avolio and Avino. Ottone and Berlinghieri Paladin. When the Dusnamo had arrived at the gate with perhaps four hundred in his companions, those of the land did not remain at all, but as valiant and great people, each one, driven by pride and anger, no one was fired by throwing stones, spears and darts nevertheless drawing them with sorry bows. Our Christians could not enter the ports for any purpose, they did a lot of this world. Said he who was not garnished, it was not worth calling the high God to him. If he were wounded by a spear or dart, dead on the earth it was better for him to go and leave this world as soon as possible. The author says that this torment I will call an hour and a half very strong, it rained down like hail with wind, arrows, spears with stones for this fate. Of our men there were perhaps two hundred who died at that point. Carlo comes along with the other people and with Dusnamo if he wants. The abundance of our people was so great that we were forced to enter the city, nevertheless fighting vigorously with those people of great cruelty. Dusnamo and Carlo, mighty emperor, were in front of all the gangs. Everyone shouted, Mongoia, and San Dionigi and long live our imperior of Paris. Let the false law of Macon die. All these Saracens are dead. Long live he who died in passion. Those of the earth, great and small, shouted, Moyel Imperia Carloni. All Christians should be made fools. They threw stones on the houses that made many sad and sad. Through the wrinkles the people started fighting with those renegade dogs, so many stones with spears rained down that they seemed to have been sent from the sky. Nothing but arrows could be seen. Sad people who were not armed. Cantons were often thrown along the streets of the palaces and towers. Our Christians cannot pass, if the pagans defend themselves on all sides. They began to move backwards, so that each one seemed to have been chased away by the devil. Dusnamo began to shout loudly, Monsignor Carlo, this is bad market. Our Christians are dead like dogs they cannot be defended from the pagans. Holy Emperor, great and powerful, without receiving our people they will immediately destroy this city and these Saracens will surrender. Let them quickly enter the burning fire, let them protect themselves from the fire, if they know how. Mercy they will ask aloud and return to the one who died on the cross. Carlo shouted, Franceschi and Borgognoni, set all this land on fire. And Alamanni, Normans, and Breton, from Picardy, people of England and Provencals, Lombards and Gascons all shouted, let the earth be burned. Fire, fire! Those who believe in Apollonius or Macon have no mercy. When the pagans hear the cry, fire! And it was already lit on some side, it seemed to them neither a joke nor a game, 
everyone was immediately disarmed. The battle stopped everywhere, all that people were pacified. Long live Carlin. I began to shout, let us be baptized by your faith. All our Christians came out of the mansions by asking. Christian people from behind and in front are flowing throughout the city, seizing every fortress from the corners, and they are dividing themselves here and there. Running Nemo went to the square and found thirty-seven barons there. Great joy made the emperors of Orlando and Olivieri and Samson, of Solomone and of the Danish Ugieri, of Astolfo and Gualteri de Monlion, and of Gand de Pontier, his advisers of the four sons of Duke Namon, Dangielin of Bordella and Turpino, Dangielir of Bayona the Paladin. To all the others Carlo gave great celebration, thanking God with a humble heart. After he had the land in his power, he went down to the major palace and ordered Turpin that without leaving the city the great with the younger should be baptized immediately in the faith of Almighty Christ. Turpin had them all baptized, to that faith that St. Piero left and Macumetto made them deny, according to what was found in the book, he made them all return to our faith, our law showed them all and how Macumetto, was nothing he demonstrated to them as true openly. Let us now leave this sermon aside and return to Carlo's nephew, Orlando, son of Duke Milo, whose feet was never failed. In order for there to be mention of Ferrau, at the foot of the bridge, where he had him missing, he had a marble monument made and letters engraved around it, which said, Here lies Ferrau, who was stronger than any other Saracen. And in him his person had such virtue that he defeated every paladin in the jousting, except Orlando, who killed him on that bridge and made him a petty man, thirty-seven barons were taken, all the best that Charles had taken. And above the monument there is a mill that was in that place, where it is certain that the grave can be seen not declining, because it could be covered. The earth validates for every chimney, therefore I believe he is covered. Let's leave this warning and return to the Baron di Valimento. Orlando Ferrau had him disarmed of all his original armor and then had him decked out with other arms, as if he were a new knight. The surcoat was made for the warrior from a great Alexandrian pallium. Well he seemed a baron of great courage, not dead yet, but sleeping. Priests and friars, of whom he had several, were around him with many doubles, singing their offices and holy psalms, as is necessary for such a thing. There were many who wept greatly at the death of the best of the knights. Saracen, who had later become Christians, had great anguish over his death. Much was mourned for that perfect baron in the palace in which he was lord, then he was placed in a beautiful cataletto and was carried out of the palace, not by poltronias or valets, but by barons and champions of valor. The baron was brought to the warning, covered entirely in a rosy palio. The valiant baron was buried with great honor, as he was worthy. Some were happy about it and some were saddened by it, the great host returned to the land. And for four days Carlo rested with those people who had him as his flag. When he had rested for four days, he had called four advisers, Dusnamo and Salamon, King of Brittany, Denise Ugieri, and Count Ganalone. Tell me, fair sir, frank companion, this city, which is under my command, do we want to leave and travel towards Spain, above the other cities of Marsilian, or send to Massilio first to say that he gives me the keys of what is sire? Dusnamo of Bavaria boldly stood up and began to speak, Most holy emperor, great and mighty, it would seem to me that Marsilian would send a messenger from our Frank people and on your side command that of what he maintains in this world he sends the keys to you, Lord Playful. When the Dusnamo had thus spoken, each of the other councillors replied, The saying of the Dusnamo be observed, the messenger should go without making any more poses. Massilio will be completely afraid when he hears such painful news that his son Ferrau will be conquered, it will be returned to you without division. Carlo Mano called one of his barons, who Anselmo was called by the people, Count of Flanders the author places me here, and said, Go, Verone, imminent to Saragossa, before Marsilian and tell him everything that is convenient, just as Lazira is in my nurse, and Ferrau is certainly dead. You will say that he comes to me without delay to ask me for mercy and forgiveness, of everything that he has dominion over, send the keys to me without delay, 
and then be baptized in my favor and return to the true God who has more power. If he doesn't want to do this, tell my host to wait immediately along the floors and along the coasts. And I will not leave him much value of what he holds, city and castle, even the value of a sad medal, I will never return to beautiful France if my nephew Orlando of great value of Pampelona, Lucerne and the Saint Illa, Noble, Mezaragoza, and Ragona, and all Spain be crowned. Anselmo said, Sir, I will gladly do such an embassy to Massilio, give me a companion of these knights, whatever you want of your esteemed people, so that I will go more safely along the paths. Carlo then called for a knight called Alorin, a brave and experienced man of battle. And I commanded him that Anselmo should follow wherever he wanted to go, and obey what he commanded and never depart from his will. Monsignor Carlo, the knight told him, will be obeyed without failure. Carlo blessed them both on his side and on the true Jesus. Trambedui and Baron were armed with what a knight needed, and then two strong steeds were led in front of them, covered in mail. The two warriors were mounted there, without bringing sergeants or squires they left the land quickly, each armed on his mighty steed. Count Anselmo with the good Alorino di Lazira left all alone, towards Saragossa they took the path, so that no one could close them. One morning the two brave and perfect barons arrived in Pampelona, saying that they were envoys of Carloni, who wanted to go to King Marsilian. They were allowed to pass in every direction, as it is always the custom of ambassadors not to be offended, but looked at. Pampelona passed for certain, according to what I found in writing. In the other corner I will tell you the dance and the battle I fought with the pagans. May God all of you be cheerful and healthy. Canto 8. Most blessed Virgin Mary, supreme hope of all and sinner, mother of that Jesus who has us at his mercy, who has mercy and mercy on each one, through your mercy and courtesy, although I am so full of ignorance, grant my speech so much value may history follow in your honor. You, good people, who are in solitude, will now hear my singing in peace, and if God gives me so much space, I believe the beautiful story will continue, but if you are still satisfied with my words, go to solitude and leave me alone, and I will still follow the beautiful words as Anselmo did, full of great courage. From the city of Lazira I left, to obey their Sir Carlo Mano, towards Spain riding around, passing coasts and mountains and valleys and plains, towards Saragossa I will follow their journey up the lands of that pagan king, one morning they arrived in Saragossa, where that Saracen king lived. The barons who seemed to be of high and great importance entered the land, ladies and maidens stood on the balconies only to see those two messengers pass by, and for the wrinkles old men and boys, saying to one another, do you not seem to be a baron of great virtue? It seems like, Carloni's people. He said to each other looking back, don't you see how well they look mounted? What should Count Orlando, son of Carlo, son of Milo, about whom people talk so much, think? What should Olivieri, Turpin di Rana, and all the other peers think? If the other Christians are like this, Massilio has done a bad job for us, those two barons seem so sovereign that they would defend themselves against a thousand. The Trojans were not so consumed when their land was taken by the Greeks, as Spain was by King Charles. It's bad for Massilio to want to challenge him. Anselmo heard well what those pagan people on all sides were saying, the baron replied to nothing, while riding he is already very inflamed. The people of the land already knew that Ferrau was dead and gone, everyone rushed to hear what King Charles sent them to say. Anselmo rode up to the palace, where Marsilian lived, he and his companion dismounted, up the stairs each ram. Pagan people went behind them, they entered the room without question, Anselmo and his companion are well armed, as if he had gone to battle. Count Anselmo arrived in the hall, where Massilio and his barons were, and the visor was removed from his helmet, and he said the following sermon to his companion, Let me make a screen with Massilio, do not kneel down, do not salute or bow except as you would to a mastiff. Just stay on one side to see how I will make a big threat against him. If he shows any ill will against me, my brother will have to do it sadly. Then Anselmo, lord of a large farm, was perhaps ten arms length away from Massilio and instead spoke boldly about him. 
Now you will hear a pleasant greeting. That true God who stopped the whole universe and made us with his hand, save, guard and maintain in every verse the Holy Church of Rome and Carlo Mano, and since his will is not opposed, let him always maintain that sovereign champion, Orlando, son of Duke Milo, Duke Nemo and the good King Solomone, Astolfo of England and Olivieri, Denise Ugieri and the Picardy Samson, Turpin of Rana and Count Ganalone, Arnoldo of Berlanda, and Angelieri, and the pro Gerardo Sir from Rossiglione, Guido of Avignon and Guido of Burgundy, Marco and Matteo, and Angelin of Gascony. Save and maintain the Normans and the French, the English, the Flemish and the Burgundians, the Hungarian people, the Britons and the Germans, the Irish, the Flanders and the Bramanzoni, and the Campanzi with the Provencalski, and the Potovini, the Picardies and the Frisians, the people of Italy of Fountain Virtue and all those of the Christian faith. Overthrow and dispel Marsilian and the Argalifa and all his nurses, evil Balaganti and Falserone, King Grandonius and the Almonsor of Soria, King Mazarigi, evil Glutton, Turks, Africans and those of Barbary, all the people of Macon destroy God of glory, overthrow and dispel. Marsilian, you are too rude, and you hold yourself too proud to want to challenge Carlo Mano, and the Holy Church of San Piero. On behalf of the Roman Emperor I command you, as a messenger, to come before him immediately to ask mercy for your failure. Come in your shirt, like a scoundrel, and on your knees you will go before him, you will greet him with great devotion and you will ask for mercy, little wretch, and so do that King Falserone and Balaganti, your carnal brother. You will say that you caused the failure, you allowed it like a fool and a madman. You will give him the lordship of Ragona, Portugal, Granada, and Filasterna, Nobile, Saragossa, and Pampelona, the star and the city of Lucerne, of Minorca and Majorca the crown will carry Count Orlando forever, and you will give him the kingdom of Sibelia, and all your territory and furniture. If you do not do what I command you, your great companion will come upon you, twenty thousand and six hundred and Count Orlando, Danish Ugia, Salaman of Brittany, with Carlo Mano burning and burning half of Navarre with all Spain. Lazira is taken and Ferrau is dead, if you don't surrender, you're in trouble. Count Orlando, of great valor, killed Ferrau your champion. If you have understood me correctly, Marsilian, Carlo Mano has the intention, and certainly has made up his mind, to crown Milo's son with all Spain, city and castle, before he ever returns to beautiful France. What Carlo told me, I told you, he now does as you want. The Argalif of Baldraca, angry with Marsilio, began to speak, that false lazy man has despised our god Macon who has no equal. Whoever does not believe in Macon is destroyed. Hey, that ugly scoundrel told us. Our law commands, and you know it, that whoever despises Apollinus, over Macon and Trevaganti, must never survive before us for any reason, he must be consumed with great trouble, soon hung without remission. So I say that those two messages that Carlo sent should be hanged. Massilio said, My dear barbarian, we are all descendants of Alexander, of the most powerful sovereign lord and the strongest of our countries. Our lineage was never rude, they were always kind and courteous, and showed loyalty in every way. He was never called a traitor. It is not customary for any message to be insulted in any way, you should not offend him because he gossips about you. He doesn't say it from his own courage, but from the one who sends him away. To please him it is better for him to do so, so to disdain to obey Carlo. If King Charles despises us because we are obedient to him, this vassal must not bear this penance for saying him, what he said must be reported, and he must never be afraid. What a traitor Macon doesn't like, what King Carloni ever appeals to me. Falseron quickly rose up, Verdi Massilio began to say, make him make you, Massilio, sorry. Therefore you do not want to put to death the one who reproached me here present for the death of my bold son, who in paganism had no baron, who in his comparison was worth a vile button. And then he took a knife, which he had at his side, and put the tip to my heart, now you will see me, Massilio, Saddened if that message from the emperor is not quickly hanged on that balcony, like a vile idler and stealer.
Massilio, hearing his brother say this, shouted, let them be hanged without appeal. The brave and learned Count Anselmo heard the Saracen's threat, he suddenly addressed Alorin, my companion, he told him in his Latin, take out your weapon without making a fuss and defend yourself as a paladin. Massilio threatens to hang us, if I understand the Saracen correctly. With weapons in their hands we defend ourselves, before we are caught we are like thieves, certainly we cannot escape death, since we are worse than prisoners. Rather than both of us being dead, more than thirty barons will die of them. In this way, upon dying, there will be honor and value brought by Emperor Charles. He drew each of his sharp blades, Anselmo ran over Marsilian to make him sad with the blade and in pain. Massilio, the Argalifo and Falserone quickly fled in one arm. Anselmo then turned to a baron, holding the wound on his head, which extended his head up to his chin. The pagans began to flee down the stairs, which they chased away. Anselmo with his companion, full of courage intermingled like inflamed dragons, set out to injure among those people, delivering strong and merciless blows, doubling to the right and left, jumping here and there across the room. The two of our Christians seemed to be dragons, so boldly did they attack, cutting off some of the arms, some of the hands, in this case the head was right up to the tooth. Pagans drew tabby bows with many arrows over our people, our Christians defended themselves, strongly with their swords, causing death to many. To whom Anselmo suddenly arrived, he had no need to call Macon, he immediately fell dead to the ground. He similarly acted as a companion, here, there with the brand he turned shouting, Long live the Imperia Car I won. Their brands were covered in brains, blood, lungs and guts. The room was covered in blood and was flowing so strongly that it seemed like a river. Some dead and some wounded languish on the ground, there are many who see no light. Some had their noses cut off and some had their legs cut off, as is customary in such a custom. One pagan after another fell to this direction, one dead and the other wounded. Fifty pagans died and more than a hundred were wounded. Such was the abundance of those dogs, with spears and swords and great arrows of Turkish and also tabby bows, such an abundance of arrows and arrows, that the Christians could not bear it, dead they must necessarily perish. And so dead, they were then hung from a balcony by those wicked people. Let's leave the two courteous barons alone, let's go back to Carlo who in beautiful Lazira, who had already passed two months, heard this news from his barons. His life had never been so sad, he immediately appealed to Duke Nemo, and Solomone and the good Dane Ugieri, Ganellan de Pontieri the traitor, Count Orlando, the Marquis Olivieri, and all the brave corporals. And the noble emperor said to them, all the people, without any more tenor, assemble on foot and on horseback, because I want to ride towards Spain. And let everyone be commanded not to take Saracens or pagans, they will all be dead and put to bad torment, and if one wants to become a Christian, let him not be forgiven for the failure that Marzilian made of him, false and rude. Then he called Carlo a noble baron, who was called Guidoni of Flanders. Guidoni went before Carlo Mano, and kneeled imminently, what do you command, my sovereign lord? Carlo then said, I want this present city to remain as guard and captain with five hundred of my good people. Guidon said, Monsignor, willingly, since you like, I'm free to the emperor. And having taken over the Guidoni lordship, Carlo had Lazira proclaim that all the people should mount their horses and follow his banner. King Salaman was prepared with eight thousand Bretons full of courage and immediately left the land, Charles with his people then followed. Behind King Charles followed Count Orlando with twenty thousand and six hundred in the flag, Charles, the Dane and the Duke of Bavaria rode towards Spain. They all went together reasoning, passing slowly and coast with river in front of all the people Solomone did the antique Shardia for reason. Charles rode with his people so much over plains, valleys, coasts and along paths that one morning, at dawn, Iusenti, near Pampelona, certainly arrived with his ranks on a hill. Immediately he called the Dane Ugieri and said, Tell me, sovereign knight, which city is that down in the plain? The Dane said, Monsignor Carloni, that city, down in the present plain, is Pampelona of King Marsilian, 
this is how the pagan people call it. Inside him is a very powerful baron who, like Pharaoh, is powerful, King Isoleri is called by his name, rather than that renegade Massilio, son of one of his carnal nuns, his father's name is Mazarigi. In all paganism has no appearance, and it will not be found from here to Paris. If you have him, natural lord, you will be like Saint Denis in Spain. Carlo had all the people commanded to gather down on the plain. When Charles was on the lower level, near Pampelona, half a league away, his pavilion was suddenly tense. Denis Hugieri the Orifioma explains, King Solomon A, of great valor, with his people, all in league, made the anti-guard near the city all around with his gang. Each tented tents and pavilions and unfurled flags and banners and pennants with dragons and falcons, half-serpents, wolves and leopards. All the warriors dismounted from their horses, French people, English and Picard, Alamanni, Fiomengi and Yes from Ireland, Hungary, Provence, and Berlander. All the people who went with Charles waited around Pampelona with 180,000 on horseback, with those who he left to guard Lazira. Let's leave the Christians in this stalemate, and in the other singing I will follow you and the beautiful story, and the delightful song. May God receive you into his holy kingdom. Canto 9. I pray to that God who is above, that every grace reigns and descends from him, and without him nothing is ever done, and that he has mercy on everyone who offends him, that my mind may cover so much knowledge with knowledge, gentlemen, when the author explains of this story, that I know how to rhyme, that all people like to listen to it. Gentlemen, I said in the other song how Carlo Mano the emperor with his people of such business from around Pampelona with his troops turned down into the field to camp. He had the flagpole and flags unfurled, sounding trumpets, alarm clocks and harpsichords, whistles, castanets, horns and cornels. It was already the sun in the eastern Esparto when our Christians arrived, the camp shone all over with the arms and insignia that they brought, one could not say so much about the third, who had noble shelter in that field. Let's leave what is crowned by Rome and talk about the lord of Pampelona. King Isolia, son of Mazarigi, arose in time that clear day, at the window, brighter than a lily, that noble baron was adorned. He raised his eyebrows towards Carlo's innkeeper and saw him waiting around like that. She immediately recognized his banner, and that worthy people of honor followed her. Forte shouted, Praised be Macon, praised be Apollonus and Trevaganti, since I will try myself with that baron, who is the nephew of Charles and Sir of Anglant. My cousin Ferrau, Frank Champion, I will avenge this day ahead. Saying this, he heard a loud shout, To arms! Alarm! To death! To death! The whole earth rose up in noise, everyone shouting, to the walls. The pagans, the emperor is awaited outside with two hundred thousand Christians. With stones, spears, darts in great fury, with many arrows and tabby bows, all the pagans, covered in armor, quickly mounted up the high walls, opening the bows and holding stones in their hands and waving some with spears and some with darts. Up the walls shouting those lossy, come forward, Franceschi and Picardi, whoever wants Spain to be crowned, come and prove whether we are cowards. Unfortunately for your purpose you passed into Spain, you will never see France or La Magna. You will never return to Picardy, to the countries of Flanders and Gascony, England, Provence, and Normandy, Brittany you will not see nor Burgundy. Come forward, full of cowardice, if you don't already want trouble from us. Our Christians looked at them, but none of the ranks changed. Hearing Charles shout those sermons, some of his people began to shout, let us fight the land, free barons, pagan people will not be able to last. You see that they have no garrisons or weapons on their backs for defense. Today we will be lord of Pampelona if everyone feels good about him. Duke Nemo, lord of Bavaria, shouted loudly towards Charles, saying, Sir, your mind is too haughty, other than you, you don't care about anything anymore. Damn whoever follows your flag. Already you did not make as many good people as there are here, dukes, counts and barons, and you want us to die like scoundrels. You want to fight this city and believe you will take it in check, 
yours is too great a simplicity, all the pagan believers to sack. Haven't you yet experienced their goodness, why do you want to make such a big deal out of Christians? Don't you see the battlements all laden with spears, darts and bows, stones and rocks? And they are above and we will be below, one of them will be worth more than twenty. Whoever arrives on stone or stone will not return to tell news to his relatives. Let them be besieged around each step, you will have them hungry, not otherwise. Let us not fight in any way, our people will remain conquered. Dukes, counts, marquises and great barons, who were in Carlo Mano's pavilion, hearing such sermons spoken, all shouted, Dusnamo says well. We will plough the pagans all prisoners, if we do according to the Dusnamo. As you like, said the emperor, lay siege to every path around. Pampelona was then besieged all around on each side, no person could enter unless he had flown like a bird. As history tells me, every little path was closed. Let's leave Charles, Roman Emperor, and return to that pagan. King Isolia, sire of Pampelona, went before Father Mazarigi and said, Monsignor Father, I want to go and fight with that Lord of Anglant. The father replied, What do I hear you say? you whore, you wicked bitch, don't go to fight with him, that would make you like Pharaoh. Don't you know that he killed your cousin who was three times stronger than you? So he would still make you miserable if you went to fight in front of him. Don't talk to me about this Latin anymore, arm yourself and make us all our barons and you will mount your horse without abode and you will keep guard together with them. Inside the walls you will go around with half of our knights, you will keep guard with them during the day, the landowners will be above the walls. Then you will return here in the evening, then the other half mount steeds, and a baron, whom you trust, lets the other guard lead at night. If everyone watches half as much, I don't know what Carloni can do to me, if he had Christianity, he wouldn't be able to damage a button. For ten years the city is supplied with bread and wine and with every entertainment. If you make the walls look good, Carlo will do the worst he can do to me. Isolia left immediately and had half of his men armed. That day he kept watch presently and then at night he had the others watch. Thus he continually changed the guards day and night, and had the walls well equipped with all the garrisons to attack me. The innkeeper of Orlando and the emperor was around the besieged land and, according to the author's account, he kept the land besieged for seven years, without giving battle for any reason, but still take care of yourself sometimes, as is customary in such a profession, but not in battle with armies. Having spent seven years with his men in Pampelona, one day the mighty emperor commanded all the barons who were most knowledgeable to come before him, and they came. When they had gathered in the pavilion, Carlo stood up from his chair and said, Beautiful lord of a large farm, who have abandoned your affections and all your possessions to follow me, we have been around Pampelona for seven years, as everyone can know, and we're not with the sweet-tongued pagans. It would seem to me, if you liked it, that the city would fight for us or we would return to our country, which I no longer want to be like this. I don't want any count or marquis to blame me for this. Let the battle take place without disputes or we will have to go back, we are all well armed and very strong, pagan will all be taken and dead. Dusnamo of Bavaria, Good Lord, spoke to Charles in this way, then what do you want, Holy Emperor, what battle should be given to the severed one, it would seem to me, and it would be the best, so that all our people were not conquered as vile cattle, that a wooden castle should be built, which would overlook the walls and be so large on all sides that five hundred well-armed barons could fit on it. Pagans are so afraid of this that they wish they had never been born. They will not be able to defend themselves from the castle, they will surrender to you without contention. All the barons agreed with the saying, saying, Nemo speaks well of that, you will soon find a perfect master who will order you to do it without a problem. Carlo then said, Have a master come before me as soon as he knows how to do the castle well and quickly to reason, as the good Duke Namon said. I raised Bordella Angelino, sir, saying, I have here with me a master who in all the world is not a fine yes and is subtle and skilled in his art. That castle will do the trick for you to challenge those alpine people. Make the lumber here first and the castle will begin to be made. 
Then Carlo ordered Franceschi to go down into the woods into a valley to cut the wood and then the Germans up the Arikasa, who had good backs. The Alamans, who were strong and fresh, all swore not to go after them, they turned to their captain without a lie, who was Guglielmo, Lord of Colonna, saying, Monsignor, for God's mercy, we have abandoned our mansions to follow Carlo and his magnamite. Dukes, Counts, Marquises and great barons are under you without any fault. Carlo wants to send us like rascals to carry wood like donkeys, over our shoulders, like idlers. Guglielmo, hearing people say this about him, felt great indignation at this in his heart. May it not please God, Almighty Sire, that this dishonor be done to you. If you want to follow me tonight without the Emperor's knowledge, we can all go together, Carlo and his people will leave it alone. I will immediately go to King Charles's request that he will guard me this night, and he will give it to me without any fault so that each of you will be well in yourselves. At midnight we are all on horseback, without letting the kidney know anything, away we will go with all our ranks without torment or raising the flag. Everyone replied, Sir, we are happy, since you like this thing. And so those fraudsters will be stopped from wandering around at night without taking any further action. Now you will hear how sorry they were for the vain and painful thought. One of the Germans, hearing this betrayal, went to Carlo and immediately began to say, Monsignor Carlo, E. Chalamano, has been ordered to turn away when they will be keeping guard this evening. See to it, sir, that this is not the case. William of Colonna will follow because he put up this land for them. King Charles, hearing the baron say this, was completely disturbed by the news, and commanded him not to leave, he had him locked up again in the pavilion. For Salaman he sent for him to come before him without staying any longer. Salaman came, as the messenger said, before Carlo, who was then incontinent, and said to him with a cheerful face, What do you command me to do, Monsignor? Carlo Mano said, I heard that this night our camp will be attacked by many pagans. Move with your eight thousand Britons, with all those who have served you, towards Christian countries it goes, inside a forest, which is nearby, he ambushes you and even stays in the morning. And if you hear any people passing by tonight who they are or how, don't bother asking and don't want to know what their name is, Mongo S and Dionigi don't shout, hit them with such things, and your people won't be able to fight lenses, as many as pass, let them all be extinguished. Salaman said, Monsignor, let it be done, and departed with his slender people. He went very quickly towards Navarre with eight thousand knights in the saddle and he hid himself in a wood. As history tells me, from the woods to King Charles's pavilion three leagues go, gentlemen, without fail. After King Salaman's death, Charles sent Orlando for his nephew. Orlando came to him without combat, what do you command, my lord, speaking? Carlo said, I have a spy here from our people, who are spying, and he says that tonight this camp will be attacked without any escape, so tonight you better keep a good guard with your knights, around this camp of people watch, so that they are safe all the paths. As you hear my clock ringing, it will help me without any other thoughts. It will be done, sir, said Orlando, and I left without speaking any more. The traitor William of Colonna, who had thought of leaving immediately and passing through France and Burgundy and leaving the Christians in this state, made such a lie with ill will. Count Orlando was gone, speaking such sermons to him he utters, it is up to me to keep watch tonight. Orlando said, if it's your turn, look at it, for my love, oh, do it well tonight. With twenty thousand I will stand guard around the city eight by eight. Guglielmo left and did not delay any longer, it was already evening and it was midnight. With his people, full of malice, already stand guard with his banner. When midnight passed, all the Alamanni were gathered together, each one loaded himself with his own tools, on horseback I mounted with deception. Without saying a word everyone embarks, believing they will pass without worries, without raising the flag or storms, without saying anything, those mourners leave. Six thousand five hundred writings I find, were those that left the innkeeper with the betrayal that happened again. They travel across plains, rivers and coasts, undeployed, 
riding in advance. They arrived where the people were sheltered. Solomon, who had the guard taken care of, said to him, We hear people passing by. Solomon called his corporals and said to them, Gentlemen, now understand me that whether these are many or so, you will place yourselves on top of them to fight. Don't ask who they are or who they are, but only take care to hurt them well. Who they are, ask nothing, wounds to them and nothing else healed. Show your might above them, none of them will move forward. They are all dead with great arrogance like wretches, lazy people and lossy. Have no mercy on them, let them be placed dead on the ground among the stones, and let swords, mazes and spears on every side be spread over them. A hundred and two hundred, a thousand or less, those Germans were leaving on horseback, and someone led the palfrey on foot so as not to tire him along the way. On the other hand, sir, we will sing of the great battle that took place in that stalemate and how many Alamanni died. Christ protect you from pain and trouble. Canto 10. True God, who formed the heavens and the air and the earth and the waters and the fire, who to reward your faithful you wanted to be held in ridicule and play, then you wanted the cruel Jews to deprive you of life little by little little, give me so much grace, noble sire, that I may end this story. Gentlemen, I said in the other song how the Germans had left, and in Pampelona our other Christians were left alone, so mocked. Nothing but God could not have escaped them if the pagans had attacked them. I also told how I arrived without rest where Solomon A was in the hidden wood. When Solomon heard these people, believing they were certainly pagans, said to his people, Strike them, let them be torn to pieces and dead like dogs. And he ahead, without any abode, ran to be with them at hand. Spear in hand, with shield around his neck, he brocaded his steeds and each of his followers. A brigade comes in front, numbering perhaps 650, some on foot, some on horseback, some behind or on foot. Solomon A, and all of his people struck them like flying dragons, who even boast of wounding each one well, with lances and brands and with manhandling arrows they wounded the Breton above the Germans. Without shouting Mongoya or saying anything, Christians followed together, wounding helmets and plates and departing, and one made the other sad and sorrowful, placing many wounded on the ground. Those who were on foot, on horseback, go back up and many fall off horseback. At the same time, no part was known to us for that night which was very dark, with darts and with the spears of the Firenze, and both sides were afraid. Germans certainly believe in themselves that those people, so confident, were pagans, and Breton believe that. Pagan fusser, but they hurt him. Wounding, Salaman went through the woods above those scattered people, his battle seemed temperate to Tosco, of the Germans he made such a great cut. He said to no one, I know you. Without speaking he went with his sharp sword and his people followed him well, no one learned to wound well. By wounding those Germans with great desire with spear and mace and sword, they made them feel sorry for themselves inside the woods and outside on the road. The Germans trembled like leaves, no one knows where they are fleeing or going, because from the Breton, battle customs, they were closed and closed on every side. They were unable to escape from any side, as they were barricaded on all sides, they had to fight or die and be well warned of wounding, for Breton attacked them with such boldness that angry dogs fell upon them. The Germans defended their advantage, as there were few of them. Whoever had seen Salaman on a destria, covered entirely in steel from plate to plate even to the heel, bold and strong and expert in battle, truly he seemed like a dragon with spears in hand, shield covered. On the shield a German strikes, sheet metal and slats, everything belongs to him, and suddenly fell dead from his horse. Salanion met another nearby, on his shield the learned baron wounded him with a great blow so heavy and often, then he wounded another without saying a word with such force and with such an attack that he divided whatever armor he had on him and put him dead on the ground. The fourth, the fifth, which he encountered, the sixth, before the rods broke or weakened, they returned the soul to the celestial father, and breaking the shafts, he drew the sword, turning around him harsh and rubestuous. It certainly seemed like a fire, anyone who had a blow from a cut or a bridge, due to his valor, never mounts a horse. 
The battle was large and dangerous between 8,000 and 650, relentlessly giving blows without ceasing, one against the other due to such strength. Very brave German people were all killed at that point. Another group, having thus created a screen, came from behind, where Guglielmo was, who was captain of those people. Near the woods, perhaps half a mile away, he found a wounded German on the plain, making the field red with blood. As he saw him coming close by, he shouted, My Monsignor, I advise you to return to Pampelona with your people, if you want to save your life with the others. Near here, as far as a bow can throw, there are many pagan people hidden. When we thought we were passing through that forest, we were assailed along the plain and along the coast, against them we could not last, nor could we flee at our own will. Those who have been killed and those who have been severely wounded have fled up to this point. William, hearing such news, then called many of his people, saying to them, The Celestial King, because we have been so foolish, has allowed us to do so much harm and these pagans have turned upon us. If it is written for us later, each of us will be dead or cut off. Let's return to the camp before daylight and stop the noise about this party. Alarm. Alarm. Frank Barony, which the camp is attacked by Pagani. People will arm themselves to see what happens, it won't seem like we have failed at all. We say that those who are wounded there have followed those pagans from the camp. Each, let's return, soon respond here, then they turned towards Pampelona. Whoever could, ran with a good horse. Salaman with his very good people, a baron told him that fact, immediately spurs his steeds. With the brand in his hand the baron then said that his people should follow him immediately. Behind the Germans the Breton go fast, spurring their good steeds down a mountain, swearing to give them bad luck. And to put them all to shame, loudly shouting, to death. To death? They reached them at the crossing of a bridge, at that pass where they reached them, more than three hundred were killed. Whoever had a good steed needed it if he wanted to survive death, they no longer waited for one another, but, like broken and dismayed people, each returned to the camp. The Breton always followed him, and whatever German remained behind was never healthy or happy. Thus fleeing as if in defeat, the Germans went nine miles, being pierced by Breton people, who made good trials on them. Some strike with a spear, some with an arrow, nor are they already looking at who or where. As those Germans fled in torment, 1,500 died. Those who were fleeing in front, with their horses running faster, arrived in the field with such features. To death? We say, gentlemen, that we are attacked by the Africans. Rise up, knights and sergeants. Carlo, who knew what had happened, heard a shout, his hammer struck the hammer. The people, hearing the hammering of the bell of the great emperor, all of a sudden, without any more weapons, were armed, hearing such a noise. Count Orlando, brave and slender, with twenty thousand and six hundred in value, as Carlo told him, so he came to the pavilion, which already did not hold back. What do you command me to do, Monsignor? Count Orlando said to the emperor. Carlo replied with a cheerful face, go here and there across the field, looking near my pavilion with your trail. If necessary, be at my command. Orlando leaves with his people, around the camp looking down. The camp was thus armed on all sides for such a fury. Dusnamo of Bavaria asked the fugitives, who is doing you harm? And everyone responds in fear, pagan people, to whom God sends heat, they have attacked us and made us suffer, so that more than a thousand have lost their lives. Dusnamo, with him ten times a hundred armed knights under his banner, departed from the camp without fear and towards those who were expelled, and he found Salaman, full of courage, with eight thousand valuable Britons. The auction lowers Dusnamo of Bavaria, and Salaman towards him in this way. Dusnamo said, Mongoya. Shouting, Long live Emperor Charles of France. Salaman, who came towards him, raised his helmet and threw away his spear, shouting, Long live Carlo and Count Orlando. Nemo, then hearing such a tip, looked and saw the black and white checkered flag of Solomone standing erect. There Solomone left very quickly and came to him saying, Sire, 
Sire, have you become foolish or mad, have you put so many Christians to die? Because you agreed or did it, for my sake, I will make you regret it. Salaman said, Don't threaten me, you don't know what the matter is. You ask me if I am mad or foolish, and it doesn't seem to me that I still know myself, my mind hasn't been taken away from me yet, and my memory hasn't been addressed. Quirito near a thick grove, to the honor of the true God of glory, as Carlo told me, I observed, and there I hid myself with my people. Carlo gave me a commandment last night that whoever crossed the line, no matter who he wanted or in what way, without saying anything he would attack them, against each one, without knowing who he was, with my people he would cut everyone off. If these were Christians I did not know, that they were pagan, I certainly believed. Dusnamo, hearing such an appropriate speech, left and returned to the pavilion of the mighty emperor in the field. He immediately dismounted from his steeds, towards Carlo he went boldly. Duke Nemo spoke in this way, Carlo, curse those who want to follow you, since you put Christians to die. It seems to me, Charles, that you delight in making Christians die like dogs, the best and most perfect knights were killed by the Britons tonight. According to me who corrected them, they did this evil by your hands. Sir, if this is true for sure, you will still be dead and deserted. Carlo with great pride and a proud look towards Nemo began to speak, for Saint Dionigi, Dusnamo, I will set fire to how many Germans there are. Nemo said, let me, sir, know why you want to consume them. King Charles said, tonight, since the trip was over, the Germans wanted to leave and wanted to return to Christianity. William of Colonna was their guide, and without guarding the camp they left the camp here and caused those who trusted in them to perish. Others that God cannot escape unless he conquers each one on the gallows, so that they will never commit treason, which would be to their advantage and to us annoyance and harm. Dusnamo said, Lord, do not look at their matza and their failure. God forgave and you forgive them, Christ will give them penance for how much love, Monsignor, you bring me. Above this, have foresight to have mercy on these people, so that the camp is not in discord. Dusnamo begged the emperor so much that at that point he forgave the Germans, and each of them willingly agreed to bring the wood, so that as much as they needed at the time, without dispute, each brought it. Once the wood was cleared, that master was quick to build the castle. And in three days the castle was built, well built and very spacious, five hundred barons could fit in it comfortably. It was turned with eight wheels, because the master was so ingenious that he could easily move it here and there, as there were people on it. Once the castle was built, Carlo had all his people gather together, small and large. Of the arms, said he, go decorate yourselves and, finding lances, mazes and brands, each brigade for me to continue. He gave such orders to all the people that they were prepared to follow the emperor wherever he wanted to go. All the people were suddenly armed and gathered under his banners. Never have we seen such esteemed people. Then the emperor made three great ranks. The first was a valiant brigade, 20,600 from the neighborhood of Count Orlando and the other parishes with great barons and noble warriors. And this group on one side is already very narrow around Pampelona. King Salaman of Britain followed, on the other side with his chosen people, 8,000 Breton came with him. Never were there such perfect people, well mounted, armed with advantage, like lions of proud courage. Then Charles had five hundred barons dressed in mail rise to the castle, all fighters full of courage, accustomed to war and masters of battle, who thought nothing of fleeing, and were always ready for warning. In front of that castle were tied four immensely tall steeds. And these four oversized steeds were covered in scarlet, and they quickly pulled away that castle, so much so that they approached the walls. The land was greatly subjugated, all around the plain, the other people went behind Carlo Mano to the castle, each fresh and happy. In golden flame was the holy banner that the Dane held behind the castle, the one that was always worthy of honor, wherever it was and in each country. Eugia, who God always saves and keeps, carried it for a long time, the courteous baron, 
However he was always loyal to Charles and of expert and natural virtues. Thus three ranks form around to want to give battle to the land, and that pagan people falsely and grimaced at his arms, each one grasping him. That morning, when the day was clear, they shouted throughout the city, War! War! Alarm! Alarm! Come on, pagan people, let's go fight with Christian people. Every person was then armed, on foot and on horseback, great and medium-sized. Mazarigi and Isalia, kings of the crown, and twenty thousand pagan knights armed themselves to defend Pampelona, and to inflict death and torment on the Christians. Inside the walls they went around looking and sending other people onto the walls. Above the gates and above the walls they had made many bartesks with hollow battlements full of armor, with stones and darts and with large-scale menesca spears and tabby bows, with many arrows, which were barbarian, and all of them were worked art, with terrible non-toxic poison. The Africans were prepared to receive and give many knocks, all shouting loudly together, Come, Christian, here to try and you will see if we are Trojans. Now you will hear the other singing that roar and boundless battle. Christ look upon you and the Blessed Mother. Canto 11. I pray to God, who holds the whole world, and who from heaven to earth sent his Son, that true Jesus, who came to Holy Mary, who to save us from mortal danger on the cross sustained death for us, that he may give me so much help. And I advise you to follow the story that I was moved to rhyme as best you can. Our Christians being lined up, as I said in the other canto, and as they were mounted on the castle wanting to give the cruel battle, Pagan had gone over the walls and each began to throw stones and spears and arrows, and their bows opening, and shooting many arrows here and there, shouting, Come forward, Christians, if you are people of such power, we have no learning or fear of coming to blows with you. You will not return to Brittany, Britons, nor France, nor Burgundy, nor Provence, the Sorceress, Italy, Hungary, and Sansogna, Bromanti you will not see nor Gascony. Carlo Mano thought badly in wanting to wage war against Massilio, so that the thought of him will be in vain, you will never be able to conquer Spain. If all the Christian populace were here, this city would not be able to accept. Even if you are pro and learned in the army, all of us will be dead and broken. Orlando with 20,600 began the battle on one side, Brittany and Salamon, full of courage, had already begun on the other side, those of the castle, who were five hundred, were approaching the city, which subjugated battlements, towers and walls, of which the pagans were greatly afraid. To begin throwing those from the castle of spears and stones and darts in quantity over the walls of that felonious people, shouting, Long live Christianity! Long live the Emperor of Rome, beautiful and holy church and holy trinity! May Massilio and those who adore and believe in Macumeto and his false faith die! Storms sounded within and without, and the sound of thunderstorms on one side and the other shouting and the ducking of good running steeds cannot be heard. Above all their sounds he thundered, their cries were louder than those of the people. Many arrows, stones, darts and spears fell like rain, thick and thick. The twenty thousand six hundred warriors, who were on one side of the earth, fight like fierce and fierce dragons, and wage great war on the pagans, but the abundance of archers was so great that death overtook many Christians. Lances with darts without any hesitation are seen thrown at those pagans. Count Orlando with his paladins, 20,600 fighters, did not advance because of that strong attack on the Saracens, because many were made miserable with arrows and stones by the Africans. In the distance, perhaps half an archway, were Count Orlando and his great brigade. The Frankish Salamon, King of Britain, on the other side fought hard with eight thousand who accompanied him, all saying, To death! To death! Here you will be conquered, dog of Spain, and all of you will be put to bad luck. Pagan made their mockery and torment, because they had room to throw. Our Christians fight below with those who were more haughty above, giving and taking the brunt of this, throwing spears and darts willingly, and those above suddenly threw arrows at them, the tabby archers, spears with darts and then many stones, making many of their lives sad and lax. He had a lot to do on every side, but those pagans had a better chance because they were up there fighting, 
and whoever was not prepared would have to pass from this life and return his soul to his father's favor. And it was similar to the pagans, whoever died gave himself to Trevigante. Our Christians seemed like inflamed dragons, so much did each one of his possessions show towards those renegade Saracens, near the walls, around those ditches. Those who were well armed fought, the others followed behind the forces. Let us leave handsome Solomone to fight and return to those gods on the castle, who very frankly fought over the pagan forces with spears and darts. Many of this life make it easy, pagan people could not last because those of the castle would certainly have batteries, battlements and towers. Pagani then could not defend themselves, so much so did they attack the castle. King Isoliri went around comforting the people on the walls on all sides. Ah, don't be dismayed, already shouting, and let everyone act like a prized baron. On this day we will find Count Orlando and Emperor Carlo captured and tied up. Fight well, may Macon help you, above Christian, who are so witty. Pagan defended me as much as they could from that castle that was above them. There was so much throwing that Christian did that many called that day a cruel martyr. Shouting loudly at their words, surrender, without making a home. If you do not surrender the city quickly, no mercy will be shown to you. The battle was great and immense around Pampelona on three sides. Christian, from those merciless people, more and more deaths, were scattered on the ground. Those of the castle, like valuable people, the pagan made to stay apart. There is fear of them throwing Pagani and abandoning the walls on that side. The author and the book say well that at that point Christian would have taken Pampelona in spite of their disgrace. The people of the castle were so ready that the pagans could not defend themselves. A pagan, a master of hardwood, spoke to Mazarigi in this way, this city, Monsignor, is lost because of that castle which causes such great damage. If Apollonus or Macon does not help us, Christian will necessarily have the city. If the castle doesn't leave or doesn't change, even if it's ninth, they will be mister if you want to pay me well, I will find a remedy for this siege with ingenuity. I will suddenly raise an overflow here, in front of the opposite castle, and two barrels of pitch to this conduit with fire inside, and you will see clearly that the castle will be immediately broken, in less time than I have it for you said. King Mazarigi said, do it quickly, do not look for effort or cost. I will make you richer in treasure than any baron who has Charles with him, in city, castle, silver and gold, if you can destroy the castle by your own strength. The master, without staying any longer, began to straighten the overflow, by midday he had it straightened, according to what was written in the book. As soon as he had it, he threw a barrel of lit pitch over the castle. The first blow did little damage, but the other who threw that pagan fellow burned the castle and destroyed it entirely, and five hundred, who were on top of him, fell to the ground, some wounded, some falling down dead and some not hurt. Pagan, seeing the fallen castle, made a great celebration of Macon, thanking him. King Isolia, as the baron learned, with twenty thousand warriors under command from Pampelona had departed, all, to death. To death! Shouting. Everyone entered the group where Carlo Mano, was with spears in their hands. King Isolia shouted in front of all the people with spears in his hands, Mongoya. Long live Massilio, and those who believe in Macumeto. And the Palma spear. From the spurs he wounded the running steed and a Christian wounded with much trouble on the shield, and all the way, and he died on the ground of the throne steed. And then he struck another with great desire, which the shield divided through his middle, all his armor seemed like a leaf, he also placed iron, shaft and flagpole on him, and when he was dead he brought him down with great pain. And then he conquered another in this way, one after the other in such a greenhouse, some dead and some wounded he put to the ground. No one could last against him, he was so strong and strong beyond measure. He caused fear among our Christians, he and his people caused death to many. A squire went to signify that King Charles was in bad luck, this condition was signified to Count Orlando and King Solomone. Each immediately moved to his side and rode towards the Emperor Orlando and twenty thousand, each prized, 
each spurring the good steed. King Isolia like a fiery dragon already fighting and breaking the ranks, seeing Orlando and his people coming, the land began to flee. He immediately had the crowd ring and order everyone to return inside. Pagan people gathered around. Sad who Orlando found. His life was immediately taken from him. For a great noise it seemed that he thundered, for the neighing of good sovereign steeds and the shouting of Christians and pagans. Orlando came to make such a noise among those people, who are so ruthless, striking them with great valor, taking shields and helmets from their heads. Nothing armor to him was worth a flower, so much did he wound with great power, and his other companions did the same in the field behind and in front. Isolia then made the likeness of the shepherd who wants his beast to guard against the wolf or other beast for learning. Outside the door he put on a grill in front of everyone with great power and the people were let in. Our Christians, having thus created a screen, made the pagan government cruel. Astolfo of England, son of Otto, who lords over England, went towards Isoleri as a swift, and when he reached him he delivered such a sermon, become prisoner, false glutton, against the emperor do not make any more war. You surrender or you take the field, if you are strong, you defend yourself from me. King Isolia took a spear in his hand and covered himself under the strong shield. Duke Astolfo then took up the plan, with spears in hand he stood on his destria and rammed hard against Pagano. The strong shield broke by force, the shaft broke into more than six shreds King Isolia did not change his saddle but he wounded him with such great force that as long as the shaft with the iron was long he knocked him down onto the prairie. He said, Warriors, you have lost your edge, do you want to surrender yourself to me as a prisoner, rather than let death come to you with a sword? The handsome sir, since you have beaten me, I am your prisoner, and I will refuse you nothing. Astolfo already in prison land due to the commandment of Isoleri. The valiant Burgundian duke, son of Ranieri, called Olivieri, seeing Astolfo, was not slow, towards the pagan he went with more thoughts. The palm pole and the strong shield he holds and the good steed steps forward to bear witness. Running hard the mighty Marquis, to avenge Astoifo for this disgrace, stretched his spear over that pagan and wounded him on the bridge. Of the arms and the shield, as much as he took, he took away, according to the book counts. Due to the great blow that Olivier gave him, the steed fell and was left stranded. Olivier dismounted from his horse and said, You will be my prisoner. Make yourself a vassal to me Topin, believe in Jesus and in Baron San Piero. Isoleri said, You had a foul. I will never surrender to any warrior, except to the emperor's nephew, the one who has the most value above all. Olivieri said, If I make you come here immediately before you, Will that valiant baron full of courage, Orlando, son of Milan Danglant, surrender you without failure? Oil, said Isolia, by Trevigante, make him come, for this is a gift to me, I abandon myself to being prisoners of him. Olivier sent for Count Orlando, who was going through the field fighting, Orlando came, spurring his steeds. King Isolia, seeing the army in his quarters, forgot his pride while looking at him. In for him Olivier thus saying, This man is your prisoner, exchange for Astolfo your carnal cousin. Orlando, hearing that Astolfo had been taken, was very sorry for this, but seeing the baron's power aroused, this exchange brought him joy. He was not defended from taking him to prison, feeling that he was so proud. In his heart he thought of making him a Christian and Macumeto denying him. Pagan people, thus escorted, seeing their guide and lord taken, as they could, welcomed themselves at the door. They all entered in great fury, many of whom were killed at that point by frank people full of courage. In less than an hour the people entered the door and immediately closed it. Once the Africans had left and the gates of the land were closed, our Christians all returned to the camp, where all the armed hosts were. Count Orlando with some captive companions took Isolia that time. He led him to Carlo's pavilion, Carlo, seeing this, asked, Who is this baron that you brought to me, who seems to me to be one of the pagan people? Orlando said, Dear Monsignor, 
this man is of supreme virtue and Isoleri is called by name, Lord of the city nearby. In all of paganism there is no longer a knight who has such virtue. The emperor said, let him be hanged immediately as a thief. You have no help in escaping, for I want no forgiveness for the pagans. Orlando said, haven't you known how he took the lead of King Otto, Astolfo, I say, my cousin of the flesh, who is better than this man or similar. If you had him hanged, the father of him, whom Astolfo has in prison, would quickly do something similar to him, who would not be more courteous than you. If he died, I would never be more sad, and you don't want it to be that way. Carlo replied without staying, Astolfo we will get back for treasure. I want this man to die on any terms, so that Astolfo will be restored for treasure. Orlando said to him in his heart, Yes or no this baron will die, Astolfo and I are of the same blood, that my heart will not bear death. And without saying anything more we leave, with Isoleri at the pavilion already. Immediately there were sergeants around, they took two barons to disarm, and disarmed as those mighty men were, they went to rest on a bed. Now you will hear, may God please you, just as Orlando regained Astolfo's singing in the other song and made the pagan. Christ look upon you from mountain to plain. Canto 12. To the name of he who has no appearance and without his name nothing is done, I want to return to the beautiful story of Charles, the great and true emperor. You who are around, I want to pray that you will all sit down and listen to me in peace. Now you will hear the story told, as the author remembers it. Gentlemen, I said in the other song of the battle that it was so hard, how King Isoleri had Astolfo taken inside the walls, and as Isoleri was placed on the plain by Olivier on this matter, Carloni Astolfo wanted to collect it for treasure and Orlando disputed it. Orlando having returned to the pavilion with Isoleri and rested somewhat, he was asked by King Isoleri whether he wanted to take holy baptism. Isolier replied very upset, if I were to cut everything off, Macon and Trevaganti my God for your Jesus I would not deny. You don't need to preach to me about this, because I wouldn't do it for whatever it is, indeed, you could cut my flesh, so that I could unburden myself of my faith. You can give me death and torment me, because you have held me at your mercy. Seeing Orlando's will so firm, she spoke to him without any other screen, since you don't want to wash and baptize yourself and return to my perfect life, I want to let you go to Pampelona or to another place where you delight. But I want you, before you leave me, to promise on your faith to send Astolfo my cousin back to me, or you will return to my little one. Isolia said, Baron, great reward. May our God defend you from death, since you want to leave me above faith and you want Astolfo, your cousin, to give you back. By that Macon in whom my heart believes, if my soul does not die, I will send Astolfo to you safe and sound or I will return to you, sovereign baron. Carlo Mano appealed to one of his barons and said, move without hesitation to Pampelona for the sake of Otto, if you could have him for silver, and say that he is your squire or scoundrel. Don't say it's of much value. The baron left with the embassy and left without staying any longer. And when he was near the city, he began to speak to those of the blackbirds, give me, pagan, the securtade, that I want to buy back my prisoner. Then he shouted a lot, surely he comes, without knowing. The door was then suddenly opened to him, the learned baron entered the city. At the palace, where Mazarigi was, the baron dismounted from his horse, he immediately mounted up the stairs. Up in the hall, where he stood, he spoke thus in front of him, as you will hear, sir, tell him. Ni first if placed in front, then he spoke of his likeness, that true God who took human flesh to free us from the ancient sentence in which the Christian people worship and have the highest faith and belief in him, save and maintain the Roman church and Carlo Mano and all his power. May your God Trevaganti and Macon save and maintain your religion. I have come before you, sir, for one whom you have taken from my people who is a man of little worth, for his sake I am lying here. If for silver, without any error, tell me, without keeping me in suspense. Is he your squires? Mazarigi said. Oil, said the baron, for Saint Denis. 
Hearing that Mazarigi was the squire of the baron he had imprisoned, he made Astolfo, the good warrior, come before him and asked him if he was that knight's sergeant. Astolfo replied, very angry, Nanny, whoever says it in his throat is lying, that I am neither a squire nor a sergeant. I am Astolfo, son of King Otto, who lords over all England, apart from the traitor Ganelone, I am richer, if my words do not err, than any knight Carloni has. All the English are under my greenhouse. I am Orlando's companion and cousin, under his banner I am a champion. The Baron, who was present when he wanted to buy Astolfo back, spoke no more and remained as if silent, hearing Astolfo speak in this way. Astolfo was sent back to prison and he was made to look at me first. And the Baron was bid farewell and he returned. Immediately he mounted his steed and began to ride out of the gate and towards the Emperor's pavilion the Baron went away without any other escort. He dismounted from his horse, his squire took his steed and carried it elsewhere. The Baron went into the pavilion in front of Carlo on his knees on the ground. And by telling him how the English Astolfo had said in front of the pagan that he was neither a squire nor a valet as the duke was, he made him a certain man. Carlo was very annoyed by this and placed his hand on his cheek. If we cannot have treasure, we should have another way. Orlando, hearing that Carlo wants to buy Astolfo back for treasure, immediately says to himself, silver and gold will not be given for him. With Isoleri he soon moved on and soon without staying at the pavilion they were gone and both rested on a bed. Orlando made him bear his weapons, and he was suddenly armed by sergeants. His destria made him present himself, Isolia was quickly mounted on it. Orlando had people accompany him near the entrance to that esteemed baron as far as he could throw a bow, near the walls which were loaded with arms. Then they all turned back and Isolia entered the city. The Africans made a great celebration of it, and many people went to meet him, some ran behind and some in front. Isolari dismounted at the palace in front of his father, king of the crown, who held Pampelona for Massilio. And Mazarigi saw him coming, he marveled at this greatly and greatly. Inver he began to say to him, Tell me, Trojan, vile coward and fool, how could you escape? Perhaps you turned to us, who allowed yourself to be beaten and beaten. Now I see you and I don't know when you will return. Isoleri said, if I was beaten, it was not a Paltonia or a Troyant who struck me, rather he was a master and well-known knight, the carnal brother-in-law of the Lord of Anglant. And I would never have surrendered myself to him, if not for the arrival of that handsome gentleman, Orlando, the Emperor's nephew, who has no better knight in the world and above my faith he has left me, and I must send him his prisoner, and so I have sworn to him on my faith, if not to him I must return. King Mazaridi said, You are wrong, it will be better for you to find another way, which I will never repay, if you do not make another agreement first. Isoleri said, It behooves me to return for that sacrament that I have made with that baron who is so good, I don't believe in my faith to make any other pact. If that baron doesn't want to make amends for me, tell me and I'll go away quickly. Mazarigi replied, Go away, what harm does your cowardice bring? Isolia left the palace to return to that lord of Anglant. His mother, seeing him in distress, then came to Mazarigi, saying to him, What do you think you will do, wicked man? May Macon and Trevaganti hurt you. Would you let your son go to prison among those Christians in such peril? If Massilio knew it, he would have you hanged like a thief by the throat, who holds him dearer than you in my faith. He is his nephew, you can never hide it, and he is your son and it doesn't seem like he is, who would let him go in this way. If he were your squire, it would be enough that you have no complaints about him. If you are not happy with this baron, upon our faith I promise you that Massilio, and his relatives will know about it. If Makumeto has any part in me, send these sergeants of yours for him, rather than let the perfect baron go away. Mazarigi sent two of his squires and made Isoleri return. And then he had the good Duke of England taken out of prison before him, and Isoleri took him by the hand saying, Understand me, Frank Baron, 
For the love of your courteous cousin I want you to return under his flagpole. Astolfo said, I don't care about him, because he is close to me. Isoleri immediately sent for Astolfo's armor and his horse, and suddenly, so as not to lie around, there were twenty sergeants for the armor. Armed as the baron is full of courage, he wanted to depart from that stalemate. King Isolia put his arm around his neck and accompanied him all the way down into the square, saying, Sir, out of your courtesy I want you to bring a beautiful steed to Count Orlando, full of vigor, and on my behalf you want to present him. Astolfo said, May Mary's son give you pain that you speak like this, already I am not Orlando's squire, since you want me to take the steed. I have nothing to do with Orlando that would put Jesus in trouble for you, in person and in having four men like him and even more so, and do you now want to make me his sergeant to lower my honor and virtue? If you want to present the horse to him, he will send one of your vassals after me. When I am inside the pavilion, where Charles is with his barony, I will show him Milo's son and then give him the steed to be at his mercy. Isolia brought in a beautiful drone, which had no company of goodness, from Vigliantino onwards and from Morello one cannot find one so good or so beautiful. He covered the steed with scarlet and had a dexterous infantryman mount it, saying, Bring this to the good warrior Orlando, son of Milan Danglant. Astolfo, and the squire left, Isolia commands him to Treviganti. Outside of Pampelona the two went out and towards the field riding around. Once Astolfo and that pagan had arrived inside the camp of our Christians, they went to the pavilion of Carlo Mano, who was together with his sovereign barons. Dismounting their steeds down to the floor, they were near the pavilion. As Astolfo was inside, he looked at what Carlin sent to collect. He went towards him very angry with the brand in his hand wanting to give it to him, saying, Shameless traitor, you can redeem me as your squire. Duke Nemo rose to his feet, seeing Astolfo speak thus, he took him by the arm, saying, Shut up, don't have such fallacious thoughts. Astolfo then returned, he thought he should hurt himself for the love of Duke Nemo and was somewhat ashamed, and now he was in front of the Emperor Charles. Saying this, he knelt on the ground, Monsignor, your son is a traitor. I don't know what he has to do with Isolia, who now sends him a steed. Carlo, laughing, replied, Duke, who should I trust more than him? Everything should be done for him, for without him we can do little. The whole innkeeper seems to be shining for him, I don't think he wanted to miss out. Then Astolfo stood up, Orlando had shown that Pagano. The pagan went in front of Orlando and immediately knelt down, and greeted him in Saracen speaking, saying, Monsignor, Isoleri present here sends you greeting, and shows him the strong and running steed, and says that you hold him for his love, who in the whole world it doesn't have a better one. Orlando left Carlo's pavilion with that pagan and returned to him, the sergeants took the horse from him. He gave one hundred peasants to the pagan and then had his people accompany him to the door and he went inside. And the knight will stay away and return to the pavilion without a home. And while the count was under his tent, a messenger came to him in haste, saying, May God of glory defend you and his mother the blessed virgin, a city is not the one who defends it, the people of this country are cursed and noble by name, certainly looked at by few people. If you ride hard, sir, you will be without any doctrine, the city has so few people that they have no power to defend it. There is a gate, of which there is certainly no memory of any guard, the one that goes towards Saragossa is kept open several times at night. Because they don't do anything in person, no guards will do anything to you. The one that comes towards Pampelona, guards are there day and night. Orlando, hearing what he was saying, locked him in the pavilion without deception, so that he would not tell anyone and the Emperor Charles would not know. Orlando had all his men armed, twenty thousand and six hundred that he had, he told his companions this matter and in the evening everyone moved. In the direction of Nobile they began to go, at midnight the people of June, and the great brigade gathered near the walls, perhaps at an arch. Then Orlando calls the Marquis Olivieri, Olivier quickly came to him. He said, 
With 3,000 knights you move quickly without any further appeal towards the walls of these proud pagan summers. On the other side the Cimbello begins. Olivier left with that escort and quickly approached the door. Then Orlando said to the Lord of England, Astolfo, son of the strong King Otto, who went down from one side of the earth, with three thousand people on horseback with him, and began the war with Pagan. Astolfo said, You are a great champion, you want nothing more than to command, and leave without further delay. Orlando remained on one side with fourteen thousand in his place and nine paladins, each prized. In the face of the city everyone quickly approaches for battle fully equipped. Astolfo and Olivier, without stopping, began to climb the walls boldly without fear. Our Christians were thus lined up on three sides to want to begin the battle, and the heavy flock. Without any instrument being sounded, everyone came towards the wall. Now you will hear the other singing that powerful battle. May Christ look upon you and his joyful mother. Canto 13. I turn to you, blessed virgin, who gave birth to our Lord Jesus to redeem the damned people, who must all go to the depths, so that my mind may be adorned by you so that I know how to follow this story well, without causing any harm or harm to anyone, let it please all those who hate it. Sir, on the other side I lay down just as Orlando and the other paladins were around Norbiel, all stretched out to do battle with those Saracen dogs. Now listen, rude and courtly, middle-aged and old, great and small, that I intend to show you by reason how the Picardy Samson died. Since our Christians were lined up, the twenty thousand in three parts and six hundred, close to the walls of Nobile, of the twenty thousand already more than three hundred were mounted above the walls. The dead guards were tormented, and citizens begin to wake up, alarm. Alarm. Each one shouting. The people of the land were armed and quickly rushed to the walls, Christian people mounted on the wall, those of Orlando's mighty group, had already not been defeated at all nor had they left the wall at all. Contra and Pagani show their goodness and enter the city with great force. Then they fired the fire into the gate, from above the gate they heated the bridge and fourteen thousand entered inside, who were with the brave and strong count. Up the stairs those pagans mounted and recoiled in spite of them and in disgrace, giving and taking away with spears and stones, many Christians were sad and lax. Count Orlando entered the land with fourteen thousand, and then six hundred. Each, long live Carlo. Already shouting, and Count Orlando full of valor. Those Saracens came to the aid of each other, throwing stones without remission, many Christians were killed and some were wounded and thrown off their horses. And stones rained down abundantly and thickly as a storm falls, it was very easy to miss out on life, shattering their arms, legs and heads. Such was the power of the Christians that, in spite of the Alpine people, they mounted themselves in the main square and there they grabbed all their mouths. The author says and the book shows me, before any sightings were in the square, more than three hundred of our people were wounded and killed by those pagans. In the square everyone gets inked, still looking like strong warriors. It was already early morning and earlier when the battle began. Inside the palace, which was in the square, he had locked up a thousand pagans of those merciless and ferocious people with stones and darts and saurian bows, throwing hard at our haughty people. The Christians could not be approached, but they were still going around jungle, waiting to fight then for the day. The Marquis Olivieri fought on one side with his brave people, in any way they could not last against people who had climbed to the walls, who each defended themselves so well. Anyone who approached lost their life. Of course, those who don't want to move on from this life will begin to stay behind. And of the three thousand who had Olivieri, a hundred and more were taken away. Astolfo with three thousand knights, on one side closely and thickly, so accost the ruthless and proud ones, shouting loudly, Surrender, you fools, for if they want to defend themselves for you, you will all be burned and burned. On the walls stood the Africans with tabby bows, darts and spears, throwing many stones at our people, wounding some in the head, some in the cheeks. Anyone who got too far in front of them suffered many blows, more than three hundred were injured and perhaps twenty lost their lives. 
That battle lasted a long time, our Christians set the door on fire. Seeing themselves and Pagani in such travail, everyone is greatly discouraged. Our Christians are on the alert and each one is comforted to go up, each one shouting, Come on, precious people, the land is ours without another being cut off. As Christian began to climb the walls of that city, pagan all began to flee, a large number of them died. The door was soon opened with the fire that his goodness brought about. Despite those who were unhappy about it, our Christians then entered it. Not all of them had even entered before finding pagan knights who had been sent here by Massilio, inside the door they encountered Christians, and those pagans were not warned that they had to be at their hands with them, since on their arrival the book said that they wanted to go to Pampelona. English Astolfo, mighty baron, already faced all his people and in front of those knights he clashed, ten thousand of whom were the Africans, shouting, Long live, long live King Carloni. Start shouting in this guise. Pagans together all shout out loud, Long live Massilio. To death! To death! Astolfo stood up on his good steed, held the shield in his arms and gripped the lance, broached the running and light steed, and wounded a pagan with a bad tip of such a merciless and proud blow on the shield across the middle of the belly. How many weapons he had on him he did not defend, who immediately laid him dead on the ground. Astolfo turned to another, who had a banner of a baron, he forcibly removed the helmet from his head. Astolfo quickly turned to another and struck him with a spear in his chest, no armor paid him any respect, from one side to the other he passed him and threw him dead to the ground. The duke could not have the spear, Miss Lee drew it out and then brandished it above those pagans with ill will and, turning around her, made them feel it. It made one fear well, anyone who tried it could curse it, and recalling Trevigante or Macon was of no avail against Ottone's faith. Astolfo truly looked like a dragon with a sword in his hand full of brains, he made a lake of blood on the ground, tearing apart hearts, lungs and guts. He never got rid of this group, like Astolfo of those wicked people, ears, noses, arms, feet and hands and heads fell down of those pagans. Astolfo fought hard, and his people slept nothing about him, each one seemed to be a biting dragon, so much above the pagans did he wound everyone. Every Christian shouted loudly, Mongoia. Saint Dionysius always live and long live Charles and the Roman Church and anyone who believes in the Christian faith. The pagans all shouted, Mongoia. Long live King Marsilian and long live Falserone and Balaganti and let the unbelieving King Carloni and the traitor Orlando, Sir Danglant, Denise Ugieri, and Duke Namon die. Let those who believe in Jesus of Nazareth die, who was made to faint by the Jews. So everyone shouted on his behalf and stopped from hurting no one, and like people who knew the art well, they gave each other many blows. Here, there, down, up, aside. Who knew me, he roasted himself with the brando. Thus the people, fighting together, lasted a long time, giving and taking away. There were many of those dogs killed and wounded, and the same among the Christians, the Christians were very dismayed by the overpowering of the African people, who were three of them as many and well equipped and did as well as able-bodied people. Our Christians could not last, in spite of their need to retreat. The good English duke was driven out of the gate with all his men. While fleeing he encountered the good Marquis Olivieri of Vienna, the mighty sir. Said Olivier, what is the matter, courteous baron? Why do you run away so strongly? Astolfo said, much of my people have been cut off by renegade people. As many as ten thousand are in one line, I have fought a great deal with them. I lost many of them in the first season and my people received great damage. He took the Marquis from outside Altachiera, when he heard Astolfo's speech, and saw those people standing in a row, and shouted, Knights, turn, turn. All the Christians gathered together and turned against the Saracens. The Africans expected nothing from them, towards Pampelona their chimneys took place. Our Christians soon entered Nobile in Pampelona, and went to those bastards. A messenger in Orlando had gone to tell him how Astolfo was being chased away. Orlando, hearing this news, spoke to Gualteri de Monlion, saying to him, 
four thousand of our beautiful people, all mounted, and defend from those people the bad Astolfo Duke, son of King Otto. Gualteri left with those people and left the square intact. And while riding the mighty Gualteri he clashed with fellow Astolfo and the Marquis Vivieri of Vienna, he well knew the Griffin's banner. Mongoia San Dionigi, Knights. Gualteri shouted without question. Olivieri, and Astolfo the like, long live Carlo Imperieri, and the Sir of Anglant. Reverse of the pagans they turned loudly shouting, to death. To death! Olivieri, and Astolfo entered the great press fighting hard. There was no shelter for the pagans, they were all dead and left to a sad fate. Seeing this, they soon began to flee as martyrs outside the door. Our barons remained victorious, together all four had a great celebration. What is Orlando? Olivieri asked with sweet sermons. At this inquiry from Turpino and the other companions Gualteri said, he is by his power against those who dispute with us, in spite of them he has taken the square. Without saying any more I went to the square, where the brave Count Orlando was. The sun had shown its clear splendor and was illuminating the universe. All the Christians together found themselves fighting around the palace. Those above, throwing stones and arrows, made many of them muzzards. The mighty Samson of Picardy went up the stairs of the palace to want to demonstrate his strength, the Sala was already no pleasure to him. From up on the palace a large stone came, rolling hard with a large tread, and struck Samson's helmet, and the helmet and the bearded woman smashed. And his brains went into his mouth, and he fell dead to the ground. This news soon breaks to Orlando, how the serene knight had died. Almost out of pain for the steed, he overflows and out of pain everything collapses, saying, O oh, may Topin, that I have lost the best baron I ever had and the most knowledgeable. Oh, you wretch, how badly I have done then I lost myself as a baron. Well, anyone can call me mad and lazy, cowardly, foolish and rascal, that I don't believe such a powerful and suitable baron is in our legion. True God, how have you suffered that this baron is deserted from life? Orlando del Picardo made a great lament, and he ordered him to be buried, no baron was anything slow in burying that bold baron. Turpin de Rana, a vigorous bishop, was then dressed to say mass, so earthly in the sacred square, that the mighty Sanson buried there. Sapelito that the mighty baron was, Orlando said, let the fire come and set this city on fire quickly and then we can go around. Those pagans, the wicked people, when they heard this talk about the fire, immediately surrendered to the Christians and no longer fought against their defense. And those who were reduced to the stairs came to the count to ask for wages. Those of the city then all believe in the true God of glory, men and women with jockeys and cherubs were baptized to the Christian faith. El Forte Orlando ran through the city inside and outside all the districts. And Orlando wanting to depart and return to the camp in Pampelona, five hundred knights full of courage then left it to Nobile to watch, and to a baron who had to follow and do all his commandments. Then he ordered everyone and Christian, who had died, to be buried. The author tells me that five hundred Christians were killed in life, all were buried with great honor, as is required of good people. The tears were cruel and painful, some from his partner and some from his relatives. Orlando left without any other cripples, as all the bodies were buried. In Pampelona they took Count Orlando and his great brigade away. When it was heard in the camp that Orlando had taken that city, everyone rejoiced greatly and a great noise was made throughout the camp, everyone saying round and round, Orlando is also the flower of the whole world. Gand upon Thierry, a rude traitor, as he understood this news, went to Carlo Mano's pavilion and immediately got down on his knees. Monsignor Charles, sovereign emperor, because of your misfortune there is such a crime that, without your knowledge, he left and went to Norbil this night. And he fights it as madmen do, of his people more than five hundred are dead and ruined due to his madness, the best he had and the most daring. If he often had such traits, we would be left with pain and torment. Samson of Picardy also died in this fight, which was not to say funny. 
Hearing Carlo say these words about the great damage and about Orlando's guilt, he swore to the Supreme Sir that he would make him repent and that he would feel it down to his bones and pulp. Now he strengthens his singing and follows well and how Orlando didn't earn him blame before Carlo, and how he got the glove. May Christ cover us all with his mantle. Canto 14. In the name of Jesus, Lord Wright, who was killed and nailed by the Jews for us to redeem on the cross, I want to tell the beautiful story. You, good people, without shutting up, kindly listen to me, and I will tell you, without further flaws, why Orlando went to Lamesh. Orlando having returned from Norbiel, as I left him there on the other hand, to Pampelona in the arrived camp, making everyone very happy, Dusnamo of Bavaria had clashed, I think he was the wisest man ever. Dusnamo said, Welcome the Count who is the supreme river and source of prowess. God keep you, Orlando said then. Duke Nemo said, For my love he goes homeless to your pavilion, do not turn in front of Charles the Emperor, because he is still full of pride. Orlando said, Why is he in such pain? He is strongly against you and is afraid of you being offended. Orlando said, By that true God, who is Lord of all the world, that first I will dismount to the pavilion of the Holy Emperor, since I haven't gone far enough to go to him, I should be afraid. If Sanson, and the other people died, I am sad and sorrowful more than King Charles. What I did, I did for good and to increase Christianity. If Samson, and the others had trouble going to fight the city, it would not be right to blame me, because I went there with my freedom, since if my departure were known, perhaps the land would not be lost. Had. Dusnamo said, if you want to go around, go, do whatever you like. Orlando left, without saying any more, to Carlo Mano, and did not stay any longer. On his knees he spoke with great boldness, God of glory, true Lord, save, guard and maintain Charles' hand, King of Christianity, Roman Emperor. Charles towards him with a strong witty face spoke with such a look, for a thousand times you are the evil comer, filthy bastard, wicked whore, who have raised so much pride against me, that without my word, Sir Danglant, with my people you depart and go and make me as your sergeant. Tonight you left with my people and you caused five hundred to die. Samson of Picardy, mighty baron, through your folly you have made him so turn. I will be sorry for my life, so full of courage was that Samson. Seven cities are not worth as much as those who are poor at having them. I never value the value of a needle in all the time of my life, if I don't pay you for such a fault, you will never do such madness again. Orlando turned to him like a dragon and promptly replied to Carlo, Carlo, if she was the death of my people, you already have nothing to do about it. You do not pay him with gold or silver, rather the Roman church pays him, and he gives twenty thousand less than six hundred, so that he always keeps them in his defense in every part where war I hear that Christian and the Saracens are in conflict, with these people I must go there and do all good for the holy faith. So if five hundred or less or more of my people are dead or so, the Church of Rome will hire the Holy Apostolic for two. Carlo became even more angry, and having an iron glove in his hand, he threw it at Orlando, who did not hold back, and that glove landed in his cheek. With such great force that glove struck, that Orlando almost forgot all about it, three drops of blood came out of his nose, and everyone and the whole barony who was there then were amazed, because God's messenger announced it in Aspromonte that never he couldn't be injured without losing blood. Orlando, seeing that Carlo had struck him with such a blow, was enraged with great pride and Derladena was expelled, and he ran towards Carlo, who would have had his head cut off. Dusnamo of Bavaria and the good Dane immediately took his arm, saying, Count, do not be overcome by the anger of being so mad against Charles, who, as the world turns, would like you to be made master. His mind sighs with great pain for the love of Samson, so suitable, you should be more happy than others with admonishing or chastising him. Orlando said, Never was it given to me by anyone with a sword or with a hand who did not pay for it in my own power, this is what I think I would do to Carlo Mano. I will go to such a place that no Christian will ever see me again. And without saying any more sermon, 
he left and went to the pavilion. Count Orlando went away very angry and, having had his people disarm him, he went on a bed sighing, saying, True God who has no equal, I am always raising up the holy church and to make it multiply even more, but the imperia showed me such contempt, as if he were a jockey, in front of his college. Orlando lamented so much all day that no one could console him, he seemed sullen from the great shame and did not want to drink or eat. And Carlo Mano, adorned emperor, so that he could not leave, called the good Dane of the March and the mighty Marquis of Vienna. And he said to them, Frankish barons, go to the pavilion of the son of Milo and Vigliantino, take away from him and Derlindana, who carries the gallon, and present her here before me, because I have great suspicion for the hit, which she had obscene and larder, do not let her go out of anger this night. The barons departed presently and went to the pavilion of Sir Danglant. Terrigi, his squire, infantryman and sergeant, can be found in front outside the pavilion. Olivier said, go imminently without speaking to anyone, and with Orlando Vigli and Tino's steed you will take the path of Nobile. Don't tell Orlando or anyone, on Carlo's side you are imperieri. Terrigi left Pampolona with Vigliantino, a powerful steed, without speaking to Orlando or anyone, and took his paths towards Norbil. Olivieri, and the Dane entered, they found Count Orlando in the bed. Said the Dane, Gracious Count, God of glory save you and keep you. Why are you so sad? Why does so much madness reign in you if Carlo Mano, the joyful emperor, is indignant at your failure against you? Can't the emperor do what he wants? And he is right if he feels sorry for you. If Carlo Man with pride gave you, as a father you must suffer the gods. There's no need for you to be disdainful, nothing can be denied to your uncle. Carlo possesses all of Christianity, he has no courage against him. The best there is and the most powerful, if he were to beat him, he would say nothing. If he punishes you, there is no shame in you, as a son he can punish you, in this world Carlo does not dream of conquering Spain except for you. Let us let go of every lie, and no longer think about this. Orlando said, Denise, Denise, I think I'm leaving this country. Olivieri of Vienna had spoken and said, Sweet brother-in-law and companion, for my love I want you to be prayed for, do not be angry against Charlemagne. If you leave, he will be left saddened and the Christians will gain badly, without you the camp will be worth nothing, which will be attacked day and night. They will be dead and Christian will be in great trouble, as he will have no regrets. If you leave and go elsewhere, you will not be happy with your life. Christianity will be extinguished and you know it, that Saracen will not be afraid, hearing that you will have left here, everyone above us will be more daring. Since you conquer Christiani in this way, who will carry the neighborhood sign? No one will be powerful to guide it, which is honored by all flags. I have never seen anyone more powerful. For my love, stop your thoughts. Orlando said, Denise and Olivieri, don't give me any more thoughts. Olivieri and the Dane each looked around the pavilion to see if they could see Count Orlando's strong sword, at that point they could not see it, because Orlando, who was already delaying nothing, thinking he was afraid of losing it, had placed it under his bed, so that the barons go away without it. They then reached Carlo speaking thus, we have the steed Vigliantino, the sword Derlindana, which Orlando has under his bed to all the lesser of him, already we could not have that brand of him. We sent the Destria along the way, the beautiful Nobile has gone and is commanded by your side. Carlo believed that Orlando remained on the good steed that had been taken from him, that he would not leave and that he would not go away, but his thoughts on this matter were so foolish that he did not seem to be learned about his steeds. When he was a little loose from sleep, he went to call Terrigi the squire, but he did not find Terrigi nor his steed. And not finding the horse or the sergeant, he was greatly dismayed by this. The fact was immediately thought of, he immediately went to arms. Under his scorn the sharp sword was placed, then he was completely adorned with helmet, beard, harpoon, plates and shield and everything else that was his job. The surcoat, which he usually wore wherever he went, one with a lion on it and the one inside the pavilion he threw. 
he immediately took away the good steed, which Isilia sent and saddled him. The brave baron mounted it with great melancholy and great pain. It was midnight when that cheerful baron left Pampelona, without saying a word while already walking, saying, Supreme God, Lord of the world, please, put me on this path and path, so that I am not put to the bottom of life, and before I return among the Christians, I do great harm on the pagans. And then he thought of calling himself Leonardo after the expelled nobile. Now let us leave Orlando here to ride the night until the day was lightened, I want to return to Carlo Mano, who had sent to Orlando's pavilion to find out if he was there and did not find him, whereby Carlo was very saddened. When it became known in the camp that Orlando, that short baron, had left, all the people went shouting, let the emperor die. Let Carlo be dead. Carlo, having listened to such sermons, seemed to him to be in an evil port. Dusnamo of Bavaria immediately moved, to such a beating with a thousand knights and then rounded up all the people. Carlo appealed to the Marquis Olivieri saying, Come here, mighty baron, of twenty thousand six hundred warriors I want you to be captain now at present, and bring this standard to the neighborhoods, so that the Pagani, these noble people, believe for certain that Orlando is there. Olivier removed from the headquarters the banner of twenty thousand on horseback and six hundred, he immediately resigns everyone, saying, do my commandment. None of them already disdains anything, each one likes to make the talent of him. And Olivier wandered around the earth, waging, more than before, harsh war. The pagans all believed that Orlando was the one who led them, they retreated up the walls and each one shouted against the Christians, by us you will be consumed and destroyed. Our Christians no one approached. 20,600 every day in Pampelona all around. Let's leave the camp in Pampelona, since everyone is saddened by Orlando. I want to return to Count Orlando that for two days and two nights he rode without anything to drink or eat, so he was greatly dismayed. One day on the ninth he heard a great noise, so he was afraid and crossed himself and prayed to God, saying, Father of the Celestial Kingdom, what is this noise that I hear? Out of your mercy, please manifest and protect me today from torment in this place which is so strange. And as he rode he brought out his brando and often turned his face to his face, marking. With Derlin Dana, who belonged to King Almonte, Orlando went after that fight. As he went he came to a fountain which Merlin artfully made. As soon as the strong count arrived there, he began to look at the source. Here, sir, how Merlin had that part built for art. The book says that the fountain is square and on each side there was a strong marble man who was blowing with a steel hammer, beating so much that the wild beast would not go to drink from it in any way or how much or how much, and to each man it was written, as you will hear told here. We will never stop toiling nor will our hammering ever end until the best knight in this world comes here to drink. Orlando, who was full of so many obstacles, read those letters round and round, then he dismounted his steed and drank, once he had drunk, that beating stopped. Orlando was amazed when he saw that the beating had remained like this, and he turned towards heaven saying, O Lord God, glorified Father, my soul and body, my Lord, I give you back. Don't leave me so badly off. And he gave water to his steed and went away, calling God, Son of Mary. As he went he encountered elephants, lions, deer, lions and leopards, buffaloes and deer and many wolves, of every animal young and old, birds behind, around and in front. They weren't even brave enough to touch it. Orlando riding away in fear, calling God and his pure mother. He rode the son of Milo as close to the sea and carried him off, and on land there was a pavilion of a ship which remained there. On land was the helmsman with his master who had no good wind to go, and there stands with great joy a master with sixty sailors. Orlando, who saw them from afar, studied the passage that it seemed to him that a thousand years had passed for those people to come to eat who had gone three days without eating. Now you will hear, may God lead you, sir, the story in the other singing. I pray that God, who is worthy of honor, may rest you in the blessed kingdom. Canto 15. Most solemn king of high glory, 
Father and Lord of Christianity, whose nature and virtue he remembers, Governor of the University, grant me the gift of this history, praised be your great majesty, and may your name be grace and praise, and fun time for those who hear it. I counted it to you, sir, on the other side, just as Orlando, son of Milan, left Pampelona with great tears, where King Charles is with the Christian crowd, gave him the blow with his glove, whereupon he got poisonous sorrow, and went riding only the count, and the great miracle that appeared at the source. And he said how near the sea he saw a pavilion with people under him, where his mind laughs with joy. To get there quickly, the horse broke into a trot due to the desire to eat which conquered him, and there he thought of taking the brunt. And he came to the pavilion and said his greeting, with reverence it was returned to him. And under the pavilion he had as many as one hundred Saracens who had disembarked from the ship and taken to port, as there was no wind, they waited to cool off in this way. Seeing the Count's courage, which resembled the Lord of Great Lands, the master of the ship asked him where he was from, the Count replied, Dorolo. I believe, sir, that it is clear to you that Carlo Mano, over the years, has waged war with his army, and the great barony and countries of Spain. One of his nephews of great vigor with twenty thousand six hundred gathered from Pampelona immediately moved, he was not there to demonstrate possession of him. At a city, which is called Nobile, ten miles away from Pampelona, he attacked him at night with his brigade. People from within take no remedy, for him it was taken and little opposed, he entered with his entire family. Of the citizens who all died were those who were not baptized, be sure. As you can see, I was the only one who left, riding away as if desperate. Sacrament I give you by our God that for three days now I have not eaten, neither I nor my horse. I am little restful during the day and at night. By Makumeto I ask you to eat, because I am so hungry that I cannot see the light. He had the master bring him something to eat, the count reigned in his steed, he took food to comfort himself and ate what he had to do. He ate so much that it amazed the master and each captain. They all say, Macon, may you guide the world, I have never seen anyone eat like this. If he were so early in arms and as learned in eating, he seems to have power, and he would put King Charles below him, he would be feared throughout the world. Orlando remains silent, and doesn't say a word. When he has eaten what he likes, he takes the horse and reinserts it to ride on the pagan earth. Instead of him taking the path to go, he spoke to that master not like a madman, I deserve Makumeto, God, give you the great honor you have done me. May Apollon defend you from all evil. Then I ate it, I want to ride fast. The master said, friend, wait a little, the price is paid in advance on the spot. The count replied, for my loyalty I have no money, neither silver nor gold, poor, I left my city, driven out, as I said, by those. The master said, in truth you will pay the price without abode. Certainly at my expense you will not fill yourself, you will leave your arms or your horse here. The count, who hears what the pagan asks, replied, in good faith I am never used to going on foot anywhere. It is my custom to always go armed for that Macon that the soul gave me. The master said, You won't fool me. And it came to him with more than twenty runs to give him, the count didn't even flinch and brought out the strong Derlin Dana and brandished her like a knight. In verse of the pagans nothing delays, boldly flat strikes as much as he can and no one cares. Whatever he touches, his life ends. Fighting with popular paganism, he wisely spoke to himself, Alas, how great is my cowardice in saying that, with a sword made like this, my person, with it in my hand, should fight strongly against such people. Thinking thus to himself, however, he put the sword in or drew it out, and then he struck that master with his glove, he died and never moved again. The sailors fleeing in great fear, seeing their master lying on land, Orlando followed him across the plain. Sad is the one who wanted to stay close to him. And it wasn't worth his armor's blows, so he crumpled hard and often. For more than seven, the baron cheerfully spent their life in this world. Seeing this fact, the sailors said, Sir, don't strike any more, we will give you supplies and money, you will be obeyed by all of us. 
We will never be stingy with anything and will place you wherever you want. Then, when the Count understands this, he no longer waits to harm them. Furthermore, the Count is not bothered by wounding him, he asked the sailors if the wind is good for sailing. As far as you like, I have decided to go to Persia. Everyone replied, the sea is calm, of you serving us is a grace and a gift. So I will mount the sea and load Orlando's good steed, dear sir. Raise the sails and set out to sea with the fresh north wind. The day and the night without remaining to do the ship guides the pagan people and, as the sea is used to do, moved cruel and rude fortune. Contrary winds where they fly, this way and that the ship hits them. And the sea was in such great fortune, even beyond what port it could ever take, that there was nothing left on the ship to eat anything else. The day to the sun and the night to the moon, each fast agreed, to stay. Then, as pleased that which is the greatest light, one morning it leads him to the port. Before the ship has reached port, Orlando looks out of the marina, he saw a large city, which was besieged by an army of Saracen people, and asked the sailors that time, tell me if you know the doctrine of that land which is under such strong siege, who owns it and why it is so. One of those sailors, who was the wisest, said, Sir, in truth the city is called Lamesh in our language, and that siege is there for a lady. Of what and how clearly I will tell you, then what your mind desires to know. Soldan is called the one who is lord of it, because besieged I will tell you the tenor. This Soldan, of whom the earth is all, has a daughter who is so beautiful, that the one for whom Troy was destroyed, I do not think had as much beauty as she. There is no ugly feature in her, every virtue seems to shine in hers. The lord of Persia asked the loving lady of her father to marry her. He calls himself King Machident, who is well over a hundred years old. Her father didn't want to give it to her, she doesn't want it and he's not happy. The innkeeper sees the large gathering around Machident. The count said, put me on the ground, I want to go and see this war. Having descended to the ground, the brave count mounted his horse, which cannot be supported, wherever he goes, whether on plains or up mountains, it is convenient for him to lead his horse slowly. If he has to cross a river without a bridge, great harm comes to him because of the pain, and between him and the horse he came so close that he was already almost ready to die. Due to the humidity of the water, the knight had rusty armor on his back, he wriggled on his steed, like someone who rode hard. When that noble warrior reached the camp, everyone said, Do you see what a big man he is? And everyone made mockery and torment of him, and he remained silent about it. He was asked in the camp what he was looking for and he said how he had been expelled from Spain and what money he wanted for need. How many men do you want to get paid for? The people said, and he replied, I would like a penny for a hundred people who would like my condition. The people took pleasure in him, the whole camp seemed to draw on him. He was as torn as if he were a madman, it seemed to them that he didn't even care. There was no sergeant or boy who did not mock and torment him. To make him a greater legion, take him to Machident's pavilion. The Count, in order not to be known, was struggling on his horse, it didn't seem like he had ever been on a horse, nor is he known to Orlando. When he came to that Machident, he fell to his knees, speaking thus, Apollonus, Macon and Trevaganti save, guard and keep Machident, defeat and defeat Carlo Mano, Turpin of Rana, Angelier of Bayona, Denise Ugieri and Gano of Maganza and four sons of Nemo and his person, Orlando, the strong Roman champion, who wants to bring Spain's crown, everyone who believes in Jesus Christ, let make an abate and always make him sad. I stood up straight after he greeted him, and Machident immediately asked him, from what country did you come here? Orlando immediately spoke to him, I am from Spain, born of noble blood from a city that was called Norbeel, which a nephew of Charles took over for a short time, and there was no one to contest it. What I had was stolen and taken away from me, I had nothing left as a treasure. For my life to live I am gathered here, I want to be a soldier of your people. And Machidan looks him in the face. What money would you like, mighty baron? Answer, I would like a hundred percent, but I certainly wouldn't take it for less. 
When the gentleman understood what he had told us, he said, Baron, you are asking for too much money. Go on, Makumeto will curse you for demanding such high prices. My little boy Polina, so perfect, would be enough for what you spread. He also goes riding on your journey, for I do not want people of such great advantage. The sorrowful count departed, he mounted his horse, venomous with anger. He rides away, he goes all thoughtful and often sighs in his heart. His mind cannot find rest, here and there he wanders across the field, mocked by those who see him in every corner, seeing him and the horse there is not so much. Those gluttonous Saracens, miserable and lax, come after him, making a noise, some throwing earth and some stones at him, and he rides away with great pain towards the city with slow steps, and still says in his heart, they will still avenge me of these knocks for the god who led everything well. He arrived at the gate of that city. The guard said, who is the knight? Orlando replied, of strange lands, I would like money, which makes me a living. The guard let him go around without any other care and he rides away with great thought. The innkeepers said about him, here he has good food and drink, and here you will have plenty for your horse and whatever you need. Come here, may make and defend you, you will be well served by us. The count does not answer, although he understands, because it seems that we are saying this, and painful in his heart it is called, who has no silver and longs to eat. It is better for me to do greater penance, than if I ate, it would be better for me to pay. The hosts wouldn't want to believe me. Oh well, I have no money to give them. It is not my intention to leave the horse, I would not like to take the weapons off my back. What evil befell Charles, King of France, when he put his glove on my cheek? For him I am led in such a way and in strange lands between enemies that I cannot find a hotel, neither small nor large I know here. Now if the kings Sonotto and Olivieri and Turpino and the other friends were with me, I would take this city with them, and then I would have something to drink and eat. Trotting trotting Orlando rode, still in the saddle holding his hands, and everything on the horse was wriggling. Those of the earth, small and middle-sized, each shouted loudly from behind because he was from strange countries, Ah, what an evil lord or vassal, who never put you on horseback with arms. The count arrived in the great square, where is the palace of that great Soldano, who was painted on all sides, and had the arms of every great pagan. According to what the author tells me and tells me, he found the son of that sovereign. Sansonetto was called by name, and he greeted him in this way, Apollinus, Macon, and Treviganti, look after you and save yourself, noble damsel, and let anyone who is of your faith erring, let Macon put him down and make him a fool, and also put down the false machident who it is ruining your beautiful country. And Sansonetto looked at him and immediately asked him where he was. The Count replied, I was born in Spain, from a city that is called Noble, and that Count Orlando with his great companion, who is in the pay of the Church of Rome, entered there one night with great people. Without storms that free hair took the earth and whoever didn't beat it was dead and whoever didn't disappeared was taken. To escape from the hands of that wicked man without money he put me on the path, so I suffered from much discomfort, eating little bread and drinking wine. By name I am called Leonardo, I would like money, since I am a wretch and have been expelled from my land, and I am very hungry for food. Sansonetto then lost a lot of it. He said, how much money would you like? Count Orlando replied that he would like a hundred knights money or more. Sansonetto replied, it would be enough for Polinera that he has so much virtue. Come to my father and yes you will agree. Yes or no, you will eat with me. The Count never felt so happy because he was so eager to eat. With Sansonetto he quickly went to the palace without staying. Gentlemen, I will tell you the great feat that Orlando did in singing, how Amastanti was killed for him. May Christ of heaven give you paradise. Canto 16. O Virgin Mary of full grace, O just mirror, O everlasting light, O divine virtue, serene star, mercy that always shines, consoler of every earthly soul, eternal glory that brings every good, out of your holy mercy which satisfies everyone, grant me a little of your grace, 
so that with delightful rhymes you adorn the beautiful story, so that those who listen to it are so delighted that they come back to hear me, more the second time than the first time. You who spend your days listening, sit in peace here, gathered people, and I will tell you the great feat that Orlando performed due to his pride. On the other side I left you suspended just as Orlando, Carlo's nephew, was expected to go to Soldano due to the great hunger that struck him inside. With Sansonetto lying at the palace was Count Orlando, who can do so much. The horse was led to the stable, as is customary, he was quickly unsaddled. When Orlando saw the horse placed inside the stable, he spoke to Sansonetto, I want to govern my horse myself and I want to give it the fodder with my own hands, and stay close to him with all fours of my arms, so that he can see it being consumed with my eyes. It was soon brought to him, as he said, and she saw him eat it before he left. And Sansonetto, the esteemed damsel, seeing the Count behave in this way, said to himself the slender youth, this must be a man of great power. Go up the stairs of the beautiful palace, where the Soldano was sitting on a chair, in a large room, painted and decorated in all directions. Count Orlando knelt before that Soldan, speaking humbly. In the Saracen language the Count said, Salvi make in thy lordly power, and whoever comes against you, Lord, overthrow and dispel and make him vile. If it pleases you, I ask you for money and I promise to serve your command. And that Soldano, full of bad talent, melancholy and with great pride, said to him, Don't fight me, go away, I never want soldiers. Sansonetto was then quick and attentive. He said to the baron, Come here and you will eat. That pagan orders his sergeants to have every food brought to him. The count ate to fill his coffer like a peasant, without any customs, drinking and eating he made such a racket that even his throat seemed like a river. He had broken into several foods, even due to hunger he could see no light. Look at that family's madness and everyone is greatly amazed at this. And so being at the sold and a messenger came, saying to him, On horseback, sir, mount, for Machident will be here now, he encounters some rides. He is already close to marrying your daughter, he is already inside, don't wait any longer. When Soldano heard this news, great pain and shame took hold of his heart. He mounted his horse with his barony to go against the one who, in spite of him, wants his daughter as a wife at his mercy, who was the sister of that Sansonetto, and on the way that Machident, a cursed old man, met him in the dirt. With reverence together we greet each other, with false laughter we hold hands. Then I dismounted at the noble palace, up the stairs I immediately went up. Jesters and musicians with great amusement with other people and gentlemen follow into the room to see this bastard. There are a large number of citizens there, and in the room the richest people all sit on the chairs. Seeing the people there all waiting, the damsel came from one corner. Seeing who she was married to, that everything was already white, with a great sigh, with her head bowed, she began to cry profusely, saying, Oh, you painful little thing! To whom my father gives me as wife! Indeed, if my mother had drowned me when she gave birth to me with such pain, or if my father had killed me with a knife, my desire would have been happier. I no longer care about the worth of a leaf for my graceful drapes, and decorations. O oh, may, make in God, give me death, before it leads me to such a fate. Orlando being among that companion, Sansonetto calls from one side, saying, Lady of great virtue, tell me, if it pleases you, why is the lady complaining so strongly at the present time? Why does she look so miserable? Then with sorrow Sansonetto speaks, I want to count the reason why he languishes. It has been a long time since she was asked by Machident to be his wife and she has never been satisfied with it, nor has her father in any way. Now, as you can see, the innkeeper stopped us, ruining our entire coast. To have peace with my father, she gives it to him, which I have never been more miserable. So the lady complains, as you see, for what she has done. Because he is old, she is not satisfied with it, as she would like to be left with a life. Orlando replied, if you don't have talent, let's find someone here who will fight for you. Among so many good and wicked knights, 
isn't there one who fights for her? Sansonetto replied, my friend, this story has no place here, it is Machidant Damastanti's uncle, who is the bravest man who rides in the saddle today. Here among my people I know no one who fought for her against him. Orlando said, if you like it, I'll fight a lot for her. You couldn't last against him, Sansonetto replied to Count Orlando. In all paganism there is no such thing as being so well struck by spear and sword. With him you could purchase death, then our lands will be consumed. Orlando said, I don't want you to be discouraged, because I have already fought with stronger ways. Because I will fight right reason, Makumeto will give us the victory. I certainly want to be his champion, I don't want her to have a husband in spite of him. Do it, cavalier, with God's blessing, if you like her, said Sansonetto. But let's leave the discussion of this semblance here and we will talk about that Amistanti. He saw the lady who was crying for this reason, against her he spoke angrily, whore who resembles the other bitches, whom my uncle disgusts, fraudulent whore, as if she had many flaws in her and was poor without having anything, I swear to our God to pay you for it and to make havoc of your vain flesh. Orlando can then no longer suffer, seeing what the lady threatens. He goes towards him with great boldness and quickly spoke with a joyful face, I say whoever wants to contradict, or even think that nothing displeases him that this lady is from Machident, come forward to question him. For my person alone I am proud to fight for her right for the lady. Whoever wants to contest it on any side, now at this moment stand up straight, and I will engage the gauntlet of the battle with whoever wants to contradict my word. The non-humble Amistanti replied, I don't want to fight with such a vile man. Said Orlando, neither vile nor cowardly was there ever any one of my deeds. My father was kind and strong, like no one who wore a helmet on his head. Take battle for your old uncle, since on the lady's side it is asked, do not want to know any more of my kindness, for in the test we will see who has more courage. Hearing Amistanti tell him how he was of noble status, he said, Baron, I tell you clearly that I am prepared for battle. Then Carlo's nephew said, in three days from now, let me be rested, I want you to wait for me and in three days we will end this war. I am happy, Amistanti said, and so they engage in battle together. Before Amistanti left, the pacts were written together and made, that everyone should come to the camp on the third day. Then Machidant takes leave of him. Return to the camp and Soldano remained with Sansonetto and the Christian Baron. Sansonetto and Soldano, and his daughter make perfect joy with the Count. Together with them, everyone marvels at how so much frankness reigns in him. He was honored by every family, as if required by his prowess, and that lady honored him greatly because he had already given her love. More than a lord, the Count was served food and drink and a good bed, whatever you asked, he was provided with nothing lacking. Sansonetto was greatly revered by Soldano and great honor was given to him, so much so that it would be difficult to tell, but it seems to me that it is enough and I don't say any more. Now when the third day had come, which was to be rehearsed for battle, Orlando did not want to stay at all, he dressed himself in a small shirt, then Derlin Dana, good brand adorned by her, who by virtue of her size all armor of hers, hid her well under the burden, then on top of this two outbursts were placed. He put on gloves, braces, greaves and thigh guards and then fastened his helmet on his head. The knight of great power was dressed in all his strong and natural weapons, and the damsel for whom such evils are on Orlando's side went quickly with strong and very rich armor, saying to the Count, these you will bring. The Count said, Lady, I don't like it, I don't want anything other than my armor. Let me have a sharp sword, and having that, my mind doesn't care. The woman didn't stay at bay at all, she picked up a brand of good size, sharp, strong and beautiful and of every type. There are few better than that. And a surcoat also collected, entirely worked in gold and pearls. With a happy face I gave him such joy that it seemed worked in heaven. He put it on him, saying, take it off, carry it for my love this breath. In this surcoat, elegant and slender, in the middle, there was a golden lion. Armed, the Count asked for his steed, he was led powerful and frank, 
more beautiful than any knights then had, all of a hair as white as snow, covered it as is the trade in war, and lacking nothing. And the count mounted on his right hand and the hard man gave the spear and took up the shield. He takes leave of the people and encourages them, and out of the city the frank person immediately leaves the innkeeper, he goes more slender than a fish born. He takes the horn, which no longer struggles, and blows so loudly that it no longer bothers him. As he plays, Amastanti calls, come to the field and buy the lady. That Amastanti, as soon as he heard the sound, Vengan my weapons, he already shouted not softly. Arm yourself in less than a thunderclap to go and fight with the Christian, then he mounted the good running steed. He left the pavilion and went to the floor, in front of the count, with a troubled face, he rudely blamed him and threatened him, saying, Poltronia, how have you had so much courage in your wicked person to have come to the camp against me and against my will? In the saddle. Go back and be sorry for this, and don't want to die for the damsel, because killing yourself would be shameful to me, and you don't need to fight me. Take the field, the count said, come, for I defy you, evil traitor. That Amistanti then no scholar, takes the field for his part at ease. On the other side immediately trots what is called Leonagio. Those of the land are camped outside, only to be warned of the battle. Thus the two good knights were challenged to wound Jinsi with their raw souls. Strong spurring and current steeds, wounding themselves with lances in two blows of such proud power on the shields, up to the outskirts I turn the irons naked. The staffs of the knights do not bend at all, but and two horses retreat back. Pulling and breaking and beating the spurs, the tightly packed spears are forced to break. The two barons took swords and struck each other many blows together. The knights stood on their horses, each one more than the other believed they could. And the damsel prays to her god, today give victory to my champion. Amastanti wounded Orlando on the helmet, that blow fell on the shield. As much as he took, he took it away with his sword, the strong attack then defended him. Count Orlando, reviving him, dealt him a blow above his helmet. Of the helmet, and the shield a piece levers, such is that blow of mighty power. Together they struck very strong blows, so that each other's armor shredded, like a lion, each one, bold and proud, that battle strengthens and begins. Orlando calls to his mind Saint Piero to watch over him, and save him in every province, and Amastanti strongly urges Macumetto to guard him from death to talk about the harsh and perverse blows that were delivered with the sharp swords, it would behoove me to write more verses, since together they were so strong and great. Not that anyone still sheds his blood, but it is necessary that he pleases God. The weapons cut from mail and plates were on the meadow and on the main roads. And having fought for a long time, no one still claimed victory. Orlando Count, who is a well-known master, all angry and tinged with pride, has taken his path towards the pagan, with the sword in his hand he did not end up wounding. The beast strikes him on his head and strikes him with such a blow that the weapon is only a handbreadth close to the weak hilt. Then he defends a piece with his stump, but the strong Amastanti then advances. Towards the earth the count takes flight, the pagan follows the dance behind him. Orlando's horse extends, so much that Amastanti's leads him. The Lady Sansonetto calls and says, Our champion is dead, so happy. Lock the doors and surround the walls for their defense and to guard them well. Count Orlando left the plain and reached a valley, so that no creature could see him. Then his face turned and not his shoulders. To give Amastanti a bad hotel, he took Derlin Dana out of the Spago. When the pagan saw the brand in his hand, so beautiful that no one would ever have it again, he said, Please, let me know your name and whence you come from. Orlando replied, I will not be rude, I am baptized in the faith of Jesus and Orlando, of Olivier, dear companion, and I am the nephew of King Charlemagne. Hearing the words, the Saracen, like Orlando, Carlo's nephew, directs his path to flee and wants to tell who he was. Then the valiant paladin ran in front of him and did not let him go, with his sword on his head he delivers a blow with such virtue that it cuts right up to his chest. Once he is dead, 
if he put his sword back between one attack and another, as he usually does. To get around the city he takes the road with joy that doesn't hurt anything. The people, who were keeping watch, see the baron wanting to enter, the door was opened for him, and he boldly went to the palace of the lord who had been seized. When he counted that Amistanti was dead, there was great joy for the earth, they and Saracen took comfort in this, which had previously seemed to them to be a bad thing. Sir, on the other hand I will say how Orlando then waged a great war and Machident killed Polinara. Look at us, the father of the celestial kingdom. Canto 17. King of kings and creator of all, son of sons and divine justice, light of lights of eternal fruits and supreme justice of every sinner, from which they were chased from the sky and destroyed those who fall with such malice, so as a glorious and just father, for your mercy enlighten my taste, so that with delightful and clear rhymes I follow the story in such a way that whoever will be listening to the may my singing with truth give me fame and praise. You, good people, liked to listen, and I will come to sing without fraud, just as Orlando, through his strength, conquered Lamecca, Persia, and Syria. Since Orlando Amistanti had died and returned to the land, as I said in the singing before him, he was praised by all the citizens. Then, when it was clear to Machident that his death was from the past century, he had that dead body brought and presented before Soldano. The knights who brought the baron, when in the presence of Soldano, spoke to him, as the story puts it, with very ugly and rude threats, saying, Do you see our champion who is dead on the ground here on the plank? On the part of our king, know for sure that upon his death you will be deserted. We will return to Syrian countries and we will gather so many good people, that before two months have passed, we will take away what you have by force. As we were offended by you, by our God we will take revenge. And having said this, the messengers left with the dead body and returned to the camp. That Machident who awaits messages, when he saw them returned to the field, commanded that all lodges and tents, huts and pavilions be removed. When that innkeeper hears this news, he begins to unravel his thoughts and his thoughts, and each captain brings the people under his banner. And load all their provisions, hovels and pavilions without abode, armor of plate, leather and mail and rich tools such as they had with them. That Amistanti, who was of great value, they involved in a rich gold prize. And with sorrow that innkeeper departed, towards Jerusalem they took the road. In a few days, still sailing, everyone was landed in Jerusalem, and Polina tearfully asked, Where have you left my brother? Some of the innkeepers told him how everything had happened to him, and as he saw him dead with pain, a cry began with a great noise, O oh dear brother, who killed you? Polinara said in his language, Supreme hope and all my comfort, who had such courage against you? Who brought you to this port? O oh dear! I'm dying of pain. Who is that knight who took you from me and freed me from you in this century? I promise Macon, our God, to take vengeance for your person on Soldan and that knight who took you from me, worthy of the crown. I will never be content if the Soldan does not abandon his lands, and my soul is satisfied with you, and I cause him and his people torment. Let's leave the painful Polina alone and return to Lamish, to Count Orlando, and to Soldan who is melancholy, waiting for Polina, the great innkeeper. The Count, of valiant power, says to Soldano speaking in his language, My lord, you are not at all learned, you make me captain of your people. I promise you that if Polinara and his people come to see you, he will leave us a lot of his treasure and it will be better for him to stay too. Make me captain without abode, then let me keep the way. Orlando was then made captain general of the people of Soldano. The captain had the captain proclaim throughout the land that anyone who knows what trade to do, whether to have armor or cloth cut and sewn, or to decorate clothes or clothes, should go outside the city, he must camp alongside the captain. And so the captain and Sansonetto camped outside without fault. Then all the people left the city and their shops in the camp were equipped with every trade, I swear to you, in truth, for fear of the count I went around the camp. Thus all the surrounding districts, which were under the Soldan, obeyed him, and armed people, without any gap, as many as one hundred thousand on horseback were found. 
He ordered the captain to close the gates of the town on all sides and that no one from the camp should change, at the risk of losing his life to anyone who errs, so he agreed that everyone should camp to stay outside and maintain the war. One day the captain looked out to sea and saw many ships sailing. Immediately he said, Tell me, Sansonetto, what ships are those that are so many? The bold young man replied, The host will be the false Machidant who will come here, in our district, to avenge his son Amastanti, and Polinara, in which a lot of trust is certainly given to these people as guides. The flags, which we see closer in front, appear to me to be like his arms, now think about what we do, what path we now take against him. We must fight the ranks or we will return to the city, for I fear among so many good people that our side will not be the loser. Orlando replied, Have no fear, let them dismount first on the ground. If it is their intention to fight, I believe it is against them that Makumeto will give us power, for what reason we have in this matter. And so being, all those ships led master and wise helmsmen ashore. As the people were dismounted on the ground, Polina, without taking any more remains, ordered all the people to be deployed. He gave the first army to King Brutano with valuable men, thirty thousand on horseback, and after this led the old Sir of the Mountain, thirty thousand on horseback in his company. With thirty thousand Franks knights he led the third Machident line, and Polinara willingly led the fourth group with as many people, then the other part of his good warriors, who were more than those in front, stopped all in a large group a mile behind, remaining in the fight. The Count, seeing his enemies in ranks, had his men quickly deploy, and gave Sansonetto the first position with thirty thousand brave men, and ten thousand under his flag wanted to watch the brave captain, the other cavalry remained behind, as the fresh and cheerful Count commands. Then Sansonetto spoke to Orlando saying, Cavalier I want him to make me. Hearing what the Count had said to him, the evil knight with a cheerful face, said, For the love of Makumeto, he will do you good to inflict strong wounds. Farallo, Sansonetto answered him, then to go and hurt him if he wanted. From the other side came King Brutano with his staff low in line before him, and Sansonetto, son of Soldano, spurred towards him with happy features. Turn to hurt each of their Pagano. They already do not remember Christ or his saints, but still and seated in the saddle, Makumeto calls on everyone to help. The shields and two barons were injured, both shields were forced to break, and the knights did not move from their horses and their horses kneeled on the ground. Pulling and breaking and beating the spurs, the powerful cavaliers get up again. Then Sansonetto, at such a tip, wounded the king in my belly with his spear. The spear, which was stuck in the shield, was weakened in several places by the blow, and Sansonetto, who has supported him, chases his heart out of his iron for me, and once Sansonetto has died on the ground, he throws him, shouting, Cavalier, wounds to the ground, Mongoia, Cavalier, wound well, which I swear to put you in pain. Sansonetto struck down the first and the second, the third, the fourth, and the fifth did the same. He made ten pass from this world, the shaft broke and his face was stained so he entered the deep flock. He takes the band that he had encircled at his side, for the battle he shows his virtue and his brigade follows behind him. Thus the battle began on all sides with heavy pain. The people, fighting together, struck hard in the deadly crowd with their sword in their hands, making a great cut. That Sansonetto, son of Soldan, chops arms, lungs, heads and legs, and the flock begins loudly. He passed the first group and the second and entered the third with arrogance, he cannot find a knight who responds to him, so much did he show his majesty. For the different and profound battle each one flees ahead by learning. Seeing Polina people running away from him, he is greatly amazed at this. He asked Polina, who is this who hunts so many people? A cavalier immediately replied to him, men seem like wax and shameless. I believe that it is the devil, and not someone else, that no one can last in his arms. Polinara replied, is this the one who killed my brother Amastanti? The knight replied, it's not him, this one is much younger than him. And Sansonetto was placed so far ahead that it was a miracle that he ever survived. 
He wants so vigorously and often that each of him feels great trouble, and also killed a powerful Barbassara almost near Polinara. Polina seeing this outrage that this man had done to him before his eyes, spurs him on with fierce courage, and Sansonetto has advanced further. Polinara said in his language, Traitor, you will be dead at this point. Tell me if you are the one who killed my brother, you gave him such a blow. If you saw the one who killed him, replied Sansonetto, by my faith, you would be happy to be able to escape, if he would let you go on your way. Son of Soldano not to lie, with you I want to prove my strength. Then Polina shouts louder, he challenges Sansonetto to the death. Have Sansonetto give a vassal an Ianga staff, very strong and large. There Polinara spurs his horse and the fierce man in the shield, with a great blow, the shield breaks, which does not cause a fault, but not that the knights can move. Polina wounded him with such force that he broke his breastplate and his breastplate, as well as his entire saddle. Then he commanded his people to take it. And Sansonetto, the slender person, stood upright, who did not seem to be learned, striking with his sword so beautiful, sad was he who approached. So I defended him at the bottom of his life. And Polina fought across the field, cavalry and cavalrymen put to the ground all the enemies he found in front of him. There is a great war going on in the field, he has no weapons, old or new. Manando everyone goes to bad luck who only tries one blow from him. He shows so much strength that he arrived in the ranks where Orlandodo was. Seeing Orlando make such a great noise that his people see him fleeing, he spurs his horse Busafalasso and immediately takes off among the enemies. And a vassal with a running pass from Samson came to him, saying, Go, help, captain, because the soldan's son has fallen upon him. Orlando, when he hears this news, pricks his steed and has Derlindane in his hand, horses and knights and weapons he cleaves, it does great harm to pagan people. No one strikes him if he defends himself, he feared the people of Soriano. Seeing his pride and great power, everyone flees from him out of fear. He reached the place where Sansonetto was and wounded a great Turk on the head, he cut off the helmet, the cap and the pelvis, before the sword could remain, and he cut the knight right up to the chest, so great was his blow. Podesta? Those Saracens, seeing such a blow, flee in fear, like a bird with wings. Sansonetto remounted his horse and said to the Count, Tell me, Leonagio, have you still encountered that evil traitor Polinara in the field? Orlando replied, I have looked for him a lot to give him death and pain with discomfort. Let's fight hard and don't stay too long from me, so that he can cheat you. Sansonetto went into battle, he made many people fear him. The knight's armor is cut to pieces, no one had any power against him. Orlando saw him of such great value, he spent a long time watching his blows, then he made the brave count like a poisonous dragon over enemies. Orlando then returning to his group, he saw that all the people were already turning towards Polinara and the power was proud of him. The count strongly rebuked them, turn, knights, to my flag. Then the people were amazed, they turned their faces against Polinara, and the others who made them flee. He took Orlando's people with boldness and made them turn their horses, Count Orlando showed strength towards him, which the Saracens had great fear of, he walks the field with much arrogance, his mind full of his evil talent. Of the men he killed and the horses he made many menageries in the field. Don't think, sir, that the other people on all sides were completely quiet, everyone fought so hard that no one was spared from wounding. On the other hand I will explain in detail how Orlando was victorious with complete virtue, and with his followers. May Christ look upon you in peace and at rest. Canto 18. Most pure fountain of mercy, mother of the father of the serene kingdom, supreme column of virginity, beginning and middle of every earthly good, eternal light, way of truth, whose power will never fail, through your mercy, true mother of God, enlighten my heart with your virtue, so much so that I can demonstrate for certain how Machident and Polinara were each deserted by Orlando from their person and their guardian, and how the Count then, expert in virtue, lorded over their entire country. Now listen, people, and you will hear something that will make you praise me. 
I left you in telling before this how Orlando and Samsonetto the brave fought quickly for the battle, cutting meat and hard armor. How evident in the field was the count to whom so much praise was given. Each Saracen in front of it comes fleeing through the thick flock. He went through the field fighting, more daring than a poisonous dragon, helmets, plates and armor departing, and even when it comes to wounding well he appears vague. He goes around cutting down cavalry and men and makes a pool of blood in the field, anyone who tries his sword blow will never find himself happy in the world. The first, second and third ranks passed just as they had done before, he left no pennon or flag upright, the ranks broke the suitable young man. And Polina, seeing this manner, said to himself, could this man be mad, who puts his person so joyfully into such a profound battle? In Varam's his horse and wounded Sansonetto on the crest. That blow caused Polinera to fail, he landed the blow on the steed's neck, so that when he died he remained in that stall. And Sansonetto remained on his feet and proud, just as a little lion defends himself from many who all contend to catch him. Polinera does not stay, he rides his steed among the many people, all angry and full of evil talent, he goes wounding among the thick battle. The people are greatly afraid of him, and they turn to flee, and in that part, where he rode, none of the enemies awaited him. Outside the land he had a beautiful palace in which was the Soldano and his daughter, who were enjoying themselves with women and damsels and more family to see. Near that battle and in a large plot there was the palace two short miles away, well fortified with ditches and fences, and many armed men for defense. Polinera rides to that palace with perhaps four thousand next to him, swearing to Mikometo what hardship he will cause to the one for whom his brother died, and that Soldano, evil traitor, will have her hanged on the battlements of the castle. And having arrived with his people at the fortress, those of the castle demonstrate their bravery. And Polinera with his company began the battle around them, inside they demonstrated their strength, not caring about their enemies for a straw. The lady, full of melancholy, daughter of Soldano, in such trouble, a message from her called and said, Move, our captain let you find yourself again. Tell me how I am in the palace besieged by Polinera and my father is inside, and the battle has already begun around that treacherous stream. If you don't help me in this breath, oh poor thing. I'll be dead. Then that message was moved and reached the count in the large flock, saying, Captain, move quickly since the Soldano is besieged in such a place, help him and his daughter quickly, who can already hold on very little. That Polinera, who you don't know, has set fire around the palace, with spears and with many arrows and swords the palace fights even in front. Gradually another messenger came saying, Captain, what are you doing? Sansonetto is knocked off his steed and will be taken if you don't help him. He is surrounded by several troops and he calls you to come and help him. Orlando, hearing this spoken, broached his horse without staying. Put yourself in the inanimate flock with the brand in your hand and it hurts badly. Those who arrive both in front and to the side would put everyone at risk of death, and in fighting he had arrived where Sansonetto was by bad luck, and he wounded among those who fought him. As many as it arrives, it is convenient to die. In less than one hundred fathoms, all of the people had to leave, then Sansonetto with a cheerful face made him get back on a horse and immediately chased into the flock, doing his best to injure well. Where Polina was, by great virtue the barons both arrived. Sansonetto said, Comrade, or Captain, or Sir of Gentle Deeds, that knight you see with the golden lion in the middle of his surcoat, he is Polinera, their champion, whose helmet is so shining on his head, that is the most pro-baron ever born, that in this world our faith had. Orlando replied, if he is so powerful, I intend to see him for true proof. There Polinera left frankly, swearing to God to make him stay. And Polinera didn't do anything, came to him to show him his farm and said, tell me, are you the villager who killed my brother Amastanti? I am that countryman, said Orlando, who killed your brother Amastanti, and I still believe with my sharp sword to make you like me, little wretch. And Polinera, speaking nothing, raised his shining and beautiful brand and wounded the count on the strong crest with a merciless and proud blow. 
how much of the helmet he took away, the Brando then descends onto the shield, it regards nothing as to what it is and the shield and the blow cuts what it takes. Orlando is very melancholy at the blow, seeing Polina, who so offends him, and to himself he said this verse, this is the best baron in the universe. To avenge the blow he received, he raised his sword with great fury, Polinara was wounded on the helmet, but he was unable to cut it off. And Polinara, having arrived in iniquity, then raised his camp with great vigor. On the helmet the proud man, as the book estimates, that blow went like the one before. Orlando wounded him inanimately with his sword and touched him well on the helmet, as he had intended to cut off that piece of it. The shot landed on one side of Pagano's horse above the neck, and from that blow the horse fell dead, Polinara immediately got up again, alert. The strong count, when he saw him on foot, quickly dismounted from his horse and boldly placed his helmet on his good helmet, but did not remove anything. And Polinara gave him a blow, a large piece was cut off from the shining helmet. Then Polinara said, Knight, why have you dismounted your steed? The Count replied, Of course I will direct you, because I am dismounted from horse to foot. I don't want to have any advantage from you and so I hope you truly understood me. Then Polina with great courage with both hands took the strong sword and struck the Count with a harsh blow, believing he would be punished with death. Orlando avoided the blow and the Saracen bent to the ground as he struck him. When he saw this, the noble paladin, against the back with the sword he gave him, sheet metal and snag were not worth a lupin, which cut the man and the weapons across. And when Sansonetto saw the bow, his heart laughed with joy and joy. And he said, Now I don't care about a medal for King Machident and his cowardly people. And he starts wounding himself in battle, which none of the enemies care about. Men and grooms and steeds sighs, and so do his strong people. You don't think Orlando was at peace, but for forty people he did. Machident, hearing that his nephew Polinara had died, was very sad, he set out to flee towards the port with several barons and great wealth. His people, seeing themselves at such a port, showed their courage in following him. Orlando and Sansonetto followed him, and with their people they killed many. Those who could, I began to get on board the ships and set out to sea, and their enemies, who were very wise, did not allow them to go to their ships. They killed so many with their heavy blows that few people were able to escape. Three hundred thousand were on the field, forty thousand or less escaped. Count Orlando remained victorious and few of his people died. Everyone stole the stuff of the camp, whoever could in the city gate. With joy the people singing, that innkeeper returned through the door. Count Orlando, who was captain, spoke to Soldano in this way on that day, since we are victorious in the battle, as is clear, we will ride above Machident and take all of his country. And without hesitation we will follow him immediately, he will have no defense against us. The Soldan said, Baron, I am happy, there is no point in delaying this. Then the good count had a proclamation issued throughout all the lands that the soldier held, that all the people should follow wherever the captain wanted to go. Then each one to obey his call came to Lamish, near and far, everyone who paid homage to the Soldan was given an advantage there. However, sir, I don't want you to think that every people drew from the country, but all the persons named should be under his command. Maybe at three months I want you to know what everyone wanted came out, and sixty thousand armed knights were all assembled on horseback. When the people were all assembled on the ships they were ordered to enter, then the provisions were loaded so that no one would lack anything. The Count wanted Sansonetto and Soldan to accompany him on that army, and his daughter also went with him in the company of bridesmaids and women. And so loaded those ships with armed people and many horses and brave and kind barons, as was ever found at that time, in the ship's master's master's and subtle commandment to the sailors that each sail immediately when it was good weather it moved. One morning the wind on their voyage was fair and the sea was calm, each master and wise sailor tried to sail his ship. The beautiful army then with great advantage towards Jerusalem heads out to sea, within a few days the horses and tools were landed at the port and unloaded. If the whole people were armed, from sea to land everyone dismounts. 
Jerusalem was completely besieged on both sides, as the book states. Seeing Machident such a group, it seems that he bursts with great anger and shame, but let us leave him with poisonous grief and tell us how the crowd encamped. The first camp closest to the land was that of the Count, a perfect knight, on the other side, if the book does not err, Sansonetto camped with his men, and the Soldan behind him, his field, his fortress, and his daughter with him, as I told you, and each camp was well fortified, as is customary, with ditches and fences. Let us leave Orlando here, the freelance, who kept guard evening and morning, and let us return to Charles, King of France, and to his lady, the gentle queen, who knew how he gave Count Orlando in the cheek for such doctrine, and how he was part of the innkeeper's party, and they don't know where he went. So she was sad and saddened by this, and blamed Carlo a hundred times a day. He longs to know where the Count is and wants to spend a lot to find him. One morning Ugundi Brava called, who was the Count's cousin, I'm telling you the truth, and said, do you want to set out to find your cousin Orlando? Darity twenty thousand knights, those here will be under your lordship. She replied the Count, very willingly, do this as quickly as possible. Once I found him, I no longer thought about it, I remember his great strength. It doesn't seem like the Queen is sleeping and she's well informed about how to provide this. In the country of France and Burgundy, in the islands of Scotland and England, many people were soldiers as needed, young men brave enough to wage any war, all gentle enough to fear shame, and twenty thousand men, if the saying is not mistaken, each armed spear, shield and sword and surcoat with Orlando's arms. When the people were gathered in Paris, the lady said to you gone, now you move, searching from east to west, so that you can find Orlando the paladin, and don't worry about the treasure you have to spend, as long as you find it. And gave him a lot of treasure, saying, go and you will spend this. With those people the brave young man you gone left Paris. With him he took his brother and Swiggy and away he rode without rest. Praying to God and Saint Dionysius that they can find Milo's son, and riding in this way, they took off as quickly as possible towards Soria. In less than a month the young sovereigns were in Syria with his people having arrived in a land that was Christian, and so they camped around. Those of the land, small and middle-sized, armed themselves with great noise and went around to the patriarch, their lord, counting the tenor of those people. The patriarch out in the camp sends word to the captain to come to him. Eugen, who wants his name to spread, went to him as he told the messenger. The patriarch suddenly asks him if he was one of those whom Christ obeyed and why he came and whence and how, what country he was from and his name. Eugen replied, I am not proud of the kind deed of Chermonti and I believe in the supreme omnipotent God, who is the supreme source of mercy, and I am looking for my frank cousin, son of Milan de Anglant, Orlando Count, who for two years seemed to be his person to Carlo, who was an innkeeper in Pampelona. The patriarch replied, nowhere was he seen in these districts. Nearby is a pagan, who is besieged within Jerusalem, the great city, and there is a very well-known man outside, of arms one finds great goodness in him. Thus speaking the patriarch to him, a damsel from the pagans came to him. This man was the son of Machident, who called himself Pilagi. I knelt down before the patriarch and greeted him, as I used to do. Sir, I will tell you every aspect well, why it came into the other singing, and how you gone found his cousin. May God always keep you in the morning and evening. Canto 19. Supreme Creator, who allowed each one to be formed in your figure, and the planets and the elements festive to govern each creature, on the cross, where you took death, you repurchased the human creature. By your mercy, Holy Father, enlighten my heart with such vigor that I can follow the present story, that I may say so well that my words please and delight all these people and I have some value for myself. Everyone around you, sir, listen to me with a cheerful face, and I will tell you how Soldano became a Christian with Sansonetto. Gentlemen, I pointed out on the other hand how Eugen with his frank companion in Syria had arrived and arrived in the city called Bethany, and how, before that point, Machident, his son Pilagi, who was of the faith of those wicked men, came to the patriarch without complaint. 
Immediately that Saracen valet went to the patriarch with a worthy greeting, saying in Latin, I have come from my father's side. Around our land every chimney is kept by Soldano and his people, and we know, and this is clear, that you have a lot of people as your defense. If you want to lend us some of your people to exhaust us in this war, I promise you by our faith to first give you half of my land, Jerusalem, my words show you why I have come to such a hothouse. The patriarch, hearing him speak, replied, Wait, I want to think about this. He called you gone and said, Young man, we can gain that city, as this Saracen said. We can do it, if you feel like it, you can go there, if you like it, and prove your goodness with your people. You will have half the earth in the beginning, then perhaps you will acquire the other part. You gone replied, Just and holy father, I am prepared for this task and I am proud of finishing that war. Then, in the name of the eternal God, he took up the gauntlet against the Soldan Ugo and with Pelagi and his people departed, and by this remedy he entered Jerusalem from the side where there was no siege. Then Jerusalem was divided and Ugan was given one part. And know, sir, that the city was barricaded in this way. Everyone is advised to look at a part of himself, so that from every side he is well looked at. At the end of three days the strong Ugon gathers his people to come out of him. Of the twenty thousands he had means armed to go out with Soldano to the battle and so he had his people lined up, armed as no one lacks armor. And Swiggy remained inside to watch with his other high-class brigade. Before he went outside, and Swiggy spoke in this direction, you know, brother, that you have come to free Machidan from war, let you never be considered a coward or a traitor under any guise. Let him be well equipped for battle, and meet the evil afflicting faith. Oh! Let today, dear brother, demonstrate that he is a descendant of our ancients. Remember the righteous Constantine, who was the first Christian emperor, and as you know, in vernacular and Latin, that all of us are descended from him. Remember the strong King Pepa and his son, our Carlo Mano, and Gilberto Pro del Fier Visoggio and Bovo di Antona, wise baron. Now it reminds you of Prince Rinaldo and his old father Duke Amone and of Berlanda our uncle Arnoldo, of Astolfo and Gualteri de Monlion, of Olivieri of Vienna, the bold warrior, of the strong English King Otto, of Orlando Paladin similarly his great prowess makes you bear in mind. Remember the brave Furavanti, who was brave and of our lineage, and the good Count Milon, Sir of Anglant, for whom many feats had already been accomplished, and of Don Cairo, who killed Agalanti, and of the good Duke Gerardo de Frater. If they were bold and frank, let virtue not be lacking in you today. Thus speaking he recommends her to Christ. The strong Ugan of the city leaves with ten thousand, each strong and strong, to exercise the virtue of Mars and to make a gain over their enemies, and he goes near the field on one side. When Soldano saw such people outside, Orlando immediately sent for them and he told him to immediately arm himself and come to fight with the enemies without abode and not wait any longer. At that message, Count Orlando said that out of love for him he would then forgive him and not burden him with going to the flock, since he was feeling rather bad, so that he did not dare to take up arms. And suddenly the Soldano, hearing this, had very great sorrow in his mind, seeing the captain so annoying. He sends his son there reluctantly and wanted it to be clear to him whether he should remain in that group, and by diabolical art it seemed to him that the son of his blood would lose there. Then he commanded Sansonetto with twenty thousand fusses prepared, and yes it was done as he said. The son gathered with those people, towards and enemies he went close together, like a strong trained man of war. You gone towards him with his band boldly unfurls his flag. The storms begin to sound and the people to shout with great storm, you see the flags unfurled and the good helmets fastened on their heads. The people began to press forward to demonstrate each one's power, with spears in hand and shields in their arms they went to wound the prized knights. The merciless melee began on all sides with spears and brands, in the battle the people risked themselves, giving each other large and large blows together. Arms and flesh are cut and fiddled with, it is fitting for each man to command his god. Whoever runs away and whoever leaves the saddle now dies, what a word will never be known again.
Thus the people were mixed together to make each of them test persons. Each group had gone to wound as needed, when and where, with their brands they made cruel cuts, and spears and darts are raining on every side. Thus, through that very bitter flock, Ugon and Sansonetto found each other. To wound the men with their spears low on their shields with much plunder, it was necessary that each spear should be weakened, but no one is already bending over the saddle. He took each of his swords from their scabbards and went to wound them with great ruin. Suddenly Sansonetto suddenly cuts off a large part of the crest. Samsonetto was not slow against him, on the helmet he wounded him with all his strength, but he was the helmet of such value that the blow does not care anything. Ugon then, full of evil talent, runs towards him with his big sword, on the shield he wounds him with such a blow that it cuts off all the parts and the brute force. It seems to Sansonetto that he did wrong by being led into battle with him. The captain suddenly calls out as loudly as he can, without a word, if you move to help, he will come quickly, for this night I am below. Orlando, captain, as he was called, looked at this noise in the flock. Seeing Sansonetto arm himself for such a plan, he no longer waits for anyone, he climbed up Pusifalasso, who quickly seemed like an arrow to run. In battle that bold baron must place himself at this point, his sword, which is called Derlindana, he takes with both hands between the hilt and the pommel. During the battle he found Sansonetto who was fleeing for fear of Ugan. The pagan says, a young Christian is here who deprives everyone of his strength. Orlando left him, as he said, and went strongly towards Ugon. Coming to him he said, Knight, who are you who brings this armor to the neighborhood? Ugon replied, I am the cousin of Orlando, Count, nephew of Carlo, I wanted to search in such a way that I would very willingly like to find it. Then Orlando, a natural warrior, spoke with him a little to prove him, saying, to tell the truth, without lying, you need not look for Orlando any longer. It's been more than a year since I let him die and if you don't believe me, here's his body. Of which, if you want to redeem my faith, it will be your reward, since Orlando is dead. You gone, hearing this news told, goes on urging him on with great venom, with the brand in his hand he said with great sorrow, Orlando, my cousin, I want to avenge. Count Orlando wounded him on the guard, but not to any extent, Orlando wounded him with Derlindada from the flat who doesn't want anything to cut. Giving them slowly, much concerns him, but let him bow his head towards the bow. Eugen stands up very poisonous, he wounded the brave Count on the helmet. I gave him a lot of blows on the crests, not that I could do anything about it. Orlando wounded him very lightly for not wanting to cut off his flesh. And thus he began to think of wanting to reveal himself to Ugon, but in order not to be heard by people, he fled from the camp in front of Ugon. Ugon followed him ahead of him, but out of fear he never abandoned him, and when Orlando, brave and wise, found himself alone with him in the field, then, cooler than May Rose, he raised the guard of his helmet high, saying, We have fought a lot, I am Orlando who is looking for you. At this Eugen was greatly amazed and could not believe that it was him. I took off my helmet and uncovered my eyelashes and often looked at his face, and then grabbed him tightly to hug him. Orlando shouts, Come away, don't stay near me. If these people knew about this, we would have done badly if they knew about it. Eugon then explained to him all the facts, why he left Christianity and how he made a pact with Machident, who had given him half the city, so that he would stand guard at that point against Soldano and his Frank gangs. Orlando said, Cousin, now understand, my advice for the best, take. If by my wisdom you will carry yourself, you will plough the whole earth at your mercy. With your people inside you will return and I will return with mine. In this way you will stay inside, fully armed with your company, because I fear that in such a departure from Machident you will not be betrayed. If it happens that Machident does or causes to be committed treason against you, he and your people will hunt you against him and give them all death with torment. But nevertheless I beg you that it pleases you that the beginning does not come from you, so that he will not be called a traitor, but if he starts, he should be warned. As soon as the fight has begun inside, you will place your flag on the tower, 
and I will prepare my people and come in with my large army. The people of Soldan will be cut off if they do not want to follow my flag. Thus speaking, parting and barons of battle with the other champions. And shortly Orlando had the trumpets sounded in concert on his side. The people, hearing this, without waiting, turned towards the pavilions, and Eugen had the same done inside the town with his numerous people, and as Orlando had previously told him, he had his people armed without defect. He had his horses covered and saddled, and he sent out a proclamation to his people, so that the guards at the seraglios should be removed, and that at night everyone would go around the city making sure that no one broke away from his post, and this put his life on the line. And so the guards were doubled and now all resigned. And so Eugen was having dinner in the evening with Answigi, his dear brother, Pilagi came to him, who no one leads, and greeted the bold damsel saying, Although it is great pain to my heart, I want to reveal the betrayal of the man who my father thought of making you, for my excuse I wanted to reveal it to you. So that you do not call me a traitor, I want to make it clear to you that this night my father will drive you out of this land to dishonor to him, so I do not apologize for such a tenor and I make an apology to make in my God. Now, pro cavalier, I tell you to be honest, beware of me as an enemy. And when Eugon heard him speak about him, he said to himself, I am not already learned about you. He immediately commanded that he be seized and done was his sudden command. Not because he wanted him to be offended, Eugen made him catch him at this joke, but he led himself only to support him, so that the knight would not be against him. Having already had dinner, Count Eugon, without disarming himself, went to sleep, and Answigi, however warned, had the guards supply three doubles. And when the first sleep was over, the guards began shouting, Alarm! Alarm! Come on, bold Christians, the pagans have their guards attacked. And do not shout at the guards because no people were already attacking him, rather they hurt him to start an argument and so that the people would come to the fight. Then many people mounted on horses, according to what the author actually wrote. The people of the guard, who were sleeping, immediately came to that noise. And Swigi then blows his horn loudly so that all his people will arm themselves. The people then decided to stay and defend the roads each one, and don't look because it wasn't day, so that the moon was shining brightly. The enemy's bars passed through in many places without any shelter. Thus the terrible and rude brawl began within the country between the Saracens and the Christian people, each of whom engaged in battle. The Syrian people armed themselves and went out to Christian, making war, but our people, caring little, caused them to set fire in many places. It reinforces that fight on all sides, the shouts and the ducking of the good cavalry, one then reproaches the other in this way. With spears and brands that had good edges. On the other hand I will say without humor how the Christians passed all the seraglios and took the land into their mercy. May Christ look upon you and his mother Mary. Canto 20. I always turn to you with reverence, most serene just and pious Father, eternal glory and divine power, governor of us, supreme God. I want to pray to you for your magnificence that you illuminate my heart with memory, so that with beautiful rhymes in this story I can remember the end. Gentlemen, I told you in front of me how the people of Ugin had moved, to take the city from Machident. And how he was in the Sali at the beating, shouting, Moya Fadi Trevaganti. Every Christian is demonstrating that he can and across the land, strong and happy, they put fire on the side of the enemies. Begin arming the citizens and then others, who were soldiers. Together those Christians with the Saracens were warned in battle in several places. On every side they are made fools, but even Saracen is punished by the Christians who were warned and Saracen could not against them. The noise was great throughout the land for the wounded who caused trouble. Christian people come from all sides, causing much damage to the Saracens. The rumor spreads throughout the city. Such a big fight has never been seen, and Machident, who was in the temple, did not think that he had been attacked, but it was clearly and certainly believed that people had started the rumor about him. People ran to the fire they saw, and he didn't believe he was so mocked. And so a message reaches him saying you thought wrongly. 
What are you doing when Christians have already taken all the land, which they have not disputed? Then Machident, hearing this, mounted his horse with many thoughts and very quickly came to the square, behind him perhaps a hundred knights. And Answegi made great trouble of men, armor and steeds. In the square he was met with an inanimate Machident. Above the shield Answegi the proud, the strong shield smashes by force, the unloading of the shirt, and the sheet metal with the iron of the spear everything passes. Machident died on his steed. Among the other people then he lowers his spear, he holds the shield, the strong steed punches, he kills as many pagans as he arrives. It was already morning when that Machident ended. Yugen, Orlando's fleshly cousin, for the noise of the people he heard, immediately armed, without any other Latin, on a very high salia steed but first had a flag of his arm placed on a high tower, so that Orlando could see that he began the battle then to show his great power he went to the square, without further trouble. On the ground he makes fall all those who are his enemies and he cleaves and breaks and cuts. The Saracen people fled in fear from his great power. Due to the goodness of our Christians and Saracens they were no longer able to do so, men, old, small and middle-aged, surrendered to Christ so as not to die. Thus all the pagans of the city promised to be baptized elsewhere, and the battle on all sides was over and there was no more fighting. Now let's go back to talking about Count Orlando who saw the flag on the tower. He immediately sent out a proclamation among his people that everyone should advance in line. And the Saraceni, waiting for nothing, were all deployed in this way. Orlando speaks saying to Soldano, immediately we ride towards the land. In the city the noise has arisen between the Saracens and Christian who are inside, if we ride, you will be lord, and we will not have any objections. Soldan says, if you think it's the best, let's go, I'm happy with that. And so together, going with a great escort, they reached the ground near a door. Eugon had the door open so that Orlando could enter from that side. The Count, first of all, not to lie, was the first to enter the land. At the door he stood boldly and Derlindana drew from her scabbard, towards Soldano he speaks boldly, as I will tell you here at present. Mr. Soldano, as you know, by the grace of God and my goodness you are free from Machident, as your city was besieged. Up to now you have considered me a pagan, and the truth still seems so to you, but I will make the truth clear to you, that I am a Christian from the French country. I am Orlando, son of Carlo Mano, son of Count Malone Danglant. If it would please you, noble Soldano, to deny the faith of Trevaganti and get baptized and become a Christian, I would be happy with this appearance. If you do not do this, I tell you from now on that I challenge you as my enemy. And I want you to truly know that Christian, is at my stake inside. If you don't do what I say right away, my mind is already ready to serve you. When Orlando spoke these words, Soldan was unable to respond. Sansonetto replied, what do we do? We're happy with what Orlando wants. And he has escaped us from such dangers that I cannot think of what he did. Now we can be certified that our God has no power. Now let's find a way to be baptized and this won't displease you, my father. The soldan then responded with pity, whatever you want, let us do without abode. Sansonetto, and Soldano agreed to be baptized in our holy faith, then they entered the land with great celebration with all their people together. Eugon and Answegi met perhaps eighty arms lengths near the door, each of them taking his helmet from his head, together they shared caresses and celebrations. That day and the next the great brigade celebrated and rejoiced together, jousting with highly skilled young men of prowess. All the people were baptized, our faith had a certain firmness. Pilagi, whom Eugon had taken, was also baptized without dispute. And that lady who was Soldano's daughter was also baptized, who was more beautiful than a copper flower, gayer and more loving than a violet. Being baptized, Orlando called and said, Baron, hear my word. I ask you for a don, perfect baron, of Soldan with license and Sansonetto, that one of your barons, whichever you like best, you grant me, if he is your pleasure. Then Orlando said to the truthful Eugon, if it were your wish, 
I would give you this woman as a wife, if you like. Yugen replied with great knowledge, do not give me a wife, that is not required. Orlando then gave it to Answigi. Once all the people had been baptized and we had returned to our Christian faith, Orlando did not want to stay any longer, after a week had already passed. He called Answigi with sweet speech, these words humbly flatten him, Cousin, I want you to stay as a guard here, with the twenty thousand you have as your companion. And he ensures that you keep it in such a way that you can maintain your lordship and that the land does not fall into the hands of others, through your foolishness or cowardice. And Swiggy said, If God keeps me, for me the earth will be well looked after. Go, what grace does Jesus Christ give you, that above and Saracen you make a purchase? Thus he took leave of him, Yugon similarly took leave of him. Pilagi was accompanied by Orlando, as history says and states. Orlando immediately sent a proclamation for all the people to mount. And so the host of the Soldan was armed and immediately mounted on the ships. Raised the sails and wise Niarinari with fresh wind sailing away, in a few days, all clear, they arrived where the Soldan has lordship, rich in tools and a lot of money, inside Lamish, the great barony. Then the celebration was very much for the land due to the vector taken from the war. The citizens are all struggling for the path they have acquired. After the fourth day, Orlando wanted to leave without further ado. He went to Soldano, humbly speaking, Sir, I want to leave with my brigade, and I want you to do me a favor and send Sansonetto with me. The Soldan said, Ah, don't burden me, anything else you ask of me, I give, I wouldn't know how to live without my son, who I no longer have and I'm already so old that I couldn't look at my lands, so I ask you for forgiveness for this. Sansonetto then replied, and I have my mind set on going with him. Then Soldano was even more grieved when he heard what his son said, but then he saw that he wanted to go, with tears he marked and blessed him, trembling as a leaf does in the wind out of great love he brings it to Sansonetto. And her sister, even when she was leaving, remained painfully dismayed. Before Orlando left there, Soldano gave him a noble book, and on his part he said that he should take it to Pampolona, to his uncle Carlo Mano, because he did not believe it could be found in the most sovereign world. Orlando received such a gift, he took his leave, but he didn't hold back. And with Pilagi, Sansonetto and Ugoni entered the port all in one ship. The good master raised the sails and sailed with a clear wind. All that day the story tells me that fortunately I won't bend anything, and then at night, at the rising of the Una, a great fortune moved into the sea, which four winds fought together, which hit the ship here and there, the night was of no avail, for the mast in the middle broke. The rudder and shrouds and all the wind equipment were lost at that point, then, as God pleased, one morning he found himself on land outside the marina. And all four of the ship went out, their cavalry and all their armor, sadly they mounted their steed, riding away across a plain. I wander through a forest all day that no creature is found, later, when the day lacks its light, it was necessary for them to cross a large river. Now Orlando says, let me pass, and then you will pass after me, on a good horse, with all your weapons, by the power of God you will follow me. Then he says, God, be pleased to love me, maker of the sky and of all the planets. The noble count passed everything across that deep river and there was already no bridge. Thus passed Ugon and Sansonetto, and Pilagi had already entered the river, even remembering Makumeto, God does not want him to be baptized. Because he was not yet a perfect Christian, the water had already taken him down, so that he could no longer help him except Orlando, if he noticed. He took him by the hand saying, Have in your heart him who was born of Holy Mary, and as it pleased God, our Lord, he came out of the river by his strength. Then riding the barons of valor, in fact you couldn't see the way, the forest is so thick on all sides that you couldn't go anywhere. Then Orlando the paladin dismounts very sadly and kneels down, saying, Eternal glorious Father, supernal majesty of the divine God, for your merciful mercy, now direct us on our good path. And having done the prayer, he mounted his steed, as God pleased, they saw a path. By the miracle that Christ showed, 
As all four had passed, the path closed behind them, the trees had drawn together together. So everyone rode thoughtfully, out of desire to eat hungry, and all that night until the day they rode without staying. And ride until past the ninth, just like the wolves longing to eat, without finding either beast or person, except finding two giants dead. Then each of those four spurs on, calling Christ and his mother and his saints. Finding those giants so dead, there was no one who would not be disheartened by this. He said to each other in their language, some evil beast must use us, which those giants in such a wild place have so badly injured. Everyone, riding ahead, reached the meadow of that river, and they saw a beautiful apple nearby, and they approached it to eat. So saying, I met a giant, all covered in cooked leather, in his neck was a club weighing more than a hundred pounds, to say the least. Pilagi, who belonged to Machident, suddenly spurred his horse towards him, he lowered his lance and wounded him in his chest, so that he passed behind him in spite of him. And that giant raised his club because of that blow and it fell on Pilagi, so heavy and big. Pilagi cannot sustain the blow, which shatters his horse, his weapons and his bones, and he had to remain dead, so that the giant, Pilagi and the horse remained dead in this stalemate. Orlando then, seeing this, had more anger than he had ever had before. And so another giant arriving, came towards him who did not seem to be afraid, holding a large club in both hands, which with great difficulty an ox could support. Orlando, the frank person, pushes hard towards him with the brand in his hand. Towards Orlando the giant struck a blow that he thought would kill him. The count then threw himself backwards, so that blow could not hurt him. Orlando ran towards him, and on his shoulder he wounded him so as not to lie, that he forcibly cut his shoulder and armor with his sword up to the waist. Once Pilagi was dead, they buried him in the street, where there was no churchyard, and they complained about him together so much that they would never have liked to have taken him away. I recommend his soul to God, who may receive it into the celestial state, then all three, always in God's name, go where the apple is seen. And when they arrived, they dismounted from their horses. Yugon climbed up to that apple, he took an apple to want to eat it, I put it in my mouth for such a party. It seemed bitter to him, so he went down that afternoon in dismay, saying to the others, we won't be able to eat, because these apples all seem bitter. Orlando went up to the apple to find out whether he was telling the truth or a lie, and he tasted an apple in his mouth, it seemed bitter to him, so he threw it away. And as he was, he looked at him and saw, outside that prairie, a small house on a mountain, and to go down there the count went down. He mounted his horse and said to his companions, I want to ride to that house and bring some banner with which you can comfort yourselves. Gentlemen, go, may God forgive you, and I will tell you to sing in the other way as Orlando arrived in Pampelona. May Christ increase you in possession and in person. Canto 21. Asking for grace to the supernal virtue, he who is king of the universe and lord, who does everything, leads and governs, from him comes the beginning, middle and end, may he grant me grace that I may discern history and so adorn it with my say, let whoever is listening give me praise, and I live my life in this way. Gentlemen, I left you the other to sing just as Orlando had mounted his horse, only to want to go to that house which he had seen and so he left his companions and set out to walk up the high hill, where he found a hermit. When he reached the house where he was going, he banged on the outside door with his sword. Thus beating, a farmer, who was twice a hundred years old, came to him. Hearing that knocking without shelter, he reached it without stopping. I will sell this beating to you more dearly than to those who today were killed with torment. If you are a devil, go your way, don't want me to be rude to you. Orlando said, Devil am not I, I believe that I am a perfect Christian, and I believe in Jesus Christ, the Supreme God. I am Orlando, Carlo Mano's nephew. The hermit says, Maladetto and Rio, having left here, I know for certain that Orlando would never leave Carlo, and would never arrive in this part. Orlando replied, It is the truth, that I left Carlo a good four years ago. In addition, I have experienced my goodness in other places, 
I have received trouble and much trouble. I have now arrived in these districts with two, so do not think that I am deceiving you. For the desire to eat I came here, so to eat, for Christ's sake, help me. When the hermit understands these words, he had a cross brought before him, which no one ever takes by force, except a person who is baptized. Towards the rear he unfolds the cross, and he takes it in his hand that moment. When the hermit sees that he takes it, he is then astonished. And to himself his heart said, Truly this one told me he was the one. Then he says to the Count, he waits humbly. I want to go in here on one side to adore Christ Almighty, and the angel will come to me, as is customary, to bring me food to eat, so that he will be able to give you some. The Count replied, I want you to ask him what he is of my Lady Alder the Fair, and then for the truth learn from him a certain news about my uncle's innkeeper, and how it happened with his brigades over Spain, a city and castle. The hermit said, this will be well done, and he ran to worship immediately and quickly. That hermit got down on his knees praying to God, and the angel came down and brought four banners as many times as he didn't usually bring at other times. The hermit asks why he brought so much food to him. The angel said, the remainder of this you will give to that baron who asked you for it, with this being something that is a holy person, and therefore God has sent it here to you. Tell him that Charles is around Pampelona as he left it, with his host in attendance, and will immediately abandon the siege if he does not see his snow returned, so ride quickly and don't mind him, and say that Aldabella is healthy and fresh. And then, as soon as you told him this, you will suddenly confess to him, because it pleases God, Heavenly Father, that you now depart from this world. The angel leaves and the hermit soon returns to Orlando with great joy, and he told him everything without flaw what the angel of God had told him. Orlando, hearing this, praised God, crying loudly with a devout heart, and then turned to that hermit saying, Holy Father, for my love, tell me your name. And he did not dwell, Sanson of Rome, or Count of Valor, and I was in the world among the good knights, it's been a hundred years since I left the profession. Then I prepared myself to want to serve Almighty Christ, pious gentlemen. As you see me, without any failure, I have been in the desert with desire, I never saw any Christian coming, except you since I was there, other than any giant or robber, and I died with great pain. And then he wanted Orlando to confess it, and he confessed it and communicated it. God took his soul from his body and took the angels to paradise. Then, before Orlando changed, he buried him in a cave, then he took away the bread that was left over, and returned to his companions. Eugon and Sansonetto celebrate, and eat the food he brought them, and then put their helmets on their heads and mount their horses without abode. They go riding through that forest, always the angel of God near them, and they rode for several days until they arrived near Carlo's camp. They were placed on a mountain three miles away from Pampelona. Orlando said down in the countryside, Noble Sansonetto, raise your eyebrows and see King Charles as the innkeeper. Look carefully, don't be surprised that, after Carlo took a crown, such a handsome host didn't follow him. Sansonetto replied, Orlando, I look and it seems to me what truth he tells me. Oh, tell me, whose banner is that so close to the city that is their enemy? The Count replied, I could be a liar if it took me too much effort to say his name, but when I first left Spain, Salaman of Brittany looked there. And he is King of Britain, not to speak nonsense, he has many proofs of his person. He is no more proven person in the field of throwing than he is, yes he fights proudly. Our King of France holds him so dear that for ancient times the anti-guard beats. Speaking Sansonetto, you gone and the Count, rest unarmed at a fountain. Let us leave Orlando here for a while, we will talk about Carlo and his falconers, who left the camp to go birding to have dinner for the Holy Emperor. Towards the source to the Poggio riding in this way the noble squires, thus climbing a slope, up there the falcon on a catornis. The cottontail flies ahead of the falcon and enters a large forest. The falcon loses it and flies in the air, as long as Terrigi watches it, then the falcon descended, to say the least, where Orlando and his company are resting. 
Terigi, who sees him going down, rides there, who thinks he will take him up again. He rode Terigi a lot hunting to find his noble falcon. Being twenty arms length away from the count, he saw Sansonetto and Yugon sitting. He immediately recognized Orlando by face, he doesn't know the condition of the other two. Without any of the three being aware of it, Terigi returns to where Carlo is sitting. And Terigi kneels before him and says, May God maintain your frankness. For the true Baron Saint Dionysius today you will be free from woes, since since you left Paris your heart did not have such joy. Even now, when I went to Bird, I found two Orlandos on the hill. Carlo, angry and devoid of joy, strongly threatens Terigi at that time because he does not believe that Orlando is alive. Depart, he commanded, without abode, except that I will deprive you of life. Whereupon Terigi immediately came out. Being outside with great pride he said, Damn what crowns you miss. Olivier of Vienna the paladin, coming to Charles, Terigi clashed, hearing him bestemia in such Latin, he immediately asked for the cause. Terigi said, Alas, I'm a wretch, he brought him news of his misfortune and he threatens to make me die and, like a scoundrel, he chases me out. When Olivier hears such a new ode, every vein of him is filled with joy, embracing Terigi, and he rejoices within himself, that he never believes he will have more pain. There, where my brother-in-law Orlando is, brave, by God, Terigi, take me immediately, and I promise you by our God I will certainly give you good credit for this news. Then said Terigi, let us ride up to that hill to place the lassi. Then Ottone, Duke Nemo's son, Astolfo with the Dane and many more, hearing this, each joyful and longing, with more joy than they had ever had, went around where Orlando was without fail, as many as fifty mounted on horseback. They took their path towards the hill and rode to the source. Olivier, full of joy, embraces Orlando, his dear companion, and the others as well as his similar manner, and then also admires his manner from Sansonetto and Eugen. Orlando told each one who he was. Then with celebration, joy and great joy I returned to the camp singing loudly, chasing away melancholy and boredom, and thanking the Holy Spirit. When the great Troy was set on fire, there was no such weeping for the Trojans, as the Christians rejoiced at that point, seeing Orlando, their champion, arrived. The whole camp was in a frenzy at that point, going around the count with great celebration. Our emperor still doesn't believe that it is Orlando of the frank deed. Astolfo came forward with a noise, he comes to Carlo with a great storm saying, What are you doing, Carlo, not going to meet your snow, which is here now? Charles, when he heard the truth that Orlando his son had returned, left his chair with great dignity, with several barons on horseback he mounted to meet the count, accompanied by a large number of knights from the field, and wanting to dismount to honor him, Orlando dismounts and kicks Carlo's foot. And Carlo then, out of great tenderness, kissed their foreheads several times, and then Orlando, full of frankness, immediately mounted his horse. The barony of great kindness went to Charles's pavilion, all those renowned barons were seated, as they were used to. The emperor, with courteous speech, asked Orlando, who was present there, how he had arrived and in what country, when his people had first left him. Of these two barons, tell me who they are and whence, tell me what is appropriate. Orlando said, This, Mr. Fine, is Ugondi Brava, my cousin. This other brave young man is from Lamish, son of Soldano, he had his name called Sansonetto and for my love he wanted to become a Christian. You do not have, Carlo, in your entire district a baron of such sovereign virtue, know that to save him I have placed in the fund two best knights in this world, such as Polinera and Amistanti, two good champions of the pagan faith, both nephews of Machident, lord of the province of Soriana, and also all their lands are subjected to our Christian faith. Jerusalem, Lamecca and Christian Syria are governed by your lordship. When King Charles heard this, he spoke to the count with such mottoes, well done to your valiant person. Well done to the one who carries you in your body. True God, the soul rests of your father Milon whom you fathered. 
Now he will be able to say Christianity that yours is of superna virtue prowess. Speaking for a while in this reasoning, Orlando said, Charles, dear sir, has he who you left there as vicar made a noble regiment in France? How happy is the country with him? Is he still your official Macario? What happens to the queen and my lady? Tell me the truth that I long to know. Carlo replied, By God I swear to you, since you left me in Pampelona, no news of France has ever been brought to me here by anyone. I don't know if the whole chimney is safe, but ours is not Ragona. Many messages that I have sent to France have never been answered. Orlando raised his eyebrows at these words and suddenly had a bad opinion, marveling at such a thing. He leaves Carlo and goes to his pavilion, and immediately takes the book in his hand, which Soldano gave him as a gift. Inside the pavilion on one side he made a large circle and then through the art. According to the book, a thousand demons enter the circle, both small and large. Everyone shouted with loud sermons, What do you want, Count? What do you want? What are you asking? The Count was afraid of such conditions that he could hardly recommend himself to God, then he said to them, Whoever has the most mastery should remain here and the others should go away. They all shouted, Macable remains. So he stayed and the others left. Orlando says, Tell the truth without complaint, if you ever want to get out of this circle. Why, since I left Spain, how many messages have I sent in Paris, why haven't they returned? Tell me the truth, without lying, the whole fact. Tell me stories of Christianity, of the Queen and then of Alda the Beautiful. The devil said, I will tell you the truth in full truth. She is the queen with great dignity in Paris with your beautiful lady, because news doesn't come to Carlo, it's the way I'm speaking to you now. The reason why no messengers come to us is because Macarius was tempted and involved in sins and thoughts, that all the time he was elsewhere, the messengers sent by the French emperor never returned. And by letters he shows the queen that Carlo is dead and all your people. It is also the truth that tomorrow morning that wicked Macarius, a traitor for a wife, must marry the queen and then crown himself emperor. Then Orlando bows his eyes to the ground, because he is in great pain over such a thing, he then begs the devil to prevent this marriage. The devil replied, I couldn't do it. Know that the deadline is tomorrow, but this night I can take you into Paris to the Christian places. You must, said Orlando counterfeit in as many strange ways as you know. Become so filthy that every creature, upon seeing you, will be greatly afraid of you. Then the devil made himself an exceedingly large black horse. Then Orlando says that there was no way out of that stalemate and so he truly did. Orlando alone, without any vassal, went to Charles, a haughty emperor. Arriving at him he said, King, without chatter, news of France is brought to you. Carlo was amazed when he heard this, and then asks where the message was. Then Orlando replied saying, Inside my pavilion I will show you the light. Carlo and Dusnamo then go running to the pavilion with the good and wise count. Carlo, seeing the demon counterfeited, he and Dusnamo fell at that moment. Then Carlo said, Dear Nievo mio, make this thing disappear for me. Orlando then obeyed this, he made the devil take his form by his adjuration and by the power of God. Then the news made Carlo say, the emperor, dismayed by this, wants to find a remedy for this decision. Orlando replied, and I will have it brought in from Paris this night. I will kill Macarius with my weapons for the virtue of Baron Saint Dionysius. Then says El Dusnamo, it seems to me that you are not going for such services. Carlo goes and you will stay here, so that the innkeeper will be much safer. Then Carlo said, I fear very much that that devil wouldn't take me there. I fear that before he wouldn't kill me, that he wouldn't let me fall in a bad way. Orlando responded to such fates upon him without fearing that he would rise. And so Carlo mounted him, all shaken by sword and coin. Carlo did not bring anything, whatever cross he had, to make this journey. Orlando ordered him to be locked up in Paris before morning. Carlo then stood up above the devil, dressed like a true pilgrim. And no, 
gentlemen, that at that point the sun had already reached where it runs. He moved the devil with King Charlemagne, lifting away up the burnished air. In the next article I will tell how Macarius' life was taken away with mourning that day and how many made bad gains who died in this game. May that true God, from whom everything proceeds, satisfy you with his holy fruit. Canto 22. Divine grace of the supernal kingdom, which you incarnated in the Holy Mother to free us from the pains of hell and the whole human nature, which was eternally damned, for your mercy give me such knowledge that by honoring you, I can follow such a beautiful path that everyone let those who hear it like it. Gentlemen, I said in the other song how Carlo Mano the emperor had a demon take him to beautiful France, for such a tenor, to want in the morning to forget the marriage that the traitor was making, and I told how the devil had mounted himself and how he was decked out. From Pampelona, the devil left, with Carlo on him flying through the air, in the evening already past the day, and even up and down he went rising, saying to Carlo, this land is here. He was showing him all the lands, just so that God would remind him, that he would gradually release him. Carlo said, go your way and don't remind me of anything false. The devil said, see Normandy, this is Bromanti and this is Gascony, that country over here is Picardy, that is Flanders and that is Burgundy. See Champagne, also Brittany, see Ginese, Frisonia, and Magna. That castle on that hill is Montalbano, see Tremagna where that war took place. What seems to you to be slowly exterminated is the large island of England. Carlo Mano often said, I know each land well about you. It's the devil, see Provence and Avignon, on this side is Mon Lion. See Monpolia here, see Bordella, now if you have arrived in your country, now you can see all of France beautiful. See Paris here on the side. Descending it comes more through the slender air, when he was lowered on the stairs of the great and beautiful palace of Paris, he went to Saint Denis in the morning. When he heard Carlo Matutin playing, his face was marked with his hand, praised be he who has no equal. Praised be Saint Dionysius the Baron. Just as the devil saw him mark, the laxon fell on the ladder, but as the Heavenly Father wanted, the Emperor did not suffer any harm. He said to the devil, I ask you for a gift, so that even though I have let you fall, you will not say anything to Count Orlando, who would like to keep me in prison. Carlo said, Go away, I command you, I say, there's no need for you to fear. Leave quickly, I promise you that nothing will ever be said to him about me. The devil left at the bad time. Carlo, dressed like a pilgrim, began to go up the stairs of the beautiful palace that Peppino had built. When he reached the main room, he looked and saw inside a fireplace that the food was being cooked inside for the wedding that was to take place that day. That day Macario, son of Gandapontiri, was to be crowned, and the queen, who was the wife of Charles the Emperor, was to be married. Carlo, seeing that wedding take place, then became even more worried and, almost trembling with fear, he went to the kitchen asking for bread, saying, Do me good, by God, who come from Galicia, and Santiago Po. A lazy, ugly and dirty chef said, You are worthy of several blows. It's not day yet, I see, and you come up like this without restraint. He goes away and returns with the other scoundrels when they have all eaten the barons. The emperor said, Oh well, a little bread or meat or some good. A cook got up from the fire and came towards Carlo with a stinger saying, Leave this place, I will give you pain with this stick. Carloni then raised his staff and hit that big chef's head. And the others attacked them all with hooks, with clubs and some with shovels. Carlo roasts himself with that big staff, to those who catch it it was not worth anything else. Whoever was struck by that staff either died or was ill. Three were killed and the others fled come to us, Guion, saying loudly. Carlo went down the stairs for fear of not being found. A tough young man got up with a steel stick and immediately went into the kitchen, saying to them, what were you thinking? Are you drunk, shouting like this? May God put you in trouble, be at peace. They and the cooks said, a scoundrel came to us, asking for God's charity. Because he didn't have it, 
nothing was held, he took the staff with great niquitade. For his frankness three were killed, who had no good against him. Yone, hearing this speech, immediately went to the stairs with his stick. Gion said, Wicked lazy people, go slowly, I will cost you dearly. And Carlo said, Noble squires, please, please listen to me. I came to tell the emperor some news and he wanted to throw me out. I came from Santiago Po and saw Carlo in Pampelona, clearer than crystal. And I saw Solomone from Brittany and Nemo from Bavaria and the good Dane, Gander Pontieri, Giltier de Monlion and Olivieri, the mighty Marquis, Orlando son of Duke Milo, Astolfo son of English Otto, Arnoldo di Berlander, the good Turpino, Ottone, and Berlingieri, Avolio, Avino. Count Orlando from Mecca has returned, with him a young pagan, who is baptized in our faith. Five of the Soldan from Mecca, Sansonetto, Eugen of Brava, who was sent with Answigi, a perfect young man. Count Orlando is back without faults, Jerusalem has taken and Lamish too. When Gione heard that Carlo was alive with all his barony, he was not deprived of joy, nor did he feel melancholy about it. It seems to him that he had an olive tree about victory, nor does he then seem full of madness, but, as a wise and learned man, Carlo began by saying, Come up, courteous pilgrim. He took him to his room and got him something to eat and drink. When Carlo wanted to eat, he said, I would like to speak to the queen. Pione went after him and began to beat him hard. And that lady, who heard the beating, immediately thought the fact was obvious. The door closed in tightly and on a bed he was sighing, but who was truly believed to be Macario without further asking. Gione said, Pleasing queen, I am Gion, who am at your command, someone who comes from Spain from the wicked people, bears news of Carlo Monsignor. The lady, hearing such tenors say, opened the room with great fury and came out to Gione, What news are these that you tell? Gione said, Better than ever, if a pilgrim who is here says to me. He saw Carlo, and his person with his people around Pampelona. Come up, beautiful lady worthy of honor, to the pilgrim who is in my leg. If Carlo man, whom God saves and protects, as he says, it is true that he is alive, by that God, by whom power reigns, Macario will not be your husband. The lady said, let's go and see, I want to know these stories. In his arm Gion led her. As Carlo saw her, he knelt down, the lady then stood up and spoke. Carlo then immediately stood up, beside her, through her, he moved closer and covered his eyes with her hat. Said the lady, tell me, pilgrim, what news of King Pippin's fief? What news can you tell me about the emperors, about Count Orlando son of Milo, about Duke Nemo and the Dane Ugieri, about the brave and pro-King Solomone, about Astolfo of England and about Olivieri, Avino, Avolio, Berlingieri and Ottone, of the Fi Giraldo, Arnoldo of Berlander, and everyone who follows Carlo's band. She then said to Carlo, everyone is safe and sound around Pampelona. I saw Carlo with the other Christians, if I'm not mistaken, it was less than two months ago. Those miserable dogs are besieged and nowhere are they defended. The lady, hearing such a news, was very happy, not to speak badly. The queen had a catella, who had kept it for sixteen years and by custom, she had to be at Carlo's house evening and morning once she came. Let no other lady or maid touch her, she refuses to caress anyone else. As soon as she saw Carlo, she licked his feet and then licked his whole face in celebration. From head to toe he licked everything so that he seemed to be consumed with joy. In amazement the lady looked at him, wondering why she did it. The little cat didn't stop licking, as it seemed she knew him well. The lady said, tell me this news. Why does the Catella celebrate you so much? Have you used this building several times? Were you here as a squire or footman? If not to Carlo, to no one who was born, the Catella does not make such an appearance. Carlo had spoken in this way, now I am not a lazy man or a whore, who I see clearly recognizes me as a beast and not you who are truly my wife. I am Charles, son of King Pepper, Emperor of Rome and King of France, 
and so that I am here as a pilgrim, without armor, shield, sword or lance, without scarlet or Alexandrian cloth. In truth, not to talk nonsense, you should know me well by seeing, without speaking, not by saying so much. The lady fixed her gaze on his face and strongly saw him transfigured, you are not the emperor, he has been conquered. Where is Joyosa that you carried next to you? Carlo then told her without hesitation that the devil had carried it and because of the cross that was inside her, he could not carry it in that way. The lady said, show me the ring that I gave you when you married me. See it, said Carlo, even more beautiful than the first day you gave it to me. The lady still didn't stick to that and said, I want to know as much as is enough. The cross that you have on your right shoulder, if you show it to me, you will be the imperia. Carlo undressed his slave and completely undressed his right shoulder, then he showed the cross to the queen. When he saw her, he was filled with joy, they hugged each other together that morning. The queen said, without fail you are the one who, if you were dead, all of Christianity would be in ruins. And so they both fall to the ground out of joy, all in anguish, and so together out of great tenderness they were embraced in the space. Gion, who appears to be full of madness, seeing them in such a state, went over Carlo with a stick saying, What are you doing, false scoundrel? The lady said, Gione, pose, this is Carlo Mano the emperor. Gione, hearing such a thing said, embraced Carlo with great love, saying, May God and your merciful mother always save you and maintain your honor, and whoever against you, Carlo is deceitful, be destroyed without rest or peace. Carlo, not knowing the young man, said to the lady with great joy, Who is this? And she told him, Son of Salaman, King of Britain, that Salaman left him as a child when I followed you with the others to Spain. And know, Carlo, that Macario has taken all your friends from these countries. And this young man would have happened, if not for the fact that he is driven mad by the court, so Macario has not already feared him and takes pleasure in him like a buffoon. And I kept him with me in the palace for company two years ago. More letters Macario showed me how you died, you and your brigades. Over and over again that traitorous fellow wanted to marry me for his wife. I never wanted to consent to what I would have previously allowed to be cut off. This morning he must give me the ring, but since he's here, it can't be done. You are wise, so that you will be able to remedy such a need without shame. Carlo, who heard such a sermon, did not know how to remedy himself, with great sighs he asked, Gione if no remedy could be found, and whether in Paris there is a count or no baron, who could trust him with people. Gione said, four of your friends remain, who will be happier than two hundred men on horseback, who will always be at your request. This day, if God gives me a good year, I will cut off the head of that Macarius, and to all those who follow him in my power I will give them a bad celebration. All those from Maganza will be dead if my stick doesn't disloyalty me. The Imperia said, he goes secretly to these four, to their mansions and as I have returned here to the present let you count and under what conditions, that they have prepared their armed people this morning on Ronchonai in the square with covered weapons, so that they are not seen uncovered. As they will hear once the noise has subsided, they will take to the streets of this square, shouting, Long live Charles the Emperor. Whoever contradicts him must be put to the sword, wounding everyone with a cheerful heart, giving them dirty wounds and praise. Gion said, Even if I show myself mad, I will do this deed like no other man. Then Carlo said to the esteemed lady, When Macario wants to marry you inside the church, as is customary, you will humbly pray that you do not want to be married there. I know that you want to make a custom of the others, that bourgeois women and merchants all do this custom. You will say, I am queen and empress, so I must have advantage over the others. In your happiest palace you will marry me with great baronage. If he tells you he doesn't want to do it, ask him to do so by showing a good face, and it is to please and content you in the palace he will come to marry you. When Carlo had spoken this sermon, Gione left without a rest. He immediately dismantled the palace and opened a stable and found inside a well-groomed palfrey, which was worth thirty marks of silver. 
The valet mounted it, and went to the square, spurring and carrying the club. Gyone came shouting loudly, Rise up, merchants and burghers, to do honor to mighty Macario, princes, dukes, barons and marquises. On the other hand I will say, good people, as I understood in the beginning, how Macarius the traitor was killed. May Christ from heaven lead you to good port. Canto 23. Almighty God, Lord of all, who formed the universe with your hands and in the mother you wanted to come and for your love you repurchased us, give me the grace that I may say this of mine first as well as is enough. You, gentlemen, who are led to listen, I ask you all to listen to me in peace. Gentlemen, I said in the other song how Gion had left Carlo to go to his friends to tell them how he had inherited his inheritance from Pampelona. Gione began to shout loudly, so much so that it seemed as if he had been driven mad, get up, merchants, to do honor to Macarius who is the new emperor. Rise up, the day is clear, come and see the beautiful court, how Macarius will be crowned. This guy is getting married and won't be able to enjoy it. Everyone, hearing the esteemed youth, said, Lord God of great power, do you see the son of Salaman knowing how knowledge has been so lost? Gione went to four damsels, who were Carla's perfect friends, inside their houses where they were, and found them all still on their beds, telling them such beautiful sermons, get up, none of you wait any longer. Carlo, our ancient sire, has returned and will punish each of our enemies. The reason why he had returned and the how is there when Gione told everything rightly. Each of these four, forgetful, could not believe such a sermon. Gione said, I speak the truth by swearing by the God who died in passion. Be armed this morning in the square, esteemed knights. Covertly with their arms covered, so that no people are aware of it and that such news is not certain to those who want Macarius to reign, when such news is revealed, everyone should ensure that they are faithful, shouting, Long live Charles, Holy Emperor. And whoever says otherwise will be disheartened. Gione swore so much and said so much that he made them believe what he said, and each of them promised to come with as many people as he had. Before Gion left, everyone promised him to come. Leaving from them without staying, he returned to his palace. As the young man went across the land, he shouted loudly, Rise up, people, to do honor to the perfect emperor. Someone is getting married here now in the present, who will not enjoy it or take pleasure in it. Thus the handsome young man was passing by, and he was called from Macario's house to go to him, and he went there. As Gione came before him, he knelt down saying, Sire, what do you command? I am at your call. Said Macario, what do I hear you say, wicked lazy man, thief and criminal? Tell me the truth or I will make you die. Tell me that someone is having a wedding and won't eat any of it, now tell me the reason. Gione said, he is the truth. This morning I got up early, to provide your dignity with food today I went to the kitchen. The cooks had great adversity together, so I was worried about it, I took the lives of three of them with this iron club provided. So those who make the wedding, due to their folly, will not eat. Macario, full of joy, said to Gione, God grant you trouble. All the surrounding people blamed the madman of Gion who caused such damage. Macario said, Tona to the queen, let her be prepared this morning. Gione left the fraudster and returned to the palace in front of Carlo saying, Sire, don't learn anything, we will help you without fail. Dead will be the unbelieving traitor and all those who want to follow him. The why and how he told Carlo what Macario had ordered him. When the time came, the esteemed lady dressed herself in a rich and beautiful robe, all made of pearls and worked gold, which was not similar to hers then. An adorned crown of stones, which was worth more than ten castles, he put on his head, and with maidens and ladies he went to the saint to satisfy his desires. Good Gione went with her, and yet he had the staff with him. Macario with his people then came and all the people of the earth. Some were happy, and some were melancholy at the betrayal committed by the criminal. Men and women, wise, foolish and mad, were brought there to see such a thing. 
and Macario and the brave lady enter the church with many people. Having said the great and gracious mass, Macario, traitor and fraudulent, wanting to make the queen his wife, the queen spoke humbly saying, I want you to give me a gift, that in the royal palace you marry me, because in the church every person, bourgeois and merchants with Catani, their women marry as one thinks. Corporal you are of all Christians, wherefore the crown must have an advantage, since the kingdom comes into your hands. Macario said, Lady, I am happy to marry you wherever you like. Then let all the storms sound, and the barons depart from the church. There were many who were not happy but for fear they did not dare to speak. Up in the palace the most powerful barons with that lady and with Macario Gino. Macarius then, without any remedy, was crowned on the royal seat. Gione went into Carlo's room saying, Macario is on the chair. Now we will certainly be able to undo it and all those who are against it. Carlo told him that he had to arm it immediately, without any further delay. Gione then armed him with all his weapons, as I find written and certainly seems to me. Once he was fully armed, he put on his armor a suit of armor, as was appropriate for him, and then he took a wand in his hand, which signified seigneurage, in the other hand a soft golden ball, on top a little crystal cross, then the crown on his head without fail. He truly seemed emperor, yes Gion had decorated him well, and so both were already among the people. Pione always goes with a quarter staff. In front of Carlo he shouted loudly, Do honor to the emperor, who has returned. See here our sovereign lord, Charles of France, Roman emperor. Inside the room there were many barons who marveled at seeing Carlo. Carlo, without speaking too many sermons, went to Macario saying, Do you want to give me the lordship in front of these witnesses? If not, I offend you, who betrayed me, and yes I forgive you. Macario crossed himself at such jokes, not showing that he knew Carlo and his face was often crossed. Carlo said that he returned the lordship and he forgave, but there was no point in him telling him. Gione then shouted loudly, Monsignor Carlo, let's not stay any longer. Minus the stick on the head. The blow did not hit him at that point, once there was that blow he went down. His heart was soon pierced by death, then he lay down behind Macario, who fled across the room and had reached him, and gave him a blow without further disputes, he crushed his head, such a blow he gave, and he immediately fell dead on his feet. Carlin's friends, who had come out to see that court, when they saw such features all shouted, to death. To death? With brands in hand, which were not silent, and with swords already striking hard. They shouted, long live Emperor Carlo. Kill the people of this traitor. Who didn't say, long live Carlo Mano? He was at that point divided and cut. Firienzi together with swords in hand, each one looking like a flaming dragon. Gion, son of the good Breton king, with his well-shod stick of sinew already wounding those of Maganza, placing brains and arms on the ground. They were all dead, divided and cut off, those of Maganza, who were his then, were driven out in spite of themselves, and quickly descended from the palace. Many were thrown from the balconies, in all fifty or more died among those from Maganza and their followers, who had mounted up in the palace with them. Having driven them all out of the palace and the square, Carlin's friends came forward with him, without any abode. He welcomes them with noble features, each one as a true lord honors him. And Carlo wanted, rather than having dinner, that the city be sought for him. Sans Armadura I mounted Carlo on steeds with more than a thousand following him to demonstrate that he was the Imperieri. Throughout the city everyone shouted, Sire, God keep you, Carloni, in power. Throughout the city nothing else was heard, long live King Charles and his great might. Those from Maganza are dead and conquered. So much so that it was past midday, Carlo went around the city showing off, then he returned to the beautiful palace with all his people, each one enjoying himself. The dinner became beautiful and adorned, and they all dined at their command. The wedding, which Macario wanted to have, was convenient for those people to eat. Great games and great fun were played that day and the next and even as many as eight. 
Many more buffoons come, hearing the return of the learned baron. And this news spread, Carlo believed that he was below. Every Christian who heard this news celebrated in the city and castle. Let's leave Carlo in France for a while and return to the innkeeper in Spain, as we see every day trying to prove one night to another in the countryside, receiving and giving many blows, but one gains little with the other. Two days after Charles left, King Isoleri went out. Son of steed, all covered in steel, which seemed to cast a lot of fire, when he was out in the field for sure, shouted for a knight to come to him. Sansonetto from Mecca, expert and expert, begged Orlando to go and leave him with the pagan to fight and Orlando said, go, for I command you to Jesus. Sansonetto immediately armed himself and mounted his steed Bucephalasso, which he had given to Orlando when he arrived at Lamish so leisurely. Spear in hand and shield in his arms, he went towards Isolia at a leisurely pace and came to him saying, Traitor, take the field if you are brave. Said Isolia, I am not a traitor nor was he ever called anywhere, but you are an evil and wicked traitor who has denied Makumeto the god and you believe in their god as Christians. You have certainly lost your soul and body. Oh, how bad advice you took when you were baptized in the name of Jesus. You are lost if you do not act, said the strong Sansonetto from Mecca, because with the other wretches you believe in that wicked and false Makumeto. In truth, Isolia, you see that Jesus Christ is also a perfect master. Surrender to him, Carlo Pardonerati, and in Christianity Mr. Farati. Isolia said, let us no longer argue. Take some field and show off your possessions. If Jesus Christ has greater virtue, he will call him back to the first beatings. Sansonetto recommended himself to Jesus and the steed turned to take the field. As long as they could, each moved with great courage. Shields in their arms and spears grip and sting the strong and running steeds. Willing to wound they went away, the shields and the shining weapons passed away. The rods broke and the trunks flew, in between there were more than twenty. The good knights moved nothing because of those two merciless and proud blows. When the sword returned, the learned barons drew their swords from their naked sheaths. Throw the shields behind, which were broken, one closes to strike against the other, throwing themselves on the weapons of great barrels with all their power and great virtue. They hurt each other boldly together, but one has nothing left for the other. More and more blows were delivered together on the weapons with sharp blades. Sir, know for real and clearly that Isoleri would have been put to torment or taken to the air without any shelter, if not for the fact that the best of the mighty knights came into the field with their arms to attack Sansonetto from Isoleri. When Isolia saw Orlando coming, he said to himself, I won't wait for him. He immediately began to flee, saying, I will return to Pampelona. Of course you won't let me die, I won't start a war with you. Fleeing hard for fear of the count, he reached the door and had the bridge removed. Orlando and Sansonetto returned to the camp after Isolia had left, and I had that innkeeper all day long. When it cleared up the other day, the good Dane Ugieri was fully armed and mounted on a strong steed. Shield in arm, spear in hand, the sovereign baron went towards the city. When he was near the city Ugieri, as far as a bow can throw, shouting loudly he says, Islanders, come to the field with me to joust. Come alone, without any other warriors. King Isoleri, hearing himself called, had himself armed without a bow and came out on a good steed. The good dame was waiting for her in the camp. When he saw him coming he was very happy, the steed spurred towards him and Isolia did not move forward at all, but boldly went against him and set out to strike without prohibition. Two blows are given above the shields, the spears and the shields are forced to weaken. Isolia bent his back completely from the great blow that the Dane gave him. When Isolia the Dane stumbled, he did not stretch him out of his saddle at all, because he had too much strength more than him, the blow, like that of a jockey, fell. Once the spears were broken, each of them returned and brought out their sword. Turn to wound those noble barons with all their righteous strength. Denise stood up and with Cortana, his joyful sword, 
wounded the baron garrisoned above him. As much as he took he carried out without stopping. Isolia wounded him on the right arm of the jacket's weapons and raised a rag. He doubled his blows against each other, cutting his own flesh and armor. The Danish Isolia advanced so much that those in the city were afraid. Six knights went to his aid, well armed with each armor, without saying anything Ugieri left that pagan king and returned. Sarachin returned to the city, seeing that Ugieri had left. Here we will leave their goodness alone. In the next article I will tell of the emperor, how he left Christianity and returned to Pampelona to his ranks. May that eternal father, who is true God, always guard you from torment. Canto 24 Supernal virtue from which everything moves, celestial and divine power, most high lord, supreme Jupiter, mercy, justice and clemency, I always have recourse to you, and nowhere else, and I pray to you with great reverence that you grant my heart so much memory, that I know and can follow this story. The other singer, sir, was finished there, as Isolia, so valiant Lance, was inherited from Pampelona, when the Dane left for such a tip. Let's go back to Charles, a welcome emperor, who had been in France for eight days, to return to Pampelona Magna called Guillaume, son of the King of Brittany. I give you the lordship as vicar, who will keep all people right, whether they want to be courteous or avaricious, poor or rich, merchant or baron, whoever is right, tell him openly and clearly, and punish those who fail. Guion replied, I give you grace, I always accept, honor grows to you. Then Carlo sent his final message to Desida, who was king of Pavia, who would be present in Pampelona with his baronage within six months. Then Carlo Mano with May's retinue departed on the road to France and, riding in a few days, arrived where the innkeeper and his adorned barons were. There was a great celebration in Carlo's camp, both children and adults were very happy. Guillaume, who has the lordship as his podestar, to demonstrate his frankness elsewhere, gathered together with valorous deeds, suitable young men of great prowess, ten thousand on horseback, bold and frank, who were not tired of fighting. Gathering together such strong people, he made a vicar in his similar stall, a gentleman of strong power, and I command him, and he must observe it, to keep an eye on people on foot and on horseback in the good land, and to respect every man's rights, regardless of who he wants or what status he holds. Guion had flags and banners made with new standards and new surcoats for eagles and leopards and lions, busts and heads of boars and horses, dragons, serpents and griffin birds, peacocks and roosters and many birds with crests, and fish and bears and he had several fairs made of surcoats and flags. All weapons, which had never been seen, were made by Guione to all his people, so that they would not be known to anyone, nor would anyone know who they were. As soon as all the tasks were completed, he set off quickly with ten thousand, passing through France, Gascony, and Brittany, all of Navarre and arriving in Spain. One day, at the time when the sun sets and leaves the universe darkened, as the author tells me, Guione arrived in Pampelona. On one side of the land it dismounts, Carlo's innkeeper was on the other side. Trebacchi, and pavilions raised and banners and flags unfurled. They rested there all night, making merry and playing storms. When the clear day appeared in the morning, Count Orlando looked towards him and said, Where did this come from? And thinking about it strongly comes. The people showed him to his companions, everyone was amazed at the innkeeper. Orlando said, I know well that in my brain I have drawn all the arms that are beneath our God of all the people named. I don't know any of those, I've never seen such misrepresented weapons. God could make those, but not make an, real people. Those of the land were very afraid seeing those people so fresh, well on horseback, covered in armor, they believed that they were French people. From that side they climbed up the walls and mended some Bertiska. One pagan said to another, those insignia do not appear to be those of the Christians. King Isolia, in order to know certainly what people they were and what conditions they were, immediately left the country and thirty barons in company with him. He entered the camp of the Christian people shouting such sermons, By your God, knight, tell us who is the greatest captain among you. 
Isalia was taken to the pavilion where the captain of that group was. Isalia greeted him with a beautiful sermon saying, Tell me, sir, what coast are you from or what condition? From what country or in what way? Do you believe in Jesus Christ or Makumeto? Tell me the truth, perfect baron. Gion replied, I do not believe in Jesus, and I have no hope in Makumeto. I have placed my virtue in the idols and so I believe that they have power. Since you want to know where I came from, of the feminine kingdom for certain, I border with Greater India, on the other side with Minor India. My father is a very rich Almansoro, sir of countries I couldn't say many, in people and lands and treasure, he is richer than Carlo III so many. A long time ago I left with them, seeking the world behind and ahead, I would like money, since I lacked the gold and silver that I had brought. I have here with me ten thousand armed men, who are men of great power, with seven of these many they were warned and they made them remain losers. With those Christians who are waiting there, I don't think I'm afraid of these people. If everyone were strong like Orlando, for my people they would all be destroyed. I also tell you, if this city were filled with well-rounded and crowded people, with as much goodness as they could, it would come to a bad end for us. Whoever you want or from which country, whoever pays me at this time, either those from the field or you want those from the land, I promise to win the war. When the sailor heard this, he said, Tell me, Baron, if I were to hire you, how could I trust you? I don't know you, what if you deceive me? Bione said, And I want to give you, if you are afraid that I should fail you, five hundred knights for positions of the best and wisest I have. King Isalia said, I am happy. Let's go to my father, agree with him. Bione took away five hundred of his men, he went to the city with the pagan fellow. The pagans made a great whisper, saying to one another, Do you see that? Do you see how they are armed, well mounted and adorned in person? Seeing Corieno and its citizens, those very beautiful Christian people, men and women, big and small, everyone talks about their beauties. At the king's palace, those fine warriors, the majority dismounted from the saddle. Gione with some knights mounted the palace with Isolieri. Gione was kneeling before Mazarigi, speaking thus, May that true God, who was screwed on the cross, save and keep Carlo at his command, and Makumeto, who is on your side, save and keep you always rising, and the idols, in which I have hope, save and maintain me with great power. As I have already said to your son, who is present here, who came for me, I am calling for the departure of that group which is around the Christian faith, dead and cut down with grave pain, and Carlo will no longer be of France king. And if you don't give me money, I promise to destroy Makumeto's faith. King Mazarigi, hearing that boy promise such a thing, then stopped the agreement with him and took five hundred of his brave people with him, for stages he gave him without stopping and said, I want us to make three ranks me in front and behind Isolia. You will come back to the rescue with those people you want to beat. I will go beyond the first blow to everyone and I will make Christians retreat. As I strike, move your large group and have the doors closed, so that no one, sergeant or squire, will be able to escape inside. Then Gione said to his people, always be armed at all times, and as soon as you certainly feel that the battle has begun, stop the current noise. Pagan people be all cut off. Having said this, he left the city, all alone without any other crowd. He brought his people to him and had them well armed to begin the battle with Christian. He had his insignia all unfurled and raised the camp with the supplies. And Mazarigi had fifty thousand worthy knights assemble inside. Throughout the city they shouted more and more, now the faith of Jesus will be destroyed. There was a great celebration throughout the city, sounding trumpets, castanets and drums, the storms made such a great storm that forgetting made us cowardly and safe. Our Christians who were in the forest, hearing that shouting inside the walls, marveled greatly and called the Emperor Nemo, and the good Dane Ugeri, Salaman of Brittany and Count Gano, and the most renowned barons that he had. That great noise that the pagan people make, what will he want to say? Carlo Mano said. 
Duke Nemo, sovereign of virtue, stood up straight and replied thus, I believe that the pagans will also come with these people to come and meet with us. Those people who are gathered outside will be putting us in trouble with them, so it seems to me that, without further ado, our people will line up. If desperate people come towards us, everyone should try to defend themselves. Then everyone responded in this way, follow the words of the Duke of Bavaria. Then all the marshals and drivers were suddenly ordered to be one of his own people to follow the major captains. The camp was immediately armed, and the great and lesser ones mounted on horseback, and three ranks were formed, and the first led the one who was at the top of all, that was Orlando, and the second rank had King Solomon in his power with eight thousand of its haughty people. Charles was in the third great deed, Eugia with him, with the rich flag always carrying him above his head. Having formed the ranks, the pagans standing shortly, all exit the city shouting. Guione, seeing the African people, moved his army towards Count Orlando. To all the people already in front of him, the lance in hand and the horse stirring, Orlando did the similar towards him. When they were near, Guione raised his helmet and threw away his spear, shouting, Mongoa San Dionigi. Long live France! Orlando raised his eyebrows and shouted, Who are you, Baron, with such a beautiful companion? Guion said, Fie of King Salamon, who is behind you, Lord of Britain. Then they hugged each other tightly. Now let's leave them here in the countryside and talk about the Christians who remained in Pampelona, as the book says before. Before Pagan had left the earth, thousands and fifty, our Christians had mounted their horses. Long live Carlo and our holy church. They all shouted with flowery valor. Let all afflicting people die. They go throughout the land spreading here and there, how many pagans they found going west. Hearing those pagans who were outside, the great noise that rose within, each one quickly returned without making a home, whoever could. Gione and Count Orlando at that time followed with their people pagan, giving death to all who came up upon them and putting them inside with great damage. As soon as the pagans entered the land, they closed the doors and went over the walls with their arches, those renegades, all covered in armor, come forward, baptized Christians, we have no fear of you. Our Christians let him have his say, and began to write in the field. Those Christians who were inside fighting, were then all cut to pieces. King Salamon of Britain, hearing that his son had left them behind, suddenly addressed him, saying, Why have you brought these young men of Christianity here to be put to death, so that by Jesus I will make you regret it? And he took out his sword and said, Bridge down to the earth and I will take away your person, so that to your advantage you will cross the mountains from Christendom to Pampelona. Then princes and counts will rise up and say to him, Don't do it, holy crown, forgive him because out of youth he committed such a fault and out of madness. The prayers of the barons were so great that Salamon forgave him for this fault, then all the people will return to the pavilions and disarm and dismount. Orlando, the flower of all and champions, armed without squires or vassal around Pampelona already see where the walls had less power. Going around the walls looking, a little girl appeared to him saying, Baron, what are you looking for? Orlando does not speak due to great anger. The woman said, Now you understand me, Orlando. If you don't listen to me, you will have bad news. Orlando marveled at speaking and immediately stopped hearing for the woman. Said the woman, Understand, learned baron. Mazarigi in Pamplona has already collected, six months ago, a lot of water per pipe, and when this night is dark, to put everyone and Christians below, where your people are all gathered, he will artfully throw that water to let you all drown tonight. So that you believe me without error, know that I am the Virgin Mary. And immediately she threw a splendor and, without speaking any more, she disappeared away. Orlando raised his hands with great love saying, Thank you always. He returned to his people and broke camp in the evening. Then the great innkeeper suddenly gathered himself up on a high hill and pavilions and huts were placed, because everyone wanted to camp willingly. In the other song with arranged rhymes I will say about water, if they understood it well. 
I pray that God, who satisfies all, will grant you all his grace. Canto 25. True God, Almighty Father, who built the universe world, then incarnated in the Holy Mother and suffered death with great burden, give me grace with graceful rhymes, follow the story and the beautiful joyful singing, that I can say well in every side that I am thanked by all people. Since Christian's host had left, as I said in the other canto, having climbed up the mountain from the plain, King Mazarigi had the water poured, believing it would finish off the Christians, and had the whole plain flooded, and then, as the day became clear, pagan people of the land came out, saying to one another, those pagans, now who will be able to put away as much stuff as the Christians have left. And with great joy we chatter, or. The Turks and Saurians believed well what the Christians had stolen and taken away, but when they saw the camp taken away, each remained sad and sorrowful. In Pampelona we will return soon, all Macon, their god, basting Carlo, who was placed on the mountain, returned to the plain for a few days. And so the camp was all packed away. Now we will leave Carlo behind and tell us when the messenger, without any reproach, reached the good King Desiderio in Pavia. He passed through France, Provence and Piemonte, in a few days he was in Lombardy, walking across plains and mountains, so much so that he arrived in Pavia. He climbed the palace with a cheerful face, he went there where Desider is staying. Arriving in the room, he looks at it, then I salute him in this way, may that true God, through whom every Christian was freed from infernal pain, save, guard and support Charles Hand, King of France, Emperor of Rome, the Duke of Bavaria and Count Gano, Orlando, and Olivier, full of valor, and you, King Desider, save and maintain and everyone in whom the faith of Jesus reigns. Charles of France to you, sir, sends me, meaning that you prepare yourself with as many people as your command and soon ride to Spain. Around Pampolona, introduce yourselves to his band with your people. King Desiderio said, it pleases me to follow the true emperor. Desiderio gave great honor to the message, then he had a proclamation throughout all of Lombardy, and for Tuscany and for each shore, in every part where he had lordship, to all counts, dukes and other baronage to present themselves in Pavia, with those people who could do it within a month they had to present. All those who had the commandment showed up, each with his own brigade. Many came there on their own talent with armed men on foot and on horseback, and in a month without failure of people thirty thousand Tuscans and good Lombards on foot and on horseback, all vigorous, gathered in Pavia. Desiderio assembled ten thousand astride his kingdom in less than a month, and twenty thousand master lumbermen, each well equipped with his own tool, all of whom followed him with great eagerness. Thus he left his country, passing Christian's villa and castle, he arrived in beautiful Pampelona. When he was near the host of Carloni, Franceschi, Alamanni, and Borgognoni, each of the host was amazed, seeing those knights and pawns, who were in doublets and jackets. He said to one another, the gluttons that Desider brought us from Pavia, those who are all badly armed. Desiderio with his entire entourage went to where Carlo was, kneeling, saying, May the God who was betrayed save and keep the Emperor Carloni and Olivieri, and the Count Orlando Ardito, the Duke Nemo and the good King Solomone, Arnoldo di Berlanda, and whoever believes in Jesus Christ and his holy faith. Monsignor Carlo, I represent myself to you as I was told by your message. I have come to make your talent and destroy Macumeto's faith. Tell me where you like me to set up camp in this district. Charles, seeing the people like this, replied to him very upset, go, set up camp inside Pampelona, in the great palace where Mazarigi is. King Desiderio with his good people departed from the king of San Dionigi and of talking about Charles he reasons in himself, rather than returning to Paris, I believe I can do so much with my people, I will remember what he told us. Desiderio with his people will dwell on from King Charles' camp, a good two miles, and near a large wood, close to it and take whatever field you need. Thus in this way he encamped in that forest with all his gang and his family, then he commanded the king that a lot of large would be cut down and ploughed there. And he ordered all the masters to quickly build large, 
very high towers and castles and plenty of crickets and many cats out of wood to destroy the Turks and Africans. The masters, ingenious and well suited, began to make many castles, as they knew, well thought out and beautiful. And those of Carlo's innkeeper went to see the Togliani every day. Everyone looked this way and that around as the masters held their hands. In twenty days, without staying any longer, those Lombard and Tuscan masters destroyed towers, castles and five hundred cats and truncheons and truncheons as many as one hundred. Then he sent Carlo Desiderio to say, when he wanted to fight the city. Carlo replied, without any failure, that the other day with his gangs he wanted to go against Pagani and demonstrate his goodness against them. King Desiderius, hearing the embassy, had his people assembled the other day. Before the day was cleared, all our Christians were in ranks and each captain was well advised and all the flags resigned. When the Christian people had assembled and all the people mounted on steeds, Charles formed four ranks of his people, each of whom had a powerful captain. The first was given to Count Orlando with 20,600 people, the second led the good King Salamon at his command with 8,000, the third, continuing after two, led the false Count Ganalone, of his lineage with sixty counts, thirty thousand on horseback fast and ready. In the fourth there was Charles the Emperor and Nemo of Bavaria and the good Dane with another barony of great value, who were always with Charles in defense of him. With this tenor, King Desiderio caused two armies of the people of his town to approach that city with great buildings which he had had built. Just as King Desiderio was accosted with his people around the land, Count Orlando goes to the other side with his people well trained in war. King Salamon with his people, having been informed of him, went to the other side, if the saying is not mistaken. Gander Pontieri did the same and moved in front with his people. Carlo nor his cohort did not. It moved, but remained behind so lined up. Each of those others was well beaten, and the city was completely besieged, filling the large ditches around it. African people were all mounted on the walls, all well armed, with what is needed in such markets. Many arrows with tabby bows and spears and darts and stones in quantity, throwing down, shouted to the Christians, Come forward, if you have goodness. If you come to blows with us, you will never return to Christianity. And Christian also fought and pagan defended themselves. Our Christians placed many ladders, believing they were climbing above the walls. Wretched is the one who climbs it, if he is not well covered with armor, he will suffer from stones and arrows, who falls dead to the ground on the plain. Many ladders were seen there, some being raised, some were being raised, some were being raised, some were being raised. On all sides our Christians fought with all their power, giving and taking away such a hardship. Many people saw them fall to the ground, for those pagans were of such great worth and with such fine valor that whoever approached the walls fell dead and never rose. And stones rained down on it from all sides thicker than the storm ever came, and spears and arrows and poison darts, wounding some of the arms, some of the head. There were many Christians killed by those very dishonest people. One dead man on top of the other fell there from the throwing that every pagan did. From morning to none our Christians fought with the Africans, however they could gain nothing and certainly all of them would have died, except that the valiant Desiderio with his deficiencies was brought forward, throwing overflows and truncheons over the walls of the evil people. Wooden castle and cats and crickets were placed next to the walls and many armed men provided them, and masters under those crickets to dig. The pagans could not destroy them, as they would push back castles, and they would quarry the walls so much that they drove a large part of them to the ground. The pagans departed from that side. Desider with his safe following, who saw that Pagani had fled, surely had the wall leveled and entered inside him, and his followers followed him. When the Talians were in the city, Desider went to the Lord's palace, with his bands full of great valor. Every person fled through the city before Desiderio and his followers, saying to one another, Pampelona will also be biting for these Christians. It was already more than nine o'clock when the Talians, true warriors, with their lord, Desider of Pavia, assumed lordship of the great palace. 
without further disputes there arose and all the great treasure was stolen. When it became clear throughout the city that they had taken the palace, those who were at the walls and defenses took to flight and abandoned the wall. And Christian, who was outside, seeing this, marveled, not knowing anything else. When they learned how and how Desiderio had entered, Orlando and all his frank ranks from the side where the wall had fallen, with the flag white and red, entered like a well-warned baron, shouting, Long live Carlo and his gang. Moya Macon who has no goodness. They went through the city killing as many of those renegades as they found. Thus the land flowed, many knights had clashed. Sansonetto, and Orlando come running in front of all those esteemed barons, running among those knights who were Mazarigi and Isoliri. Orlando pushes Vigliantino hard, the spear lowers towards Mazarigi loudly shouting, Long live the divine god. Long live Carlo. Mongoia San Dionigi. He wounded the Saracen on the shield, he struck him to the ground for such services. Then he dismounted and said, Do you ask for mercy? Do you want to return to the Christian faith? King Mazarigi said, Sir of Anglant, since you have defeated me with my steed, deny Macon and Trevaganti, whom I have always believed in God. Then the African king was taken, bound tightly and held in prison, and others who were in his company, some of whom were dead and some who were about to surrender. Samsonet of Mecca wounded Isolia on the head in this way. The blow left him largely stunned and he had no power to hold on. Sansonetto said, Bold Baron, do you want to return to Christian deeds? He said Isoliri, I cannot do anything else, I surrender to you and want to baptize. Then both those gentlemen and others who were with their corporals were taken. Many died in pain, not wanting to return those people. Stealing Hygienic Children and Adults Alamanni, Franceschi, and Provenzali, through the city women, infantrymen and, and jockeys, making many of them star wretches. Salaman of Brittany with his men entered the city without disputes. Gander Pontier, an unbelieving traitor, entered his country with thirty thousand and Carlo Mano, the powerful emperor, with Duke Nemo together with the Dane, entered Pampelona with his army, without being contradicted by anyone. The city was then completely stolen and those who did not want to return to God died. Half the people were baptized, some did it by faith and some to escape. When the people had rested, Carlo wanted to enter the great palace, where Mazarigi lived, and to enter he went with his people. When King Desider saw Charles and his flags coming into the square, he had his people commanded and told not to let the emperor enter, nor his people go up to the palace, be they who you want, sergeant or squire. If you come, say hello with the stones, don't worry about Carlo or anyone else. Franceschi and Alamanni and Borgognoni and other people, whom Carlo followed, mounted the echelons of the palace loudly shouting, Carlo Mano Viva! And Toliani, like fierce dragons, wounded them with darts and those with stones. I made them turn down the stairs, many fell dead and wounded. There was no one near the palace who was not beaten by Lombardi. To whom a stone was easy to reach, which broke all the weapons on his back. He said to one another, Wicked traitor King Desider has turned on us. Carlo, greatly amazed at this, called Count Orlando as follows, Go to Desiderio and ask why he has turned against my agent, asks if he has denied the faith of Jesus Christ, son of Mary. Orlando then stayed no longer, near the palace he was already riding. The Lombards said to the king, shouting, Shall we throw stones at Count Orlando? King Desiderius said, Do not throw, let's see what Orlando means. As long as it comes up, you'll stop. From Piazza Orlando he began to say, King Desiderio, now you reveal to me, why are you killing our Christians? Have you denied your God or do you want homage or favor from Carlo? King Desider said, I want from Charles half the treasure that was stolen from us, so that I can give it to my people, and the Tuscans and Lombards can carry the weapon on all sides as they wish, whether they want it around their neck or belted around their side, and I want him to never be king again in Tuscany and Lombardy after my death. When Orlando had heard Desiderio, 
he returned to Carlo and told him the tenor. Carlo said, let him quickly provide what he wants, which is worthy of honor. And then the treasure was gone, and once the agreements had been made, the good emperor went up to the palace to rest and take his ease and refresh himself a little. All the people enjoyed it, many pagans were baptized. Now I want to end this saying here and in the next one I will sing how Charles, the perfect emperor, wanted to send a message to Massilio. I pray to that God, who is the supreme good, to lead us to glory without pain. Canto 26. Mother of God, glorious virgin, with reverence I ask you for a gift, that I may make my mind virtuous, that I may always follow improving the great, beautiful and delightful story. Sir, it ended in the other saying when Desider wanted three agreements from Carlo, then he left it to be assembled in the palace. All that day the people were there, at night several people kept watch. King Mazarigi, who was baptized, at midnight quietly mounted a post horse and secretly left the land. That evil King Saracen took his path towards Saragossa. When he was cleared the other day, Christian of Pampelona got up. He was searched for extensively in the city of Mazarigi, but could not be found. Imagine that he had left as he was, and not worry about him any more. And while Charles and his barony were in the palace in Pampelona with great enjoyment, a messenger came before them saying, Monsignor, from Spain Massilio has gathered so many warriors that he is no longer the kingdom of barbers, Turks and Africans in Christianity, they come to you without restraint. In Saragossa he has already assembled 400,000 armed men. The majority are people on horseback, covered in arms, and very fine archers, there are a hundred thousand of them who without fail show that they are perfect warriors. Don't wait, Carloni, in this stalemate, go against him with your good knights, for in Saragossa there is more talk that those people will come to Pampelona. Charles appealed to Nemo and the De Nugieri, Gan de Pontier, Salaman of Brittany, now advise me, counselors, whether it is better to ride towards Spain on Massilio or send messengers who will obey my great power. Nemo replied boldly and boldly, strike the iron while it is hot. Monsignor Carlo, when the sea is calm, the wind is strong, don't lower your sails, don't take port, but it will chase you into the sea and don't be afraid of luck, and so I advise that it be done against Massilio and his cruel people. Since you have now taken this city, if you go against it, it will not be defended. If you send him a messenger or an embassy, do not think that he wants to obey you, but with the people he has gathered, he will want to contradict you so far. As I already told you another time, my mind would soon turn against him. Let him say now, young or old, that it seems to me that he has said the truth and the best. Salaman of Brittany stood up and said, let that be what Nemo said. Without sending a messenger, we are all moved, it is not for us to send an embassy. The pagans have been so beaten that in Saragossa there will be a memory of it, they are still continuing and doing them damage, destroying them and they will surrender. Said the Dane, Nemo spoke well and Salaman said the same thing. On my advice he accepted himself and executed without further harm. Gander Pontieri stood up and spoke as false and disloyal, Carlo, it seems to me that a message is being sent from these barons of yours and the greatest. If we go against those pagans, I certainly believe that we will be victorious, but a large number of our Christians will be killed and made sufferers. If we can without coming to blows with them who are obedient to you, send a messenger, who I believe will truly make Massilio your wish completely. Carlo replied, and I want to send you whatever you think is best and I like it. Now what will be the one who wants to go and arrange peace with Massilio? What will the embassy be able to tell me? Rise up, O oh true barony. English Astolfo said, My lord, I will be able to handle such an embassy well. If Massilio does not want to obey, I will take off his head with my sword. Carlo said, Go, sit down and don't say anything more. You boast too much about making such a request. Olivieri of Vienna, full of courage, stood up straight, without further ado, saying, Monsignor, this embassy will be delivered to Massilio for me. Go, sit down, 
Carlo said to the Marquis. He immediately sits down to command him. Then, without argument, Arnoldo di Berlander, the son of Gerardo, stands up saying, Carlo, courteous Monsignor, for me this embassy spreads. I believe he knows how to count so well that I will make Massilio return to God. If he is freed from your will, with my sword, I will take his life. Among his people I will cause him to fall dead, if I don't, I want to be hanged. Carlo said, Go, sit down again. Still like your father you have pried. Arnoldo then fell silent, and Ganalone stood up and said, Listen to me, Carloni. A young man is here before you, sire, Duke Guion, son of King Solomone, a man more courageous and courageous than anyone else in this mansion, who will know how to convey this embassy on your side to King Marsilian. Carlo appealed to Gione and Gione immediately knelt before him, saying, Monsignor, what is the pleasure? Carlo said, I want him to go to Marsilian immediately and tell him to get on the road so that he can come to me. All his seigniorage and his keeping under me without any heed. If he comes with spite to be under me, tell the innkeeper to wait for me immediately. I believe, my lord, said Gione, that I know how to say your embassy. Massilio will return to our God and will be under your lordship. If he turns away from this, I promise you, among all his barony I will cut off his head with my sword in spite of him, always raising you up. Carlo then marked it and blessed it. Dusnamo of Bavaria, even seeing that the emperor wanted Gion to ride, spoke out of great pain, almost crying, and said to Gione in this way, I want to lend you, and I give him to you for yours, my steed Morel, who has never been better. I don't think it's of much value. Olivieri said, and I want to lend you all to Chiara my sword until you return. Orlando said, and I want to give you a helmet that is above the other adornments, which for my love you must always wear throughout your life, by night and by day. Above all this helmet has virtue, and it was the one Ferrau wore. And when you return I will want you to be under my banner of twenty thousand in company and six hundred for the great goodness that reigns in you. Gione said, and I will be happy and I pray to God who will always keep you, Duke Nemo and also the Marquis, who have each been so courteous to me. Gione then armed himself with all his weapons and then mounted the Dusnamo horse. He takes leave of King Solomone, who was thoughtful and sad as he went, because he saw clearly that Ganalone was sending him there to have him killed, but so as not to displease Carlo anything, he marked it by crying, then he let it go. From Pampelona that young Frank departed on horseback, well armed, who had no armor at all and was, riding, requested by that pagan, war-weary populace, to go where he was sent to go. Gione said, I want, if God pleases, to bring peace between Massilio and Carlo. Everyone and pagan said with joy, may your God save you so that he can take us out of this misery, so that we are no longer at war and in torment. We did him honor out of tenderness because everyone was happy with peace. Gion also went along his path, without stopping, riding every day. And he rode so much over mountains and plains that one day he arrived in Saragossa. Those of the earth, small and middle-sized, rushed to see it from all sides. One of the pagans said to another, This message is sent by Charles to come to an agreement with Massilio and make peace and no longer wage war with him. Pione also went his way, he didn't respond to those important people. Where is Massilio with his barony? In the square, the horse dismounts. A Saracen came to him, according to what the author tells me, the good steed of Nemo, who was Morello, kicked at the pagan fellow twice in the chest. He hit him so hard in the chest, that he suddenly fell dead. Said that cursed pagan people, that horse will kill many people. Gion left the perfect horse there, he quickly tied it to a harpoon. Up in the palace, before Marsilian, this sermon was spoken of him, the true God who made Eve and Adam in his likeness of sand, from whence we all descended, and who died for us in passion, who in hell before us were, deep down in every generation, as he is true God, may he save and maintain the holy church of Rome and its banner. Save, guard and maintain Charles' hand, son who was of the strong King Pepper, 
King of France, Sovereign Emperor, save and maintain Orlando the Paladin, the mighty King Salamon Bretano and Nemo, and the Archbishop Turpin. Whoever believes in Jesus Christ, the Supreme King, may his strength always grow forever. Kill with shame, damage and disgrace Massilio and the Argalifo and his nurse, Falserone and the wicked Firamonte, King Grandanio and Almonsor of Soria, King Justant, and King Giastamonte, Margaritone King of Sibelia, King Bienchidino evil person, Albissimo, and Strugant of Ragona. Overthrow and dispel Balaganti, and anyone who believes in your pagan faith of Apollonius, Macon and Trevigante and in any other faith, except the Christian faith. Let whoever wants to be from west to east, from south to north, whoever does not believe in him who made everything, to have and personally be destroyed. Above all, let that old man Mazarigi, who is there in that corner, who denied Macon the vain and stubborn man and returned to be quell who died in passion, now he has fled like a vile liar before the holy Emperor Carloni. And those pagans, hearing the young man, said, Don't you hear what the Christian said? Gion stepped forward a little, saying, Marzillion, let him be found. Damn God with all the saints. How did you fail the Emperor so much that without sending sergeants or infantry to you, you did not present yourself before him to obey him as a greater, to be his servant and he to be your lord. You have done so much to my lord that he should never forgive you, but if you want to return to my god and get baptized with all your people, Carloni is so gracious and pious that he will forgive you if you know how to apologize. Come to him and you will say that out of madness you have acted against his greatness. You will give him the lordship of Spain and all that you hold at your mercy, and he will give you in France or in Germany, you will want in Provence or you will want in Normandy, in England, in Flanders or in Brittany, you will want in Bramante or you will want in Picardy, city and castle and every seigneurage from which you will always receive pride and homage. If you don't surrender, within a month of Carlo you will be besieged here. You see that he has taken more lands than you. I know that you also know how Ferrau was dead and mangled, and I will make it clear to you that this helmet, which is so well decorated, is the one that Ferrau wore on his head. Orlando gave it to me in my Podesta. Hearing Falseron reproach his son for his death, he stood up in great fury, wanting to inflict pain on him with a knife. Massilio took it saying, don't do it. I don't want to be called a traitor, which would be a betrayal of the message, for him to speak out, to do him no insult. If you killed him, you would be ashamed and Carlo would be more angry towards us, but if your heart longs to kill him, I have a good plan for this. Outside this city such needs will be provided, and you will not have such a burden. You will kill your people along the way and they will never know. King Falserone said, I am happy. This is how I like to do it the most. Thus having ordered this betrayal, he had him ambush outside the country people on horseback of great valor who had noble business among them, there were four hundred of them and of these a powerful Allman Soro was captain. He was ordered to hide in a large wood, two hundred with him, then further on he sent a hundred and the other hundred all followed by a brush far away from all the others. As soon as Christian passed, I would strike him at the front against him so that the third line never passes. The people went as ordered. Gione stayed there that night and in the morning, when he was raised, he went to Massilio, speaking thus, Marzillion, whether you still thought of returning to Jesus or not or yes. What do you answer me about the embassy that I contacted you on Carlo's behalf? Massilio said, you will tell King Charles that I do not fear him or his gang, that with my people I believe I will confront him and demonstrate my virtue and goodness. Then Gione, without listening to him any longer, mounted his horse and left the city. When he had advanced three miles, two hundred horsemen found the ambush. The captain of the first ambush in Guion was met on the road, well armed, on a bay steed, his spear in his hand, leaning towards Guion. Good Guione, brave and cheerful, went towards him and did not stay at bay. The lance lowers and running riot, the weapons passed and died down the jet. The second who clashes with the fourth and the fifth, rather than breaking or weakening the poles, 
caused everyone to be defeated in death. Having broken the spear, Altakiara took out the heat on those pagans, tinged with anger. It certainly seemed like a blaze of flame, cutting off heads and feet and hands and arms, and lungs and guts and raging bellies. He never made such a slaughter of animals, nor of such a destruction of the Viterbo line, starting from the head all the way down to the brain. Such a man's nose crashes into his face, helmet, pelvis, hat, or armor did not have such virtue that if Altakiara catches them, she will not cut him and give him severe pain. The pagans above Gione struck with strong swords, some with maces and some with spears, the weapons they had made the swords twisted back for such a tip. Gion gave death to as many as fifty, whose head he cut off, whose cheek. Seeing the pagans belittle him, they stand back and let him go. Gion departed perhaps a mile and, as it was at the entrance of a valley, they stopped in front of the road, barricading streets, paths and streets, a hundred on horseback and waiting for nothing, some wounded him in front and some from behind. Gione took Altakiera with both hands, turning his steed towards that group. A Saracen, who Christ gives him pain with a spear on his right thigh towards Gione, comes to give him death and punishment with anguish, the spear holds him through the body. The pagan suffers such a serious blow that all his armor shatters him and the big iron passes through his kidneys and his guts fell out of his body due to that great cruel and rude blow, they had already fallen onto his saddle, with great pain I supported her with my hand, calling in my voice, Holy Mary, beautiful, Mother of Christ, Sovereign Saviour, supreme comfort of all and sinner, help me so that I am not defeated and dead. Then it pleased him who made everything, Gione departed from those people. He rides away, goes thoughtfully and is silent, commending himself to Almighty God. On the other hand I will tell, if God pleases, how Gion, wounded and so painful, returned to Carlo Mano in Pampelona. May Christ always guard you. Canto 27. I pray to that God from whom all that is past, present and future proceeds, every grace is given and granted through him, and without him no one would be sure, that he gives me grace, as I have the faith, that I know how to follow with his I'm sharing the beautiful story, so that it pleases all those who are here to hear the stories. I left you to tell the other story, gentlemen, how Gione had left Saragossa and how traitors had attacked him on two sides. The Dias told you how he killed them and how he was wounded inside the body, and fleeing wounded and drowned, he reached where the third ambush was located. Up a pass, where he had passed, those Saracens were all hidden. As they saw him approaching, everyone stood on the road shouting, Traitor, you cannot survive unless it costs you hard first. Gion, seeing things turn out like this, decided to live or die. He raised his hands to heaven with reverence saying, Supreme Divine Creator, O above all kings full of excellence, have mercy on me, a wretch, so that my power may not be taken away from me by this false Saracen people. Then that he saw himself led to such a port, he strongly spurred the steed that was beneath him. Through that troop the good steed passed beyond, by his power, the whole troop perforce, spoke in spite of them and their handicap. He went out among them, so that nothing troubled him, and the pagans, seeing the abundance of blood from his wound, let him go, saying, and he has no life. Riding Gion, all thoughtful, on a hill of a high mountain, he descended the powerful steed and, calling upon God, he loudly laments saying, God, eternal and glorious Father, give me so much virtue and may I be able to return to Pampelona tell Carlo what Massilio said, and that I can return the steeds to the wise Nemo, Duke of Bavaria, and to the mighty Marquis Olivieri I can return his sword Altachiera, and be, as I had in mind, with twenty thousand and six hundred as a flag as Orlando certainly even promised that I would come in this way. The helmet, which was so beautiful on his head, he took off and threw down a cliff. Then, wanting to mount Morello, due to the great wound that was eating away at his belly, the slender youth fell three times, saying, True God, do you want me to die and not return to Pampelona, since I still have three days left to ride? When he had had a good rest, he mounted his horse and entered the fireplace, and as he walked he was asked, Who, knight, 
made you so mean? Gion said, It is because I have agreed Massilio with the son of King Pepa. Once peace was made, I left him, and in a forest I was thus ruined. Each one was greatly affected and everyone did him great honor. Some here and some there took it and said, Ah, rest here for our love until he gets well. And he replied, I want to return quickly to my lord. We will leave Gione riding here because it is better for me to return to Massilio. As Marzilian knew for certain that Gione had escaped from his people, he said to himself, Oh, I am deserted. Now Carlo will be inanimate against me, once the betrayal is discovered. And Falserone immediately called out, For such news, dear brother, we must find a remedy and shelter. Carlo, to avenge such an offense, without waiting for anything, will come upon us. Let him move to Lucerne to defend us with ten thousand cavalry. If his people pass with him they will have contention, rather than him coming here, he will be beaten. And Falseron, ten thousand on horseback, went to Lucerne without further stalemate. Let's go back to Gion, where I left Carlo returning to Pampelona, always drawing great sighs and woe for the wound that so hampered him. Riding a lot day and night, one evening he arrived in Pampelona. In the king's palace the wise baron went where Charles and the baronage were. And on his knees he went in front of him and greeted him as was appropriate, Monsignor Carlo, I was in Marsilian, and told him about your embassy. He replied to me that he would never give his lordship to either us or others, nor that he has no fear of you and believes he has great power against us. When he was returning along the path from Marsilio's people he was attacked. As you can see, he left me miserable and I'm dying in my wounded body. And Carlo, hearing such Latin, was then greatly instigated, I swear to God to take great revenge on Marsilio and make him cursed. And he was immediately sent for doctors to treat the young man. The doctors came and ordered him to return his guts to his body in his state. As well as being able to do and organize the guts in his body, I will be able to give them back to him without any cripple. Two barons held it on one side and then two similar ones on the other and here, and there they had it so much fun. So he gave up his soul to Jesus. Then there was a lot of crying. Once the baron of great virtue had died, Gandapontier, who had died, was happy with this outcome. There is a great lament among all Christians at the death of the Frank youth. King Salaman hit me with both hands, scratching his face and hitting himself in the chest. To take revenge on the pagans he swore to the high God, the perfect father. And he was buried with honor and merit in Pampelona from the Christian college. And as that day passed, in this world was the dark night. Count Orlando Terrigi called, and had his armor brought to him. Armed, and Vigliantino covered with a noble and beautiful covering, said to Terrigi, I am leaving, but where I go for you may not be separated. Make sure you never say anything about it, because I would then immediately have you hanged. And that mighty baron departed, towards Lucerne he began to ride. The whole night until the bright day Orlando rides without stopping to do and in the morning, before the sun shines, he reached a river near Lucerne. King Falserone was outside Lucerne with those people he had brought and all the people of the city were outside with him at that time. Seeing Orlando, such a beautiful champion, they said, he is one of baptized people, but they feared nothing of the count because he had no bridge over the river. Orlando put Vigliantin in the river, the steeds boldly set off. As he had the habit of noting, he cut off that river with throw after throw on the shore, without another volume, Orlando remained to provide his advice. On the shore we will leave Orlando, and return to Terrigi, to tell when Orlando left Pampelona. Terrigi then stayed for perhaps three hours and thought to himself, rather than Orlando dying like this, I want him to make me lose my person. And down where the holy emperor was, saying, Orlando, without another companion, rides this night towards Spain. Hearing such sermons, Charles had all his people commanded that knights, masters and pedestrians should follow his standards. And flags, banners and banners can be seen unfurling at that time, some mules, horses and packs loaded, some camels and some steeds. 
Some people remained on guard in Pampelona, and the others left, and riding the strong people, I ride towards Lucerne all night. Let's go back to Orlando, since nothing is late. As he crossed the river, he looked at himself, towards the Pagani the strong rod lowers and spurs Vigliantin who passes away. And he wounded a pagan on his shield who knocked him dead to the ground, he wounded another with such a cruel blow that it made him lose his life. The shafts with the pennon and the bare iron made him let go of the break at more than twenty, as soon as he had broken the shafts, his sword took out the scabbard, which was not at bay. He made a great cut of those pagans, breaking ranks and beating down banners, whoever was touched by him in a breath, he could say, Makumeto, I surrender to you. Although fighting without stopping, and heads and arms and legs departing, even if she was third, not to lie, more than two hundred lives left. So many people pressed upon him, that he could no longer resist the blows, he then retreated to a mountain and there he stopped to fight. He turned his face towards the enemies, who could not attack him from the other side, and with his back to the mountain, King Falseron, was gathered towards him. All the pagans around him were throwing spears, arrows and arrows at him, but he had no one so sure that as far as he could reach with the sword, he would approach him, seeing him so hard, but from far away they still shouted, Surrender yourself, Baron, rather than be dead among us at such a port. Falseron said, Now you surrender, rather than let me make you fall dead. Deny God and take my faith, I will make you rich and rich in lands. Orlando said, I want you to understand me a little. Come closer to me and do not fear. Falseron said, I will not do this, for it would be dangerous for me to approach you. So from afar they wound the baron with large arrows, spears and some with darts, shouting, believe in Macon's faith, but they were not brave enough to approach. Orlando prayed to God to protect him and his good steeds from death. And while fighting those pagans, we see that people are following distant standards. Falseron made the gathering sound and turned his horse towards the earth, without delay, chit of his other followers gathered to his standard. And Orlando, seeing them escape, was greatly amazed and took his time, he moved his person away from the mountain and paid attention to Pampelona. He saw three ranks coming towards him and he knew the master standard bearer well, in front of everyone the banner was surrounded by 20,600 people, Salaman behind them with his black and white flags, his chessmen and his flagpole, he saw Eugia with the flame and gold banner with Carlo Mano following them. When he saw so many people coming, Vigliantino turned towards the enemies with his sharp sword Derlindana, wounding the Saracen populace, cutting off outbursts and making those who came too close to him suffer. He showed so much of his power that everyone was afraid of him. And Olivier, Astolfo and the good Turpino, Sansonetto and Gualteri from Monlion, Ottone, Berlingieri, Avolio, Avino, with twenty thousand, quartered the flagpole, reached the river, passing the chimney, where the noble baron passed. Astolfo said, Turpin, what will we do? And there is no bridge, how will we get through? Turpino said, here, about two miles away, there is a bridge where we can cross. Astolfo Verdi O raised his eyebrows saying, it would be too convenient for us to go. At the name of Jesus he takes the river, noticing the good steed without remaining he passed the river and the others followed him to help Orlando and rescue him. Everyone ran towards those pagans, more daring than anyone else in the hunt, cutting here and there, as they could, their bodies, feet, hands, ears and arms. The blood could be seen flowing like water. Blessed is he who tries to flee. And fighting Charles he passed away the river and all his barony. Astolfo of England left the ranks, telling Charles, Orlando has been taken. And Carlo, hearing it said in this way, became very angry. The wise Nemo, Duke of Bavaria, looked and saw Orlando in his defense. He said to Astolfo, By the throat you lie, that he is not taken, fleece among the people. You see the one who has entered that group, who with his brand makes such great cuts, is Orlando, if I am not mistaken. They changed then from that talk, everyone entered the battle, making each other give place. 
On the right and on the left they fight, Christiani and Saracen fight well. Good gentlemen, whoever has seen twelve paladins and their followers strike those unknown dogs, well they look like real biting dragons. The camp is completely covered with fallen soldiers, there was no talk of peace then, but to wound whoever knew me with the sword, knocking one down and smashing the other. Such was the great strength of the Christians, who were stronger and even better armed, that even pagans were forced to flee, but they were followed for little by the Christians. Those Turks and Saurians left, having been greatly damaged by our people, Charles and Orlando entered Lucerne, as history tells me. He then took her without further conflict and rested there with her people. Having thus taken the city, I advised myself to ride further. In the next article I will tell how I understood the story and how I agreed to ride and how I went to the star. Christ look upon you and his beautiful mother. Canto 28. With your name, Lord who does not appear, eternal father of supernal glory, I want to return to the beautiful story and remain as the book discerns me. Gentlemen, I said in the other song how Charles had taken Lucerne and then, to ride towards the star, left him his host and his beautiful company. Charles and his host arrived one clear day at the star, as the book says, the siege was laid around with seven kings who had crowns. From the city, a young man adorned, a valiant and proud man, seeing the innkeeper and such a great baronage, immediately called a message from his people and said, Go, vassal, quickly to Carlo, signifying on my behalf, if he has a baron who wants to send him to test his great strength with me. And if he overcomes me, without opposing him, I will give the land to him at his mercy, and if I beat him for real paper, I want Charles of Spain to leave. All the lands taken by Massilio I want him to leave and return to France, if his baron, with whom I will come to grips, is defeated by me with sword or lance. Then the courteous message left, he left the city without speaking a word, towards Carlo's innkeeper he went in front, speaking to him with such features, Carlo Lord, Roman Emperor, Serpentan of the Star sends me to you, meaning if you have a sovereign baron, who will spread his strength to test with him. If he is defeated, believing in the plan, the land will give you at your command, and if he is defeated without stays he wants him to return to your lands with the host, and leave the cities and castles you took from Marsilian of his own realm. King Charles said, Inside the star I want to place two barons, who will combine the lock of a door and must hold that one. If your champion wants to have a bond, I want a hundred apprentices here for stages of the best in the land and the wisest. The messenger then returned to Serpentino and told him the clear news. The young man, hearing this Latin, spreads the news to all the people. Then every citizen bids to go there on an instant basis. And so one hundred boys were found in the land and sent to Carlo. All these were Armelians dressed in gold decorations, all with stones and pearls, of the best in the world and revered, what great dignity it was to see them. Carlo, seeing the young people flourish, said, Great God, how can you have those souls in your holy faith and deny Macon and whoever he believes? Then he called to Charles two warriors, better than the host and more proud, that was the Dane and the Marquis Olivieri, and said, Go, gracious barons, with your weapons mounted on steeds, so that you can go and be victorious. From that land take a door, which the pagan will give you free and escort. If Orlando happens to be the loser, return here, to the field, to the pavilions, and if the pagan remains unbelievers, take the mansions from the land. Then those two barons suddenly, all armed, mounted their horses and entered the pagan land, presenting themselves before Serpentino. Serpentino did great honor to the Christians, as a gentle man of great business, telling them, Sovereign knights, what door is there to look at? Said the Dane, Give us into our hands what is facing the innkeeper. The door to the innkeeper was given to them, the exit and the entrance as they wanted. Having given the door their entire mercy, Serpentino had his weapons taken away, he put on his armor and plates and put his helmet on his head without further delay. A great steed came before him, powerful enough to never fail, the baron mounted it and left the earth, if the book and the singing do not err.
The innkeeper took his path in the opposite direction. When he was near, perhaps at an arch, a horn, which was made of fine ivory, he put it in his mouth at once, shouting loudly in Saracen language, Leader of the baptized people, send me to the camp a baron who will fight and who by force me or I him knock down. Charles, hearing the cry of the pagan, appealed to Isolia of Pampelona, who had become truly Christian, and said, Tell me, for your crown, that knight, who has come to the plain, how strong he is and pro of his person. Isoliri said, It is so natural that he does not have an equal in this innkeeper. The weapons he has on him, they are all enchanted, so that no iron can cut them. If you send Orlando against him, I don't think it can last with him. As you like, do with this thing, I have told you everything about him to do with him. Then more barons stood up and called for battle, lifeless. Carlo did not want anyone to go there, feeling that he was armed with such weapons, and ordered that no one should collapse under penalty of everyone being taken down. Orlando didn't seem to have learned, he was decked out with all his weapons. He mounted his horse and goes towards the Saracen, strongly spurring Viglientino. Coming he said, may your god give you honor. Serpentino gives him a nice greeting. Orlando said, Baron, full of valor, you have not yet fought with me. If it would please you, for my love, to believe in that God who is the supreme help, I would be happy and I will keep you as a companion with the honor of Charlemagne. Serpentan said, your thinking is wrong. I didn't come here to get baptized. I will not believe in that faith that Saint Piero left you until I can give up. Take the field, if you are a good warrior, you will do nothing against my weapons. Then the two warriors ran for two arches with their good steeds. One after the other the steeds spurred with low spears and shields in their arms. Chest for chest each clashed, the shafts broke on the iron shields. From the strong blows that each gave each other, they were bent over on their backs, then they recovered from those great blows and put their hands to their sharp swords. Orlando hit Pagano on the head of the strong Brando, but no cuts. The pagan went towards him without stopping with his weapon in his strong hand and shouting, on his shoulder he gave him with such force that he cut off everything he took from his weapons. The sharp Brando went right up to the flesh, and the count came towards him loudly shouting, and gave him such a strong blow from behind on the neck that he made him bend completely, but I already have nothing wrong with weapons. The beating made him forgetful. Unless the strong steed carried him away, Orlando would then do badly. Then he turned his steed towards him, he went shouting to him like this, Wait for me, Christian, for I promise you that no helmet will stand up to this blow. The Maieri and Spago already nor do I kiss against my strength anything escaped. Orlando did not already respond to that saying, towards the pagan he went with false traits. On the head he dealt him such a blow that on his steed he completely bent and twisted him. Sepantan comes towards him with anger and shame, on the shield with the sword the holiday, which, according to the author tells me, the shield in his arms leaves halfway. The blow on the right thigh lands, which greatly amazes the good count, then I immediately commended myself to God and then turned towards Serpentan, shouting, Take care, renegade pagan, for at this point I will make you die. A very strong and enormous blow left his right arm twisted. Serpentan was bowed by the great blow and turned his steed with great courage towards Orlando, then shouting loudly, Take care, baron, for I will give you death. Now who could tell so much about the strong blows that each one delivered to the right, and left to double? If one beckoned and the other gave, Orlando could no longer last, because the pagan was cutting off all his weapons and he could not injure him at all, nor could he cut or leave his weapons. After having fought for a good three hours, Serpentan with great anger raised his sword and struck a blow of such great value towards Orlando without heeding anything. If he were dead he would have had no other tenor than for Orlando to descend from him, and Serpentan, who missed the blow, bowed completely to the strong horse. The large thigh of the straight thigh for bending in the signia broke. Orlando then, to give him a spear with the sword in his hand on the stirrups, stood up, Baron, shouting, Your mind is afflicted against me, 
I don't think I can do it anymore. Surrender yourself to me as a prisoner, may God sift you, so that you cannot last any longer in the battle. Sepantan said to him in a humble voice, Baron, let me rearm. If you kill me, you will be considered vile, let me arm yourself and then try with you. Orlando then, like a gentle baron, said, Now you surrender without praying any more. Saying this, with an angry mind he wounded him on the unarmed thigh. From the force of the blow and then of the brandish he severed the thigh and part of the bow. The baron, forgetful due to the pain, fell to the ground with a strong swallow. Then Orlando dismounted his horse, saying, Do you want to deny Macon? Sepantan said, No, kill me quickly so that Macon may guide my soul. Then Orlando took Derlindana and removed the armor from Serpentino, and that mighty paladin placed the sovereign sword on his body. The champion of the pagan faith died. Orlando then with courage even wore the arms of that pagan to himself, then towards the joyful innkeeper already. There was great joy among the Christians and everyone, all shouting, To the earth! To the earth! Then all the pagans of the city, seeing their champion in such a greenhouse, men, women, small and middle class, for defense each one closed in on the Oliviers and the strong Dane, who were at one gate as defenses, shouting, Get out outside our house. Return to the camp to your people. If our champion has lost the tournament, we don't want you as gentlemen. And each one of them can show them, but whoever went in front was sad. Such was the great power of the barons that the people had all their knowledge. It made all the people shout so loudly that it seemed as if the world was falling apart. Olivieri, and the Dane make a great cut of those very thick people. The battle lasted two hours or more, no baron seemed to be afraid, for as many as three hundred, both small and large, they had died with sharp blades. Then there were certain citizens, who had given to Charles and their sons, as I said before in this Latin, so that they could not feel death or pain, they sent a proclamation among those Saracens who refused to fight the troops, which is right reason and expressed the land to give to Carlo, which is promised. Then the hard battle stopped and everyone returned to their homes. Carlo, who was stationed on the plain, had his masters set up banners. Well half the innkeeper, without any other fear, in the city, knights and pedestrians, will go with Carlo Mano to follow him, if people want to contact him. They took the land without being contested, they took away the hold of every fortress and yet they always remained awaited there down in the plain, so that the field did not change. Charles with counts, princes and marquises, with kings and barons and more well-known people were on the ground at the, the great palace to rest and enjoy themselves. Now let us leave our Christians here and tell us about King Marsilian who, seeing his lands taken from him by Carlo Mano and his legion, had his entire barony gathered in the great mansion in Saragossa. And he is with them together, then I rose above all to speak, saying, Well, sir, I see for certain that I should be subject to Carlo, who has taken from me what I previously lorded over, city and castle, county and district, and I fear even worse, so much Carlo has been restricted against me. I have no city or villa, fortress or castle left and I have lost the star. I see Carlo's innkeeper so soon that in a few days he will be here under siege, I ask for advice for myself and for yourselves if he has no remedy in any way. No baron responded to it, each remained silent and took his place. Then a wise and pro-king Saracin rose up, whose name was by Anchidino, and said, King Massilio, I advise you for my wisdom, as it seems to me. Carlo has put you in great danger and will put you in great danger if you don't know how to repair it. As far as my mind is concerned, we will make Carlo return to the Christians with broad promises and the holding will be up to whoever has it to do as he pleases. Such a tribute was sent to Charles, one hundred beautiful mules loaded with gold and silver, three hundred with greetings and a thousand goshawks with this treasure, a thousand sparrow hawks, each well kept, and a thousand greyhounds and a thousand pointers for them, thirty gyre falcons with a thousand falcons, a thousand damsels with a thousand boys, and a thousand old men to advise him and twenty sons of kings for his stages. If you send this, 
you will bring him back, Carlo and his people, to the Christian shores. Send him word that you want to be baptized with all your bold and wise barons. If Carlo goes back in this way, he will no longer be such an adorned innkeeper. When he returns to Christianity, all of Spain will be left to you. Thus you will have deceived him in such a way that he will never make such a great companion. I know that every one of them will be cut down, we already don't care a spider's web about them. Of the twenty I want my son to go there, if he dies to escape us, I like him well. When King Mayanchidino had said this, all the barony, princes and kings, replied, let it take effect. For such speech they gave him praise and praise. I want to end this saying here and in the next I will talk about the great colleges that made the barons so esteemed. God rest you all in good states. Canto 29. Supreme virtue, from which everything proceeds, eternal father, omnipotent God, true justice, supreme reduction, I turn to you as a pious lord, grant me of your supreme fruit that my spirit may learn and be able to follow the beautiful story as well as the book counts and remembers. Gentlemen, I said in the other song how Massilio had consulted with all his barons of great business and how by Enchidino, had spoken and how he wanted to send a message. And then King Fiorano had called, King Mazademo and the good King Giastamonte, King Onavio, and King Feligaconte, and King Albici and King Margaritone, and King Answigi and the good King Lionetto, King Biasamonte and Biancidin called. Then in each one, like a perfect baron, went on his knees before him. Massilio said, to Carlo, in his presence, from my side, let this message sent for you be told before him. And he told them how they should tell them about the great tribute he promised them. Then Massilio had ten mules come, each of which was worth a great treasure, the saddles were made of ivory, so as not to lie, the bridles of gold and silver that shone, and the swans and swans were of silk, which were worth a lot of gold and coin. The ambassadors had much treasure and then departed riding. In a few days, gentlemen, you should know, they arrived where Carlo and Orlando were around the Stella for these tenors. The ambassadors, arriving at the host, were led in front of Charles and dismounted inside his pavilion. Charles did them great honor, as befits such people, they dined in the evening with the emperor and then slept the following night, then in the morning, as dawn appeared, they stood in front of Charles imminently inside the pavilion, where several dukes and princes of note were gathered. Now you will hear a beautiful embassy that was placed by those ambassadors before Charles and his barony by those false traitor pagans. King Byanchidin, a false and noble person, stood before him saying, Gentlemen, we are sent by Marsilian in front of Carlo, the champion of Christian. On Marsilio's side we come to you and yes on his side I greet you. Know that he wants to be at your call and give you this tribute as a gift, although we do not bring it to you at present, take it from me as you have received it, three hundred mules loaded with silver and one hundred with gold of great value, and a thousand goshawks with a thousand sparrow hawks and a thousand good hounds to hunt, thirty gyre falcons with a thousand greyhounds, a thousand perfect falcons to be fouled, and a thousand women and sons of knights and a thousand young men to wife, clarified and shining like mirrors, and for your good advice a thousand old people, and it was desired by your faith to baptize and deny Apollonus and Macon, and with your people you must return to the Christians and leave his home, and ask him to forgive you if he has failed you. Carlo replied, How can I trust that such a don should send me? By Anchidin replied, When you return to France with your great host, for the feast of Saint Michel the Blessed, Massilio with a great entourage from Spain will come to France, as I have counted, to be baptized with his great host. The great tribute will then be brought to you and also as ransoms twenty sons of crowned kings will be given to you, and one of my sons will be one of those twenty, who is among the best and most esteemed in all of Spain and among the most powerful. In your faith they will be baptized. Christians should be happy when so many pro-spearmen all come to be baptized in France. Charles replied, if Marsilian sends me such tribute, I am happy, I won't ask him anything else. And Charles ended his parliament. Orlando, son of Duke Milo, stood up with great courage, above all he spoke thus, 
as you will hear, sir, without fraud. Charles, King of France and Emperor of Rome and Supreme Leader of the Christians, with your beautiful host of such valour for seventeen years above the pagans we have been in Spain with sorrow. Coming is almost entirely in your hands, cities and castles in Spain have been taken and Saragossa is alone in disputes. Let us break camp for this host and set ourselves up around Saragossa, so that Massilio can talk to us more closely, if he is so eager. We'll see if he wants to pay the tribute, we have it as promised. If he wants to give it then, we'll see, if anything else is done, we will be deceived. If we return to Christian countries, we will have harsh deceptions from King Massilio. As many barons as are expected here will never resemble him again in a hundred years. We will be warred by the Navarres more than ever with our great worries. Let whoever wants to say that for this tribute we consider the game won for lost. Having said that Orlando had rumours about him, so that everyone in the pavilion hated him, Carlo, looking at that barony and not speaking, heaved a great sigh. Gander Pontieri with his mind straight stood up to say he wanted him. Now begins the great betrayal, which still spreads throughout the universe. Gander Pontieri said, you mean, Carlo. If we stick to Orlando's advice of wanting to please him even with war, when will we return to Christianity? We will never return home, Carlo, we will always go to war around the world. Since Massilio promises so much, he leaves the field and expects nothing. Duke Nemo, Lord of Bavaria, stood up before King Charles and said, that everyone could hear, who were all in the pavilion, Charles, if you want to follow my advice, having heard what the Africans have said to us, send Massilio your dear message and you will then know all his courage. Who will tell him, and tell him openly and clearly how you intend to receive the tribute, let him come to you without any shelter, if he does not want to be destroyed by you, that the tribute, which he says so clearly, come with him and be baptized in full, before we leave here, unless I completely take away his life. For if you leave this country and return to France and deceive this man, such a noble band of men-at-arms will never return to him here. Now I have finished, if you like my words, what you say next, I was sorry that I abandoned my adversary, hindsight has difficulty sheltering. And I want to be that messenger, if you like him, to that Saracen king. Carlo replied, sit down, advisor to go there, don't speak Latin any more. Archbishop Turpino then stood up willingly with Rana, saying, Carlo, such an embassy will be reported to Massilio for me. King Charles said, speak not of this. Turpin immediately sat down again. Orlando said, and I want you to go to King Massilio to have so much. If he does not want or does not want to send, I will take his life with my power. Carlo replied, among those Saracens I do not want any of the paladins to go. I want to send you another great baron, who is wise and well connected. Orlando said, send Ganalone, who in all this pavilion, has no better pavilion than he for such a market in all that you have asked for. Those of the council then, small and large, all shouted, let such a messenger be sent. Charles called Ganellan de Pontieri and said, Count, since it is to the liking of all the innkeeper and my advisers, I am very pleased and very pleased that you should go with these messengers to King Massilio for the gold and silver. The great tribute that he promises to give, know whether he wants to give it or whether he feels like it. And when Gano heard these words, he was never so sad or so sad. He took up this embassy unwillingly, because he thought he would make a bad purchase, and shouted loudly so that everyone understood him, if I return there, in faith of Jesus Christ, and am not killed by those Saracens, this journey will cost the paladins. The mighty Olivier, who heard him well, went towards Gano with ill will, with all the strength of his arm he gave the Count, who was sitting, a jolt, not without strength, so that it almost made him feel like a chair. Fall. The blood from the mouth on all sides came out of Gano, whereupon he became angry, saying, Dear Consterity, Sire, this blow that you have given at present. With the brando in his hand, wanting to hurt him, he went straight towards him. Duke Astolfo, Sire of England, seeing Gan with an angry mind, 
ran towards him with the sword in his hand. Then Duke Nemo moved and took Astolfo saying, don't do it. Don't be so deceitful against him, let him complain about his damage, since it is convenient for him to go, since Carlo likes it. Then Gano began to speak in front of Carlo, the true emperor, saying, Monsignor, if you like, I will soon be on my way. But inside he burned with anger more than fire, harshly inflamed by iniquity, and he says to himself, it is necessary for him not to show me that he is angry, but I will play such a game with the paladins that each one will be cut to pieces. Before you return here from Saragossa, I will cut and mow the paladins. Then Carlo got up to respond to Spain's messages. Hearing how everyone had spoken, he said, messages of great virtue, I am completely resolved to send Gano to your companion to find out from Massilio what he wants and that he send me the tribute and the assets. The messengers, hearing the answer, said, we are happy with what you do. And out of the pavilion, without further pause, they went out and had their loads loaded. Gan de Pontieri went out to the coast saying, I want you, sir, to stay here at my pavilion until the morning, then we will take our path. King Bianchidino, the wisest of them, replied, For your love we are happy. Thus they rest the night until the day, at the bright dawn, then they loaded their loads and treasure to take those false fraudsters away, and Gan with them entered the street together to carry out Charles's embassy. And so these people were riding, King Bianchidino asked Gano, How strong a man is your Count Orlando, who gives great pride to Carlo Mano? Gan replied, speaking proudly, In all the Christian people there is no one of such power, nor anyone who does not have great learning. If he had the whole universe on his back, a vile besant without learning or care, he is so full of power in every verse that I could not tell the extent of it. I don't think he's such a different giant that he wasn't very afraid of him, and if I tell a lie, whoever felt it could tell if he left it alive. King Bianchidin said, Is there any way or way to have him die by treachery or by deceit or fraud, that Charles would not have so much courage? Gano replied, For this I praise myself, that at his death I want to consent for the great outrage and great disgrace that was done to me by his company. You will see Massilio threatening me when I am in his court before him, and him and his people despising his barons together, then with him I will want to order the great victory for you Africans and the death of Orlando and the companions who are so great against you. King Bianchidin said, If you do what you promise to my just lord, you will gain so much treasure that there is no greater in Christianity. And so, reasoning together a lot, in a few days the false traitor in Saragossa arrived in the palace where King Massilio was at ease. When Massilio saw his ambassadors return with Ganalone he suddenly asked them, What response do you get from Carloni? Said King Biancardin, This baron of his will tell you all the matter here. And Gano continued speaking, not seeming to know what point he was making. That true God who formed and made the universe world with his own hand, of which three parts are round by round, Africa first, Asia and Europe, and from then took us from the depths, giving us of his grace magna copy, safe and maintains the church of Rome and Charlemagne, who is called Imperia, save and maintain Orlando, Sir of Anglant, Duke Astolfo and the good Turpin di Rana, and Sansonetto, who was already Africanti, save and maintain all Christian faith. Destroy King Massilio and Balaganti and all your false pagan faith, whoever does not believe in Jesus, Lord of everything, of having and of person, be destroyed. I am a message from Charles the Emperor and here on his behalf I command you to pay him reverence, as if you were your master, and what you hold at your command by half once without any other tenor than to make Count Orlando the lord of it, and with all your people return to your God and deny yours which is false and filthy. And he wants you to send him the great tribute, which you sent him to say you would give him, and I am here for the treasure that has come, and he also wants other agreements with these, that the Argalifo, who is your uncle, must make it known before him in prison that he wants to have his head cut off, because he had two of his nephews hanged. And if you don't do what I tell you, Carlo and his host will put the siege to rest. What you have won't be worth a fig to you, stealing and burning everything. And if you want to be friends with him and get baptized and observe these agreements, 
you will remain a rich and great lord, and if you don't do it, you will have bad gain. Farante Carlo take and tie, and in France he will treat you like a mastiff, then he will make the dogs eat your meat, if you don't surrender to him, a wretch. Massilio, hearing Gano speak so, felt great pain in his miserable heart and then angrily took a large skewer from the hand of a sergeant. And towards Gano he led the spit saying, Messagia, you can't survive. You won't do any more embassy, the king shouted, I'll have you cut to pieces. Gano then took off his cloak, to be able to better repair his arm with the blows, she wrapped it around herself and then pulled out the piece of her sheath, shouting, Massilio, a vile besant will not care for you, nor you nor your entire court. I believe I am safe and indeed I swear to you that I will die, to give death to more than a hundred inside this wall, so strong do I feel that I am a person, and if I am dead, Massilio, wait until Carlo will take great revenge on me. A Saracen, who had the name Ardolotto, who was a carnal relative of Massilio, came forward and said, Already not learned, O King Massilio, natural lord. If you give me the floor here suddenly, I will give that Christian a mortal blow, who has despised you so much in speaking about him, that my heart can no longer tolerate it. Marsilius then replied nothing and the Argalif stood up. There speaks boldly of Massilio, Massilio, the message that is sent must be fully conveyed on the embassy, he must not be offended or attacked. You sent your great embassy to Charles and it was accepted by him with honor. If you were to make Ganelone die here, it would be dishonorable to you and then Carlo would make an effort against him with his legion and would completely avenge him. Then by Anchidin, a false criminal, rose up to want to attack him, Massilio, regards Ganelone, from whom I have received honor and honor. This is the eldest of Christianity, of great wealth and great family, before he leaves this city, he will teach you something that will suit you, to put to death Orlando and, as gangs who are ruining your kingdom and your countryside. Marsilius, when he heard this news, threw the skewer and Gan took it by the hand saying, I want you to give me a gift, to forgive me if I had offended you. Laughing Gano said, I forgive you. Having the heart of betrayal ignited, they both sat down. We will leave the singing suspended here and in the next I will talk about the betrayal. Christ protect you from trouble and torment. Canto 30. Supreme God, most powerful Father, who let yourself hang on the cross, and shed your most precious blood to want to protect us from darkness, give me grace, most holy Saviour, that I may know how to sing so well that it pleases all who hear it. Now you will hear betrayal and deceit. Since Gano and Massilio were sitting, as I said in the other song, on a golden chair of great value, which the betrayal wanted to order, God then demonstrated his power, that that chair was seen weakened, and Gano and the king suddenly falls to the ground, Gano does not unlock the evil thought. Gano was then astonished when he saw that the chair had fallen, the terrible and rude betrayal cannot be changed for that miracle. Massilio then took him by the hand saying, I treasure your coming very much. So together in a garden Andero, and other great barons followed him. Everyone entered the garden, who were twenty-eight of the best chosen, including kings, princes, dukes and admirers, all perfect friends of Marsilian. Again the beautiful woman without defects came to Massilio in front of him. As far as the author claims, the name was Queen Brenda. In that garden she had a fountain adorned with a hundred apples around it, which there is no more sovereign in the world, than a beautiful lawn completely surrounded. Massilio and all his company vainly sat in that meadow on a gold-worked cloth, and Gano sat with them together. Massilio had a large book brought, where the story was of Macumetto, saying to Gano, it behooves you to swear to observe, without any defect, just as Orlando dies we can do, indeed let you leave from my district. And Gano placed his hand on that book and disposed his mind to observe it, saying, the way you must keep is that the great tribute which is promised to be given to Carlo must be kept and I will in the meantime take it to it. Charles, seeing how much you have, will depart from your kingdom with all his great host and leave you, Orlando will wait for you in Roncesval. I will tell him that you will come to France for St. Michael, when it is the great feast, 
then he will leave Orlando, a freelance, with 20,000 that he has at his request, and you will then come to give him a tip with all your effort and great power. Of your people you will make three companies one of a hundred thousand you will send. The hundred thousand hays are all cut, then the second one will be set up. These will be brought to a bad end and the Christian people will be alist and their deaths will be many and saddened. Do not wait until it is rested, the third group will come forward afterwards so that it will cause pain and anguish to the Christians, because they will find them lax and tired, a large part of them dead and still wounded, and their horses wounded on the flanks, so that many will have fallen. And make your barons fresh and frank. Your wishes will all be fulfilled, no Christian will escape death, except Orlando who will remain in the camp. Who cannot necessarily be dead, but will cause great pain to his people. Seeing them led to such a port, he will certainly die from great pain. Carlo will be lost to his comfort, which is so powerful for him alone. You will be lord of Christianity, of every province, castle and city. Massilio was then very joyful, making Gano festivities and joy, and said, Tell me, gracious baron, how can I trust as a certainty that the betrayal will be well hidden from us, if I give you the treasure and the wealth? He then said Gano, I have sworn and I swear, it is safe for me to make such a treaty. Can I adhere to you for certain, said Massilio, giving you the tribute. He replied Gano, yes, clearly and openly, I have fulfilled what I promised you. Then Jesus wanted to show a miracle accomplished because of the betrayal he had experienced, because that source, with such clear water, became red as blood and bitter. And the leaves of the garden dried up, the people then marveled greatly. A king then, brave and clear, gave Gano a very beautiful helmet. Another king was not at all stingy, he gave him a brando saying in his face, this is the best brando in the world, from Derlindana onwards, I answer you. Gan thanked him for these gifts. Then the queen stood up and gave Gan a beautiful bag with five stones, each very fine. This I give to you, the lady spoke, only so that you can give this doctrine to your wife from me. And then the queen departs. There was no duke, prince or baron who did not donate the treasure to Gano. Speaking Gano said to Marsilian that the great tribute should then be prepared, I would not want Monsignor Carloni to think of crime for my room. Massilio said, he is well prepared. When you want to go, he will be there for you. The statics sent Massilio to the Emperor Charles with that great treasure and gave ten mules loaded with gold to the traitor felon Gano. And he departed without a boat to soon return to his lord, and for several days he rode so much that in the star he arrived at Carlo. When Carlo's gracious innkeeper saw those loaded mules coming, all the people seemed victorious. Many barons he met had gone to Gano and the malicious embassy, not believing they were betrayed and deceived. And Gano went ahead of Carlo with the tribute just to want to introduce him. Carlo then threw a great celebration in Gano saying, you are the one who through your courage always increases the Christian people. Now I want to hear the news, Gano. In Carlo Mano's pavilion the barons gathered to hear what Massilio had in his heart to do, and false Gano began to speak, Monsignor Carlo, Massilio sent this tribute, and wants to be baptized. For the feast of Saint Michel blessed he will come to France to observe your law, but he wants the camp and the host to be removed and I must return to Christianity and the Argalifo di Baldraca, his uncle, can only send him, as I saw him, into a ship and leave. From the port, perhaps three miles away, a great storm arose on the sea and I saw that the ship sank without leaving a trace. I can tell you for sure that he is dead, so that we can make joy and celebration about it. This is the embassy given to me by King Massilio and so I counted it. Therefore it would seem best to me to remove five loggias and pavilions, because Massilio wants you as lord and has given you such magnificent gifts, and to leave a corporal with some barons to guard the brave guard, who will wait for Massilio until the holy baptism. It would seem to me to leave Orlando and the Marquis Olivieri in company, and Marsilian thus waiting, with them twenty thousand warriors. Orlando then replied to him, sneering, sweet stepfather, Pro Gand Pontiri, 
I can see that you love me with a good heart since you have given me such an honor. Carlo replied, I don't like Orlando staying on guard to do anything. I want another of my true barons to wait in Massilio. Orlando said, I will never have peace if you want to contradict me like this. Charles, also seeing his wishes, agreed that he should remain with 60,000 good people, so that he could be strong in such a place. Orlando said, I will not take away so many people with me from such a fate. A thousand on horseback I only want that I already have no fear of death. Olivieri then and his companions said of him, we don't want him to remain here without us. And here we want twenty thousand and six hundred to remain in company with you. Orlando replied, I'm happy to stay here and the others go away. Then Charles made a commandment to all his great host and barony that each one should remove the lodgiers and pavilions and load something upon his departure. Then the lodgiers and hordes were removed, so that everyone seemed full of joy, all their packs had been loaded with clothes and armor and great wealth. They were the resigned flags of those people of such pride. And he ordered and gave guard to Salamon with his strong people. So leaving Carlo then spoke to Count Orlando saying, King Massilio awaits here and I will make my home with all these perfect people of mine in San Giovanni Pie di Porto again, because my soul is very suspicious. And so Carlo left and Orlando remained waiting in Roncesvalles. Carlo and his followers rode so much that they arrived at Porto San Giovanni. Not believing himself to be betrayed, he was his host with him in that place. Now let's leave Carlo to this point and tell us about Massilio, who spied on Carlo's great host who had risen and how Orlando remained waiting for him. He immediately held a magnificent parliament of all his kings, princes and barons to advise themselves on the advice they should do with the Christian champions. And then a worthy baron, nephew of Massilio at such a sermon, who Ardolotto was called by name, stands upright, fired up and inflamed. Before Massilio he speaks boldly, Mighty Lord, I ask you for a gift, for in Roncesvalles I want to be the first wounder of the Christian people when we ride, so as not to fail anything. Orlando I will kill there with my brando, to Olivieri I will make the likeness for our god Macon Trevaganti. Give me eleven of your sovereign barons, who will be my companions, so that we will be paladins like Christians. Then Falserona at this sermon said, I will kill Orlando with my own hands, if our god Macon forgives me. Then King Malpromo stood up and said, I respect Orlando. Then Tertian of Tortolosa rose up, King Folgari and then King Franchinus and another great valiant barony of that wicked Saracen people, with their heart and with their poisonous mind they threatened Orlando the Paladin and Olivieri and his company and to put them all on the bad track. Massilio appealed to King Falserone saying, I want you to lead the first line with a hundred thousand people and Ardolotto with you as a flag. Together with you, King Tertione may strike those proud people. Then he appealed to King Grandonio di Veglia, I grant you the second battle. With Yukiaiolo and Fieramonte and King Margarito and Pro and Daring, the horned king goes with ready forces, Folgari and Fioretto in my wake. These are champions against the Count, who will end up dead for us. Now let everyone get ready to arm themselves and then quickly get ready to ride. Then he sent a proclamation across the land for everyone to arm themselves and mount horses with all the good war armor. Then in each one without fail, covered in arms, grabbed his horse and departed from that stall. And as soon as the people were prepared, they came out of Saragossa in this array. Massilio then called by Enchidino saying, I want you to drive a thousand loads of food, bread and wine to Roncesvalles and give them, in my name, to Count Orlando, who we will make a fool of, so that he doesn't mind having to wait, as I cannot come yet, so forgive me and take away these feasts so that he and his people can refresh themselves. If you do so they will not be afraid, and the Breton and French barons will eat a lot of him and will have no power. We will come upon them fresh and give them bad penance, and as soon as they have taken away their supplies, we will return as soon as possible. Then Bianchidino leaves with a thousand loads of refreshments and riding arrives in that part where he and Christian were full of courage. So he gave the sums he brought to art to Orlando, 
who received them with good talent and then by Anshadin sent his message and left him. All the Christians then refreshed themselves with what they needed, many in the evening there became inebriated, whereupon Orlando together with Olivieri of good guard took counsel all night without other thoughts. Up on a hill until midnight they decided to keep watch until midnight. Orlando said, Olivier, I will watch until midnight on that mountain, and then you will do it for our God. I am happy, he replied to the Count. So Orlando stood on that hill with a thousand knights in front of him to guard and escort the camp, so that his people would not die. Olivier remained on the plain with the other people and went to sleep. He already had no doctrine nor fear of having to die. Let's let the dark night end here and then I will tell in the next chapter how the brave people took sides. Christ look upon you and his flowery mother. Canto 31 True God, Almighty Father, who first formed heaven and earth, water, air and fire with your hands, then celebrate Adam and Eve on that place, from which we all descended, multiplied in this dim world, give me grace, my Lord Major, that the beautiful tenor of the story follows. Gentlemen, I finished the other song for you as Orlando had climbed the hill with a thousand knights to ensure that his camp was not attacked. When it was midnight, he went to stand guard and Olivieri went to guard with a thousand others and with him in his person he kept good guard all night. When the sun was scattered across the universe, Olivieri looked towards Spain, as the old tailor does in his needle, and saw that crowd and great companion, who could certainly not see the fourth, so great was the plain and the mountains. The gold, white, blue and black insignia seemed like a cloud to see in the air. Olivier seeing such an abundance of armed people on foot and on horseback, says to himself, O, oh, O oh Gan of Maganza! Sir de Pontier, you thought badly of always wanting to use disloyalty. Now Christianity will certainly be degraded, for I can see that these people come for our harm and not for our good. If Massilio wanted to get baptized, he wouldn't come with so many gangs on foot and on horseback, as it seems he shows all his africating faith. They don't seem to me to be lacking in armor, so much so do they shine from behind and from the front. Thus thoughtful, trembling with pain, he returned to Count Orlando's pavilion saying, Get up, carnal cousin, for now it is day and the guard touches you. The sun has opened its wings for the world, since midnight, not with a foolish mind, I have the supply ready. Orlando opened his eyes when he spoke like this and this sermon breaks out saying, you must certainly be lying. It's not half an hour since I came to sleep. Olivier said, come on, I don't lie. The day is clear and the sun shows the rays of him and of Spain, a great gathering comes towards us along the streets and across the fields. I believe that Gan has betrayed us, but he takes you away, so that we can escape. The people seem so armed and so many to me, all the faith seems afflicting. I see many red and white and black and yellow banners with new carvings, with crescents and bands of stars and lilies, and dogs and feet and heads of horses and snakes and armelins, metzapros and rabbits, sparrowhawks and falcons without bells of more colors I see light and dark, and lion for crest, dragons, bears and wolves, I see many blue, white and black spears that cover the mountain and the plain, palfreys and steeds of great power with men covered in armor. The fourth cannot yet be seen, what can be seen seems dark. Orlando said, Go promptly, idler, I must still be drunk on the wine. The wine hurt you so much, it made you see in visions. The men you say you saw will be goats or sheep or rams. The men of the country will be awake and will come out of their homes, due to the peace that has been made between us and them, they will release their animals without a home. Said Olivier, I am neither drunk nor blind unless I know man from cattle and a small bird from a tree, and I know gold from manure. For sure, Orlando, with my eyes I see that Massilio is coming and all his kingdom. Orlando, hearing the Marquis say this, got out of bed and took him by the hand, saying, I want to see such a marvel. Let's go to where you were guarding on the mountain. And each of them takes a horse, without armor on his horse the Count mounts with him many of his family. On the mountain he soon raised his brow. When they reached the top of the hill, 
Orlando esteemed all those people. Seeing so many tabby people from India, and Africa and from Alphania and from every part of the pagan faith, he said to himself, Virgin Mary, Mother of Christ, Fountain of Virtue, what condition are these people? For sure I see that Gan betrayed me when he sent Massilio a message. But I swear to that God who made everything, before I lose my life, that people will be so destroyed that the earth will be red rather than white. Here the fruit of their seed will remain, so free do I feel about my life. It will never be said, if not wrongly, that I died as a vile or coward. Olivieri said, Tell me, comrade, do those you see look like beasts? That very large sign in Macon and the opposite part that you see, do you look like beasts? Tell me the reason. Well, break camp, then surely you see, or you go to the hill and sound the horn, Carlo and his people will return here. And since these people seem so large to me that we will not be able to repair them, ours will be shattered by them, so that we will struggle to survive at all. Orlando said, The Holy Mother of God will help us, for she can do it well, and do not fear and do not be afraid, that we will give them to their bad luck. Olivier said, Well, do what I say, because I see that there is great need, and if you don't do it, we won't be worth a fig to these people and so many Saracen knights and hostile people, who come so willingly to destroy us, so that I advise you to sound the horn if you want to save us from death. Orlando replied, I don't want to play it yet, you don't have to struggle with this. Carlo's rescue does not take place here. I don't want anyone to ever say about me, nor to be able to truly prove it, whether I played out of fear or not. If you are afraid and your stomach is trembling, the way is to return to France. Olivier said, if you go forward, kinsman, with your Derlindanas cutting as I will with my stinging spear, to wound the afflicting people, you will never see the mighty emperor, nor Aldabella, who has the sweet countenance, you will not be able, and you will not have pleasure, because you will die here with great spite. Orlando said, if you follow me into battle, as you say, all who call themselves our enemies will be dead with sighs and woe. Now let's descend this hill now and ride down to the slopes. When Count Orlando was in the host, he sent out a proclamation among all his people that everyone, armed, should mount on horseback, under his banners and his banners, to wait for battle he lined up. Then everyone, old men and boys, there was no one left who was not armed, covered and steeds on their horses. When the beautiful people were lined up, from Monlai and Gualteri Orlando Appella. Move, Baron, with a thousand knights, to that hill that encloses the valley, and look and take all the paths with these knights used to war. If it happens that these proud pagans want to pass, he will grab their flesh. Gualteri de Monlian immediately moved, to stand on that hill to the rescue. He remained at the camp eleven paladins with ten nine thousand and six hundred knights, fine fighters. Orlando, full of courage, in order to deal with those Saracens, decided with great foresight to also make a troop of his own people, and so he did if history does not lie. He made all the people drink and eat and also give to the horses what is needed to refresh them. He had all the saddles and straps trimmed for him. The naked swords can be seen looking and admiring if they make good cuts. The armed people standing thus lined up, Turpino went on thus speaking, let each one prove himself well, so that our power may be discerned. I absolve you and Christ forgives you, today we will all have eternal life. De Martia we will carry the crown in the great court of supernal glory. Christ died for us, we are certain of this, now let us not be sorry if we die for him. Marsilius and his people approach Roncesvalles. The primary line against Orlando rode strong, which consisted of one hundred thousand knights. Each of the Saracens boasted, it is fitting that my virtue should be seen above these Christians on this day. Neshan will return to Christianity. And by riding those bad people you also came closer to the Christians. How many warriors are in the saddle of the Christians who die at their hands? King Falserone, the Apel barons of India, and Persia and many Saurians, saying, Well sir, be brave in battle, that Macon will win you over. Do as pro-men and strong men do. Each one put swords to the edge. These Christians, Franciscans and Picar, 
will not be able to show them goodness, and they are so few that they will be cowards. We will do our will with them. Today we will be victors of the sting and of the war that has been so long. Today we will be more honored than people who ever fought in the world. Be warned, sir, about wounding, that this is something that carries great weight. We will be laws of the baptized cannons, if Orlando and the others are put to the bottom. And then, sir, I also want to ask you, whoever wants to observe loyalty, that if you encounter a young boy, who carries a falcon in his surcoat, the blue and silver field, that you do not show his power against him, because he is Ganelon's son, he betrayed us and Christians to this investigation. And all that trained band was promised and sworn to do so. Olivieri of Vienna, pro and daring, said, Orlando, cousin and brother-in-law, since you see that Gan has betrayed us, and you see these people lined up, send a message to Carlo who has left, let him come to us now, over you go to the hill in front and play your good elephant loudly. When King Charles hears it played, he will immediately come here to help us. If you don't do it, you will see us cut off how many of us are here from that clever people. Orlando said, I don't want to do anything, I never want to be held cowardly. Never for Saracen no ringing, as many as they want and of what lineage. I don't want anyone to ever be reproached for such a shameful deed of mine. If these pagans are much more than us, we need not have any fear of them, for we are twenty thousand, and you know it, strong people not to lie, that in the whole universe there are not so many Franks among Christians and Africans. Turpin de Rana said, Sir of Anglant, and it reminds me that I was in Aspromonte, when King Agalante happened there and in the company of him and his son Almonte, and you were still a little infantryman, and your father Milo was with you. I know that we fought with Almonte and barely managed to gain control. If it had not been for one standard of his ten thousand had gone, and if it had not been the good Gerardo, with him Don Buozo and Don Cairo, our cowardly army remained, and this was clearly seen, that we were more than half of Almonte's people and more than him. And then we fell in with Agalante, and as God pleased, we were victorious. And I know well that ten of us were as great as we are now and even more powerful. We then caused you great harm, so behold, here you do not regret it, because of pride you have in your person, your heart does not think of anyone else. If you have no knowledge of anyone and the whole world is abeasant, don't worry, think of others, they have less power, if you believe like you they are safe. Please don't want to have such arrogance, we are not here forced by walls. Go, blow the horn, as Olivier says, let Carlo hear it and be a happy host. Orlando said, go, sing mass. Don't worry, because if these people come near us, I'm determined to fight with them, I'm the only one born. Whoever doesn't want to get into the press, either runs away or stays to watch from the side. Then they all shouted with one desire, put us to death, since it pleases him. Each one said, let each one be a brother in wounding these cruel people. King Falserone with his fine group, came forward with the first group, which numbered one hundred thousand of the people. They passed hills and each riviera, and went from the hill into the valley where our Christians were expected. And when the Christians and the Saracens were crowded within half a mile, cruel and merciless pines were heard on every side without making a home. Thus being warned for battle, each one calls his god and adores, and so those ranks closed in to die without any shelter. Good Turpino is already encouraging our Christians to do good wounding, let each one act as a champion. Today we will be in glory without sorrows. And so the great Saracen people boldly comes towards the Christians, and the Christians have nothing to do with them, but they go as far as they can from them. Two hours had passed during the day, according to what the author makes clear, the storms made such a noise that no one could tell the story. Here we leave the tenor to sing and in the next we will say, without further ado, how the great battle began. Christ protect you from worries and troubles. Canto 32. Benign merciful Father, supreme virtue, celestial power, supernal peace, merciful Lord, I turn to you with great reverence. 
who may make my heart so ingenious and my mind with such knowledge that I can follow the history understood in every place and with no contention, so that with pleasant rhymes I tell stories of the cruel storm and the fierce battle, which at Roncesvalles was between two mountains, where the frank and holy deed of princes, marquises, dukes and counts of the false and manifest idea that Gander Pontieri and the betrayal of which twenty thousand and six hundred died. I left you to tell me beforehand that twenty thousand of the Christian faith and one hundred thousand of the African faith were in Roncesvalles at the hotbed, and everyone was warned to give themselves a terrible and rude death. Now you will hear the beautiful wounding of spears, swords and darts, and not babbling blows. The storms sounded from every side, the cries and the ducking at such a fate, as is always the custom of this art, each shouting, to death. To death! From the side of the pagans King Ardolotto departs and comes shouting loudly with a spear in his hand, full of inflamed anger, Bolivieri will be dead and Orlando will be taken. And he wounded a Christian on his shield, so that the iron passed behind his kidneys, he killed him from that cruel blow. Then he wounded another with great poisons that he put the spear and the naked eye into his heart, so that both abandoned their restraints. The third one he met killed him and killed him. Sad is the one who fights him first. Ardolotto was so well wounded with the lance that there was enough for the strong Hector, he was very strongly wounded and learned that before him everyone had learning. English Astolfo, son of King Otto, seeing him coming with arrogance, lowers his spear and rams towards him and does not care why he has a crown. On the shield he wounded him in such a way that he passed him from behind with his spear and struck him dead on the hard ground, then another pagan of life chest. An admirer, who had much praise, whose name was Chiarotto di Valmassa, with the strong Astolfo he clashed with a spear, so that he smashed everyone's shafts. Duke Astolfo took Miss Lee out and wounded the admirer in such a way, between the head and the neck, that with real pain the mortal blow knocked him to the ground, then with another such blow he took the natural baron over the head, who separated the helmet and the bascinet and put the sword up to his chest. The good leader places himself in the harsh flock, sad is he who stands before him. A pagan, who had the name Mycelet, of Valmagior sire and of Valkyara, above and wounded Christian, who did not resist, and gave two of them a bitter death. In the large flock, the Duke of Bavaria's son of Eno clashed with the Saracen. Both were wounded on their shields, the Saracen's spears were not worth a die, which was seen breaking into a hundred pieces. Avino thrust the spear for me and saw the iron behind him come out, and when he was dead he struck him down despite him. Then in a big and fat Amaranti Avino was beaten again. Wounding each other together on strong shields, the spears shattered into pieces, then they put their hands on the quick and short brands and gave two great blows on them. Sariensi certainly died then, except that the armor saved them. Avino stood up in his stirrups and hit the helmet with great anger. With such great force of the brand he gave him that the helmet and the breastplate were completely opened, and he fell dead from his horse on foot. Avin covered himself under his shield and boldly attacked the flock, more than fifty were placed on the ground. From the side of the pagans a strong king towards and Christians unfurled his standard and met with a knight from Magna who had the name Tessello. The shield and barge passed and the plates, he put the lance and the brush to his heart. When he is dead he knocks him down, then he turns his steed, making great slaughter of the Christians. At seven days of death a bad tip, rather than having weakened his spear. Orlando spurs the steed Vigliantino, the lance is lowered and the strong shield is held in his arms, and he wounded the Saracino in the throat, lifeless, on the ground the fighter. He found another in that fireplace, his helmet and head cap came undone. Orlando beats him on the steed and then another on the proud shield. The shield passed to him and for my heart he placed the iron of the big spear, the Saracen died from that blow. Orlando made a move against another, he pulled him clear from the saddle and knocked him to the ground with a bad blow. Then he came running hard into the flock, killing horses and men on the ground. At twenty-seven days of death anguish, before his spear weakened, and he then put his hand to Derlindana, and advanced further into the flock. An admirer wounded him on the thigh, 
which he had no weapon to repair, he cut off his thigh with his bow, and when he was dead he knocked him down into the sand. Holding his frank sword in his hand, he slashed and slashed around. As wide as the road became, no one stood in front of him. Whoever finds it on land must go to a bitter death without further ordeal. Thus Orlando by force breaks down the pagans and breaks and breaks the hosts. King Turchione, black as a blackberry, came ramming towards Christiani. One Christian dragged himself from the saddle and then wounded another by colliding with his lance and passing him so that the anchor, then it goes loudly shouting through the flock. Whatever clashes, it is convenient to die, every Christian flees before him. Sansonetto from Mecca regained control, as a valiant and daring baron, with the spear he wounded him between the head and the neck, and felled him dead on the ground. The steed, Sansonetto carried him away, he went into the great flock with his brand. An amirant collided very large and dead on the ground by force he spread it. Then he met a great king of Soria, who by his name was called Isotto. Samsonetto struck him with the shield, the shield and the blow passed him suddenly. Let me put the spear in my heart, so that the learned baron would leave him dead, and he entered the bitter battle, wounding as many of the pagans as he could reach. On every side, great grief was felt from the many people in love, some saw their father dead and some their son, everyone seems to have bad food. There came from the side of the pagan crowd so many arrows and poisoned arrows, that when the thickest storm strikes, it would have been nothing compared to this one. Ah, how many swords can be seen being brought to bear on the shining armor and helmets. See legs and arms and feet cut and separate ends up to the teeth. It was not possible to hear one another due to the rushing of the good current steeds, so much so that from all sides there was great shouting from those who wound and those who challenged each other to death. Valiant olive lords of Vienna boldly joined the flock. At the first blow it hurt a Saracen, and then similarly an Amirant, who was very shameless. In the Petignon he wounded him badly, and the Marquis passed him with plates and mail, and dismounted him on the ground of his steed. The valiant Angelin of Bordella among the pagan people is already wounding. He does not clash with anyone, he does not vote on the saddle, to whom he gives death and to whom he is departing. A strong king of those fellow people met him running on the shield, the shield passed him and the armor and he felled him dead on the plain. Angelia of Bayona came forward with his staff low and his shield in his arms and met a great crowned king, who was called King Albio by name. This one was very pro of him in person, proud Angelier on the iron shield. The strong shield did not break in a rush, Angelier's entire spear breaks. He broke his spear, put his hand to the sword and on top of that pagan returned to wound. El Pagan goes ramming towards him, saying, Sire, it is better for you to die. Angelier of the pagan wounded by shouting, it will not be worth your while, Baron, to have courage, and he gave him a great blow on the helmet, which with great force sent him to the ground. Otton, son of the Duke of Bavaria, moved forward with a spear in his hand and found a valiant and powerful admirer in the middle of the ranks. On the shield he wounded him in such a way that the weapons passed through all of him, and he put him dead on the ground and then closed in on the flock to wound him. Avenus was already making a great storm with his sword in his hand, and his spear was broken, and he wounded a pagan on the head, so that he fell dead in a few seconds, and in the flock with his great power he went, wounding where there was the greatest crowd. Berlingier behind him does no less, he jugs the Destria and abandons the break. Archbishop Turpino was well known among the pagan people of great importance. With the brand in his hand, the Frank paladin disarms his helmets, shields and armor. A king of Lubre, who was a Saracen, met him in the battle, he wounded him on his helmet, causing him to bend it over the neck of his steed and tear it apart. Turpin stands up and fastens his helmet and shaves himself well on his horse, in the harsh flock, wounding, he chases the cursed pagan faith. He procures all the good he can inflict, sad is he who expects good blows from him. From the pagan side a king moved, I believe he was from the kingdom of Valgrana. 
and he wounded a Christian with such courage above the shoulders with the sharp sword that he made all his weapons go away and when he was dead he felt him sad and painful. Then he wounded another, the Lord of Vienna, his straight arm cut him off, so that Cristiano fell with a heavy hindrance due to the pain of his steed's arm. Baldo Vino di Gano de Pontieri for the battle wounding Macisi, killing barons and knights, no pagan defended himself from him. Alas, how many palfreys and good steeds on saddles across the seafield field! The dead men, the arms and the good cavalry formed great menageries on that plain. Marco and Matteo from Pien di San Michel with the others attacked along the coast. A Saracino, ruthless and cruel, had the spear placed on Matteo's shield and passed through the Gaul, so that the flock already costs him dearly. From what the author truthfully tells me, the great Saracen was seven arms. He had a head three times larger than any man who existed at the time. By name the Africans Ulamandoko of the kingdom of Trosse called him. In the large flock he puts himself in front, there was no Christian who was waiting for him, but the flower of all the sovereign knights met him and with both hands Derlindana the beautiful and strong clasps, saying, Saracen, now you have come. He gave him a blow that didn't land, between his head and his neck it hit him to the point. He frees his head from the harness, then he stung his horse with his spurs. When Orlando turned the horse, he found himself in the king of Portugal. This king had the name Chiaello and a thousand followed him in his reign. Orlando towards him, without further appeal, meeting him full of disdain. Strongly he wounded him on the beautiful helmet, the helmet, and the cap he had no restraint. As if he were made of wax, Orlando placed a perfect brand of him right down to his chest. Ah, how well the pro Olivieri, Astolfo, Berlinghieri and the Francotone and Sansonetto and the mighty Angelieri and Baldivine, son of Ganelone, were wounded. And similarly the pagan knights took advantage of their people. Alas, how many dead and wounded there were in the camp on every side without escape. Who would have seen the banners and flags fall to the ground and knights, brave and vigorous, show their great power that day? Alas, how many spears, arrows and large arrows could be seen remaining in the field. The bitter battle, however, reinforces that no amount of pride can dampen him. A valiant pagan prince, who was called by name Sophrisus, with a huge sword in his hand entered the battle into the flock. He entered with great and sovereign retinue with ten thousand the devil from the abyss and upon the Christian with double force the one blow upon the other then doubles. He roamed the field with his frank people, who looked like an infernal demon, and wore on his crests a serpent that had both silver wings. Here the present singing has ended, in the other I will tell you about that reality. Christ, please forgive us all and give us part of his holy gifts. Canto 33. True God of the Celestial Kingdom, who on the cross allowed yourself to be placed on the cross by that Jewish people, proud and rogue, only to want us to escape from hell, grant me grace, Lord manifest, that I may know how to dispose this story well and follow the battle and the raw flock, as I learn well from the author. Gentlemen, I left you to tell the other story, when Sophrisus entered the battle with ten thousand barons following him, dukes, admirers and barons of great importance. Orlando sees that pagan wounding his people and making such a great reward, of the spurs Vigliantino stung, where Sophriso was, there he arrived. Then he wounded him in the middle of his back, the weapons he had did him a foul, causing the belt to fall apart for me, and the steeds to overflow to the ground. His people, who were under obedience, flee when they see him dead in that stall. Orlando sticks back into the flock, whose arms, whose head stands out. Olivier collided on a pass with a rich admirer of Soria, who by his name was called Fedrasso. Olivier wounded him on his arm, he cut off his arm and struck him downwards, so that the pagan died from such a blow. And a pagan then wounded Olivieri on the helmet, and made him bend his steeds. Then he wounded him severely on his shield, the more he took, the more he got off. And Olivieri raised his sharp sword, towards that pagan he took his path and gave him a blow on his shining helmet, which cut off the pro Marquis entirely. He placed the sword in the middle of his head, 
so that when he is dead he must go to the ground. Miss Essie falls her on in the deep, strong and bitter battle judged. With the spears in his hand he wounded one of the baptized people, the shield passed to him and the weapons rounded, I gave him the sword right up to the battlements. Then the steed broached with great power on a baron of the Christian deed. Under his chin he placed the lance which El Christian of that dying body, then he wounded another and gave him a tip, which made him give up his soul to God, then another wounded that infernal, terrible and evil demon so as not to speak nonsense, all the Christians then fled from his power out of great fear. Orlando sees Falserone wounded, where he sees him, he goes to that place. With the brando he gave him such a condition that he cut two spans off his shoulder. This man was fatally wounded by the spur, loudly bellowing and squeezing his hands, and through the flock, as the boar does, it kills and kills, causing great harm. A Turk comes from the flock shouting, Long live Massilio and kill King Charles. Smashing the ranks and landing. Sad is the one who waits for him. He wounded a Christian on the head with the sword, which caused him to fall dead on the ground, and then he wounded an Earl of England between the head and neck, and when he was dead he sent him to the ground. Sansonetto de Mecca met him and wounded him on the shoulder with all his armor, dividing and cutting him, he severed the shoulder, which does nothing. Then he wounded another and cut off his head, so that he fell to the ground dead. A Turk was found in Sansonetto, who wounded him in the chest with a spear. They gave him the weapons and some meat, but it wasn't that fatal blow. Angelin de Bordella plants himself in him and gives him a great and natural blow, however many weapons he takes, he crushes him all away, it did little harm to his flesh. El Pagan brings the brando towards him with his helmet to give him mortal punishment. The helmet was strong and didn't cure anything. Angelin wounded him on the right arm, he immediately cut it off cleanly. The pagan, who was initially so mountainous, quickly fled through the flock, stronger than a crossbow bolt. Instead of leaving the spotted flock, the steed fell dead on the plain. An admirer entered the battle, with a thousand Turks following him, who was in the shape of a giant, black as coal, full of virtue. On his golden helmet he had a trevigante, with stones and pearls, which was very valuable, and he had two swords strapped to his side and a huge staff in his hand. Among Christian people it was placed, the first one it encountered, it hit on the head, and his helmet broke with his head and he lay dead on the ground without a remains. Then on top of another he delivered a great blow which struck him dead in the field, and then he joined the flock, he wounded another on the right thigh. His thigh crushed him and the good steed fell dead to the ground from the great blow. Then the pagan for the proud battle, plate and chain mail weapons. Then a knight, the son of a strong earl of England, met him, believing that he would be wounded, and gave him to his horse, which killed him in that stall. Sarachin being thus defeated, he did not allow himself to go near anyone, and he had a thousand Turks to assist him, and no one around abandoned him. Then on a great steed he was greeted again and strongly spurred towards Count Orlando, his people followed him strongly, giving the Christians a harsh and cruel death. Orlando, when he saw the Saracen causing such great destruction of Christian people, strongly urged Vigliantino towards him and brandished his sword Derlindana between the head and the neck and wounded the paladin and threw him dead onto the flat ground. When his people saw him die, no one expected the other to flee. Astolfo struck well on one side with Miss Lee his bloody sword, to which the arms, to which the head leaves, wounding it goes, that nothing lands. Better than him one leaves in front of him, seeing someone more valiant than him. Ottone and Belingier, sons of Dusnamo, the pagan people are sad and miserable. Archbishop Turpino, Avino and Sansonetto and Berlingieri and of Bordella the mighty Angelino, Avolio, Ottone and the Marquis Olivieri, Gano's son Baldovino, were well wounded. Well done all the twelve Pieri. The strong flock then thickened, a large part of the pagans moved forward. Olivier encountered King Falseron in the plain and wounded him severely in the middle of the side and all his armor fell away with his good cutting sword, 
whereupon he was greatly afraid of death and immediately began to flee. Then his people, seeing him flee, as he did to want to follow him. Thus the pagans began to flee, our Christians followed them well. Orlando Falseron arrived, who was already a little closer to death, for me he placed his side and the sword, so that he fell dead to the ground, then above the others like a wolf on the hunt to wound and kill he seeks. No such great destruction was ever done to beasts as those pagans were fought for, it would have been enough for Thessaly. Having rooted them and the Christians, they made food for crows and vultures. None of the good hurts if she pretends or is learned. Fleeing through the pits and valleys, some have wounded their heads and others their shoulders. It was already past midday when the Pagani were driven out. Of one hundred thousand he returned to King Marsilius and the others were cut off. Of that much adorned Christian people, eight thousand were left dead and as many as two thousand were fatally wounded, leaving everyone stunned. A pagan king, called Malprimo, only escaped from a hundred thousand, he returned to Marsilius, a strong man, who was in camp outside Roncesval, and told how the event had happened, which caused Marsilius to flare up with anger. King Malprimo, having said his words, fell dead from his steed without telling any nonsense. Massilio was very thoughtful about this and wanted to take him away to be buried, and then he made a brave and valiant king, whose name was Grandinio, come to him, saying, I want, virtuous Grandinio, that above and Christian go to wound with two hundred thousand at your command, to the death and destruction of Count Orlando. I want King Margaritone and King Fiorello and Chiamonti of great vigor to be in company with you. Each of them champion slender towards the Christians fighting both. Said Grandinio, my beautiful lord, I am ready to do what you love, to increase our perfect faith. Marsilian then commanded two hundred thousand knights who followed the royal banner of King Grandonius and the other warriors. So I left without question, towards Roncesval they took the paths and on a hill the pagans arrived, who could see them and the Christians. Seeing our Christians coming down from the hill so many armed people, everyone began to be afraid and to shrink together. Turpin began to comfort them all, do not learn, gentlemen, at this time. Wounds willingly against enemies, today we will all be happy in glory. All the Christians then lined up and, refreshed by eating and drinking, stopped on a strong beach so that I could save themselves. And Saracen in the valley dismounted near them, locked in one will, and when they were near an arch, everyone shouted, to death, brigade. Grandonio, a great Turk then called, brother of the Argalif Balsamino. This one was black and the person was slim, strong and mighty as a paladin. Said Grandonio, go, with six thousand of this Saracen people in your saddle and with Christian I will prepare you for battle. The great Turk said, if Macon will win me over. Towards the Christians the Turk goes shouting, come forward, O high sir of Anglant. Come and fight with me, O Count Orlando, who today will die with your Trojan people. A Christian went towards him, spurring him on, and killed him there in front of him, then he struck another dead crowd and threw it to the ground with great pain. That Turk took the lives of four of him, rather than have his spear broken, then he put his hand to his polished sword and got back into the thick crowds, wounding infinite people of Christians. Everyone seemed to fear him. Then Astolfo, son of King Otto, clashed with that pagan together, and he wounded my chest with a spear that all the weapons divided from him, but he did not fault his flesh. That Turk then moved towards him, he held him on his head with the perfect weapon, he broke his little pelvis and his helmet and his bone and felled him dead, present at the piano. And then he wounded another Christian and took his head out of the bag, as if it had been made of snow. The Marquis Olivier, with the right power, with Altachiara, his prized brand, wounded the pagan with poisonous taste within the throat and cut off his head, then in the flock a Saracen waits, who goes running like an arrow, and strikes him on the head of Altachiara, who makes him fall dead into that stall, then he goes on wounding and breaking the ranks. Avio spurred the mighty horse and found a flag with a black lion on a yellow field. This belonged to that Turk Bandrio, who killed Gaestolfo of England. 
Avio wounded him with a large spear and his steeds and caused him to fall to death, all the Turks people were moved, seeing the flag remain. Then the pagan people grow bigger. Ahead comes a lord of great power, whose name from Persia was Felak, running he goes more than a bow's arrow. And he wounded Archbishop Turpino on the shield and opened it all up for him. Then Angelino comes from Bordella and that Felaco of the adverse steeds. While this Saracen was on earth, he performed surprising and diverse feats. Sansonetto from Mecca with his spear ran through my belly. Brandonio clashed on the plain with a Christian who was from Hungary, the shield and the strut and all the armor went away from him, so he fell dead, then he got into a tough battle, putting Christian in a very bad way. Avolio, son of Nemo, brave and wise, entered the battle with good courage. Waldivine de Pontieri, son of Gano, wound his way through the different flock, placing many Saracens on the plain, now here, now there, across the field in every direction. Then a pagan entered the flock, the best that was in the whole universe, who he called was King Margariton, king of Felicitan's kingdom. He looked like a dragon in the field, killing Christians throughout the flock. The field made a lake of blood, everyone flees before such a flock. In the other speech I will follow the vague singing, as I inform myself about it. I pray to that Lord, who is supreme peace, to receive us into the true kingdom. Canto 34. In the name of him who is the supreme good, who has no greater, similar or similar, from whom all grace descends and comes, I want to return to the beautiful story, and tell of the painful punishments that were seen given in Roncesvalles. Sir, I said in the other word when Margaritone came ramming. In the battle he suffers severe cuts of arms and legs which he takes away his life. No Christian wanted to wait for him, seeing his power to be so infinite. Orlando saw so much damage done to his mortally wounded people, Vigliant in rammed towards him saying, Wait, Saracen, you're running. And Derlindana sword rebranded him and wounded the Saracen in his belt. The blow was so merciless and great that it cut him with all his armor and when he died on the ground his blood spread, so that the pagan people are afraid. Orlando then enters the fray among the great crowd of darts and arrows. There was never a battle as fierce as that one, seeing one wounded, the blood that was shed on the field could not be counted or said, and the dead and wounded on every side, and yet they set about injuring. Angelia of Bayona with his sword made his way through the battle. And there came to the camp a mighty Africant, who was king of the kingdom of Sobilia. This man had all his weapons of gold, which in terms of virtue, were worth a lot of furniture, and was almost in the shape of a giant. He lowers his spear with more than eight thousand, he came to strike our Christians and caused a serious death with the first blow. For the battle he goes flashing like a serpent or a biting dragon, to whom he gives a blow, he never has a chance, the soul gives to that which is supreme peace. Olivier clashed with him in the field with Altachiara, on his true sword, on his head the fier who put the sword without any flaw in him up to his chest. The pagan made the earth a stalemate. Olivier prides himself on other people, putting many dead on his horse and wounding him very badly. In such a dance Otto clashed with a great Turk of mighty virtue, he struck him with the sword on the crests, which made him fall from his steed when he was dead. An emirant from the kingdom of Nun came forward with three thousand armed men. This one had the name of the strong Agamemnon, and on our baptized Christians he went wounding with a spear in his hand, he caused many to fall into the water. Berlingieri struck him hard with his sword between the head and the neck, causing him death. Boldivine de Pontier went around wounding pagan people of great value, putting his horse to the ground a lot, and no one led a fight against him, so he marveled at this. And so he met Orlando in the skirmish and said, Tell me, my brother, now listen to me, may God look after you. All day today I fought and put many pagans at a disadvantage, no one was ever touched against me, I was neither wounded. Orlando replied, God wanted it and you with your father who betrayed me. They know you well for Gano's sake and therefore they won't reach out to you. Baldivine replied, I can never prove treason to anyone. If this was with the consent of Gano the traitor, who is my father, 
if I can escape this torment, I promise it to Jesus, our God, that with my hand I will take revenge on his cursed person. Orlando said, if you want to know for sure that Gano has deceived us, take away the surcoat and then the crest and dress yourself in other disguised weapons, then you will be able to clearly see whether Gano has brought us to this end. Baldivine threw away his coat of arms and his head crest. With Mutossi surcoat and crest and quickly spreads out in the flock. Thus running with him I encountered a Saracen who lays his sword on him, he wounded him on the head and did not fight, and he slashed him right up to his chest with his sword. When Orlando saw him thus dead, he said, Gan has betrayed me, I see it. To take revenge on him, Brother Baldovino towards the Pagano, who had conquered him, rammed his steeds Vigliantino with the brand in his hand without any warning. On the sword he wounded the Saracen who had divided it up to the bow, then the Baron re-entered the flock, killing the pagans greatly. The paladin fights so hard that no Saracen blow awaits him, he beats the banners and banners to the ground, his hosts breaks his perfect strength. And in the flock he fights a pagan, who was king of the Polita Isoleta. This one was black as a bumblebee, and had a face in the shape of a lion. He was seven arms long and the other limbs corresponded to his torso, he had the arms of great kindness all of silver and the saddle and the whip. His name was, to be sure, the cruel and merciless framed Usto. To defend himself, he carried in his hand a large stick that weighs a hundred pounds. Yes, he barked like a dog, he led his stick towards Orlando, if Orlando had not pulled back, he would have been punished with death. Another blow that Pagan dealt, he wounded Orlando cleanly on the back, so strong was that little blow that the crest of the horse touched his neck. For a long time Orlando was darkened by the great pain of the blow he felt, then he stood in his stirrups and Derlindana brandished his sword. He wounded that renegade dog on the helmet, up to the chin his head fell away. The valiant Samsonit of Mecca clashed with a powerful Turk and struck him with his sword, yes it cuts it as if it were ice and he went riding through the flock, pagan people cause great trouble. Archbishop Turpino comforted Christian and went to battle. He forgave each of them for their failure, he gives them penance for hurting well. On every side one another was having fun, it was already not worth calling their thanks. For the battle many people are heard, one Makumeto and the other God calling. So many pagan people died there that they could almost no longer last, unless King Grandonio came before him, different and prouder than a demon. He lowers the poles and spurs his good steed towards Belingie, son of Nemo. The beast harshly rides over the shield, the armor passes through them and makes them burdened with life. Then Otto, breaking the ranks, to avenge his brother he desired, clashed with King Grandonio together, with the spears in his hand he commended himself to God and wounded that pagan on the shield, the spears broke, worth nothing. Grandonio wounded him and not in vain, he delivered that fatal blow to the ground. Avino pushes him towards the floor, Grandonio did the same for him. Avolio came forward to avenge, like the others he intervened. Four of Grandonio's paladins have died, so the Christians fear him. He reinforces the battle and the strong blows, Ben proves to be the one with the most power. How many fighters, Pros and escorts, go with providence on every side. On the right and on the left, those who hit with the cut and those with the thrust were well joined. They saw themselves and steeds on empty saddles going around the field, having lost their siri, with their heads held high they strike each other, tears seemed to them great antreria. Alas, how many sad and painful notes and great sighs were heard from every side. Some father cries, some nephew and uncle, now strengthen that flock Rio. And Pagan called to Makumeto to take pity on their souls, saying, Ganellan be cursed, who ordered such disloyalty and causes, so many people to die in spite. He consumes Pagan ire and Christianity. Cursed be the day and the hour and the point that you reached betrayal, Gano. You hear screams from the big blows from every side, ruthless and ferocious. They wounded some with spears and some with brands, and there was no point in making crosses of arms. Old people died, small and large. Alas, 
How many caused trouble out loud, some wounded in the head and some in the side, and some in the straight arm and some in the left. The thunderbolts, spears and arrows came thicker than a storm ever falls. Franceschi, Provenzali with Picardi defended themselves with spears and swords. People of India, Saurians and Sardinians with bows drew arrows in poisonous quantities, so that those who arrived there for such wounding died. Now who could tell the blows that were given in the field and received, cutting the weapons and the bones with the octopuses, and arms and legs and heads of the parties? It didn't seem like hunting rabbits or foxes, so many men fell dead, you see. The ducking, the shouting and the heavy hitting each other almost left no one to hear. And King Fiorello of Val di Lamonda with the brand in his hand very proud in the merciless and deep battle, strongly spurring his frank steed. Margaritone behind him second and Chiamonti with false thinking, causing great torment to the Christians, made space for the battle. King Chiamonti met Turpino, who was lax and tired from fighting, and wounded the warrior with his spear and put three fingers in his side. Turpin recalls the high divine god, the Brando grips and on the left arm he wounded and cut that King Chiamonti, whereupon he fell to the ground to his evil disgrace. Olivieri of Vienna, the good Marquis, wounded King Fiorello on the head, he split his head and knocked him down dead and then caused a great storm in the field. Sansonetto from Mecca grabbed a pagan by the beard with painful pain, knocked him down on his steed and then put the horse on him and caused him to die of stalemate. The strong and pro Angelier of Bayona met King Carcuto on the shield, the shield passed to him and his person, and he was killed on the beaten ground. Angelin di Bordella strongly spurs, King Margaritone struck the shield and gave it such a blow that it made it fall, so he remained on his feet. The Africanti was put back on his horse and began to wound him through the flock. Orlando saw that great admirer who killed four sons of Dusnamo, towards him he spurs the afferent. Brandonio, when he saw him, did not laugh, but spurred his horse to escape. Orlando followed him into that standoff. Brandonio fled for two miles to escape from the hands of Cristiano. Orlando had brought him to a cave, shouting he said, Wicked pagan, you fled two miles en route. Now I will give you rude repentance for the death you gave to my comrades who were so pro and magnificent in arms. The pagan raised his sword and dealt him a great blow over his helmet. Orlando did not stay at bay at all, he raised his sword and ran on top of his helmet to wound him. As Christ pleases, his head went away without saying anything, he put him on the ground and took his life away, then to return to the camp he turned around. He entered the merciless battle, where many people had died wounded, making a great cut of the pagans, here and there the field changes. The pagan people had diminished and the Christians had not grown, the people who had died in the winter seemed to be asleep in the field. Who would have seen Sansonetto, Angelia di Bayona and Bordella, Turpino and Olivier, each surrounded by those so beautiful people, wounding each one without any suspicion? Orlando went around with the beautiful Derlin Dana, Marco and Matteo following well the band and the Count of Provence and that of Ireland. It was already the sun at Compline time, shining throughout the valley. There they paid bad money, sad was he who turned his back. Everyone gets sick of hurting each other, cursing the plain of Ronceval. Who avenges the relative and who the friend, you no longer care about life a figure a king whose name was Balsamello, who was a native of Barbary, with ten thousand under his brush entered the battle fresh and joyful, and wounded Marco, Matteo's brother, of the Pien di San Michel with a violent blow, through the heart of a spear thrown, which I threw to the ground of the dead steed. That Barbaresco entered the battle with his people, causing great damage, and met a Christian who was German, who was causing damage to the pagan people, he killed him and knocked him down on the fresh sand, of which the Christians were very afraid of him, and before no one waits for that king, but everyone contends to flee. Christians cannot take sides, such is the strength of that unbeliever in everyone, and Christian caused fear in that part where he was present. Now he reinforces the mournful singing of the harsh flock and painful battle. Christ through his mercy and gift offers true forgiveness to all and Christians. 
Canto 35. Eternal God, Divine Majesty, whose power shines in all, supernal peace, of each pity, if the penitent fault is returned to you, grant to my heart such goodness that, as the book and the author stretches me, I know how to continue the beautiful singing and return to the great battle. King Balsamello having arrived, as I left you to say in the previous article, and many of the Christian people having been defeated, some wounded and some killed, Orlando saw him in the field where he was causing such serious wounds to the Christians, he charged his steeds in those leave where he was to give him death this evening. When King Balsamello saw Orlando, he already had no knowledge of him, he came forward with his brand, saying, I will not plough your land. On the helmet he said to him, speaking thus, the helmet is strong and does not care about his power. Orlando came to him with Derlin Dana, and gave him a rude wound. The sword stuck in his straight side, whereupon he was greatly dismayed. Feeling so pierced by death, the steed had a face to flee away. Olivier met him so afflicted, Daltachiara slashed his face, eyes and nose with his sword, and then gave him the pain of death. When the pagan was dead, all his people began to flee and left the camp alone, the others who were left similarly took to flight, as best they can. All of our Christians boldly began to follow after them, as if they were being killed by dogs by running away, they did not defend themselves. Fleeing here and there across the mountains, our Christians followed behind them, punishing them for their grave misfortune, they put many to cruel torture. Thus, Saracen of Spain, fleeing, made a home on a hill for three thousand and one army and returned to wound them due to their bad sense. When our Christians saw those three thousand who were returning, they went towards them as they knew. Orlando, brave, brave and adorned, did not wait until they had descended from that hill, but without making any light he spurred Vigliantino on, and with his good brand he went towards them shouting loudly. A Saracen came in front, Orlando El Fiere on the right shoulder, the weapons sends them all to the ground and mortally wounds them with their sword. Another of Trevigante's followers Orlando met with that defeat, he cut off the head from his shoulders, and then he places himself in the hard flock. Olivieri of Vienna goes wounding among those people with his good naked sword, putting many pagans on the ground, no armor or shield is worth against him, for as many as he finds, he kills everyone. A very ruthless and crude Turk towards and Christian with a large club for the battle made a great scene. Therians and Christians joined forces with the Saracens for that plan, they cut off faces, heads, legs and hands, everyone felt their own sovereign brand. So many of those pagans were killed that to escape the unhealthy advance they turned their backs and Christian followed them, putting them and their horses to death. The author tells us that at that time the lives of all the pagan people, who were so many, were taken away, so that nothing other than a king can boast of surviving, that Marsilius received much pain from a wound which his heart breaks. As he reached Marsilio, he said, Sire, move if you want Orlando to die. He remained in the camp all alone, with no other than eighty in his company, and of that great and valiant band that you sent today, by my faith there is no one left, and with sorrow I have barely seen up to this point. I have the way. Saying this, he lost his life and fell from his horse to the ground. Marsilius then ordered all his people to follow his example, and so he moved and made three ranks move towards Roncesvalles and entered the great plain. As soon as he arrived, without further delay, King Byanchidin called and said to him, Go to that hill of that mountain with fifteen thousand as your companion. All this night you will keep a good watch so that none of the Christians can get away, then in the morning with your strong people you will start to hurt them. Byanchidin set off, which didn't take any longer, with fifteen thousand following him and on the hill he set up guard near Gualteri who was hidden there. Marsilian remained that night in the plain of Roncesvalles so deployed. Our Christians, who had suffered a terrible beating that past day, of the twenty thousand people brought there, eighty of the flock escaped, the majority, badly wounded, spent the night in bad shape. When it was day and the morning was clear, our Christians were all lined up, and the Saracens moved forward, so much so that they were all close. Orlando, full of bitter pain, had called all his companions, 
saying to them, Well done companions and brothers, today it behooves us to show ourselves strong and slender. Here it behooves us to show our prowess, so that we may always have a good reputation. Today all kindness will die, so Christianity will remain miserable. Show yourselves, gentlemen, with harshness, my desire is to see your virtue. Everyone must agree on these pagans, so that Christ remembers us. Do not doubt anything about dying and do not fear, O noble Christians, make your great virtues felt and these terrible dogs are dead. Make them suffer a painful death, no one escapes it from your hands. Do not doubt, take comfort, that every pagan there is will be dead. Each Christian embraces each other together, each crying with a pitiful heart, kissing each other on the face and showing each other perfect love. Massilio sought to fight and called upon a baron of great valor, whose name was King Philodoster. Massilio said, Go without stopping with twenty thousand of my good people, with those Christians the battle begins. King Philodoster then quickly moved with people from his province against all the able Christians. Before they are given to them, everyone chops them up. When they are pressed on all sides, one of the pagan ranks departs. In the direction of Christian, he comes, spurring him on, lowering his poles and in the company of him a hundred to put anyone who comes to harm to harm. Sansonetto wounded with courage, it is he who is wounded that nothing can be held. Each of him broke his talented spear and suddenly struck their swords, wounding each other at such a cost. Orlando Vigliantino spurs strongly, among those pagans his spear lowers and he strikes down five kings of the crown, finally the line passes behind. No Christian abandons himself here, many pagans pass by this life. Olivieri of Vienna in Philodosta had the lance placed on the shield. From one side to the other the destria falls and falls to the ground. Another wounded him between the head and the neck and similarly beat him to death. A strong Turk then regained control, who fought well in the flock, in the shield he wounded Olivieri so hard that he almost caused his steeds to fall. Olivier wounded his belly for me, he passes it all over, so that he falls dead, in the strong flock he then flew with his spear. He demonstrated his great goodness well. Long live Emperor Charles of France, everyone shouted, and Christianity. The cursed pagan army, they all shouted, long live Macumeto. Angelin di Bordella with courage for the battle above Pagan Fiere, causing raw and merciless damage, the dead and wounded fall from the steed. Angelia di Bayona, in this respect, behaved well as a good warrior, and Guiltierino, Count of Provence, with them together shows his power. Turpin ravaged among the pagan people like a dragon that spread flame. Orlando with his sword Derlindana made himself the field for the battle, he does not give a wound that is already small or in vain, to whom he gave it, he never has any escape. So in the field with heavy troubles many horses ride. A Saracen with a large spear wounded Turpino on his strong shield with such great force and venomous power that he put naked iron to his flesh, but he too and he did not die from the beating. The Drudo Baron went through the flock, receiving and giving many blows, sending dead and wounded to the ground. Sansonetto met a great pagan, who was king of the kingdom of Valbianca, and wounded him with such a rude blow that he threw him dead and lost his life. Then he wounded another and when he was dead he sent him to the plain, he never tires of wounding them well. Olivieri of Vienna in the ranks wounded a flag captain and when he died he fell to the ground and then wounded another mighty pagan, when he was dead he felt him due to his great power. Orlando Fier with his sovereign brand, no one can suffer his blows, sad is the one who is close to him. Such great force shines upon wounding that all those ranks part and cleave. Massilio then had a king called, who was from the kingdom of Volturna, this was King Paladotto. Massilio said, Let your great power be discerned and be trained for battle and lead and govern thirty thousand well armed on horseback. That king leaves, who can no longer be held. This king, who is so well accompanied, among the Christian people wounded heavily in the battle on each side, he put many to death on the ground. It was found in Count Orlando, 
Orlando wounded him by such a fate through the heart of a mortal wound, which threw him dead from his horse to the ground. The author says that thus fighting these people in the plain of Roncesvalles, King Bianchidino keeping guard near Giltier, looked and put his mind. As Christian was certainly seeing, he immediately closed in on him and Gualteri, having been well advised, clashed with a thousand knights. Thus the battle began, on both sides there was shouting. Gualteri comes at the first sight, with the pole low he climbed over a lot. King Bianchidino Ferrier of great value, who cared nothing about death, for the battle he wounds himself and puts many dead on the ground. Gualteri took to the field, cutting off feet and heads, hands and arms. It caused such great harm to the pagans that hare hunting was never done. And so those people fought, each other died from their hunting steeds. An admirer meets Giltier and lands a great blow on his helmet. The more of the helmet he takes and brings to the ground, the more effective the blow was. Gualteri strikes him between the head and the neck with severe torment, he cuts off his head and gives him mortal punishment, then in the flock he boldly goes with the brand naked, covered in blood, among that pagan populace so deserted. A Saracen, like Black Carbon, goes to wound the Christian people with great power, merciless and proud, causing many Christians to die. There was no one, and this is certain and true, who could suffer his blows. Gualteri saw so much damage being done to him and left without delay, and wound him with the sword on his head that up to his chin the helmet is part of him. For the flock, Gualteri makes a huge storm in every direction. He demonstrated his great power in fighting well, as he knew the art well. Everyone on the ground should put him, no one Saracen hits him waits. Both Christians and pagans were less affected by the cruel and mortal wounds of swords and arrows with poison. How many brave and natural barons were seen dead on the ground and were almost equal in fighting? King Bianchidino met Gualteri, he wounded him with evil thoughts. He struck my side with his sword, so Gualteri thought he was going to die and wounded him, and although he was tired, he made the head go away from the crowd. Having lost his life, he began to dismay his people, who were left between healthy and wounded except for a hundred Christians in those quarrels. There was no one left who did not die, except Gualteri who seemed to have passed away with great pain from the wound. Then he dismounts from that hill in the valley, in the battle on the others he loses himself, wounding some with the cut and some with the bridge. When Orlando heard it, he raised his eyebrows, Seeing him he was very amazed and asked him where his people were. Diltier replied, everything was dead. Orlando, who hears such an opportunity, becomes more disheartened than ever. In the other words the painful battle I will count you fully extended and escorted. May that true God, who is supreme harmony, have mercy on us all. Canto 36. Glorious Virgin Mary, who are the supreme hope and true path of salvation for sinners, Mother of Christ and eternal power, give me grace through your kindness so that I know and can follow with beautiful adornment the beautiful story and the beautiful singing, which I all people delight in hating. Gentlemen, I said on my other hand how Gualteri had come to the camp. The flock was so cruel that one would not be believed to tell it, one dead on top of the other with great crying, whoever was alive had his head wounded, and pagan people also abound, although Christians respond to the majority. A Saracen of great vigor with ten thousand in the flock entered and his name was Eudolo de Alphania, who lorded over a beautiful country, the lance lowered with him and many of the Christians he straddled. Angelia de Bayona rechecks and touches the shield with the brando. He cut off what he took from the shield and the blow falls on the thigh, no armor defended the Saracen, who cut off his thigh and cleaves the bow and laid that pagan dead on the ground, and his people then take to flee. Orlando for the flock with great pain very pagan of this bare life. Samsonet from Mecca, valiant for the battle, shows his might, with the brand in his hand, all bloody, he was greatly missed by the Saracens. Turpin of Rana, nothing hidden, goes through the field with much arrogance, Dead and wounded with great bitter grief he puts to the ground anyone who stands in front of him. Orlando turns through the flock, giving and taking away merciless blows, 
many pagans had taken their lives, and placed the dead in the water on the ground. In the thick battle Olivier, had cut off many of those pagans. Angeline de Bordella behaves well in this escort with the other paladins. Gualtieri de Monlian, who was wounded, fought so desperately, Saracen was not so bold that he did not flee when he saw him, but he fought shortly before it was finished, so that six paladins remained. On the side of the pagans, King Cordis then advanced with eight thousand. He wounded Orlando in the visor, the helmet was strong and that blow does not cure. Orlando turned to him with a proud mind and measured the brand on his head, his helmet cut him as if it were wax and when he was dead he struck him down on the plain, then he met a great admirer, who was built like a giant. El Pagano wounded Count Orlando on the shield and in the middle of the road. The Count thus struck him with a strong sword between his head and his neck, and that pagan ended his life on the ground in a similar way, then through the field Orlando proudly strong, giving death to many Saracens. Marsilian entered the battle, the lance lowered and the good horse, spurred on, and encountered in the bitter battle in the fort and pro Angelier of Bayona. Pass him the plate and male weapons, the person passed from behind. The champion of such goodness falls dead on the ground from that blow. Massilio took the lives of five of him before his spear was broken, then he put his hand to a polished sword and slew across the field, who was not aware of him. The Amansa of Soria with courageous strength in the battle placed himself in that eighth. The Argalif of Baldraca, and the king Struganti and Mazarigi then advanced. The great king Simeone of Soria with admirers and many kings with him, with twenty thousand in his company, entered the roar, and thick flock. Above and a few Christians each wounded, some were dead and some were placed on the ground. And how many inauspicious people fall there, that I make to close them across the field. Marzillion, like a proud serpent, slashed through the flock on all sides and met the mighty Samsonit. With the sword he wounded his side for me, no armor was of any use to him, for the sharpened sword reached his heart and killed him with the good horse, then for the flock fares not in error. The Argalifo of Baldraca with his lance on his shield wounded the good Marquis, the shield passes, the bruise and the belly all the way to the back, which defended him nothing. Seeing Olivieri at such a tip, he took Altachiara with both hands, shouting, Saracen, you won't survive, you will not boast that you killed me. And the Marquis wounded him on the head for such great shame, vigor and power, that up to the chest with the sword he struck him, whereupon he gave him the penance of death. Olivier's blood came out of his body like a pin with great suffering, and of the Olivieri fasciosi plague, then when they hurt they abandoned everything. Already in the field as if forgetful and already lost all sight, and among the flock he found Orlando, a paladin of great power, he gave him a great blow on the head, which almost knocked him to the ground. Orlando was amazed at that blow and raised his eyebrows towards Olivieri saying, my sweet brother-in-law, why are you so angry towards me? Now have you become a Saracen, and denied our true God? Olivier said, My dear cousin, forgive me for the light I cannot see, I'm mortally wounded, I won't deny it. But if you escape, for love I beg you that my sister and your lady Aldabella be recommended to you for my love. We no longer wait, but among the bad people, put me quickly where it is most crowded. Orlando, out of pity, does not speak, he thought he would die at that moment. He took his horse by the bridle and put the horse where it is fullest. And yes he said to him, my strong brother-in-law, now you are in the large and thick flock. Olivier stung his steeds to this fate. Sat to him who comes before it. At more than thirty then he died, so much so in the great flock he had placed himself, and his steed carried him so much that he led him from all the ranks to the plain where his pavilion was, and precisely there the steed stopped. Olivieri, the mighty Burgundian, dismounted to the ground with great pain and made a devout prayer to God. His soul passed away from his body, then the steeds returned empty of the Baron of Vaglia in the harsh battle. He made the great steed duck, kicking hard and then biting hard, he made the ranks desert and open, placing the wounded and dead on the ground. Orlando, when he saw him coming, said, Olivieri is dead, if I understand. For my faith, 
I will take revenge. Then he began to hurt in great haste. Marsilius, who saw him in the field, turned towards his pavilion to make his escape before the paladin. He took a little jockey in his arms, away he runs away, it seems that the flame is less. Orlando broke away from the camp after him and ran so fast that El Pagano reached a cave, at the bottom of a level. On his shoulder he wounded him with knuckle, which cut it as if it were ice, and even more so stripped him, that his son cut off his left arm. Massilio then fled in mortal pain so as not to feel any further embarrassment. Orlando, having done this, did not stay, but in the cruel flock he gets back. And he met the Amansa of Soria, who had died, of Bordella Angelino, between the head and the neck Orlando wounded him, who knocked him down to the ground. King Mazarigi came before him, Orlando the beast with the flint and steel. His head is cut cleanly and then he gets back into the bitter battle. Due to the power that the Baron shows with Derlindana in his hands for such a fate, all people flee from him so as not to feel cruel death from him. Apollo and Macon were strong based him, you know, and so Gano Maladiva strong, cursed be you who came here, who makes so many bodies of life sad. Orlando also looks across the plain, where he saw more noble people, there he hunted with the hard sword, striking some from the head up to the tooth and others up to the waist. As his horse ran thus, the good steed died due to exhaustion, and he soon took away that of Olivieri who had always followed him. As a person the horse followed, at which every pagan is astonished. Everyone who was fleeing behind watched, Orlando followed him eagerly. To the strong pagan people he gave such a harsh death with both hands, he acted like a proud lion among dogs. It was already past midday, and between ninth and vespers he was busy. Orlando clashed with Turpin, and asked him about the other companions. Turpino said, no one survived. The Count then grieved greatly. Turpino said, let's go and rest and now let's leave these people alone. I immediately went to the pavilion, and as soon as they had dismounted there, Turpino said, my dear companion, all my senses feel troubled. Saying this, the angels were soon seen and clearly taken down from heaven, they carried the soul of Turpin with songs and celebration in the holy deed. Orlando remained completely disconsolate with great sorrow and much pain. Being refreshed at a fountain, he thanked the Supreme Creator saying, God, no one has survived in a while, give me death, true Lord. Suddenly a splendor appeared and these words were scattered towards Orlando, the true God will give you company just as you had before, men strong and full of vigor of your deed and each powerful. Orlando replied, if it can be that those who have died now that God the Father brings them back to life, I am happy, if not, I don't want to escape. Another voice said, God does not like to resurrect those who are dead. Since then he has asked us for deceitful death, you will soon have it, but let him comfort you. Then the voice disappeared and Orlando fell silent and returned to dark and strong thoughts. Thus, thinking of the King of Paris, his squire Terigi appeared to him. Orlando gave them many caresses, then he said, let's go to that mountain. Terigi moved with Orlando, on foot to go through the sad countryside. At a large stone Orlando struck his very great Derlindana sword, believing it to weaken, the strong sword split the stone, without failing. Orlando struck more and more blows at that Petron, believing it to weaken her, and doubling all his possessions, he was unable to do anything to her. The stone left it alone and then moved saying, True God, you don't seem like it, O oh my sword, beautiful and so strong, why didn't I know you before death? If I had known you, as I do now, I would not have learned anything in the world. Getting onto the hill, with complete force the horn to mouth placed itself in certainty, it sounds so loud that his heart changes and his blood flows from his great power. And Saracen, who had remained in the camp, hearing the horn, fled for escape. The author recounts that the sound of that horn was so loud in that breath that it passed over mountains and plains and all the areas where Carlo and his people were waiting. By the virtue of God his voice spreads, it went to San Gian Pie di Porto. Carlo, who heard that horn sounding, began to speak towards him and his baron, 
that sound seems to me to be that of Count Orlando, I am very afraid that King Marsilian has deceived me. And Gan immediately said, Holy Emperor Carloni, old man, you make me think of this, so you speak like a boy. Carlo then remained silent about him, Orlando goes to play again. With such great force he blew his horn that Carlo and his people understood it. Carlo looked around him, the baron, and then with great melancholy said, that looks like the horn of my adorned snow. And Gano first replied to everyone, Monsignor Carlo, speaking like a jockey, it seems to me that you have mastered Latin like this. You know well that Orlando does not already care for the whole universe of Isle Bezant, he will now be hunting on the plain and therefore his beautiful lionfant sounds. Carlo then remained silent, but he does not reassure himself. Orlando speaks to Terragi about him as an infantryman, you will go to Carlo, as I am dead, which is in San Giovanni Pie di Porto. Tell how Gan committed this betrayal, when he went to Marsilius by message, of knights twenty thousand and six hundred of whom died with grave outrage. And then the Baron of Courage placed the horn on his mouth and blew with courage. As soon as the horn sounded, I knelt down, devoutly I commended myself to God. The angels of God carried his holy soul from the body, as it pleased Christ, up into the glory, where it is always sung, they carried it, and this was seen. Terrigi almost collapses in pain, embraces Orlando and says, Alas, sad man! Dear Hope, my sweet Lord, why did God take your life? How will I go back to Carlo and tell him about such an embassy, which will cause him to be tormented by pain? The baptized people may well say, Where is our champion? Where can we find it, O oh, disconsolate people? Terrigi made a great lament and wept, then he departed and left the holy body. Now let's let Terrigi ride and yes we will say about the emperor. When he heard the third bell ring, he immediately turned to the false Gan alone. He said, you certainly had to deceive us, when you went to Marsilian by messenger. All the barons then shouted loudly, Gano the traitor be given death. Duke Nemo, Lord of Bavaria, took Gano by the chest in this manner and said to him, it is better for you to die, now you have come, false traitor, you made me die four sons, who were with the emperor's son. Arnoldo di Berlanda, and the good Dane each lay down against Gano. The pro Gerardo, Sir de Rossiglione, and other great barons, each powerful, each ran towards Ganalone, facing him strongly. Gano said, Imperador Carloni, do you suffer by telling me you are present? Carlo replied and said, It seems to me that they are right in doing this. He ordered Charles to be tied up and placed in a tower, guarded by five hundred knights until he was gone and returned, then he commanded that everyone be armed and on horseback that everyone should salute to follow the ensigns where they go, who wants to see serious damage done to them. Then Carlo made the people of Gano go forward to disarm him, then the sovereign army moved, and it had not advanced an arc before Carlo Mano descended from his steeds, and then I knelt down in that breath and asked God for grace thus adoring, as you will now hear here listening. Grant me now, most high lord, that the sun, which has already passed at Vespers, shines so brightly with its beautiful splendor that I have arrived at Roncesvalles, and the mountains for your great valor up to there are all level, so that my people can ride well. Then he got back on his horse and made a move. As soon as Charles mounted his horse, with his gang riding quickly, the true Christ granted him the just prayer he had made. Every mountain and knoll was removed and all leveled in that stretch, and the path that Carlo had to follow, Christ by virtue of him had it leveled. And the splendor of the sun that leads us, which had descended at the time of Vespers, continually showed its light, as if midday were lit. This is what Christ did, who leads all good things. Then Carlo took his path, and riding for such services, the squire Terrigi appeared to him. He was amazed then, seeing it, it seemed to touch his heart a great deal of pain. Terrigi went to him with a troubled face, with great sighs and tears in his eyes. He seemed almost foolish about the great pain, he doesn't even remember that he knelt down. King Charles saluted with such effect, as for me, sir, you will be told. That Father God, who is eternal peace, who built the earthly universe, 
and every good is done by his grace, whose power will never fail, save and keep you, true Carlo, in great Victoria and in a serene state, beat always with damage and shame whoever has done you harm or causes you agony. The stories I bring are so raw and so bitter and with so many pains that I cannot say, my heart closes so much, because they were never worse in the world. Count Orlando, who had great virtue, commanded me to come to you, gentlemen, so that I could tell you everything that happened and the great damage that was received. Dead is Orlando, the flower of the knights, the Duke Astolfo, his carnal cousin, Sansonetto de Mecca and Olivieri, dead is the Archbishop Turpino, Avino, Avolio, Ottone, and Berlingieri, and of Bordella the mighty Angelino, Angelier of Bayona, Count Ugon, dead is the Frankish Giltier de Monlion, Marco and Matteo del Pien di San Michel, 20,600 dead, by those people, who are unfaithful to God, they died with pain and torment. Gand upon Thierry with evil fele with Massilio ordered this betrayal. When King Charles heard these words, he took to riding with his people. Away riding Charles and his companion, with him Arnold and the Duke of Bavaria, first goes Salaman of Brittany and then Eugia with the royal flag. Now he reinforces the beautiful singing of Spain. In the other I will tell you about the proud battle that Charlemagne fought in Roncesvalles. May Christ give you peace with gain. Canto 37. Supernal God, from whom seven planets and four elements were formed, and you freed the righteous, the sinners and the innocent from the dark hell, grant grace to my hard intellect and give my mind so many arguments that I can talk about the grave pain that Carlo made of Orlando and his group. Gentlemen, I said in the other song as Orlando, the virtuous count, after having made his third sound, the soul returns to the glorious Christ, and he said how Carlo had already started riding very melancholy, towards Roncesvalles he rides with thoughts in the midst of Nemo and Ugieri. Carlo arrived on that mountain where the flower of Christians had ended, and riding, which loudly complains, upon reaching his body, he fell stunned. No baron of his companion was at all daring to remove Charles. And staying like this for a while, I felt again with great sighs, pains and fixed cries. With great lament says Charlemagne, my dear Hope, nephew and son, who had no companion in prowess, O supreme champion of the Christian band, for you I remain in pain in the world and disconsolate with heavy sorrow. Today, due to your death, all the hope of Christianity lowers and falls. Today the pride of the Christians is dead, their great hope has gone to the bottom, they have lost their courage and comfort, since your great power is over. Oh, you wretch! Led to misfortune only by the traitor Gan of Maganza. Oh, Gan de Pontier, how much you failed when you ordered such a great betrayal. Cursed be the hour when your father begot you with a just marriage and cursed be the hour when your mother gave birth to you, devil incarnate. With betrayal and your thieving works and with spite and clear testimony the flower of Christians, who was my hope, is extinguished for you, the valiant seed. And so over the body of his anguished nephew stood that King Charles and often hit his face with his hand and no one could console him. And he shouts as loudly as he can, painful, with what pain I speak. Dear nephew, why don't you lighten up to take away my pangs and heavy cries? This is not what you promised me when in the beautiful country of Aspromonte you made yourself a knight through my hands and killed the valiant Almonte, and Derlindana, his sword, you swore, and you promised me with a happy face that when I wanted that brand back, laughing merrily you would give to my command. I must keep this promise, so I can console myself somewhat about this. Then, as it pleased Christ, the Holy Spirit entered Count Orlando, I rose upright, who was lying, towards Carlo, who was weeping greatly, and that body certainly seemed alive due to the power of God who led it. So Orlando, with his sword in his hand, turned towards Charles, laughing, and spoke humbly, like a human body, King Charles' hand, I give you your sword. Carlo took it and then the empty body remained dead on the ground falling, the spirit departed and the body, deprived as it was, fell dead and not alive. If Carlo made a big complaint first, sir, think what he had to do afterwards, the pain increased for each one hundred, the tears great, and the screams and the anguish. 
Batiasi Carlo at such torment in his strong face with his hand he crumples. There was never a pain equal to that, so much so did it seem that the king was wasting away. I wouldn't want you to think, sir, that Carlo was the only one crying at that point, making such a big cry around there that there wouldn't be a person who would believe it. Dusnamo of Bavaria remained silent, and didn't seem to want to cry, and took Carlo in both arms, saying, you don't want to cry any more. Carlo replied, I promise you, Nemo, if not that you have always been faithful to me at this point where we have reached, at the betrayal that was ordered I would say that you were eager to order it, that you are not troubled by it at all. Of the great damage we have received, not a single painful point seems to have been suffered. Nemo said, Oh dear, Carlo, what is the use of complaining about those who have died? For me to move to cry with others, I wouldn't have four of my short children back. There is so much pain in my mind that there is nothing that comforts me more, but please don't complain any more, join us from now on to comfort you. And so Nemo and the mighty Dane Eben the Emperor on horseback. When Orlando was dead, they then took the people, on a horse they quickly crossed it and then the people, without any further disputes, were all willing to follow Carlo, and they descended into the painful valley where the valiant people died. Where the battle had already been, Carlo Alota stopped his pavilion. It was the land of the dead trodden, that every ditch and cave was full of them, together those people are mixed, Christians and Saracens, thus conducted. And so the dead are not known, whether they are Christians or Saracens. Ditossi Carlo Mano on his knees, he raised his hands to heaven with reverence, praying to God with devotion that he would demonstrate true experience of the dead of so many of that legion, some of whom had believed in Jesus Christ. And so Carlo, when he had adored, this miracle was shown to him. All the dead Christians turned with their faces upwards and the cross on their chests, and Carlo ordered them to be gathered together and, as he had said, all the Christians found in the valley were gathered together with perfect love. And so the Christians gathered together, there were screams and painful cries. Some mourned their nephew and some their cousin, some their father, some their brother and some their uncle, some called their son the wretch who had remained in the wild flock. So many were crying then with bowed heads that I couldn't tell the fourth, the screams and travails were greater than when the battle began. No Christian would have a heart so hard that he had not cried at that moment, hearing the somber lament of the dead people and the pain, and so all those who had the holy baptism were buried, except the paladins and the two brothers of whom I will tell you the beautiful names. Then Carlo said with great difficulty, Ronceval, painful plain, Christ by his virtue curses you, that in this place you never glean wheat so that from memory it will always never be said, righteous Christian blood was shed here. And even today, where there was such a trouble, there is no grain or ear of corn. Charles then ordered that fourteen arcs be brought to France and the paladins, and that in each should be a dead body of those wretches. Thus it was done, before he said it, by craftsmen who were ingenious and refined, and once the ark had been made, a dead body was placed in each one and then locked up next to it. Then each ark was covered with soft cloth, all brown in color, and then on the cloth the arms and crest of each one are carefully drawn. It was already nightfall that time, so that no one could see the sun, so the people then disarmed themselves to rest, those who were not keeping watch. And so the people are there to pose, some in pavilions and some under huts, those who were assigned to look, everyone gets busy looking around. All night, restlessly, French, German and Alamanna people, so that the innkeeper was very safe, until the day looked at the dark valley. As it was morning, Carlo got up and ordered the infantry and knights to all move towards Christianity and take the paths. Then all the people were armed, made packs and saddled the steeds, and raised pavilions, trebakes and tents, before the day came each one waited. When the sun moved from the east, shining on each mountain, and the armor that the bold and majestic barony of Charles wore shone, and Charles moved his eye to look at it, raised his eyebrows towards Spain and he saw people coming with flags and arms from Orlando to the neighborhood. Carlo seeing such people coming and displaying the flags they have, he began to say to himself, Oh, alas! 
and the great damage that my nephew caused me to die is not enough for me. Now with their weapons they go to mock me. King Charles certainly believed that Saracen was the one he saw. The strong and pro Salamon of Brittany, who was already lined up with 8,000, raising his eyes across that countryside, saw the people coming from one side. He immediately moved with his great people, towards them the path took place, all the people behind him in a line under his black and white checkered sign. The horse punches and the lance palms, boldly ahead of his people he runs, spurring so that hardly anyone else sees him. Well then his spear was believed to be placed. The captain of the opposing flock stands firmer towards him than Hector. Shield in arm and spear in palm, long live King Charles. And he shouted, Mongoia? Then Solomon A, hearing this, stops his horse and raises his visor and shouts, Cavalier, make your name known in your manner and manner. Then the knight quickly replied, I am a Christian and not from this coast, of the gentle country of France as cousin of Orlando and Answegi I have the name. King Salamon threw away his lance and embraced the knight with great celebration, he often kissed his mouth and his cheek with more joy than he ever had, and said, Charles, our King of France, will be very happy when you come to him. Said Answegi, humbly speaking, Ah, tell me it belongs to Count Orlando. Salamon, when you hear his words, can hardly stop crying, then he said, Friend, courteous damsel, Orlando is healthy and eager to enjoy himself, and goes fouling around this country here and there, as he pleases. Let's go to Carlo, who is in his pavilion, to make sure of your condition. So they went to the camp together and, when they arrived among the people, many barons asked who they were. After the name was truly known, Donzelli and Cavalier with bitter tears went to him crying strongly of tenderness, because he was Orlando's cousin above all paladins. Then it was revealed to the damsel that Orlando was dead with his companions, hence he is called a strong wretch. Oh dear, cousin! Oh my greatest comfort, the slender youth said, shouting, where is your courage, shrewd champion? Painful and all your relatives, who today are destroyed by your death. And Swiggy then made a great lament, the crying was renewed throughout the camp, but so as not to make you regret crying any more, I don't want to follow the song, but we will say that without rest and Swiggy went to the holy emperor. Coming to him, not with good news, I humbly greet him in this sermon, that righteous father, who is the supreme lord, who on the cross was laid for us, and freed us from mortal hell, where everyone was awaited for sin, safe and sound. Maintain Charles forever and whoever has taken Christian baptism, let him bring down with shame, disgrace and damage all those who go against him. Carlo replied in a breathless voice, Tell me, Donzel, may God help you, Jerusalem as you left, what are you doing with your people? And Sweetie said, I abandoned her because I couldn't keep her any longer. I placed myself and Pagan in such a siege that there was no remedy to hold it. And let Carlo know that King Balaganti with 200,000 Saracens is coming towards us with his African people, perhaps they are close to us at six miles, therefore he has all your ranks formed at once and does not stop there, for on this day I believe he will attack us so that we can fight with them. Carlo immediately had a proclamation sent that all his people should take sides. The people lent to command him under his banner everyone withdrew. Nemo said to King Charles when speaking, it would seem to me that he should order twelve pro and vigorous paladins, six who are young and six who are old. Carlo replied, if this pleases you, I am happy with this. Whatever way you want, Denise and you take action. Then Nemo, a source of knowledge, was with Ugeri together with the twelve ordinary parliament and paladins, as you will hear clearly and clearly seen here. Of the elders there was Desider of Pavia, King Salamon and Nemo of Bavaria, the fourth Ugeri full of vigor, Gerardo from Roussillon the fifth Bromo, then followed the sixth in company, I call Arnoldo di Berlanda Duke, the seventh was adorned with a crown, King Isilia, Lord of Pampelona. Guido of Burgundy was then the eighth and Answegi followed the ninth. Beltramo, son of Nemo, in order to be tenth, asked them for a gift, Ricardo and Duodo, Lord of Gascony, are paladins with the others together. And having ordered this, 
he formed three ranks. Now you will hear who was leader. The primary ranks were granted to Guido, and Huodo, and Suigi and Ricardo, and to lead 20,000 cavalry, of the second Beltramo and Isolia led the banner with gay people, with them Arnoldo and the mighty Gerard, Charles and King Desida led the third group and the Dane and Nemo of Bavaria. Thus arrayed were the slender people, even awaiting their cruel enemies. In the other story I will tell the beautiful story of how the pagans descended the slopes, of their wounding and their falling from the saddle, who together were happy and happy knights. I pray to Christ, victorious Father, to keep you at peace with rest. Canto 38. Divine Majesty, True and Supreme, O Supreme Father, Almighty Jupiter, by whom virtue is guided and governed and every good principle moves from him, grant to my mind that I may discern to demonstrate the virtuous trials that Charles made after the rout, when Count Orlando died with twenty thousand. Gentlemen, I said in the other words, when King Charles had his people assembled, King Balaganti and his people waiting, and it was already half a third past, those Saracens, riding hard, arrived in the unfortunate valley, a good two miles behind our people. Everyone stop and each one takes up arms. King Balaganti raised two armies in battle, each of which numbered eighty thousand, the first army was led by him, and the second army boasts of leading the king of Persia, which was an uneducated war. Thus the people in full ranks, King Balaganti believes he will win and advances with the first ranks. Then he had his flags and banners unfurled and ordered everyone to follow him. The barony of the strong knights entered into battle with him. Guido and his companions, no longer cowards, each followed him happily, he said, thus the ranks were moved together, stands and flagpoles and flags unfurled. The storms sounded from every place, and the steeds began to fall, they were gradually approaching the valiant people with courage. When they were pressed into this game, they immediately began to hurt. The knights go with their poles low, they give each other great blows. Strong wounds and severe blows broke spears and shattered shields, one fell to the ground while the other was dead, then they put their hands to the strong naked weapons. Some proud in front and some behind the gangs, giving each other ruthless and cruel blows. Many grooms of dead knights go through the field, abandoned and restrained. And Sweetie came, the strong paladin, the shield in his arms and the spear in his hand. In his chest he wounded a large Saracen, he passed the brunt and pierced his belly, and then the fine baron defeats another, shouting, Long live Charles of France. He then turned to a great pagan, and took his life with his spear. Once the lance is broken, the strong Brando takes it and moves, through the flock wounding, knights and horses and weapons he cuts and legs and hands and heads departing. He offends the pagans so boldly that whoever sees him turns and flees. A large and powerful Saracen enters the flock with his large spear. At the first blow he felled a Christian, he wounded him to death, on the ground of his steed, then he wounded another with a rude blow, the shield passed to him, overhang and plates. Once dead, the wicked pagan beats him, he did similar to another knight. With five deaths he must strike them down, before his spear is broken or shattered. From the Christian side came a German on a morel horse with low shafts, bold and slender, brave and fresh, shattering the ranks in battle. On the helmet he displayed a great barbaresco, the helmet he split and the chest tied of life, then he wounded another for me, the Petignon, who killed him from the sand. King Desida, to test his person, lowers his spear and takes up his shield, he spurs his horse as much as he can, placing himself beyond the raw flock. Frank people are not abandoning him yet, but each one tries well when he is naked. In the battle Desida met a Saracen, who was of great value. Forillo Desiderio in the crest, so that he made him fall with his head. El Saracino boldly and proudly turned against him with ill will, with the brand in his hand he stands up on his steed and Desiderio fies with great power, over his right shoulder he cleaves what he takes from his surcoat and armor. A vassal of Desiderio, seeing his master thus wounded, lowers his lance and spurs his horse towards that Saracen with great courage, wounds him in the head without fail with such a great blow that he dies, 
Then he wounded among the Saracen people as much as he could with force and robbery. The son of Duke Nemo, who was one of the newly elected paladins, came to the flock, and was called by name Beltramo, he caused a great massacre of the Saracens. Every encounter makes one's life miserable, more than forty were made miserable, some falling to the ground and some injured, taken to die in this way. Arnoldo, Duke and Lord of Berlanda, came to the flock with an angry mind, he commands himself to Father Jesus Christ, the shield in his arms and the spear in his hand. A Saracen who was carrying a band across the red field of gold, who was king of Tunis at that time, broke his lance against Arnoldo. He gave him such a great blow that Arnoldo barely supported himself on his horse. The duke's anger cannot be restrained, the spear is lowered so that nothing is held back, towards Pagan he goes with strength and energy. That Saracen came towards him, Arnoldo then wounded his side for me, his arms and flesh are pierced up until now. Our Carlo Mano came to the camp on a horse that looks like a mountain, the shield in his arms and the strong spears in his hand, and behind him Salamon of Brittany, Nemo and the Dane, sovereign paladin, all followed with their companion, King Isoliri, the good Duke Girardo, the Emperor followed each strong man. The brave people, our French and Alamanni Christians, fought well against the painful faith of Macon, giving those Saracens heavy troubles. No Christian has already taken a stand, everyone does well to hurt everyone without deception. Everyone believed that day to take revenge on Orlando and his perfect people. King Balaganti saw the battle starting well on all sides on a horse, covered in mail, the Saracen was immediately mounted with spears in his hand and the brand that cut well, which he had girded around his left side. The spear is lowered, the strong shield is held in one's arms and one goes out into the flock to wound. He drove his horse in such a storm, ducking and often scratching, that it was never such a terrible thing to see men falling to the ground. King Balaganti shows his power by overtaking the barons of his steeds, during the battle he makes such a great noise that there is no one to keep track of his pace. As the king ran through the deadly flock with spears in his hand and strong shield in his arms, he encountered a young Provencal boy, whose name I am withholding at present. The royal baron wounded him in the helmet, he passed everything as if it were ice. When he was dead he was knocked down and then another beast fell, in a similar way he made him fall. So fierce is King Balaganti that no one can stand against him, whoever he sees behind or in front, he takes the trouble to flee across the plain. Rigiglio takes over the afflicting people, then strengthen the hard battle. They cut limbs, weapons and horses with good cut swords. Guido d'Avignon came to the flock on a horse covered in steel, and followed under his flag more than a thousand Frank knights. With the spear low that noble baron spurred his strong and gay steed, he wounded a Saracen in the visor, when he dies he beats him in this way. Eighteen beats Guido from his horse, before he finds any obstacle. Every admirer, squire or vassal, seeing him, fled at a gallop, and Balaganti, king of Portugal, who at that point was too strong, met the good Guido and passed him with a low spear through the middle of his chest. Then Balaganti wounded a Frankish knight, who was English, in a similar way, he was praised for giving death and found no objection from anyone. The author tells us, not to mention fraud, that in less than an hour he dispatched between fifty and a hundred wounded and dead, so much so that he wounded with great courage. Our Christians fled before it, seeing it perform such marvels in arms. No one dared go too close to him, but whoever can takes the field from me. King Charles then, who often looked, raised his eyebrows towards the flock, he saw Christian and himself moving forward and everyone returning behind. Carlo asked, who is the knight that our people put in this way? He was answered by some squire, he is a Saracen who has great strength. He beats and shatters the ranks, he has already taken the lives of more than a hundred of them. He gave death to Guido of Avignon due to his immense and strong power. Hearing Carlo talk about his prowess, he doesn't think it's a game to just watch and says to himself, it would be madness if I let him be held in this way. He would burden all my people if he has such infinite power. Thus thoughtful and sorrowful and sad, he appealed to Duke Nemo of Bavaria, saying, I never want to be king again, 
at this point I give you the crown. Towards the pagan, who shows so much pride, I want to go and prove myself. I take away his life with the sword or my person is abandoned once dead. Nemo replied, Oh, what are you talking about? Don't think about this anymore. What would we do if you were dead? Who would these people then lead? Stay here and let us go, it wouldn't be much good for you. Carlo replied, I am still determined, since the one who loved me so much is dead, to avenge him or die quickly and I am willing to do so. Seeing his will, we shout, let everyone wound in battle. Then the knights, who were good, all followed Carlo with great merit. All the people in community with the Saracens go to the showdown. When King Valaganti saw this, he quickly sent to the rear group and commanded the king who was leading him to immediately move forward. The captain observed his command, the African barons stopped ahead, so that one another followed everyone well on one side and the other. Christians and Saracens, in such a dispute, whoever has more strength punishes the other. Thus all the people were alerted to the battle on all sides. The great shout and then the great sonata, whoever could use such an art. The people in the field were cut down and here and there the meat was falling apart. Voting from saddles and tearing down flags was done by those who were free knights. Desider of Pavia comes to the camp with his people, Tuscans and Lombards, there is no better barony in that host. Pawns and knights, all strong, make a great cut of the people. With spears and swords, with falcons and darts, those brave Italians make all the ranks of the pagans tremble. Don't think, sir, that those Saracens were silent in battle then, but like strong and knowledgeable masters they seemed to be paladins towards Christian. Those who had rich admiring views of paganism, both abroad and nearby, were never more valiant people, since Jesus came into the holy womb. Gentlemen, to recount the warnings, the great blows and the many wounds, which the Frank knights, with mighty arms, made at the same time valiant and cheerful, I promise you, good people, I would never believe I could ever sing, they fell so often and knights daring, who together fought against such parties. King Balaganti on a great steed for the battle goes fast, spurring, he knocks down insignia, banners and flags and many people on the ground while climbing over. Charles of France, our emperor, was shocked in him, to death. Shouting. One reverses his bowed spear to the other, running with pride and robbery. Valaganti gave him such a great blow that he fell to the flat ground, then he commanded his African people that they must take him prisoner. Once Carlo had taken on such a look, he caught Gioioza in a strong grip, here and there he stood strong, throwing away anyone who approached him. Carlo then acted like a bear, when he is closely surrounded by many dogs, now in front of him and now behind him he gives him bites, thus Charles was arrested by the Pagani, so much so that he was aided and aided by his valiant Christian Franks, and on a powerful steed was placed the emperor by his people. Carlo, with great fear, doubted that Balaganti would ever encounter him again, where he saw him go, he disgusted him, fearing that he wouldn't go over him. Then from heaven a voice spoke, an angel I believe Christ sent, saying to Charles, Go boldly upon the pagan with your sword in your hand. Against him God will give you such strength that with your sword you will give him death. King Charles, hearing that holy voice that comes from the king of the supreme court, sings to himself with joy, with both hands he takes his strong sword, and he spurs where Balaganti sees that, as he did, he believes he is going to kill him and give him a serious blow on the head, so that the head and the helmet and the little pelvis up to his chin must be cut off, so that the plane makes him read. Then Carlo returned to the troubles where the flock is more crowded and narrower, by wounding he goes showing his prowess, boldly with much joy. Carlo didn't care about a medal after he had Balaganti dead, due to the harsh flock those people cut down and many Saracens put to harm. In the next chapter I will tell you about the battle and show you all, clearly and clearly, how Charles took Saragossa. May Christ always be at your defense. Canto 39. Emperor of the Supreme Height, who built the sun, sky and moon, which gives us heat, coldness and clarity, and illuminates the dark air at night, 
O Supreme Father, divine strength, against whose great power fortune is not worth it, although I am not worthy of asking for grace, grant to my mind so much ingenuity that I can clearly show to all people how Charles Mann was victorious at Roncesvalles after the consummation of the deed of valiant blood. Gentlemen, I said in the other song that Carlo had already entered the painful flock, and I said clearly and clearly how he had Balaganti dead. Carlo goes fighting through the flock, proud as a wild boar fleeing in the hunt, horses, men and weapons departing, flags and banners torn down and torn to pieces. Each Saracen, seeing Carlo, quickly turned his face to flee. There was no knight so sure that he wanted to wait for a hard blow from him. Although Carlo and his people fought as much as they could, each to the advantage, don't think that any pagan was there, on the contrary they showed every courage of him. The fights for the flock were so frequent among the knights of great lineage, during the battle the people fight and one another is killed on the ground. The sun was already turned towards the south and as it shone it made a great noise, the flock was cruel and very harsh. When it was certain to the pagan people that Balaganti had been taken from his life by Charles, king of the Christian people, the great Barbassari, dukes and admirers were all dismayed by this. Then all the Saracen people, knowing that their great lord was dead, each one walked towards Saragossa, all of them began to flee. French, German and Latin people with happy faces go to follow them, along the way causing much damage, some coming from the west and some taking. All the Christians followed them, except for 4,500, who made their home in Roncesvalles, who remained to watch the supplies and dead bodies and their other treasure, which was in the camp, of great value. Carlo and the others followed him in the name of God to Saragossa. Our Christians, following them, go as far as Saragossa for this purpose, causing them very cruel damage. Many pagan people had already died in spite of them and Christian did so much that after them they entered the door. King Isolia, Lord of Pampelona, was the first person to have anything to do with the Christians. Although he had been a pagan and the carnal nephew of Massilio, he was more ferocious than any Christian to do great harm and harm to the Saracens. Inside the door, with sword in hand, entered the Baron of Natural War, and after him Salamon of Brittany, Charles, the Dane and Nemo in his company. Good runners march forward shouting loudly, Long live Charlemagne. We will be lords of the whole city, now we can make a lot of money here. Children and adults alike fled from Saragossa with pain and grave lament. Massilio, who was inside his palace, was amazed when he heard such a plot and asked why he was running away. He was answered by several Saracens, meaning that Carlo was coming and would arrive at the palace soon. Every Christian shouted, Long live the faith of Christ and may can be disposed. Fiero and Christians in such a brawl with the Saracens in the square to brawl. King Massilio, seeing the flag of Oriflam and Charles coming afterwards, and hearing many pagans say that Balaganti died with anguish, thought he was dying of the great pain and collapsed with his hands in his cheeks, with great lament he called himself a wretch, bashing Macon and Apollinus, saying, God be cursed Macon, who neither virtue nor power reigns in you, Christians have victory in spite of you. Cursed be Gandhi Maganza, who with his betrayals has held me so close that I have lost all hope. I am deserted, and Carlo, along with his people, calls himself a mourner for this purpose. Although his damage does not restore me, as I have lost relatives and friends, and I still cannot repair myself, I see Carlo with his people here. Alas, sore. Because the pain makes me sad, seeing myself and Christian happy, and it is better for me to die or deny the faith that I have always wanted to observe. Massilio made such a dark lament, as I find written in history, that there would be no heart so hard that he was not pierced by pity. In truth, sir, I swear to you, although I was not present here, that from what the story explains, this lament still makes me cry. That, although he did not believe in our God, because he was brave and of gentle blood, Considering the shame and the harm he had never received like it, I cry strongly in my soul, bearing my subtle memory of it, but because I have come here from history, I want to make a specific comment on this lament. 
Massilio stood at the window of his palace in the main hall, and had cut his left shoulder, from which the pain in his heart never subsides, due to great pride that crossbows his heart with his head downwards he threw himself onto the staircase. The blow from the fall was so great that his soul lost its flesh and bones. Makometo brought his soul and his body to pieces with the disease. Carlo, with him, Christian, runs all over the world with him, as I said before. And Saracen no longer defends but many people leave to survive. What remains, make an I deny, then in our faith they were baptized. Charles was the lord of Saragossa and all the citizens obeyed him, in the palace most of them mounted with great honor and more people followed him. Let us leave Charles the victorious emperor here with tears and sighs, and we will count how Gander Pontieri thinned out to escape thoughts of him. You know, sir, that I said how Carlo left from San Gian Pie di Porto and left a man, whose name I won't say, escorted by five hundred knights, with provisions and loads, and for me it was in truth the port that Gano left and he said that he should watch it, until the innkeeper returned. Gano was locked up in a tower, closely guarded all night and day, and one evening, when the sun passes towards the west with its vapor adorned, that Gan, who cannot be prevented from betraying, went around the prison where he was, Maninconoso with a lying voice called the Donzel who guards the prison, saying, For my love, Donzel, please come in and dine with me, for eating alone doesn't seem to do any good, I will eat better accompanied by you. Gano spoke with more false face than he did for Greek scene and Troy. The Donzel, who does not think of being betrayed, entered the prison to go with Gano to the table. When he was inside, Gano's traitor saw a knife on that Donzel's side, he immediately placed his hand on it and wounded the damsel in the side. And the villainous traitor had him dead, then immediately, as he had thought, he left that tower and no harm, immediately he went into a stable. He immediately saddled a palfrey and as soon as he left the stable, he took the path towards the pagan earth, believing himself to have truly escaped, but as it pleased the high serene God, the time, which was starry and clear, through the power of God everything is clouded with a very deep fog. The fog is so thick and deep that the light of the stars covers and blows away, Gano does not yet see the second path, but here and there, like a blind man, he wanders. He does not beat the sea as often as his wave, as at that point the traitor sighs, and all that night until day he walked less than a mile, going around. Then in the morning, when the sun moved across the universe and the east cleared, as it pleased the supreme Jupiter, the one who had it on guard went immediately to that tower, where Gan the traitor in prison was. He found the guard dead, so to his disgrace he and his people soon mounted. Looking for Gano, the captain went very silently with his companion, he found him very sad to go here and there through the countryside, because the sight was hidden from him due to his malice which so enchanted him, and as the fleeing captain finds him, he firmly binds him with his hands, saying, Traitor, you cannot deny the betrayal you have done to us and the great fault. They are your discoveries and betrayals, now it is obvious to Baron and Vassal. It's also a bad death for me, I don't want to look at you any more in this stalemate. I want to present you before Carlo, who will punish your pride with death again. Due to the cruel pain Gan does not speak and as if he were mute then he remains silent. That captain with five hundred in the saddle towards Ronceval L. Carmen face. Having arrived in beautiful Saragossa, where Charles and his true barons were, he went to the palace and where Charles is he takes a look, with reverence he kneels before him, saying, The King of Divine Glory, by whose power everything is governed, and fortunately his virtue does not decline, save you, Carlo, with superior power, destroy all the Saracen faith for the universe, and now and forever reduce the pride, virtue and power of the cursed Gano di Maganza. Just as you put the traitor on my guard, so I present him to you. Be assured, Monsignor, that he was happy with Orlando's death. Since then you left San Giovanni, he treacherously killed one of my darlings and had already set out to escape, except that I arrived there with my company. Carlo then responded nothing to the cruel pain that came to his heart. Duke Nemo, without staying, goes towards Gano, who did not hold back, saying, Traitor, it is fitting that he dies. I swear to Christ, 
who suffered death. With a clenched fist, bold encounter, give him more and more blows in the face. Then Berlander Arnoldo stands up with his fist clenched in his face and locks one fist on top of the other, thick and firm, hitting hard, and Gano seems to be crying. Arnoldo said, my bold husband must remain dead for your sake. For your betrayals you have put to the bottom all my relatives, the flower of the world. Giving him a loud shout, Duke Nemo said, alas, traitor. Through your wicked deceptions of four of my sons you have made me miserable, so that I will feel the troubles in my life. So each one of us longs to give him a good eight and I tear all his clothes. The traitor said with full face, do you suffer, Carlo, that this should be done to me? I am beaten with great sin and wrong, and despised with great rudeness, there was never a traitor, I apologize I see, neither I nor anyone else from my house. I am happy, Carlo, to be dead, if it ever turns out to be true. Then Carlo spoke and said, Siri, sit in peace and let no one be martyred any more. Each baron then went to sit down and went no further towards Gano, but first they made them want so much that their eyes and nose were completely exhausted. Now let's leave Gan, who has nothing to enjoy, and I will tell how Carlo just and clearly left Saragossa to return to the Christians, where he wants to live. Carlo called Answigi at that point. He said, Vicar I want you to remain with 10,000 for all your services and King Isoleri as your companion. I want to return to Paris with my host, and I no longer want to live in Spain. If you never need help, send the police immediately. Answigi accepted the lordship cheerfully and with King Isoleri. Charles departed with his barony and left 10,000 knights. There Roncesval set out with him, taking Gander Pontieri, and having reached Roncesval he had fourteen steeds taken away and placed an ark on each of those dead bodies, the arch and the horses covered in black. Then he moved the host of the short barons towards Christianity, to tell the truth, they passed mountains, rivers and ports, so much so that they actually arrived in Gascony, in the land of Nurbona, and their Carlo reasons in this way, since, gentlemen, we have arrived here this city of Saracen people, now at the present time you want us to fight. For sure take it this morning. The wise Duke Nemo then replied, do not speak any more of such a doctrine, because it is clear that many of our people have been killed. And if this city were fought before it was ours by battle, it would be necessary for a large number of your people to remain dead. It seems to me, sir, if you like it, and this is the best and my mind proves it, that if you cannot have agreements, you should keep to these conditions. You have more graces from God and he has granted you all of them, devoutly pray to him now that he will lead the land to such a direction that you can take it without giving battle and be obeyed by those Saracens. Suddenly Carlo then knelt and devoutly adored heaven, saying, Father, everlasting God, grant me grace through your dignity that I may take this great city without battle to my will. And Christ then answered his prayer, for on that side of that city, as he pleased with his pure will, walls all fell to the ground. Carlo then entered with his people, who were not personally opposed. And Saracen all communally in our faith was the baptized people. Carlo remained in that present day until the day after it was cleared, then, as he was about to leave and leave the vicar, he began to speak to the barons as follows a frank captain, Sir, must remain here with people on guard. This land borders Gascony and up to here you know that it is Spain. If Saraceni thinks it is a lie against Answigi and a frank companion of him, from here the rescue will soon be able to go, as he will send to indicate. There was no duke or baron at the time who responded to such a statement. I say under no circumstances was anyone who wanted to stay. When Carlo saw this opinion, which everyone seemed to fear, he felt such great pain at such a punishment that he was unable to speak because of the pain. Seeing that everyone refused to remain to guard the land, he became angry at that strong point and threw the golden wand onto the ground. Arnoldo de Berlander then spoke, Sir, I am old and no longer fit for war, but if it pleases you, I take the precaution, not for myself, but only for one of my sons, who, when I left, as a little jockey, has already made me so many years old, 
I believe he will be so great by now that it will be able to last a long time in war. I no longer believe I will go to war with dukes or counts, with kings or tyrants. Then Carlo said, Now you understand me, as you say, you take it for your son. Then Arnoldo removed the lordship with those people he wanted to keep. Charles turned towards France with the innkeeper and everyone rode as he could. May that true God, who wanted to die for us, look upon us all with peace and pleasure. In the other words, sir, I will sing everything, as Gan was spent and spent in life. Canto 40. I pray to God of the supreme flock, in which fortitude and temperance reign, which lords over the entire universe, from which every virtue must come, to give grace to my mind that sees in such a way that my singing is appropriate, the last I sing the rhymes in such a way that there may be praise throughout the universe. Grant me virtue, supreme God, that I know and can sing the last so adorned with my intellect that no one can blame me for it, and I kindly ask you around me to listen to the ending. Now you will hear the rude complaint that Gano's traitor made. Gentlemen, I made the point of telling the other how Charles left Nerbona to travel to France with his people, he rides hard and spurs with pain, no iniquity can come out against Gano, a terrible person. Over and over several days, riding eight times, the innkeeper was taken near Paris. The ladies with their maidens went out of Paris, each one was in disarray, with heavy crying they are called sad with tears falling from their eyelashes. If the whole kingdom were then destroyed, it would be no wonder to cry, the loud screams and the lamenting that make the voices six miles and more go further. Some mourn the son, some the uncle, some the nephew, some his brother and some the beloved father, some beat his face with his hands, tearing his clothes and his white chest. Keep yourself happy then whoever can cry, nature sufficing out of spite, and the hour and day that Gan was born was enough for which so many dead people lay. Maidens and married women and widows were crying, they remained at that point, but teens all with palms and dishevelled, each of them was stung by pain and their hearts. Many of them had blood on their faces that their blood had reached the ground, with cruel moans and loud cries in proof, one cried out more than the other. In their lament the women said, Gander Pontieri, God curse you, who have knocked down so many good pillars of Christianity, an ancient power. How did the devil not bring your spirit, when you thought of something so difficult? And with this lament Charles entered Paris and his people followed him. Then the dead paladins were placed outside in Our Lady of Paris then. With great lament all the citizens, seemed to be dying of great pain, the little jockeys, who as yet had no knowledge, were crying loudly, and it seemed that nature had granted it that then every creature should weep. Gentlemen, to tell the story of the harsh tears that the French people did then, there were no such complaints in Troy when the Greek people took it. I will not let you sing because of the effort, but so that you may not be displeased by saying too much, I will now put this lament to rest here and I will tell you about the sorrowful Aldabella. Carlo then sent word to Aldabella to come to court, that Olivieri and Orlando had returned with their bold and strong barony. Having listened to such sermons, Aldo was happier than the man was to escape death, with damsels and ladies in company she set off towards Paris. She arrived in Paris, believing she would find Orlando alive and the Marquis Olivieri. In front of Carlo he went to introduce himself and greet him for such tasks, then she sweetly began to speak to him, cheerful and bold without having any thoughts, saying, Monsignor, on your embassy I am here to obey you. I have come to see my husband Orlando and Olivieri, my brother, who have not heard anything about them in any hostel for a long time. Then Carlo was completely dismayed, when Aldabella reminded him of that, and she said, Lady, I can no longer hide what fortune has brought upon us? As fortune turned over destiny or that treachery had been used, Olivieri and Orlando the paladin, with twenty thousand who were accompanied, from the great Saracen army in Roncesvalles each was cut off, and in Our Lady of Paris still Orlando and Olivier dead dwelt. I sent for you so that you can see your pain and my great spite. Then the Lady of Pain flames, her hands raising to the everlasting God. He shouts, Tapina, before I want to see Orlando and Olivier more seated. Then the Lady was taken forward to where all the paladins were, Orlando dead, 
as he was in the ark, and Olivieri in another near him. She was full of great pain and heavy thoughts, it seemed to her that her heart was disconnected. Weeping in lament, he remembered her and stood close to both of us, and held a hand on each ark with painful and strange laments. There was no pain that ever resembled what I found her doing. Thus weeping, she drew the Lady Berta to that lament with reprehensible laments, it seemed that it was all consumed in itself, that I could not tell you the third, saying, Son, O oh my, who killed you, my dear hope, delight and comfort. That the whole universe was afraid of your power which was so great. The power of the Christians is defeated, and painful my name is now Tanta. I had no faith in seeing you and now you leave me in the world so heartbroken. Now I can say that for you, dear son, I have lost all hope and advice. All to the fair wept cruelly, praying to the father of the supreme kingdom that Orlando or Olivier, whoever is more worthy, would speak to her with happy speech. To give consolation to her, God miraculously demonstrated this sign, that Olivieri, her physical brother, spoke to her through celestial virtue. I am, sister, with much rest in glory of him who is supreme lord. Speaking thus, that glorious body fell silent without saying any more. The lady, hearing this, sadly saw her life come to an end. Alda the fair died in the midst of her brother and her husband. After the painful and dark lament, the dead paladins, each for himself, were buried inside Paris by the command of Charles the king then. Alda with Olivieri, the pure body, together bury each other in good faith, and once this is done, the people plan to kill the unbeliever Gano. Carla thought of having Gan de Pontieri tortured so that he would die, and Lady Berta with great complaints went before him and said thus, Carlo brother, by God I want to pray to you, for that faith that Christ blessed, that at this point my husband be left and taken out of prison. That's enough for the enormous outrage we have received for such a move, and I don't want you to believe in your courage that Gan has betrayed you at this point, my husband would never have ordered such damage against you. May I please you, Carlo, so that I don't become a widow unjustly and that I don't cry for him. Milan first gave me away as your husband and he was dead, as you know. If this man makes death painful, I would be more painful than I ever was. Carlo then replied very thoughtfully, shut up, you won't receive any wrong. Today I want to consult with my barons and say what I think about this fact. He then made Carlo ring the bell and all his barons gathered. I stood upright with this resolution, speaking he says with a bitter sigh, I don't know if there was a betrayal in Roncesval, when Orlando and his company fell out with the Saracens, so it seems to me that the people are Latins. Whether Gano ordered the betrayal when Massilio became ambassador, if this is true, I am not sure but my heart cannot believe that I would punish him with my own hand if he had been a traitor to me in this regard. If any of you is certain of this thing, let your understanding be clear and open about it. I raised Salamon of Brittany, saying, this is evident. Gan ordered the betrayal and cruel deceit to kill the valiant deed in the country of Spain, when he went to Massilio for your inquiry. Then Nemo, Duke of Bavaria, stood on his feet, speaking in this way, the betrayal cannot be concealed, which was committed against Charles by Gano. That such a fault must be paid does not remain a matter of any agreement. And Pinabello, hearing such talk, who was new to Gan, quickly replied, I say who Gano, the traitor, calls by the throat and speaks poorly. On my own behalf I want to excuse him against those who say, he is a traitor, in the presence, I say, of Carlo here, to prove my strength against him. Now let anyone who wants to accuse him stand upright, I will make him repent of such madness. Then Terigi, Orlando's squire, stood up thus speaking, I say that Gano committed these deceptions. Orlando and his companions caused him to die. I wore the spurs for more than ten years and obeyed him as my sire. No one should bother to excuse Gano, whoever you want, I want to contradict him. Before Charles, our King of France, I want to prove this by virtue of the spear. Pinabello replied with fairness, I am prepared for this test. Fighting for my uncle to such a call I will not let it be of low status. Before Charles, 
our handsome emperor, everyone was engaged in this battle and that council was no longer held, each armed man came to the square. They brought all the people to the square to see that battle. Everyone prays that God would give power to Terigi, such a valiant baron, and Gano was led to this site in the square with the others present. Terigi and Pinabel challenge each other, with spears in hand, each shouts as they run. Both were injured on the shields, the shafts broke and the sections fell away, the knights did not leave the saddle, so much vigor reigned in each one. With brands in their hands they struck each other several times, none of them seemed to be dismayed, on the right and on the left they force each of their arms to kill themselves. As Christ and reason wanted, Terigi Pinabello advances strongly. Gano spoke to King Salamon with niquity and with much arrogance, if my nephew dies in this matter, I will pay you for my allegiance, since you were the first speaker and you advised against me so proudly. Salamon replied, I care nothing for you, for today you will lower all your pride. You have made us so dark about the betrayal, today you will bear pain and condolences. Pinabel will die with harsh pain and then I want to see you die too. And so, contending with each other, the knights came in strong wounds. And they had already fought for a long time, one against the other showing his valor, the armor and the surcoat each one breaks, and each one of them is bloodied. He never came out with such a strong frenzy from the bow, as one spurs the other on. Bold and quick, they give each other cruel blows, which do nothing. But because Pinabel fights the wrong, Christ made him lose all his power. Terigi towards him, quickly and short, wounded him on the helmet with a great blow. As much of the helmet as he takes, he cuts off, then he dealt the other blow to this move. By such great strength and by the virtue of God I left his head up to his chin. When Pinabello was then dead and the proof of Gan as a traitor was made, Carlo spoke to Gano as follows, tell me which death is best suited to you, for since you are brought to this port, your life must be ruined. Then Gano said with lament, not believing that Carlo would consent, since I am called a traitor, I want to die the death that suits me. Carlo makes sure that my body is quartered, since for me there is no reason to do so. Carlo was then almost terrified, such great pain comes to him from that talk. And that day King Carlo Mano ordered the traitor of Gano to be quartered. And he brought four palafrons, roomy, powerful and well flown. Gano was quartered and burned to death and the dust thrown into the winds. Thus I purged his false betrayal, as you have heard, good people. Thus it was great joy for Paris when justice was done for Gano. Would it please God that those who use betrayal, deceit and fraud would be so punished, that already the great Troy was destroyed by Sin and the Greek who followed such methods, women and maidens he led to shame and the brave men were killed like dogs. King Ptolemy, Judas and the king of Thrace fed their minds with this art. You, good people, who have listened to the ancient story for worldly desire, for this time do not blame me if I had rhymed my song badly, for in good truth, sir, you can see that I have begun to rhyme, but you have given me too much to hate the great rhymes of which there are many. Gentlemen, I pray to that God who wanted to die for us, placed on the cross, and took us away from the infernal enemy, where every sinner was willing, as he freed souls from limbo, so free us from vices quickly and give us grace, when we die, we go to holy paradise. Gentlemen, you have rhymed all this support from Zenobi de Firenze, who always prays to God, the Heavenly Father, to protect us from further judgment, and it is clear and manifest to all of you that whoever takes care not to fail goes to heaven with his holy life. To your honor that story is over.